come. I'm E.G. Marshall. Are you old enough and were you lucky enough to have been raised on A Child's Garden of Verses by Robert Louis Stevenson? If so, you must remember the one that began, I have a little shadow that goes in and out with me, and what can be the use of him is more than I can see. Well, in the musings of the very young, a shadow may seem a superfluous, if delightful thing, but in the world of parapsychology, the shadow is full of significance, mysterious, and arcane. In the morning on sunny days, there was my shadow walking ahead of me. And in the afternoon, if I looked over my shoulder, there it was right behind me. But then this wondrous thing happened. And after that, my shadow was with me on the rainy days, too. And indoors, not only outdoors. In the dark, just as much as in the light. Why, oh, it's here, even now. After all that's happened... My shadow is right here. Our mystery drama, The Sinister Shadow, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Terry Keene. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. There are 23 separate definitions of the word shadow in Webster's International Dictionary. If you wish, you may read them all. But for our immediate purpose, we have selected definition number eight. A reflected image, as in a mirror or in water. Listen carefully to what follows, and you will understand why we selected this definition. I'll tell you how it all started. I mean, that is if you're interested. Sure, I'm interested. I don't know why you should be. Well, I am. It would kind of help me to clear up the whole thing in my head. So tell me. Uh, It was the darndest thing. I was on my way home from the bank. Uh, I'm a teller at the bank. It doesn't pay much, but it's a, you know, a respectable kind of job. Not like some, you know. Sure. I was walking east on Lake Street. It was about 3.30, and I was... Looking at my shadow. See, I always walk with my head down. It's a terrible habit, but anyhow, that's the way I generally walk. And for some reason, I heard my mother's voice the way I'd heard it about a million times. Stand up straight, for heaven's sake. She was always saying that to me. Dory, for heaven's sake, stand up straight. Don't slump. Dory, don't slump, she'd say. Throw your shoulders back. Stand erect. Stand erect, Dory. Throw your shoulders back, Dory. Oh, how many times I'd heard her say that. Yeah? Then what? Well, I looked at my shadow and... (laughs) My goodness, I looked like a dwarf or something. I could hardly see my head at all. And I didn't seem to have any shoulders. So... So? So, I straightened up. I threw my shoulders back, and I pulled in my stomach, and I held my head high, and I started taking long steps, swinging my arms. And? And I walked that way for, oh, half a block, maybe. But then I looked down at my shadow. And? My shadow. My shadow still looked like a dwarf. All hunched over, no head showing, hardly any shoulders. You believe me, don't you? Whatever you say. Well, you can imagine how surprised I was. Sure. I mean, there I was, standing erect, and my shadow was all hunched over. I couldn't understand it. I I was... I was... flabbergasted. Naturally. Now, it so happened that I was standing right in front of a bar and grill. I'm not in the habit of going into those places, but I was so... I, I was really shook up. Sure you were. So I went in. It seemed like a nice place. There were not very many people. After all, it was the middle of the afternoon. Uh Uh-huh. And I didn't know if if to sit at a table or what. I really didn't know what I was doing there exactly. 
But then I saw a woman sitting at the bar. She was by herself, too. I'd heard that women do that these days, or I read it somewhere, so I thought, well, I'll go and I'll sit next to her. That way nobody will think I'm trying to pick up a man, you know. Uh Uh-huh. So I hopped up on the stool next to her, and I just sat there wondering what had happened to my shadow. Excuse me. Hmm? What? Uh Uh-oh. Were you speaking to me? I think the bartender wants to know what you want to drink. Oh. Uh, What are you drinking? I'm having a glass of white wine. Oh, well, I'll have that. She'll have a glass of white wine. People seem to be drinking that a lot these days. Uh, It's fashionable. Uh, A glass of white wine sounds very ladylike. Yes, I guess it does. It shows right away you're not a drunken dame. (laughs) I guess so. On the other hand, you're not a prude. Not above lifting one on occasion. Oh, here's yours. Shall we? What? Lift one. Oh, sure. To the future. Whatever it is. You like it? Oh, what? Like the wine. Oh, yes. I've, uh... I've had wine before. Several times. I'd never have guessed. Oh, beer, too. No fooling. Oh, yes. Uh, Look, uh, um... Am I bothering you? You want me to shut up? No, no. No, I talk too much sometimes. I can't seem to help it. I just go on and on and it drives some people crazy. I can't seem to stop myself. So just tell me. No, no, no. It's not that. It's just... You don't have to listen to me. No, I am listening. The way you keep staring in the mirror. That's just it. What is? What's it? Look in the mirror. Don't you see? See what? You and me. You and me. Side by side. So? We look alike. We do? Don't you see? You must see. We're doubles. Why, yes. So we are. It was true. We looked exactly alike, and when she really looked at me, she could see it, too. Uh, Of course, nobody would notice it right away because, I mean, well, her clothes were very, very, uh, mod. Isn't that what they say? Mm, They used to. She had on blue jeans, very tight, very, uh, well, revealing. Uh Uh-huh. And then this top, kind of a magenta color, cut down to here. And these masses and masses of gold chains. And her hair... It was like light blonde, like mine, but all in tiny little curls. She told me later she'd had a permanent, but it certainly looked wonderful. Sort of lighted up her face, you know? Uh Uh-huh. Well, we got very friendly. Yes, we did. We really did. I told her all about what happened with my shadow, and she listened, and every once in a while she nodded her head and acted like she believed every word I was saying. Really? Well, sure. I've always heard that everybody has a double somewhere in the world, but i never met mine. Have you met yours? No, I haven't. Well, wait till you do. It will change your whole life. It certainly changed mine. Certainly has. I I told her all about my mother, about hearing my mother's voice. You know, stand up straight, Dory. Don't slump, Dory. She understood that, too. It was really amazing. I can imagine. All of a sudden, I realized I'd been sitting there for almost an hour going on and on about all these things, and my mother must be wondering what on earth had become of me because, well, usually I come straight home from the bank, and it was almost five o'clock. Yeah. So? So I, I knew I'd get holy heck for being late because I always have to get the dinner. Uh, my mother does the shopping, but... I get the dinner. So I jumped up all of a sudden and said goodbye in a hurry and went out. But this time... This time... Yeah? This time? This time, I walked with my head up and my shoulders back. I stood up very tall and took long steps. And? And this time, 
My shadow was very tall, too. My shadow held up its head and took long steps all the way home. Dory, it's me. Where in the name of heaven have you been? Do you know what time it is? Nearly five o'clock. Where were you? I was detained. Detained? They detained you at the bank? Uh, not, not at the bank. Then where? You never go any place that I know of. I just dropped to talk to somebody. Did you forget I have guests coming for dinner? Well, I guess I did. The Swensons are coming and the Morrisons. Oh, and the Morrisons' son, Gordon. I, I think his name is. Remember him? I, I don't know if I do. Well, he got married about ten years ago and moved out of town. But now he's getting a divorce. I thought maybe... Oh, look, I have put the ham in the oven. I thought I'd better when you didn't show up. How big is it? Uh, Twelve pounds. So eighteen minutes per pound. Is... At three fifty. No, no, you start at one fifty internal temperature. Well, you go take a look at it. Well, in a minute, I, I want to tell you and about. Dory, you'll have to make the sauce. I have no conception. It is just prepared mustard and currant jelly. Well, you take care of it, Mother. I met somebody. On the way home. A man? You met a man? No. A, a woman. Oh. Uh, listen. About this Gordon Morrison. I understand his marriage wasn't too happy. Now, there weren't any children, so there won't be any trouble about the divorce. I believe he's a certified public accountant. Mother, I want to tell you he's about... He's moving something. back here to live. A good CPA never has any trouble getting established, so I'm told. Mother... He's just your age, Dory. Give a year or two. I wish you would listen Dory, to... Dory, what I am getting at is this is a chance for you. Oh, Mother. You're almost 36. I wish you would... Now, at dinner, please, don't sit there like a lump. Please don't. Say things. Join in. Be a part of the conversation. Be animated. The dinner will be good. We know that. And I'll make sure they know you cooked it. You'll make spoon bread, won't you? Yes, sir. But you have to do more than that. You have to act like you're having a good time, like you're enjoying yourself. Do you understand? Yes. Maybe if you... if you took a drink. That often helps. I, I know it helps me. It helps most people. Now, do you think you could do that? I could do that. A cocktail, maybe. I think... Uh... I think maybe a glass of white wine. Maybe two. I sat there like a lump. Once in a while, I'd think of something to say about something, but by the time I got around to saying it, they were talking about something else, you know. I think I do. Of course, they raved about the food. I really am a good cook. I'll bet you are. But I was all shut up in a cocoon, sort of. I couldn't get out. Uh-huh. And I could feel my mother getting madder and madder and more disgusted with me. But I couldn't do anything about it. I didn't blame her. No? No, because to her, everything comes so easy, always has. She laughs a lot, smiles, she can talk about anything practically. The words just roll out of her mouth. She doesn't have to try to make an effort. It all just kind of comes naturally to her, and she can't see why it doesn't come naturally to me. You're shy. I... I guess you could call it being shy. I don't know. I just get sort of paralyzed when I have to talk to people. I want to go away or... die or something. You're talking to me. Oh, yes, but... But what? You know all about my double. Oh. Do you know what I did the very next day? I went out and I had my hair cut short. Oh? And then I had a permanent. You like it, don't you? Sure. It's nice. Now I look exactly like her. I'm, uh, I'm going to bring you a comb. You can run it through those pretty blonde curls. Why? Do I look awful? No, you don't look awful at all. But you could stand a little sprucing up. Okay. You'll be going upstairs in a little while. You'll want to look your very best for that. It's important. 
How would you feel if suddenly you came face to face with someone who looked exactly like yourself? How would you react? Would you advance happily thinking, why, what an attractive person? Or would you back off a bit thinking, what a loathsome creature? Not knowing what my own immediate response would be, I am content that my double should go his way while I go mine, and that we should be destined never to meet. I'll be back with Act Two. I said before that in case I do have a double, that there actually is another E.G. Marshall roaming the earth, I hoped that we would never meet. But fate has a way of ignoring our hopes, and that has set me to wondering, if we did meet, we two, would we get along? Would I like him? Would he like me? Or would we dislike each other intensely and even become enemies? I think I'll return to my first position. Let him go his way. I'll go mine. You really like my hair this way? I really do. It's exactly like hers. You just need to run a comb through it. Well, you said you'd bring me one. I will. How about the blue jeans? You don't think I look silly in them? No, not a bit. My mother thought they were okay. She liked them. She liked my haircut, too. That's nice. No, not really. Why not? She had the wrong idea entirely. She didn't understand. You see, I couldn't tell her about meeting my double. You couldn't? Oh, no. It was such a remarkable thing. I I wasn't sure she'd believe me. Maybe she would have. Oh, no, no, no. She hardly ever believed me about anything. And she'd never believed I'd met my double. And if I told her, she might try to do something about it. Like what, for instance? Well, forbid me to see her, for one thing. But you're 36 years old. Oh, that wouldn't have made any difference to my mother. No, she would have found a way. Like what? Oh, I don't know. It it was very important to me to be able to see my double. I saw her every day. You did? In the same bar and grill, sitting on those same two stools, drinking white wine. Oh... It was lovely, you know? Uh Uh-huh. The only thing was, it made me late getting home. And my mother didn't like that. Not one bit. Dory? It's me. Do you realize it's five o'clock? It is? Yes, it is. I suppose the bank detained you. I was detained. But not by the bank. No, not by the bank. Well, who then? Who detained you? Dory, are you seeing somebody behind my back? Uh, what'd you get for dinner? A chopped meat. Is it enough for a meatloaf? Dory, are you seeing a man? I need two pounds for a meatloaf. Who is he? Somebody at the bank? No. Well, where did you meet him? You never go any place. You didn't pick him up on the street, did you? No. Girls do that all the time these days. I am not... A girl. You just better bet you're not. Listen, Dory, if he's a nice man, you know how much I want you to meet a nice man. I know. Nothing could make me happier. And with your new haircut and those jeans and that top, well, there's no reason why you shouldn't meet some nice man. And where are you going? I'm going to make the meatloaf. I want to know who this man is. I want to know where you met him. And I want to know where you see him every afternoon. Why don't you see him in the evening? Is he married? Is that why? Are you seeing a married man on the sly? No. Then why don't you bring him home here so I can meet him? What is he, some kind of crook? No. Then what's wrong with him that your own mother can't meet him? Mother, I am not going to discuss this with you anymore. I'm going to make the meatloaf. couldn't explain to her. She'd have wanted to meet my double. And that would have spoiled everything. Why? Well, because when you have a double, it's a... a very strange thing. 
It's not something you share with anybody. It's very personal and private, and it's not something you talk about. Not even to your own mother, especially to your own mother. It's your secret. Your very own secret. Your most precious secret. I... I don't know how to explain it to you if you don't know. That's all right. But you see, she kept after me and after me every day when I came home from the bar and grill. It got worse. She said she'd have me followed. She'd hire a detective and have me followed. She said she'd report me to the bank manager. She said she'd throw me out of the house. She said everything. And every day it got worse and worse till I could hardly stand it. If it hadn't been for my double and seeing her every day, I think I'd have gone crazy. But you see, I could talk to her about it and she would be very sympathetic and we'd drink our white wine and I'd feel better and I'd go home. But it was always the same thing as soon as I got there. Oh, get in here. What's the matter? I watched you coming down the street. What for? You're a whole different person, you know that? I know. You don't walk all slumped over the way you used to. You hold your head up. You're 36 years old and all of a sudden you walk like a human being. Now, what I want to know is what is the cause of all this? Or should I say, who's the cause of it all? I know you get out of the bank 3.30 at the latest. You've been getting home later and later, 5, 5.30. Now, Dory, I know perfectly well you are not walking around by yourself or sitting in the library. Because I smell liquor on your breath. You spend your time drinking with somebody. Just a little white wine. I never get drunk. You've never seen me come home drunk. Two little glasses of white wine and that's all. I never said you got drunk. I said you spend an hour, an hour and a half drinking with somebody. Now, I'm sick and tired of asking you who it is you're meeting on the slide. I'm your mother and I have a right to know. Now, you look me straight in the eye and tell me who it is. Dory? Who is it? Just somebody. I know it's somebody. I want to know what somebody. It's nobody we know because I've asked all you over town. You asked people? Well, how else am I going to find out? Not that I found out anything. A couple of people said they saw you go into the bar and grill on Lake Street a few times, but they never saw you with anybody. You asked people about me? Well... Who do you meet in that bar and grill? Dory, are you going to tell me? I'll have to shake it out of you. Tell her don't let me go. I'll let you go and you tell me. Now, who is it? My double. It's my double. You, you what? Everybody has a double. Most people don't meet theirs, but I did. She was sitting at the bar. What? What did you just say? She was sitting at the bar. You've been meeting a woman? We look exactly alike. You mean to stand there and tell me you've been getting drunk every day with a woman? Not drunk. A man, a maybe. A glass of wine. Oh, but this is crazy. It is not. It's weird. No, she's my double. She's like a twin, only it's better. She's wicked. That's what she is. She is not. Don't say that. And so are you. Don't say that or I'll kill you. To think that my daughter... I swear I'll... My very... Shut up, daughter! I will kill you! I was shaking all over. I was so angry. Sure you were. To think my own mother, my very own mother, would say such things about me. That she would even think them. It was horrible. Of course. And talking about her that way, was she, she'd never even met her, never even seen her. Uh-huh. She knew that I, I'd never... She knew me. She knew I would never, never... Uh, she should have known anyway. I understand. I... I got away from her and I ran out of the house. I couldn't possibly have stayed there. I just couldn't because... When I said I'd kill her, I meant it. I really did. I didn't know how I'd do it. But I knew I'd do it if I stayed there. So I ran out of the house. She was still standing in the doorway, screaming at me, saying awful things. I just ran, ran down the street. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't have any idea where to go. I just ran. 
And all of a sudden, I was on Lake Street in front of the bar and grill. And there she was. Your double? Yes. I could see her through the window. She was sitting at the bar just the way I'd left her, oh, maybe an hour before. And there she was with a glass of wine in front of her. And oh, I was so relieved to see her. The only person in the entire world I could talk to. So I opened the door and I went in. Oh, oh, you're still here. What's the matter? Oh, I'm so glad. Oh, sit down. You're, you're all out of breath. Yes, I've been running all over town. Oh, sit down. You want some wine? I don't think so. Oh, here, drink the rest of mine. I thought you'd probably left by now. I left when you did, but I came back. You must have known I'd need you. Oh, listen. I had the most awful row with my mother. What about? You know she's been trying to find out who I've been seeing after banking hours. Yes, I know. And she's kept after me and after me. She thought I'd picked up with some man, some disreputable man that I was ashamed to bring home so she could meet him. And, and she said she'd hire a detective. You told me. And this time she said she'd been asking all over town different people if they'd seen me with anybody. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's like opening my mail, reading my private letters. I simply could not believe she'd do a thing like that. And then she grabbed hold of me by the arms. And she started to shake me hard. And she hurt me and she wouldn't let me go. She said she'd shake the truth out of me. Yes? I had to make her stop. So I told her. I said it was you. Yes? Oh, not your name, because I don't know your name. But I said I was meeting my double, that everybody has a double. And I was so lucky that I had met mine. Yes? And then she really started to scream at me. She said I was wicked. And you were wicked. And crazy and weird. And when she said that, it was like the top of my head just blew off. And I yelled back at her. I told her. I told her to shut up or I'd kill her. Yes, I said that. And oh, I meant it. It's all right, really. And I would have if I hadn't gotten out of there. Really, it, it's, it's all right. And if I go back there... I will. There's no need to do that. I've already killed her myself. She was so calm when she said it. I've already killed her myself. She said it like it was nothing. Uh Uh-huh. And the peculiar thing was... It made me feel like it was nothing, too. Really? Yes, It seemed perfectly natural, perfectly logical. Like she'd done the only sensible thing. Then what? Well, we sat there and drank a little more wine and talked some very quietly. And then I came here. You did the right thing. I hope so. Absolutely. Say, I told you I'd bring you a comb and I haven't done it. Why don't I go fetch one now? Oh, don't leave me. I'll be right back. I don't want to be alone. This is the first time I've told anybody, and I don't want to be alone. It won't take a minute. Please. Then you can fix yourself up a little. Before I take you upstairs. A most efficient double, wouldn't you say? One capable of strong, direct, even violent action. And at the same time, able to bring peace of mind and serenity and the conviction that everything has been for the best. Now, if I could be sure of having a double like that... Oh, but no. So far, I don't think I want to take the chance. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. I said before that I still do not wish to meet my double... But now, it occurs to me, were I to meet him, would I recognize him? Offhand, you'd say, of course. How could you fail to recognize a replica of yourself? But consider this. 
Do I really know what I look like? I think I do. It's a very familiar face. But have I ever really seen it? Is it possible ever to see it? I'm not sure that it is. Thank you for the comb. Don't mention it. See that you use it. Oh, I will. Right now. We'll be going upstairs in about 20 minutes. So fix yourself up, you hear? What's upstairs? You'll see. I wonder what's upstairs. I wonder... Hello, Dory. Oh. Oh, it's you. How are you? I was just going to comb my hair. It needs it. Nobody told me you were here. Nobody knows. Are you glad to see me? I think so. You're not sure? What about my mother? What about her? How did you do it? I think I hit her with a chair. Don't you know? You know that little chair that stands in the front hall just to the left of the door? Yes. I picked that up and I held it up high and then I brought it down hard on the top of her head. Yes, that's what I did. I could never have done that. And then I choked her, just to make sure. You did? Really? Then when I was quite sure she was dead, I went back to the barn grill. You didn't even seem upset or anything. Well, why should I have been? It was the only thing to do. I suppose There so. was no other way, huh? No, just the same, to kill a person. People get killed all the time. People kill people all the time. Not people I know. Just the same it happens. Well, I guess so. I know I read about it in the papers, but... So why shouldn't it happen to you? To my mother, you mean. I didn't do it. No, of course you didn't. I did. That's right. Do you think I'm a terrible person because I did it? Well, when I... we were sitting in the bar and grill on Lake Street... You didn't seem to think I was so terrible. No. So why I... do you think I'm so terrible now? I don't know if I That's do. That's the way you're acting. You're being very critical. But she was my mother. Exactly. Sometimes... Sometimes I don't understand you at all. No? I thought we would double. We are. Then why don't I understand what you're saying? I don't know. It's really very exasperating. You're not mad at me. Not yet. I mean, you won't leave me. Not yet. Not ever. Don't leave me ever. Dory. What? What is it? I brought you some hot water. Now wash your hands and face. Haven't you combed your hair yet? Oh, I, I was just going to. Look, I'm putting this bowl of hot water down here. Now there's a washcloth and a piece of soap. Use them. I will. Oh, before I forget. What are you doing? Taking down the mirror. What are you doing that for? Orders from upstairs. You're always talking about upstairs. What is upstairs? You'll find out soon enough. Are you mad at me? Do I sound mad? Kind of. Well, I'm not. Now you wash your face and hands before that water gets cooled off. I'm going to check and see when they'll be ready for you. Who? The people upstairs. Who are they? Look, they're very nice, really. You don't have to be afraid of them. They mean well. They've got your best interests at heart. Believe me. Why would they want to take my mirror away? Just a precaution. They were afraid of what you might do. Do? I wouldn't do anything. No, of course you wouldn't. Then why... Better safe than sorry, and that's how they figure. Now listen, I'm going to go upstairs and check on how soon they'll be ready to see you. Meantime, you wash up, okay? Okay. I'll be back in a few minutes. What is she talking about? They're going to do anything? Where's the soap? Oh, here. Hello. Oh. I thought you'd gone away. Not at all. Look, if I said anything to make you angry... You were very snippy. I was? About my killing your mother. 
Well, after all... You're getting very holier than thou all of a sudden. I don't mean to. Sitting in the bar and grill, you seem very pleased at what I'd done. Yes. After all, I did it for you. She was your mother, not mine. I didn't know her from a hole in the wall. She meant absolutely nothing to me. She did to me. Oh, the way you talked, I'd never have guessed. That was just talk. You wanted to kill her, you told me so. That was talk. Don't you understand? That was talk. serious talk. I would have never done it. Never. I wouldn't have. Of course you wouldn't have. That's why I did it for you. I'm going to tell them you did it. You are? You don't mind? What can they do to me? They will catch you. I'll tell them what you look like, and they'll go after you, and they'll catch you. What will you tell them I look like? Well, she... What do I look like? Come on. Take a close look. Now, tell me. What do I look like? You look... You look... Just like me. Of course. We're doubles. Okay, now, you ready? Because they're ready for you. What? You haven't even washed your face. No, I... The water's not even warm. Why did I go to all the trouble to bring you hot water? You're not going to throw it out? What good is it now? You haven't combed your hair either. What have you been doing while I was out of the room? My double was here. I was talking to her. Oh. Oh, I see. Your double. Well, how did things go with your double? Not very well. Oh? In what way? We, uh... We had a kind of a quarrel. I see. We're not getting along. Look... It's time we were getting upstairs. So come on. You'll have to go as you are because they do not like to be kept waiting. You said the people upstairs, you said they were nice? They are. Basically, very nice. Now, come on. Turn right here. That's it. What will they do to me? They won't do anything. They'll just talk to you. And the stairs are straight ahead. We have to walk up. And of course, they'll want you to talk to them. Come on, up we go. What will I talk to them about? Oh, almost anything. Anything you've got on your mind. Should I talk to them about my mother? If you feel like it. Should I tell them she's dead? If that's what you feel like telling them. I think I'll tell them that. Okay. And something else I'll tell them. What's that? I'll tell them who did it. It's one more flight up. Okay. You're going to tell them about... about your double? Yes. Definitely. I'm going to tell them she killed my mother. All right. You think it's okay to tell them that? I think it's exactly what you should tell them. Of course, if I tell them, I may not ever see her again. Oh? Why not? Well, when you were out of the room and I was talking to her, I got the feeling she didn't want me to tell anybody. Of course, I'd already told you, but you wouldn't tell, would you? Certainly not. She said she did it for me. Uh Uh-huh. And I understand that. But I didn't ask her to. Did I? Look, here we are. This is the room. They're waiting for us. I'm scared. I I don't want to go in. Now, there's nothing to be afraid of. But I don't know these people. They're very nice. Really. You'll like them. No, I won't, and they won't like me. Yes, they will. They think I killed my mother, and they'll ask me all about it, and it'll be awful. No, I don't want to do it. Dory, stop it. Now, you just stop it. I know. I won't do it. (laughs) You hit me. You hit me. I want you to listen to what I have to say. Listen to me carefully. Do you understand? Yes. 
You are going into that room with me, and you are going to tell those people in there exactly what you told me. Start to finish. Got that? I can't. Those people in there are doctors, Dory. They want to help you. They're not policemen? Whatever gave you the idea they were policemen? I just thought... Well, you thought wrong. And there's something else I'm going to tell you. Something I'm not supposed to tell you because I'm just a nurse here. But I'm going to tell you anyway. There are three doctors in that room. Two are men and one's a woman. And there is some possibility that there'll be another woman in there with them. Your mother. My mother's dead. Your mother is not dead. My double. She killed her. She hit her over the head with a chair and then she choked her. She did it for me. My mother's dead. Your mother is very much alive and there isn't a mark on her. Now, are you ready to go in there? Okay. Wait a second. Look at your shadow. All hunched over. Aren't you ashamed? That's it. No, you're standing tall. And your shadow is, too. All right, Dory. Go on in. Nobody is going to hurt you. you know, Dory's double lived in her shadow. Then, in her image, reflected from the big mirror behind the bar. Later, a reproduction of herself in the small hospital mirror where she combed her hair. And finally, her own face seen in a bowl of water. So she got a glimpse of a second self. Strong and competent and possessing the capacity for rage, even murder. I'll be back shortly. Yes, theoretically, an earthquake of a certain intensity at the right place could carry the state of California into the sea. Read Goodbye, California by Alistair MacLean, the story of a fanatical terrorist whose ability to detonate an atomic bomb gives him the ultimate blackmail weapon, earthquake. An earthquake so monstrous it could mean goodbye, California. The authorities are helpless, but one man alone, a super cop driven by a personal motive, races to meet the terrorist head on. A race that must be won, or else it's goodbye, California. Read Goodbye, California by Alistair McLean. A story of daring, danger, and the threat of a doomsday that could happen tomorrow. If you enjoy suspense, get set for a thrilling experience because you are going to live that experience in Goodbye, California by Alistair McLean. Now in paperback from Fawcett. I do believe that I have a double and that he and I have a rendezvous somewhere, sometime. And he will have qualities I never suspected in myself. Some pleasant, perhaps. Perhaps others very, very unpleasant indeed. I wonder, am I ready for this encounter? Not today, no. Maybe tomorrow or the next day or the day after that or, well... Someday. Our cast included Terry Keene, Grace Matthews, and Joan Shea. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I keep telling myself it's a lover's quarrel. They'll make up and everything will be all right. Yeah, well, that's not what Susan says. It's off, over, finished. I asked did he give any reason, and she just shook her head and went up to her room to cry. Listen, I'm not hanging around this town any longer. Everything about it gives me the creeps. My sister gets kicked in the teeth and my pop says, well, well. Well, I don't see it that way. She can't protect herself. But I am not letting that guy get away with it. Hi. Hi, it's Mayor Greeley. 
I'm coming, I'm coming. What? Harry. What are you doing here at 5.30 in the morning all dolled up in your police chief's outfit? You'd better get yourself dressed, Horace. And hurry. Well, would you mind telling me why? There's been a murder. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. the most beloved of all books is Mother Goose. I dare say everyone in the world knows Ring Around a Rosy, Mistress Mary Quite Contrary, Ba Ba Black Sheep. Many of those nursery rhymes were based on actual fact. Ring Around a Rosy depicted death from the plague in the 14th century. Mistress Mary was commonly thought to be Mary Queen of Scots, and Ba Ba Black Sheep was a protest of the common people against confiscation of property by the royalty. But I wonder what promoted Hickory Dickory Duck. The mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one, and down he runs. Hickory Dickory Duck. Charlie, look. The door to the clock. It's opening. All by itself. At this point, I'd believe anything. That cold air again, too. Look. Something sort of floated out of the clock. I thought to. What was it? I don't know. I'm not sure I want to know. more popular American pastimes is attending garage and tag sales. There seems to be something about buying someone else's junk that fascinates most of us. But of course, not all garage sales offer junk. Some of them have some very usable merchandise. And occasionally, you might pick up a real antique. The garage sale we're about to visit now with Charlotte and Charlie Tucker contains the belongings of a recently departed minister, a bachelor, who left his earthly possessions to his nephew, a Richard Lum. Let's join them on the lawn of the Lum's home in southern Pennsylvania. There's some real nice things here, Charlotte. I'm amazed at the prizes. Everything's underpriced. <laughs> they probably want to get rid of it fast. See anything you like? Oh, it's all beautiful. I'd like to find a pretty lamp if there are any. Mother hates that one I have in the guest room. Oh, that's right. Yeah, she gets in day after tomorrow. And remember your promise, Charlie. No golf or cards for the two weeks Mother's here. You know she adores you. I think she makes her visits more to see you than me. Hey, I hope she brings her tarot cards. And that's another thing. No teasing her about her interest in the occult. The last time she read the cards for you, everything she said came true. You landed that job at the Cromwell Agency and made art director six months later. Yeah, but that might have been because... Can I help you with anything? I'm Mr. Lum. Oh, uh, well, I, I would be interested in a lamp. Lamps are up on the porch. My uncle had some lovely ones. Your uncle was the minister? Yeah, I was his only living relative and he left all this to me. I, I really can't keep it. We have no room for it all. Uh, then this isn't his home? No, no. I live here. My wife and I carted the things from the parsonage in Milford. I'll leave you to browse. I hope you like one of the lamps. Mm. Hey, you want to head for the porch? Well, let's just stroll and look around. We'll get to the lamps. Hey, check that grandfather clock. That's an oldie. What a beauty. Huh. It doesn't know what time it is. It just struck one and it's ten minutes to eleven. Looks so old. I bet it costs a fortune. Hey, you just wanted a lamp, remember? Oh, but I didn't mean we'd buy it. But it is awfully good looking. It's in great condition, too. Charlie, wouldn't it look perfect in the south corner of the dining room? It almost matches that antique hutch Mother gave us when she moved to Florida. Yeah, yeah, it would. But ask the price first before you start redecorating. Well, it'll probably be more than we can afford. 
got to be at least a hundred years old. Older than that. I saw you admiring the clock. How much? I priced it at two hundred. Uh, not much call for grandfather clocks today in the newer homes. Rooms are smaller, more modern, and this one doesn't chime. But it just did. You say this clock struck? Yes. Yes, just as we passed it. Well, that is extraordinary. Two hundred dollars, you said. We'll take it. Sold. Now, do you still want to see the lamps? Oh, uh, but yes, I still need one for the guest room. I'll help you to the car with the clock. Thanks. And I'll go and check out the lamps. They're on the porch, remember? I'll be back in a moment to help you move the clock. And a very beautiful one, too. Funny what he said about it never chiming, though. Isn't it? Careful now. Watch the chair. See it. Oh, the clock weighs a ton. Uh. I never found one this heavy. Okay, your end down first. Here we go. Oh, oh, oh there we are. Oh. Now, come around here and just steady her as we stand her up. Oh, it looks so much bigger inside here than it did on the lawn. Well, it's a matter of perspective. Uh, there we are. Hmm. Oh, it is imposing, isn't it? <laughs> it looks better there than I thought it would. Well, let's polish it up first. Then see if you can get it going. Okay. Here, you rub it down with the linseed oil, and I'll do the glass on the door. Hey, this wood is fantastic. I can't tell what it is, but... Maple, maybe? Or, or even oak? I think we found a steel today. Hey, you know, Charlotte, the grain in this wood has a sort of design to it. Hmm? Look, like foreign characters or something. Yes. Oh, I see what you mean. This looks like... A row of A's. Yeah, and see here. Look, here's a ram's head. But they're not carved. The wood's as smooth as glass. Yeah, well, it couldn't be paint. No. Could it be that the wood just... just grew that way? That's possible, I guess. But these figures are so... clear. It doesn't seem like an accident of nature. <gasps> look, they're more on the other side. You don't really notice them until you look for them. This oil really brings out the color and the grain of the wood. I want to clean the inside of the door. Have you got the key? Oh, yeah. Uh, here in my pocket. Here. See, maybe these are some sort of uh, religious symbols, huh? They belong to a minister. But they don't look like... Charlie. Yeah? Put your hand inside here. Inside the clock? Go ahead. Feel it? Yeah. Yeah, the air is sort of cool and... And damp. I didn't feel that when we took the pendulum out to bring it home. But then the clock was out in the hot sun. Why would the air inside the clock be cooler than room temperature? It beats me. Oh, oh, Mike's awake. I'll have to heat up the bottle, darling. Yeah, you go ahead. I'll finish. I, I want to fool around with the works and see if I can get it going and figure out what goes with the chime. Hmm. <laughs> Speak of the devil. There it goes again. Second time this morning. You spent half of yesterday working on it. It's obvious there's something wrong with it that you can't fix. Oh, better hurry and finish your lunch. Mother's plane gets in in two hours. You sure you won't change your mind about coming along? No, and Mother won't mind. Mike's been so fussy and restless these past two days. I think he's coming down with something. <laughs> Probably another tooth. And Tinker hasn't been around all morning. It's not like her to stay away so long. I'm going to go and look for her. Hey, cats do as they please, and you know it. But yesterday she wouldn't come in at all. She'd start up the porch steps, and then she'd arch her back and spit. She refused to come into the house. Well, she'll be all right. Cats know how to take care of themselves. And I'd better get going. Traffic to the airport might be heavy. And wait till you see how your grandson's grown. He grows some every day, it seems. He'll be walking soon. He's ten months old tomorrow. <laughs> You'll be seeing him in about 30 seconds. We're home. Oh, there's Charlotte. Oh, she looks a little thinner, don't you think? Yeah, well, she's taken up jogging. Uh, hi. Hello, darling. Oh, Mother. Oh, how good to see you again. Mm. Oh, you look wonderful. And feel it, too. Oh, I'm so sorry about not coming to the airport. Oh, that's all right, dear. What's the difference? Now, put your bags in your room, Mother. Thanks, Charlie. How was the flight? Oh, rough and bumpy. I skipped the food and stuck with my old fashioned. We're cooking out tonight. You'll get one of Charlie's steak specials. Oh, that'll be nice. 
Charlie tells me you've taken up job. What's the matter? Mother, what is it? I feel... Charlie! Mother, are you sick? Here, sit down. No, 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 I... I'm not sick. I never felt it in this house before. What do you want? Felt what? Uh, a force. A very, very faint. What's the matter? What kind of force? When I stepped inside the house, it... Crushed me ever so lightly. Oh, I could even be mistaken. Hey, what is this? Do you feel it now? No, 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 not at all now. Come on upstairs and lie down. You said you had not eaten. Maybe that's it. No, I don't need to lie down, dear. I... Oh, I shouldn't have alarmed you. It, it was nothing. Oh, I want to see my grandson. Are you sure you're all right, Mother? Of course. Now, where is that Mike? Well, he's still sleeping. But it's almost time for his dinner. All right. I'll go upstairs, unpack and freshen up. Well, you can look in on him. He might even be awake. I'll just tiptoe in and see. I'll be down in a little while. Hey, what was she so upset about? I, I still don't understand. Neither do I. She said she felt a, a, a force, but then she tried to brush it off as, as though it wasn't anything at all. Yeah, I heard. It kind of bothers me, though. Mother is sensitive to those things, but what kind of force could be in our house. <laughs> you think that's what... You think that's what's spooking Tinker? You said she's gone again. Uh, I don't know. I, I certainly don't feel anything. No, neither do I. And you know how I feel about psychic phenomena. Huh? <laughs> Look, if Mom doesn't bring it up again, let's forget it. I hope I can. Are you going to work a while? I'm going to bed. Just a minute or two. I want to look at this new hosiery layout and then sleep on it. Mother and Mike are both dead to the world. Those flights always tire her. Hmm. Charlie, did Mother say anything more to you about her feelings? I mean, about the force, as she calls it, and the clock. No, not really. Uh, just that she thought the marks on the clock were ancient symbols or something. Yes. Remember how she dismissed it while we were having dinner? I couldn't pin her down to a direct answer. <laughs> so she doesn't want to make you nervous. Well, it only makes me more nervous. It's something I didn't mention. When I told her we thought the cool air inside the clock came from the type of wood, she said that could be one explanation. Oh, she has another? She wouldn't say. Charlotte, hey, you didn't mess around with my drawing board, did you? What? I never go near it when you're working on a layout. Well, the sketch I did yesterday is all smudged. Look. Well, darling, I have no idea how it that... It didn't could... blow to the floor, maybe. Uh, you picked it up? No, or... absolutely not. I've told you. Well, how could something no one touched smudge up like that? I mean, these inks don't blur. Charlie, I give you my word. I, I know, Charlotte. I'm not accusing. I'm, I'm just mystified. I'll have to do the whole thing over again in the morning. Well, come into bed then. Yeah, yeah, I'll be right in. Gee, that's strange. It just couldn't happen like that. Charlie. Charlie, wake up. Charlie. What? What? What's the matter? It's the clock. Listen. It hasn't stopped. Usually it's only one or two strokes. Supernatural. You're going down there? Of course. Well, I'm coming with you. I heard you two in the hall. What's the matter with the clock? Well, that's what I'm going to find out. I'll stop that chiming if I have to break the whole damn mechanism. I'd be very careful, Charlie. Now, you take my advice and don't touch it. I'm going to do something to stop the chimes. It's, it's gone haywire. Do as Mother says, Charlie, please. Don't touch it. But it looks like I don't have to. It stopped. Hey, wait. Do you feel that? Yes. A little gust of cool air? Yeah. Damp. I'm going into the dining room. Uh-oh. That's where it's coming from. The front of the clock's open. Look. <gasps> the whole room's cold. 
something opened that door to the clock. Something? Well, it couldn't have been someone, could it? Charlotte, put on some coffee. It's time we faced facts. <laughs> time, I'd say, wouldn't you? Whether Charlotte and Charlie want to admit it or not, there's something strange going on in their home. Charlotte's mother realizes it, and realized it the moment she set foot in the house. So while the coffee's brewing in the Tucker household at 2.15 a.m., we'll take a short break ourselves. always seem more sinister in the middle of the night, don't they? At two o'clock in the morning, our little fears are magnified many times. And at 2.15 this morning, in the brightly lighted kitchen of Charlotte and Charlie Tucker, the sinister happening of the past few moments hangs heavily over the three figures huddled over their coffee. There is something strange in this house, Charlotte. Something psychic. Oh, really? Now, wait. Well... I know you both take my interest in parapsychology lightly. Oh, you have every right. I'm not going to make light of it, Mother. Not after this. You never did tell me your explanation for the cool air in the clock. Well, I don't know what causes that. Mm. But something psychic is developing in this house. Developing? I felt it the moment I came in yesterday afternoon. I tried not to make too much of it. I avoided your questions. But I'm too concerned now. I really am. But why? why? Why would our house all of a sudden be <laughs> possessed, if that's what you mean? And what's the clock got to do with it? Well, I think whatever it is in this house started when you brought that clock home. For what reason? Well, again, I have to say, Charlie, I, I don't know. But have you noticed anything else strange in the house? Other than the peculiar behavior of that clock? Well, the baby's been awfully restless lately. I, I mean, more than usual. And Tinker, she wouldn't come in the house yesterday. She's run off and... Uh-huh. Charlie, your layout. Well, now you've got me wondering. What was that about a layout? Oh, it's a hosiery ad I've been working on. It's been smudged and nobody in the house could have done it. Except perhaps a spirit. Oh, Mother. <gasps> well, now that seems even more unlikely. How could a spirit smudge a physical drawing? Poltergeist can actually hurl furniture around. Oh, we've got poltergeists? Charlie, Charlotte, I'm very serious. I think you should call in a psychic investigator, a ghost breaker. You are serious. Very much. Now, there's a particularly good one I know of. Oh, I don't know him personally, but he has an international reputation. Now, he might be interested in this. I thought these guys just prowl around old English mansions. Oh, far from it, Charlie. They're willing to make a preliminary examination almost anywhere. And they can usually tell right away if there's a hoax involved or if it's just coincidental events. I personally think there is nothing coincidental here. Well, how would we get in touch with this uh, investigator? His name is Paul Carlton. Yes, the American Society for Psychical Research could get in touch with him. Oh, they'd be sure to be interested, too. Charlie, do you think we should go that far? It scares me. The sooner this thing is brought out in the open, the better. Well, I'm with you, Mother Lee. I'm all for this poor Carlton having a look. If he's willing to come. Would you like me to get in touch with him? Yes. All right. I'll call the society for you first thing in the morning. Hello? Mrs. Lee? Yes? Paul Carlton. The society gave me your message. Oh, yes, Mr. Carlton. Thank you for calling. Not at all. I'm very interested in all you told them. When may I examine the house and the clock? Oh, just a minute, please. Charlotte, he wants to see the house. When can I tell him? Well, the sooner the better. Tomorrow, if you want. Uh, Mr. Carlton. Yes? Any time is fine with us. Well, I have a speaking engagement in Philadelphia tomorrow night. I could be there a day after tomorrow. Say, ten in the morning? Yes, any time. And Mrs. Lee... Today and tomorrow, be very alert to anything else that occurs in the house. The more details, the better. I understand. 
I'll see you Thursday morning. Here he is. There's a cab pulling up out front. Oh, I'm so nervous. Oh, you and me both. He's just going to look around, isn't he? I mean, he's, he's not going to conjure up a lot of evil spirits oh, or anything. Of course not, Charlie, but I'm anxious to see if he confirms my feelings. Well, uh, look, we might as well go out and welcome him. Uh, we know he's here. Mr. Colton. Uh, hello. Uh, Mr. Tucker? Yes, uh, welcome. We appreciate your coming. Oh, thank you. But I'm the one who's appreciative. Come in. Uh, th th this is my wife, Charlotte. How do you do? My pleasure, madam. And my mother-in-law, Mrs. Lee. Ah, yes, we spoke. Oh, it's an honor to meet you, Mr. Carlton. I've read both your books. Well, thank you. You're interested in parapsychology, then? Well, I, I dabble. Now then, let's get to work. Uh, may I see this celebrated clock? Right there in the dining room. Follow me. Ah, yes. A beauty, isn't it? Certainly an antique. Charlotte, he didn't feel anything strange, like I did. He might have, and not mentioned it. Uh, Mrs. Lee, uh, you were right about these characters in the wood. Oh, they are symbols, then. Oh, I was pretty sure. Uh, would you open the door, please? I want to examine inside. Sure. We've kept it locked ever since that experience the night before last. Well, I want to get into that in more detail later. There you are. Hmm. Yeah, it's definitely cooler. I'll just shine my pocket flash in here. Doesn't seem to be any reason for it. Good heavens. What is it? Your voice, it's uh, echoing like a canyon. What do you mean? Well, when your head was inside the clock, your voice echoed. Uh, show me. You speak in there. All right. Hickory dickory dock. The mouse ran up the clock. That is extraordinary. I didn't hear my own voice like that. As though you and Charlie were talking into a long tunnel. Hmm. The inside is solid all around. Sound should be muffled. There is something psychic about it, isn't there, Mr. Carlton? Well, at this point, let's say there is need for more explanation. I'm going to take another look. Solid wood inside, all right. Ah, there's a name etched in here. Probably the maker. Might give us a good clue. Can you read it? Yes, it's faint. S-A-R-G-A-T-A-N-A-S. Saga something? Well, it's either a wry joke or... What is it? Saga Tennis, Mrs. Lee. In witchcraft. Oh, yes. One of the devil's lieutenants. Brigadier, to be exact. Yes. Saga Tennis, whose specialty is opening locks. Devil. Brigadier. Oh, really? You do have a curiosity here, Mrs. Tucker. There's much justification for further investigation. I thought so. Uh, with your permission, I want to return with a medium I work with frequently. She's gifted and brilliant. Enormous sensitivity. You mean, uh, you mean a seance? Oh, well, not exactly, but if the strange qualities of the clock are the result of spiritual forces, Margaret Egan will know it. Charlotte? Well, we've gone this far. We might as well. Now... Keep the door to the clock locked, as you have done. Uh, by the way, has the cat returned? No. Oh, that's a very definite sign. Animal behavior is almost always an indication of the unseen. I'd like to go over the entire house now, and then I'll be in touch with you after I talk with the medium. Margaret, it's Paul Carlton. Oh, hello, Paul. Uh, how are you? Fine. I have a job for you, a fascinating case. It's a home in Pennsylvania. Everything centers around an old clock with the name Sargatanus etched on the inside. Sargatanus? I thought that would impress you. The devil's locksmith. When can you work with me? Oh, any time. Oh, perhaps the sooner the better. Good. We'll drive down tomorrow. I'll fill you in on the details on the way. Is there 
anything special you'll need, Mrs. Egan? Uh, no, Mrs. Tucker, no, 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 just a, a comfortable chair. Uh, I might explain that hopefully through Margaret's trance, we'll be able to learn the nature of the spirit that inhabits the clock. Are you serious? Oh, very much so. Oh, there is a spiritual force at work in this house, Mrs. Tucker. I felt it the moment I entered. We believe it's the only explanation for the phenomena you've experienced. But you're not going to uh, make anything appear, are you? Oh, no, no, Mrs. Tucker. This is not a seance. Uh, No hand-holding or dim lights. In my trance, if I can contact my guide, we may be able to learn how to deal with whatever force is in here. Why don't we get started, Margaret? I am ready. Just let me relax a moment. Leona. Leona. We need your help, Leona. I am here. This is Leona. What can you tell us of Sagatanas? Why do you wish to know? We believe he's at work. Sargatanus is imprisoned. He has been imprisoned for 103 years. We have reason to think he's at work. Impossible. We have in our possession a clock with his name etched into the wood. Subret. Therefore, Dundee... What? Speak again, Leona. Board to prom. Oh, she's losing contact. Leona, Leona, can you hear me? Sorgatanus imprisoned. Charlie, look. The door to the clock. It's opening. All by itself. That cold air again, too. Look. Something floated out of the clock. I saw it too. What was it? I don't know. I don't want to know. She said she wouldn't make anything appear. Margaret. Margaret. Huh? Huh? What? Oh, did I make contact? Briefly. We lost her. Mr. Carlton, look at the clock. Yes. I saw it opening during the trance. Then you saw something float out while you were talking to Mrs. Egan. Something floated out of it? Yes. (gasps) An ectoplasmic manifestation. There was a manifestation of some sort. But all we got from Leona was gibberish. Except at the beginning, when she said Sargatanus was imprisoned. Oh, I've got more work to do. I don't have the strength for another trance now. But I want to consult my books and my charts. I've got to do more research on Sargatanus. And that does seem to be the key to this. Yes, I think so. But what was it that came out of the clock? Is it still here? Very likely. Look, I, I think we're going too far with all of this. Oh, it would not be wise to stop now. Are you going to get rid of these spirits for us? Well, we cannot promise that. What we are trying to do now is identify them. We don't care how they're identified. We want them out of our house. I know how you feel, Mrs. Tucker, but try not to be frightened or discouraged. So far, there seems to be no evil spirit involved. Playful, perhaps. And often they'll simply leave a dwelling of their own accord. But we do want to continue our investigation. All right. We'll go along with anything. Only please, the sooner you can clear this up, the better. Yes, well, we will be in touch in a few days after my research. Is there anything I can do to help? I'm so fascinated by all this. Uh, Thank you, Mrs. Lee, but at the moment, I don't think so. Just be alert to anything that may happen. You'll hear from us very shortly. Paul, it's Margaret. I think we have stumbled on the case of the century. Explain. Sargatanus is the key, all right. Now, can you get in touch with the people the Tuckers got that clock from? Well, I don't know. I I suppose so. Why? Well, if my calculations are correct... Yes? ...and the information I have so far points to it, that clock the Tuckers bought used to be known as 
the gate to hell. Well, I'm certainly glad she said used to be. Although, with all those strange goings-on at the Tucker household, I wonder if someone or something is trying to open the gate again. But why? Why now, all of a sudden? And why pick on the innocent Tuckers? I don't have the answers, but perhaps someone or something will when we return with Act Three. Dante's Inferno, the poet tells us the inscription above the entrance to hell is Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Well, that inscription is not on the antique clock purchased by Charlie and Charlotte Tucker. Only the strange name Sargatanus, supposed to be a disciple of the devil. But our medium friend, Margaret Egan, thinks the clock was an entrance to hell, which seems surprising. For if I were to imagine an entrance to hell, I'd picture it in some deep jungle, arctic waste, desolate mountain range, or perhaps even a New York City brownstone house. Hardly a clock. Oh, it's becoming more incessant, isn't it? Oh, it's really driving me crazy. I want Charlie to get rid of it. Just take it anywhere. Destroy it. I'd let Paul Carlton and Margaret Egan have another go at it first. They're coming tomorrow, aren't they? Yes, and I hope this... What's the matter? There he is again. Who? That man crossing the street. I saw him yesterday. At least I think it's a man. Well, so? Look at him. Hunchback. So oddly dressed as though he were trying to hide his entire body. Now, why should you think anything of it? I had the feeling he was watching our house. Oh, now, Charlotte, I know we're unnerved by what's been happening to you. But... I know. I'm imagining all sorts of things. Oh, I hope these people can solve something for us tomorrow. I can't go on like this. I know I suggested having them in. But maybe it's just intensified things. It's simple, really. If the clock is spooked, we get rid of the clock and the spooks along with it. I'm not sure it's as simple as that. Oh, you're sounding like them. I'm going to the village, dear. You want anything in particular? Oh, what about Wolf Bane and Frankincense? I wish I could laugh at that. <gasps> oh, dear. Here he comes. Who? What? Yes, he's coming up the walk. That oddly dressed man. I saw him yesterday. He has been watching the house. Well, I'll see what he wants. Well, don't let him in. I, I, I have a strange feeling, that's all. Yes? I must see the clock. What? Who are you? What do you want? I must see the clock. What do you know about our clock? I must see it, please. If you take that scarf off your face, maybe I can understand you better. Get rid of him, Charlie, please. I know about your clock, which chimes. I have heard the chime. I must see it. Are you an antique dealer? No. Well, what do you mean you've heard the chime? Charlie, don't. May I just see it? Then I'll leave. I'll leave. What do you know about it? Perhaps. A great deal. Well, maybe you could answer some questions for us. About the clock. Perhaps. Well, just a look, then. It's in the dining room. Come in. Charlotte, look, he just may be able to shed some light on this. How do you know about the clock? That's what I want to know. I have heard a chime. Ah, yes, there it is. At last. Charlie, what is he doing? Hey, now, look, wait a minute. Look, you can't open that door. It's locked. At last, after all these years. He opened it. Hey, what What the... Good heavens, he's stepping in. Oh, hey, get out of there. Him, what the devil do you think you're oh, doing? I'm going to summon the others. Ah! He, he disappeared. He just disappeared. Wait, it didn't happen. I can't believe it. Hey, it didn't happen. It's empty. The guy is gone. But... Uh, hey, look at here. I, I'm not staying in this house another minute. Charlotte, wait a minute. Charlie... We'd better call Paul Carlton at once. They can get a plane. We don't dare wait until tomorrow. Did you get a look at his face at all? No. No, he kept it wrapped up in a muffler type of a thing. Mm -hmm. And he vanished inside the clock. 
Yeah, like that. We'd better begin. Yes. I'll I'll try harder. Paul, be sure to press Leona for details. I'll try for a deeper trance. You still haven't told us who you think that creature was. I'm sick with fear now. We understand, Mrs. Tucker. Uh, believe me, this is the most unusual case Margaret and I have ever worked on. You have every right to be nervous. I think we'll have some of the answers in just a few minutes. But who or what was that creature that disappeared inside the clock? That wasn't possible. But we all saw it happen. Well, now, now let's see what develops in Margaret's trance. You know what the creature was and you won't tell us. We didn't see it, Mrs. Tucker. How can we know what it was? Please, let us get on with the work at hand. Yeah, I think we should, Charlotte. All right, all right. I- I'm sorry. Go into your trance and tell us how to put an end to this evil thing. Leona? Leona, are you there? Leona? I am here. There is much concern here. Much excitement. Leona. Saga Tannis. Saga Tannis has returned. His imprisonment is over. There is so much excitement here. Help us, Leona. Tell us. Saga Tannis is telling them. His way to the world was through the clock. His gate to hell. Go the tree, lemon. Uh, uh, Leona, Leona, please. One hundred and three years ago, the clock was bought by a minister. Sagatanus was ecclesiastically imprisoned. The clock with his name inside it. Yes, the clock is one of the gates to hell. She was right. Margaret was right. It chimes to reveal its whereabouts. For 103 years, the gate was closed. Ecclesiastically closed. Now the gate is free. The clock strikes to let Sargatanus know where it is. To let the demons know the way is again open. Now, Leona, I am in the presence of the clock. It is here, in the next room. It is the way. Sargatanus has come to summon the others. The others? For what? What others? The way is now open from hell to earth. The clock strikes to lead the demons to the exit. When? How soon? The way is open now. Soon. Tobit transit. Uh, Leona, when? When? Tobit. Gone. Oh, we're losing contact again. What in the world does she mean? Well, you heard. The clock is a gate to hell. Every chime is summoning an evil spirit. All right, look, I've had enough of this mumbo-jumbo. I know there's something wacky going on, but all this seance business isn't helping at all. Now, it's making things worse. Charlie, please. What, what, what happened? Oh, did we make contact? Yes, Leona confirms what you thought, Margaret. The clock is a gate to hell. <gasps> she said that? Yes. Oh, it's true, then. Oh, I was sure of it. But, 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 but what is going to happen? Oh, Mrs. Tucker, we must get that clock out of this house and into a church as quickly as possible. Paul. Yes. Did Leona say anything about an emergence? No, she just said the way is now open. It will be soon. Oh, dear Lord, we've got to move fast. Are you really serious? Mr. Tucker, if we do not get that clock out of here and onto hollow ground soon, believe me, all hell will literally break loose. Listen to it. It's calling. Oh, get it out. I'll be glad to get rid of it. Charlie. Charlie, we better do what they say. All right. I'll be glad to see the end of the damn thing, too. That's what it is. It is damned. Oh, do hurry. Give me a hand, Paul. It's, it's not heavy. I'll call the church. Reverend Childs is probably there now. No, well, he's not going to believe this. Uh, uh, tip it toward me. I'll go bring the station wagon around. This isn't moving. I can't... Uh... Well, well, lay it on its side. Right. We'll, we'll carry it. I can't budge it. What? We brought it in with, without any trouble at all, but I... And now I, I, I can't move it. Well, here, let me get on your side. Hmm? All right, now, push. No, I won't budge. You've got to get it out. Well, we can't move it an inch. Well, well, throw your weight against it with me. Now. It's no use. Oh, Sagatanis is having his way. Is there anything you can do, Mrs. Egan? I am a medium, not an exorcist. 
Unless that clock is on hollow ground... The child says to bring it. He didn't understand what I was talking about, but he said... We can't budge it. What do you mean? The clock is rooted to the floor. Oh, to heaven, what are we going to do? I'm going to smash it to bits. Oh, that's impossible now, I think. Look. The clock. (gasps) Flames inside. Oh, the fires of hell. Oh, they're on the way. The whole house may go up. The baby. Mike is upstairs. I'll get him. Get out. Everybody out. My baby. I've got to get my baby. Get out, Charlotte. I'll get Mike. Come with me, Charlotte. Hurry. All hell is breaking loose, and we can't stop it. Oh, only our governor connection soon. Saga Tannis. Oh, I should have seen it right away. The flames are spreading. Come on, Margaret. We must get out with the others. Everything's gone. Everything. This is only the beginning, I'm afraid. My baby, we're safe now. Shh. We're safe, Mrs. Tucker. But I wonder for how long. What do you mean? This is not the end of it. No. Oh, oh my. The Anderson's house is going up, too. There is no escape. It's too late. The world is doomed now. Hell has triumphed. Dickory Dickory Doom A clock stood in a room The clock struck well To summon hell Hickory Dickory Doom I couldn't resist a little parody On the popular nursery rhyme Something to bring us back to the real world To realize that such things Just don't happen Do they? Uh Uh-oh I'll be back shortly. I see by the old clock in the corner that our time is up for now. The next time you happen on a grandfather clock, I hope you'll take a peek inside. If you feel cold, clammy air in there, I'd suggest you tell whoever owns it to get rid of it quickly, preferably to a nunnery. That is, if there's still time. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Patricia Elliott, Sam Gray, and Joan Shea. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Uh, See, Carlo, uh, there is no doubt. Uh, this is a Lucifer man. Uh, Lucifer? Uh, you mean the devil, uh, Satan? It was not always so that Lucifer uh, meant evil. Uh, In ancient Latin, uh, Lucifer meant bringer of light, uh, the morning star. But this animal uh, groveling uh, under the floor here, you're not saying... He's a saintly man. He is a slave of Satan. You see the way he looks at me. It knows I am its master. This creature is centuries old. Get up, demon soul. Stand up on your two real legs. I shall... Will you not answer me? Yes. Speak now of a later time in your existence. What are you? This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Come in. Welcome. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. Those of you who have attended performances in the Mystery Theater know that there are certain tales that particularly entrance and intrigue me. They deal with the unusual, the unfamiliar, the unexplainable. So I have turned today to that master of mystery, Wilkie Collins, who has a habit of coming up with a story that's always making me say, why, that's not possible. Or, is it? Xavier, Xavier Yardley Zenith, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Uncle. 
It's me, Xavier. Are you a ghost? Why didn't Father Daly bless my coffin? I wanted him to, Uncle. But he refused. Absolutely refused. Why, Xavier? Because he said you didn't die a natural death. You must make him bless the grave, Xavier. I... I cannot rest until he does. Our mystery drama, Shadows from the Grave, adapted from a story by Wilkie Collins, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Christopher Tabori and Fred Gwynn. I'll be back in a moment with Act One. One invariably associates mysterious with lonely old houses, strange small inbred towns, peculiar characters. And I have to admit, this story follows that pattern. The man who told it to me is one XY Zenith. You can imagine the comments this poor guy has gone through life with. Nevertheless, he didn't seem to mind when I said, XYZ, would you tell us about your extraordinary adventure yourself? Having been christened Xavier Yardley Zenith and suffered with those initials all through school in California... I decided that when I got to the job age and became very good in photography to open up a studio of my own. Call it Zenith of Hollywood. Not an unusual word in Hollywood where everything is the top, the best, the ultimate, the zenith. Two things occurred in April of this year which totally changed my life. One, I planned to marry. And two... I got a note from my Uncle George, who lived in Fresno, to come see him on what he called a matter of some importance. Hello up there. Uncle George, it's me, Xavier. What are you doing up in that tree? Xavier, welcome, my boy. I've just about sealed up this hole in the tree. Uh, uh, here, g- give me a hand. Uh, Daddy. Uh, uh, <laughs> Pretty spry for a man of my age, don't you think? Uh, You've never been up this way before, have you, Xavier? Not since I was a child, Uncle George. What happened to this big old oak? Struck by lightning? No, it's the woodpeckers and squirrels that make all these holes. I've just had it with the noisy beggars. They jump from this tree to the top of the porch, and then they run along my bedroom window, making the most infernal racket you can imagine. So I've just been sealing up a few of their nesting places. Let them find apartments elsewhere, I say. What about that big hole on the other side of the tree? Um, maybe tomorrow I'll mix up some more cement. Uh, uh, say, boy, you always go around with two cameras hanging around your neck? Photography is my business, so I'm always prepared just in case. Huh? Is there a living in it? You, uh, you, uh, sell your pictures? I used to do better. Took shots of movie stars on location. Did a lot of newspaper and magazine work. But work is thinned out. I have a proposition to make you. Since I gather that picture-taking business isn't too profitable these days, I think you may be interested. Are you married? I'm just about to be. This coming Saturday, matter of fact. Good. Then what I have in mind might make an excellent wedding present. (laughs) Uh, I'm not a rich man, Xavier, but comfortably off. Fifty-nine acres, orchards, gardens, this house, and a private family vault on the premises. You're joking. You own a mausoleum? Uh, Death is not a joke, Xavier. I am going to die in a week. You? No, you're not. You look fit as a fiddle. An ill-tuned fiddle. Uh, No, death is only a few days off for me. Uh, I've known it would come to this for some time, so it's no surprise. I'd like to show you where I'm going to be buried. 
Here we are. That's Carrara Marble in Vermont Granite. Uh, those two locks on the bronze door are an invention of mine. Mind if I take a picture of it? Not at all. There's, um... There's no one in your private mausoleum now, is there? No. Uh, there was. Uh, uh, no. Uh, no one. Uh, now, Xavier, I want you to pay particular attention. Two keyholes and two separate brass keys. There is a very good reason for the two locks. When I am laid to rest inside this vault, Xavier, I don't expect I shall be trying to get out. But I do not wish anyone else to get in. But why would a person want to? It's not necessary for me to explain all that to you now, my boy. I, I turn the handle. And so... Not spacious, but uh, not crowded. My final home. Uncle, if you don't mind, could we go back to the house now? I'm not at my best in mausoleums. All right. I've shown you everything. We'll sit ourselves on the porch and I'll tell you what's on my mind. Have you ever sat in a porch swing, Xavier? <laughs> Comfortable? I love these old swings. Uh, Xavier, I have no choice. You are my only living kin. There is no one else. I'm leaving all my worldly possessions. Uh, this house, the contents, the grounds. Everything to you. On one condition. You must live here and every day. Every single day, mind you. You must go to that mausoleum and make certain there's been no one tampering with the locks. Uh-huh. And, and that's the only condition, Uncle? The only one. I certainly appreciate your generosity... Can I think it over and let you know? I, I'd like to talk it over with Catherine. Absolutely not. You're going to agree right now. But, Uncle... But what? <laughs> you can have your Zenith of Hollywood office right here. This place is plenty big enough. You can turn the solarium into a studio if you like. I don't care. I won't be here. <laughs> it's all decided then? Hmm? Hmm? Good. I'll have Henley take you to the top of the hill. A good view and you can see most of the property. Uh... Have a tug at that bell pull, will you, Xavier? My dear boy, you don't know what a relief this is. My fate lies in your hands. Uh, wait just a moment, Uncle. I haven't agreed to this inheritance yet. But if I do, and I find someone's been at the locks of that mausoleum, what should I do? In my desk in the library, bottom right-hand drawer is a letter of instructions. The envelope has one word on it. Joshua. Did you say Joshua? But, unless someone has been trying to break in, that letter must never be read. Uh, you rang, sir? Yes, Henley. This is my nephew, Xavier Yardley Zenith. He's going to be living here. I want you to acquaint him with the property. Uh, very well, sir. Goodbye, Xavier. I shall not be seeing you again. <laughs> Have a good walk. Well, my dear Joshua, your old friend George Zenith has found a way to outwit you. <laughs> Do you hear me, Joshua? That's exactly what he said, Catherine. He stood looking out of the window at the tree he'd been cementing, talking to someone called Joshua, who of course wasn't in the tree. It was most uncanny. And then I left the room with Henley, the butler. How well do you know your Uncle George? Only slightly, I'd say. So then you have no idea what he meant by, Joshua, I'm going to outwit you now. Not the vaguest. But the important thing is, Catherine, do we want to spend the rest of our lives in a Victorian white elephant with a cook and a butler? Our lives? Well, that's the deal if I accept. I have to guard that mausoleum every single day. Darling, let's forget about this crazy Uncle George of yours. We're getting married Saturday. That's enough to think about for now. If your uncle wants to leave us his big old house in Fresno, fine. I love old houses. 
Especially when it's a free gift. You didn't promise anything, did you? No, I didn't. Saturday, Catherine and I tied the knot. Nothing fancy, just a few friends at the registrar's office on Hollywood Boulevard. About a dozen of us drove out to Laguna Beach for a wedding breakfast. And we just got around to toasting one another in California champagne when my service tracked me down and left a message that Uncle George had died. And would I come back to Fresno? I'm Father Daly, Mr. Zenith. Your uncle came occasionally to our church. Father Daly, this is my wife, Catherine. Uh, How do you do? I'm sorry this sad occasion has brought us together. Not a very auspicious first married week, is it? It's hard to believe. He seemed so healthy. And when he talked about being dead in a week... Did he? Yes. I thought it was his macabre sense of humor. How do you suppose he knew? Well, if he intended to take his own life, then quite naturally he would know. Well, surely no one thinks... Uh, My son, no one knows. When is the funeral service? Well, there isn't going to be one in the strict sense of the word. No funeral? But why not, Father? Well, I'm afraid Mr. Zenith's uncle may not have died a natural death. The medical examiner said an overdose of sleeping pills... Oh, but couldn't that have been an accident? I mean, he told me he had a lot of trouble sleeping. Oh, of course it could have. Which is what the coroner decided, death by accident. But so long as there's the slightest suspicion, which you have rather confirmed just now for me, I cannot bless the grave. I could bite my tongue for telling you what he said, that he'd be dead in a few days. Had you kept your uncle's intention secret... That indeed would have been a mortal sin. Yes, Henley. You wish to see me? I do, sir. Cook and I want to leave. You wish to leave this house? But why? While your uncle was alive, there were some very peculiar things going on, but out of loyalty, we just couldn't go. Peculiar things that frightened you? Oh, yes, indeed, sir. Strange voices and goings-on and awful shrieks. Like someone being attacked. Terrifying, if you ask me. I quite agree with you. Have you heard such noises since my uncle passed away? No, Mr. Zenith. Well, then I suggest to you, the noises died with him. Now, I'll double your salary, Cook's also, and I don't want to hear any more about your leaving. Well, you, you put it that way, sir. We'll be happy to stay on. Every day, I'd go out and check the locks on the family vault. Catherine and I started making over the solarium into a studio, and I ordered equipment for a darkroom. But then, one night, I had a strange dream. Xavier! Xavier Yardley Zenith! Is that you, Uncle George? Why didn't Father Daly bless my coffin? I wanted him to, Uncle, but he wouldn't. He said there was some question as to how you died. You must insist he bless the coffin. I cannot rest until he does. Uncle George, am I really talking to you? Or am I imagining things in my sleep? Promise me you will make Father Daly bless my remains. Otherwise, I I am lost. I am lost. To sleep, says Hamlet, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. Our friend Xavier Yardley Zenith has surely been given pause. His uncle dies mysteriously, then appears in a dream, giving orders, exacting promises. Where will it lead? Where will it end? Mystery Theater will return shortly with Act Two. has been an enigma for thousands of years. Our ghosts and illusion 
a projection of what one wishes to see? Or do they represent some ephemeral link between the world of the dead and the world of the living? The problem that faces Xavier is to persuade a member of the ministry to bless the remains of a man who may have committed murder, for that is indeed how the church regards suicide. Catherine, I tell you, Uncle George's ghost said it as clearly as I say this to you. Father Daly must give me his blessing. I cannot rest until he does. Honey, can I say something? I appreciate this inheritance, the house, the grounds, money to run it and have a butler and a cook. I never in my wildest dreams did I ever think I'd have that. But on the minus side, there's all this infatuation with death. That mausoleum which has to be guarded as though it were Tutankhamun's tomb. And now you having nightmares about your uncle. Xavier, it's not healthy. Well, what am I to do? I gave my word. Well, what about your career? You're a little young to retire to a gingerbread house in Fresno and, and play nursemaid to ghoulies and ghosties. Oh, we're going to make a great studio out of the solarium. And then that enormous closet, turning it into a dark room, it'll be great. You don't understand me, do you? You've got to get out into the world and take pictures, Mr. Zenith of Hollywood. But having always to be one night away from this place so you can check the locks on a dead man's tomb is going to hold you back. I told you all this before we married, so don't throw it in my face now. What's the matter with you, Xavier? Have you no will of your own? Why, a month ago, if I told you that a ghost came to me in my sleep, you would have laughed right out loud. I'm not laughing now. You really believe you saw him, don't you? Of course I do. I was there. He was there. I heard him. And you've decided to stick it out here for the rest of your life, is that it? If I have to, I will. I think I'd better leave you alone until you cool off. I'm not letting any dead uncle get in the way of my life. And I mean it. Catherine did mean it. Next thing I knew, she'd lit out and went back to L.A. I knew where to find her, all right. Had her mother's. But I was darned if I'd go running after her. My dear Mr. Zenith, my hands are tied. The church simply cannot acknowledge any untoward death. Father Daly, for three nights running, Uncle George has appeared to me at night saying, Help me lie in rest. I cannot until Father Daly blesses my coffin. Xavier, may I call you Xavier? I wish you would. My boy... You and I are both modern men at the edge of the 21st century. For you to tell me that you're being visited by your uncle's ghost, while I won't discount it as a possibility, it's much more likely to be your own conscience worrying you to such an extent that you can convince yourself that you've seen him. You tell me it happens when you're asleep. I say to you, yes, it could... But that still doesn't make it any more than a dream. Last night, he said I should read some of the books in his library and I would understand. Go read your uncle's books. And if this brings you peace of mind, then you'll know whether his appearances are fact or fancy. That's just what I aim to do, Father. You rang for me, sir? Yes, I did, Henley. Come into the library and shut the door behind you. Did you know my uncle was greatly interested in black magic? Well, I did tell you I was aware something strange was going on. He and Mr. Tree, they did some kind of... I, 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 I don't know what you'd call it. Mr. Tree? A friend of your uncle's. They spent a lot of time together, and then a year ago, Mr. Tree went away. Can you be more specific than something strange? Well, sir, there'd be a lot of candles. Hundreds, in fact. They'd have them all burning. And there'd be incense and chanting. Right here in the library, Mr. Zenith. I've been reading these books. And what amazed me was how many of them deal with the power of black magic. I remember him asking me to bring home a cup of holy water from the church. And I, I said to him, I said, Well, sir, you're supposed to go to church in person and, and bless yourself with holy water, not bring the holy water here. And your uncle said, Getting the holy water is the easy task. I have to get the, 
the blood of a child to mix with the water. Henley, did you ever find out what it was for? No, I didn't. I didn't ask. And I didn't steal the holy water from the church either. Henley, you strike me as a sensible man. Will you do me a favor tonight? I generally take a walk in the garden after dark. Perhaps you'd walk with me. Well, c- certainly, sir. I see you brought your camera, Mr. Zenith. Can you take pictures with only moonlight? Oh, yes. Film is so fast nowadays. I could get a picture of you at 20 feet by the light of one match. Why? Now, this part here where we're walking, is this also part of my uncle's property? Well, I should say your property, sir. This is all part of it. And and that brook, too. Let, let, let's walk to the other side across this footbridge. The path seems to continue downstream. Over there. Over there. Well, what's that little stone building? Oh, that's the mausoleum, sir. Oh, so it is. By moonlight, uh, I'm afraid I'm a little discombobulated. Oh, wait. That's a good shot from this side of the brook. Mausoleum reflected in the water. Yeah, I think I got it. Henley. Henley. What's that? What's what, sir? A figure of a man. I, I, I just saw him in my viewfinder. Then he disappeared. Where, sir? There. There. Again. Can't you see it? Yes. Yes, there was someone. Oh, he's moving away from the mausoleum. You, you see him? He's wearing a long cape almost to the ground. Can you see? A long cape? Oh, no. No, no. Excuse me, Mr. Zenith, but I must go now. No, no, no. Wait just a minute. What is it? Sir, will you please let go of my arm? I, I will when you tell me. Now, do you know that man? He's come back. Oh, I never thought we'd see him again. Henley ran off. I followed the man in the cape, keeping my distance across the brook. He seemed to glide over the earth. I ran across the footbridge towards him, and then he disappeared. I turned back to the house, and suddenly there he was, standing against a big oak tree. And then he seemed to melt right into it. I do apologize, Mr. Zenith, for my behavior last night, leaving you like that. Yes, I was rather puzzled. You're a photographer, sir, and so I... I have something to show you. This snapshot. Do you see that, man? Yes. It's very like the thing I saw last night. A hunched over man with a long cape. Why, it looks like he's talking to someone. Someone out of camera range, possibly. Well, that's the peculiar part of it. He was talking to someone. Uh, I took a picture of the two of them. But the other man's not in the picture. Are you saying this person we can't see was there but didn't register on the film? I, I don't think I understand. Perhaps it's better that you don't, Mr. Zenith. What about the man whose picture you got? Do you know him? It's Mr. Joshua Tree, sir, when he used to live here. And now he's come back. That's why I must beg you for your understanding and indulgence. Mrs. Henley and I simply cannot stay for a moment longer. But even if it is Mr. Tree who's come back, wh- wh- why must you leave, Henley? I, I, I can't say any more. I really can't. But if you want my advice, Mr. Xavier, if you value your life, you'll leave here also. When I developed the shots I took of the caped figure, they were identical to Henley's snapshot. That night, from the darkened library, I watched the oak tree. At midnight, the figure in the cape appeared. I crept out of the house, following it to the door of the mausoleum. This is what Uncle George must have meant. I reached forward to stop the man. Something hit me on the head from behind. I blacked out. Xavier? Xavier, are you all right? Oh. Catherine. What are you doing here? 
Am I dreaming? Don't ask so many questions. That's quite a bump on your head. Here, let me help you up. No, no, I, can, I can make it all right. Oh. Ooh. Whoever hit me wasn't kidding. You just stop talking and lean on me and we'll walk slowly back to the house. Catherine, this gets more mysterious every minute. But the biggest mystery is how you just happened to show up. I'm your wife, remember? I decided I was being stupid, so I came back. Oh, no, darling, you don't have to hold me up. I can make it all right. Uh-uh, you're not going to trip and fall again while I'm around. Catherine, I didn't fall. Somebody hit me. Xavier, what are you talking about? I saw you at the mausoleum when I came out of the house. I saw you step back and fall over. There wasn't a soul in sight. You didn't see anyone near me? It's after two in the morning. When we get back to the house, to bed you go and not a peep out of you. You don't believe that I was hit from behind? I believe my eyes. And they didn't see a thing. Father Daly, who is Joshua Tree? Where did you hear that name? Henley told me, but not much else. Joshua Tree. He was a man who, to the bottom of his heart, if he had one, was basically evil. How did my uncle come to know him? Well, he just turned up about two years ago. Your uncle took a fancy to him and saw a good deal of him. Which I am afraid was the most unfortunate thing he ever did in his life. Why do you say that, Father? Joshua Tree was the very spirit of the devil himself. I show you a photograph I took near my uncle's vault the day before yesterday. Is that Joshua Tree? Hmm. Well, I... <clears throat> I can't really make out the face. But the cape and the angle of the head, very similar, I'd say... But, of course, how could it be? He disappeared a year ago. Father, here's another picture. Is that the man? Yes. That's him. You didn't take this picture, did you? No. It was given to me by Henley. He took it. Now, if that's Joshua Tree, you notice he appears to be talking to someone, but there's no one there. Oh, yes, there is. But the camera can't record an apparition. You mean Joshua Tree was talking to someone, but we can't see him? Because, my dear young lady, that invisible thing is a familiar. What's that? A familiar is an evil spirit visible to very few. The devil can see him, as can a sorcerer's apprentice. So you were saying Joshua Tree was such an apprentice? Are you in here? Uh, there's nothing here. Now, try this drawer. What are you doing? Yes, uh, nothing, no, nothing. What do you mean, nothing? I mean there's nothing in any of my uncle's desk drawers. He told me there was. Xavier, why don't you answer me? Because I don't have any answers. Uh, let me see if I can get under this desk. Knock the wood. Maybe there's a secret drawer. Oh, yes, it's hollow here. Listen. One of these drawers is short. Behind it, the, 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 there must be. Yeah, here. I'll pull this drawer out. And I'll put it on the floor. Then I reach back inside. Yes. I, I feel something. An envelope. Well, here she be. How did you know it was back there? Before he died, the last time I saw him alive... Uncle George told me that if somebody was tampering with his mausoleum, I'd find my instructions in a letter with the word Joshua written on it. To whom it may concern... So... Oh, no. Oh, no. Murdered. He killed him. Oh, Lord in heaven. What are we to do now? The ghost in the play Hamlet says, I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night, till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burned and purged away. Is it so with Uncle George? Is he also doomed to eternal unrest until his sins are purged? 
and burnt away, Mystery Theater will return shortly. It's all very well to poo-poo the occult, ghostly apparitions, phantoms that haunt, the deceased who cannot find peace until they find love or forgiven their earthly sins, etc., etc. But the fact remains that time and again, psychic researchers have agreed there are manifestations that defy and disobey nature's laws. And whether we like it or not, the unexplained does exist. I shall never forget that evening. For even as I stood there, the letter of confession in my hand, Catherine waiting for me to read on, we were both suddenly so overcome by the cold I had to light a fire. And this was late July, mind you. We needed a fire. We lit candles. Something compelled us to light dozens and dozens of candles. I feel warmer now. It's seeing the flames, I think. Go on, Xavier, read your uncle's letter. To whom it may concern, especially you, my dear nephew Xavier, I fear they have come to get me. They've appeared at the door of my mausoleum, or else you would not be reading this letter. This letter. Stop. Uncle George. Catherine, do you see him? Yes. Is he... Is that your... Don't be alarmed, my dear young lady. I am sorry we did not meet before, but only your husband can help me. Is this true? Am I really hearing this? Xavier, you must find Joshua's body and destroy it. Burn it. You see, I had to kill him. I put his body in the crypt and then it disappeared. How horrible. Catherine, Joshua Tree's death was not half so horrible as his life. I was a fool, a lonely old fool. I submitted to his black magic. I subordinated my will to his and became a crawling, a craven creature. My mind, I... My mind, I lost control of my mind... It was all the doing of the hellish creature he conjured up from the world of the damned. His familiar. Uncle, if Joshua Tree's body is hidden somewhere, how can I find it? We will try anything to help you, Uncle. Persuade Father Daly to bless my grave. Help me, Xavier. Help me. I'm glad you finally saw him too, Catherine. Mm. Oh, those heavy summer storms. We better check the library windows. Mm. I'll do the ones on the side, Catherine. You make sure the ones facing the front are tightly shut. Look! The fire in the fireplace. It's going out. How strange. Well, it must be the downdraft blowing down the chimney. Now the fire's gone out. Oh, the candles are going out. Must be some strange air circulating in this room. Let me get the electric lights. The switch is by the door. Well, that's funny. Nothing's happened. Can't you... Turn the lights on? No way. Well, that happens often in the country. Get a big storm and the electricity just shuts off. I'll look out the front library windows and see if there are lights in the other houses down the road. Xavier, come here. There's someone out there. Look, pressed against the big oak, a man with a cape. And next to him, a tall kind of man. They're both huddling against the trunk of the tree, trying to keep out of the rain. Catherine, the tall one, it's turning around from the tree. He's looking right this way. Can it see us? Oh, what a hideous face. Like death. The eyes. Do you see those eyes? Now it's beckoning to the man in the cape. I see him. Is that Joshua Tree? In spirit. For I'm sure now where his body is. Where? In that tree. That's why Uncle George was so haunted. Oh, it's all clear to me now. That time... I followed Joshua Tree to the mausoleum. They were trying to get at the corpse of Uncle George. It was the familiar who knocked me down. Am I imagining it? But the both of them have come much closer to our picture window. Hello? 
Father Daly, is that you? Yes. This is Xavier. You've got to come over to my uncle's house. You've simply got to. My boy, you sound quite upset. Father, I implore you. Come now. Catherine and I are here alone. Only you can save us. Give me that phone. Father Daly, this is Catherine Zenith. Uh, there are two creatures outside the library window right now. They're not real people, Father. I have a very strong feeling they are not human. Two? Did, did you say two? At this moment, they are pressing their faces against the glass of the library window. The hands are clawing at the glass as if they wanted to break through it. Is one of them wearing a cape? Yes, yes, it is. Father, come quickly. Help us. Help us. They're, they're raising their hands now and pounding at the glass. Ah! We ran out the back door into the raging, storming night, lashed by rain, not knowing which way to escape. The only path through the garden led right to the mausoleum, and before we could stop ourselves, we were practically on top of it. It's there. It's standing at the door of the vault. Grab my hand, Catherine. Hold on. We'll run for the brook. Where are we going? Into the water. Come on. It's not deep, Catherine. We can walk it. Stay in the middle of the brook with me. You see, these evil spirits cannot follow humans into water. If we just keep moving, it'll give up. I'm I'm sure of it. Oh, I hope you're right. It's got to give up before I do. I was right. The thing gave up, finally. And by the time we'd climbed to shore, it had gone. There we stood, the rain beating down on us from above, and our legs and clothes soaked from the brook. Somehow, we found the main road to town and ran towards it. Oh, there's a car coming. I see headlights. Let's stand at the wayside of the road. After staying alive this long, I don't want to be hit by a car. Xavier, Catherine, what are you doing out here? Oh, Father Daly. Oh, don't answer me. Just get in. We've got to get back to the house. All right, all right, all right. Close that door and let's go. Now, tell me, you two, what are you doing standing in the road wet from head to toe? We ran from the house to get away from them. They actually broke through a plate glass window. That's most peculiar. Peculiar? It was horrifying. Why do you say that, Father? Because the spirit of Joshua Tree and and his familiar are not after either of you. Well, they certainly gave a good imitation. Uh, You don't seem to understand. These creatures, the dead... And the spirit they've called up, their satanic twin, in fact. They're not after living persons. They're on the constant lookout for the newly dead. Wait till you see the broken library window, and then tell me if there aren't exceptions. (sighs) Where are they now? It's time I wrestle with the devil. What will you do? I shall quiet the demons with my crucifix. There's only one way to drive out Satan. And the church has been doing it for centuries. Father, look. The vault door's open. Someone's coming out. Not someone, but some things. They're carrying out your uncle's coffin. Stop! I charge you, arch fiends of Hades! Thou hast entertained familiarity with Satan, the grand enemy of God! I charge you! Put down that body and be gone! Father Daly advanced upon the two creatures holding his crucifix in front of him. The familiar and the spirit of the murdered Joshua Tree halted, released the coffin and ran. Father Daly and I carried Uncle George back inside the vault and closed the doors. It came to me in a flash. The big oak tree. It was there we would find the source of the evil. You were right, Savior. I can see their shadows. I'll hold them back with my crucifix. Somewhere inside this oak are the remains of the man my uncle killed. When we find them, I suspect they'll be wrapped in that long cape he wore. There's a sizable hole on the far side. When I first came here last April, my uncle was up there cementing up some holes. Since he knew Joshua Tree's body had been taken from the mausoleum by the familiar... Your uncle might have suspected it was in this tree. I don't look forward to finding a pile of decomposed bones. What do we do with them, Father? Burn them. I'm glad Catherine's in the house. I don't know how she would react to a funeral pyre. We have no choice. Look, Father. The familiar. It's still there. 
Its minutes on earth are numbered. Once we have destroyed the body of Joshua Tree, what held it here no longer exists, and the familiar must return to the black beyond. And Uncle George must have known that his body could be invaded after death. And he would have had to walk the earth forever with this familiar. When I find the remains, I shall light the fire to them and hold high the cross. But what about Uncle George? I shall go back into the mausoleum and bless the coffin. Requiescat in pace. <laughs> I'll be back shortly with a final thought. The flames consumed the phantoms from the grave and the good father returned to the tomb and blessed the coffin. Will there be deliverance for the uncle, release from wandering the earth? Oh yes, but in the dimension of the beyond, will the spirit of the murdered sorcerer allow his murderer to exist in peace? Or will Uncle George discover his eternal torture is just beginning? Our cast included Christopher Tabori, Fred Gwynn, Kurt Benson, and Betsy Beard. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, Producer Director, inviting you to return to our Mystery Theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time then, pleasant dream. Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. In the mythology of ancient Greece, Hypnos, the god of sleep, and Thanatos, the god of death, were twin brothers, and for good reason. When you turn out the light beside your bed and snuggle down under the sheets for a good night's rest, you finally slowly drift off into a form of unconsciousness. This blacking out, this easing into a soft and shapeless state of non-existence, gives you an inkling, a kind of preview of what it may mean to enter the doorway of sleep's shadowy brother, death. The brown-purple blood gathered in a swift bead trickling over my side. I could see it. Forrest flung the scalpel aside and began to shout. Ice! Ice! Quick, somebody let me have some ice! Lots of it! Even though my body still clung to me there on the operating table by the merest thread... I knew that Dr. Forrest, in spite of all his skill, had murdered me. Our mystery drama, The Long, Long Sleep, was suggested by a short story of H.G. Wells and was especially written for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss. It stars Larry Haynes, I'll be back shortly with Act One. When destiny decides a man's time has run out, when a gaunt figure menacingly emerges from the half-darkness, his face cloaked under a huge black cowl, and his long, bony finger beckons you to join him, how can you be sure whether or not you are ready? By what signs do you recognize this to be the final eternal sleep? The sleep from which no one awakes. It's the night of December 31st, and Norman Hill and his wife Lori, a couple in their middle 50s, are at home, alone.
New Year's Eve. The end and the beginning. For the first time ever, Laurie and I had decided to stay home together. Why? I wasn't really sure. But there was an unknown something that was bothering me. Only a couple of minutes to go, Laurie. Not another year will have gone by. Mm-hmm. You don't feel bad about our not going out? Norman, of course not. What we're doing makes the only sense. This is perfect. Yeah. Just the two of us alone. In an apartment that's begging to be painted. Well, I'll have the painters in any day now. I promise. Okay. Ooh, now let's get to that jar of caviar. Right, and real imported champagne. The best that money can buy. Now, when you get the promotion they've been promising you at the office. Yeah, and the very good chance of my book being picked up as a paperback. Oh, Norman, I'm a very lucky woman. Hmm. And I love you very much. And, Lori, I love you. Bill. Hmm. After all these years, you don't want to trade me in for a later model? Uh, not just yet, dear. But I'm delighted to be stuck with what I've got. For a while, anyway. <laughs> well, thank you, darling. You're still very sweet and so romantic. <laughs> and this is it. Oh, add some of the toast and caviar. Yes, of course. Mm. Oh, it's great. <laughs> One. Happy New Year, darling. Oh, Happy New Year to you. And with luck, to another 30 years to go. Well, at the very least, I'll drink to that. <laughs> to us. <laughs> what is it, Norman? What's wrong? Oh. Norman? What's oh. happening? Oh. What can I get you? Oh. Norman? <coughs> Speak to me. What is it? Oh. Norman? Norman, darling. Open your eyes. You're frightening me. Are you all right? Uh, where am I? Oh. Lori. Oh, everything's going to be all right. And, uh, uh. You started to drink your champagne. You began to choke. Uh. And suddenly you passed out. For long? Five, ten seconds, maybe. You all right now? Yeah, I'm fine. Just fine. I think... Has this happened before, Norman? I, uh, didn't want to worry you. Recently? The last couple of weeks, two or three times. Oh. Once at lunch with a couple of the fellas from the office. Have you been in pain? No, no, not really. But you've got to see a doctor. Yeah, I suppose so. Maybe I will. No, no, no maybes, Norman. Tomorrow morning you make an appointment with Forrest Hatton. What, New Year's Day? It's a holiday, even for doctors. Well, then the next day, Tuesday. Yeah. All right, maybe, maybe it's not a bad idea. I'll call him at home. Norman, you just scared the living daylights out of me. Yeah, I guess I did. Anyway, happy New Year, darling, to both of us. Laurie was scared, and I was too. If you've made up your mind you want to go on living... Then you make up your mind to follow the rules. The doctor's rules. Forrest Haddon, who was one of my closest and most trusted friends, put me through the most thorough physical examination I'd ever had in my life. Every test in the book. And then a few days later at his office... Norman, I've never kidded any of my patients, least of all you. I don't see the point. <sighs> when, Forrest, how soon? The operation? Yesterday, Norman. No. The longer we wait, the greater the chance we take. We? Do they suspect of the office? No, no, of course not. And, uh, Lori? Lori. Lori is something else. Oh, what do you say? I'm all yours, Dr. Haddon, I guess. I've already called the hospital. They can take you Thursday morning. That's the uh, day after tomorrow. I wouldn't wait, Norman. Okay. Then Thursday morning it is. And uh, the odds of my survival, of my uh, pulling through? Oh, I'm a doctor, Norman, not a gambler. I don't give up. But if you did? All right, I'd say an even 50-50. No worse? No worse. You'll be at the hospital Thursday morning at 8, admitting room. 
Um, where are you headed now? The office, then home. I think I'll walk. Clear my head a bit. Do you mind if I walk along with you? <laughs> you were my last patient. No, no, of course not first. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. You're, um... You're afraid I'm about to dissolve into a huge mess of self-pity and despair, aren't you, Forrest? Uh, I might take it into my head to do something rash, right? Could be. And if I did? Oh, that would be very foolish. Well, what would be the sense? None. No, no, Forrest, you're wrong. At this moment, I feel absolutely nothing. Not self-pity, not despair, nothing. Just a big... Big emptiness. As if I were already dead. This afternoon, as I walked along with Forrest Haddon facing the possibility of my own death, it was all very strange. Every deep, passionate feeling I might have had depression, fear, resentment, anger was in some curious way drained out of me. There was nothing left inside me except a bloodless, tranquil resignation to a 50-50 chance of the inevitable. Now, there's no point in minimizing the danger, Norman. It's a very tricky, delicate procedure. Oh, I'm not an alarmist. You know that. I know what I'm doing. And I'll be working with a team... And as we trudged through the snow across from the park toward my office, Forrest kept on assuring me that my life was in the most capable hands. But I couldn't get over the feeling that here I was, living in the very real shadow of death, without my being able to do a thing about it, to control in any way what was happening to me. And what surprised me most was the fact that I was unmoved by the whole thing. And I was cool. Lucky that I, I was uh, calm. Uh, until... Norman, look out! Move it! Well, what happened? Uh, that big pot with a plant in it must have toppled off the roof of that penthouse. The wind must have blown it. Well, it's a good thing you saw it coming first. And pushed me out of the way. It was just in time. It missed my head by you inches. Split your skull right in two. Well, come on, let's not stand here, Norman. Let's move before anything else happens. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Forrest. Thank you very much. <laughs> For a moment, I'd been brought back to reality. And then a minute later, that same dullness, the feeling of being isolated from the rest of the world, began to take over again. I think that's wonderful about your book, Norman. You know, I don't see how you manage it. A full-time forest kept on out, talking you know. about my work, and possibly to get my mind off thing, whatever right? was wrong with well, me. That's great. That's we great. kept walking through the slush and well, snow. What kind of thing do you And I was yeah. oblivious to what was going on. I remember starting to cross the street, and then... Norman! What are you doing? You come back here. Oh, my goodness, I can't see you. The brakes on that fellow's car hadn't held. You'd have been killed. Yes, I... I suppose so. I, I'm sorry. I wasn't thinking far as my mind uh, uh, on, on other things. Of course, I'm aware of that. But for Pete's sake, Norm, what are you trying to do? Uh, my, uh, my office is in that building over there. I think I'd like to sit in the park alone, if you don't mind, far as before I go up. Oh, sure, Norman. I, I appreciate your company. It was very thoughtful. I'll uh, see you day after tomorrow at the hospital. 8 a.m. Admitting room. Thanks again, Forrest. And whatever you do, you take it easy, please. I sat down on one of the park benches, and I must have dozed off into a kind of dream. I thought I saw myself actually dead, with it, tattered, one eye, pecked out by birds. Through the trees, I saw a vision of the resurrection. A flat plain of writhing graves and rolling tombstones. The rising dead seemed unable to breathe as they struggled upward through the frozen snow out of the earth. After no more than a minute, I came to and started for my office. Now, what was the sense of not quite being connected with what was happening? Was this some weird 
anticipation, a presentiment of my own death to come. The falling flower pot, my walking in front of that automobile, were they triggered by something that was making me withdraw from all reality or sense instincts, even of self-preservation? Before that cold and bony hand was laid on mine, I had no way of knowing. A certain soothsayer warned Julius Caesar to be on his guard against a great peril, a peril that could lead to his death. On the day of the month, the Romans called the Ides, the Ides of March. When that day came and Caesar was on his way to the Senate, he passed a soothsayer in the street and with a smile he said, The Ides of March have come and nothing terrible has happened to me. The soothsayer answered, Yes, the Ides have come. But they are not yet gone. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Death is the veil which those who live call life. They sleep and it is lifted. That was written by one of our great poets. Do those words apply to Norman Hill? Or are the words of Aesop, the teller of fables, more appropriate? He said, better die once and for all than to live in the continual terror of death. On a bitterly cold winter's day, Norman sits alone on a park bench, taking the measure of death. The year was only a few days old. The beginning of things. I wandered slowly out of the park toward my office. Children were romping with their sleds in the fresh snow in the winter sun. Gathering strength and experience for the business of life. And I kept thinking, I have been part of all this. And for all I know, I'm nearly done with it now. through the doors of my office and a curious thing no one paid any attention to me not a soul even looked up from his desk to greet me it was as if I weren't there I couldn't understand it had I suddenly become invisible or what I got to my own little cubicle of an office and I felt a sharp jab of pain just below the heart my office was bare completely bare the chair and the desk were gone, the carpeting, my books, the pictures on the walls, everything. My, my name played on the door, even that had been removed. And for the first time since leaving the doctor's office, I lost the feeling I'd had. That feeling of numbness. Now what's been happening here? Where are my things? Huh? Well, somebody talk to me, talk to me. Hey, hey, easy. No, I'm take it easy, relax. Now, Mr. Lewis, what is this? Just look at my office. <laughs> Surprise. Surprise. Now, for Pete's sake, what on earth are you talking about? That... I'm sorry, excuse me. Excuse me for shouting. I, I didn't mean to yell. Oh, that's perfectly all right. We may have overdone things a bit. We had no idea you'd take it this way. Take what? What way? <laughs> Your promotion. My what? Oh, my boy, the way you handled our new account, that was absolutely brilliant. No one in the office could have done it the way you did. And so the board and I decided to kick you up to an executive vice presidency. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's wonderful. Wonderful, Mr. Lewis. Thank you. Th thank you very much. <laughs> That's why we had to had them clear out your old office. Uh, the big one in the corner, over there. That's yours. All new furnishings. Your personal things are already in. Well, you know, for a minute there with nobody in the office even looking well, at that me... that was part of the act. Part of the surprise. Yeah, well, I... I must say you threw a real scare into me. I had the feeling maybe... Maybe I wasn't really here that none of those things was actually happening. Oh, they're happening all right, Mr. Vice President. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you'll be with us for a very long, long time. Well, that, Mr. Lewis, at the moment is uh, 
A little questionable. Questionable? Well, I'll, I'll know better on Thursday, Thursday morning. Now, now look, we're, we're ready to match any offer anyone else is making you. Oh, I doubt that you could match this one, Mr. Lewis. Anyway, I wouldn't uh, call it an offer. Not exactly. On my way home, I found myself lost again in a shifting maze of thoughts about death. I felt more and more certain that on Thursday morning, I was going to die under the operation. Laurie? You home, dear? It's me. My wife wasn't home. She was shopping, of course. Shopping. At this time, something very odd was going on. The, ch the chairs, the, the sofa were all covered with big white sheets. Every surface of every table had been cleared. The drapes had been taken down. And that dull stab of pain hit me once again in the pit of the stomach. I started for the bedroom to change my clothes. What? Hello? I'm so glad to find you in at last. Been trying to get you all afternoon. Who is this? Who's calling? About the arrangements. The director wasn't quite clear about one or two of the details. Uh, what? What arrangements? Which details? Who is this? First, he wasn't altogether certain how many limousines you had ordered. Limousines? The remains will be properly embalmed, of course, as ordered. But was it your desire to have the lid of the casket of the departed left open or closed? Now, would you, for heaven's sake, tell me who this is? Sir, you are not answering my question. Now, before I hang up on you for the last time, who are you? Who is this? The golden rule, funeral services, of course. Serving families, as you know, with dignity and sympathy at all modest costs since 1898. This is the secretary of the director speaking, Mrs. Haven Castle. F funeral services? Why, why are you calling us? Well, isn't this Mr. Yamashita? Mr. Shizuki Yamashita? Or have I by some mischance got a wrong number? Oh, sister, have you got a wrong number? Sorry, terribly sorry. I drifted back into the bedroom. Is that you, dear? Oh, what a surprise. What a big surprise. Laurie, have you been home all this time? Of course, in the other bedroom, trying on a couple of new dresses I bought. I had the door shut. Is that, is that one of the new dresses? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what do you think? And what are you doing home? Uh, at this time of day, that is. Well, uh, it's been a long day. A pretty full day, too. I, uh, I saw... Forrest had him this morning. He had the x-rays, lab reports, everything. And? And he, uh, he's operating on me uh, Thursday morning. That soon? Yeah, my, uh, my chances of getting through the operation are no better than 50-50, uh, Forrest says. Lori, at the office, I, uh, I've been promoted. Executive vice, vice president. New office, new everything. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, vice president. Maybe uh, for one whole day. And what do you mean by that? Well, I... could be dead day after tomorrow. Norman, dear, worrying about it isn't going to help. Now, both of us, we have to think positively. And feeling sorry for yourself won't help. You know... Uh... A strange phone call as, as I came in. A uh, funeral parlor. What? Yeah, it was the wrong number, they said. Now, Laurie, what on, what on earth is going on here? Now, what's wrong? Tell me what's wrong. Norman, you're hurting me. Let go of me, please. What's the matter with you? Now, why have you got sheets all over the furniture? Why is everything cleaned up and put away? As, as if we or you were, were going on a, on, a, on a long trip someplace. As if I were making arrangements to close down the place. Now, why? But darling, you know as well as I do. The painters are coming in to do the apartment tomorrow morning. Tomorrow? Now, now try to control yourself. I know the strain you've been under. It, it's not been easy for me either. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. You're... 
Your whole attitude since I came in, like I was speaking to a stranger, the way you look at me, the way you talk. It's all in your mind. As if for some reason you were frightened of me. As though you were looking at a, at a ghost. Somebody who'd come back from the grave. Norman. That dress, that dress you're wearing. What about Well, when you take it off, that's what a widow wears, isn't it? You're in mourning for me already. Oh, Norman, you can't mean what you're saying. That's a black dress. It's black. Out of respect for the dead. Oh, let me turn on the lights. Now, what color is my dress, Norman? It's, uh... It's blue. It's blue, isn't it? Kind of a, a navy blue. I thought it was black. I'm sorry. It's all right. Glory. Glory, what's wrong with me? Oh, you're upset, Norman. Terribly upset. And you have every reason, every right to be. Oh, look, darling. Why don't you lie down for a bit? You know, when Forrest told me about my chances of pulling through... My, my my body, my mind, everything seemed to go numb, lifeless, as if this were about to happen to somebody else, not to me. And then and then it suddenly hit me: this is this is happening to me, and I'm afraid. Uh, a nap, a nap before dinner will do you a world of good. Put all those dreadful thoughts out of your head, and in the morning. In the morning, nothing will have changed. Nothing. <laughs> in the morning after tossing frantically in my bed all night without even a minute's sleep I had an idea that I I thought might put my mind at ease Laurie let's drive up to Avalon Avalon? Uh -huh. the cemetery? yes exactly you want to drive to the cemetery in this rainstorm? we'll be drowned darling I'd like to go I, I, I'd just like to walk around and look at the family gravestones, you know, the, the whole families. I don't know why, but I think it'll make me feel better. Well, if that's what you want, dress warmly. Oh, it'll be freezing up there. And we'll take two umbrellas. Thank you, Laurie. In less than an hour, we were at Avalon Cemetery, where my family had been buried for over a hundred years. And we stood there before the big family plot while the wind almost tore our words away and the rain drummed down on our two black umbrellas. Oh, keep your coat buttoned tight around your neck. Yeah, yeah that's uh, Grandfather Curtis over there, my mother's father. Christopher Curtis, born 1859, died 1911. That, that big headstone over there? Yeah, my, my father's father's father, my great-grandfather, Charles... Robert Hill, born 1838, died 1863, only 25. Killed at the Battle of Shikamaqua in the Civil War. The lettering on some of these stones is so worn, you, you can hardly read them. Uh, this is your father's grave over here, isn't it? And, uh, and next to him, your mother. Yes, yes, that's right. And right behind them, over there... No. I, I don't believe it. Oh, Norman, what is it? Next next to Grandfather Hills. That's that's impossible. What are you talking about? The letters are badly worn, but you you can still see the name. Norman Hill. Laurie, the grave we're looking at is mine. this moment, it would seem that his fear of death has led Norman Hill to the point where he questions whether or not he is still alive. With Shakespeare's Prince of Denmark, he may be thinking, for in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long a life. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. To Norman Hill, under the dark shadow of a fate he sees as fairly certain, death has suddenly become definable, perceptible, real, 
So much so that he's beginning to doubt whether he is still alive. Or perhaps he has fallen into the kind of deep sleep that is death without dying. Living, but not life. He and his wife, Lori, on a windy, rain-swept morning, stand in a corner of a cemetery looking at the cold, gray headstones over the graves of Norman's family. What you see? Right behind those other gravestones over there. Oh, no, I don't believe it. Norman, what is it? That, that headstone next to my grandfather's. It, it's impossible. What are you talking about? The letters are badly worn. You can barely make out the name, but look closely. It says, Norman Hill. Lori, the, the grave we're looking at is mine. Norman, be sensible. Now, get closer to it. Look again. I know. It's so hard to see in the rain. Well, look at it. Look at the letters. Look at the dates. Born 1859. That's Grandma Hill. That's my grandmother's grave. Of course. And her name? Her name was Norma. I was named after her. That's what the headstone reads. An O-R, M-A. The extra N. I thought I read. It just isn't there. Darling, it's cold. Yeah. Wouldn't it be more sensible to go back home now before we both come down with pneumonia? <laughs> up at dawn. I'd been awake and hot and thirsty all night long. The glow of pain under my ribs seemed more massive than ever. We'd better go, Norman. Sure. On a dot of eight, I checked into the admitting room at the hospital. I kissed Lori. Was it Goodbye. After what seemed like an eternity of details of preparation, I was finally placed on a table and wheeled into the operating room. Forrest Haddon and his operating greens were standing over me. Good morning, Norman. How do you feel? All right, I guess. <laughs> Will it hurt much? No, not a bit. You'll be out cold under a general anesthetic. And your heart's as sound as a bell, so we don't have to worry about that. Oh, that's good. All right now, Norman. Start counting backwards. Begin with the hundred. Backwards. One hundred. Ninety-nine. Ninety-eight. Ninety-seven. That's very good, Norman. Excellent. Ninety-six. Mm-hmm. Ninety-five. Mm-hmm. Ninety-four. Just breathe normally. Ninety-three. It's fine. Ninety-two. Fine. Ninety-one. I knew I'd never come out of the ether. Just as I was going under, I think I heard Forrest say to one of his assistants, We've got to be extra careful. One little slip of the knife into a branch, any branch of the portal vein, and we're out of luck. I could still make out his words. This was my last moment of awareness, my last act of consciousness. 73, 72, 71. Suction. Scalpel. I saw him reach for the scalpel, a large one. I saw him slice into my flesh with swift dexterity. 
was interesting to see myself being cut into as if I were a drum of cheese without the slightest bit of pain. I was looking into Forrest's eyes, into his mind, his brain. I could see that he was being extremely careful, afraid of cutting a branch. Uh, what do you call it? Oh, yes, a branch of the portal vein and ending my life right there and then. I could read his thoughts in his eyes. You're right, Norman. Absolutely right. I'm struggling between the two possibilities of either cutting too little or cutting too much. And I'm afraid. Afraid. And then suddenly, like an escape of water from under a floodgate, I could see a great swirling, a brush of horrible realization in far size. Damn. The vein. I've cut into the vein. The brown purple blood gathered in a swift bead trickling over my side. Forrest flung the scalpel aside and began to shout. Ice! Ice! Quick! Ice! Lots of it! And hand me that clamp! Thoughts rushed through my mind with incredible speed, but with perfect clarity. Even though my body still clung to me by the merest thread, I knew that in spite of all his skill, Forrest had killed me. I was aware of a growing pull upon me as though some huge magnet were drawing me out of my body. The doctor, his assistants, the nurses seemed to have vanished. And I was in midair, flying swiftly upward. And the circle of scenery beneath me grew wider and wider. And the sky became deeper and richer in color until in no time at all, it had become a terrifying black, as dark and foreboding as no blackness I had ever beheld before. An innumerable host of stars broke out upon the sky, and then as from nowhere, the sun suddenly appeared, wiping out the darkness, an incredibly strange and wonderful disk of blinding white light rimmed about with a fringe of writhing tongues of red fire. Turn away, Norman. Don't look at it. Protect your eyes. How? How do I do that? Put your hands over your eyes. Uh, just... Just a minute. Who are you? Where are we? I'm here to help you. Why? Well, I, I can't see you. I have the feeling that I've not left the earth, but that the earth is pulling away, leaving me. It's interesting that you should notice uh, so soon. Well, not only... Not only the Earth, but the, the whole solar system seems to be streaming past me. I wonder if scattered in the wake of the Earth, there must be others like me. Maybe millions and millions of them floating through space, the same as I am. That's altogether possible. But suppose I, I, I should collide into some of them. Oh, that's not very likely. Why not? The space through which you're all traveling, you and they, is infinite. It has no beginning. It has no end. Plenty of room for all of you. Look, look, the North Star. Over there, the Little Dipper. Isn't that the Southern Cross? It's so clear, so big. You know your stars. What you, what you see in my latest book, Lost in the Stars, I, I, I called it. Yes? Oh, I, I shouldn't be talking about my book, not now. Oh, my. Such color. As though the light... We're coming from a world of sapphires and and that oh that big red one down there like a brilliant ruby rushing up to us. That's Mars, and uh, that one is Venus. Oh yes, and, and uh, the one with the little moons around it and all those rings. Saturn, of course. Oh yes, and those rings are all crystals of ice. Now with luck we get to the interesting part. Oh, and what's that? Outside and beyond your solar system, past all the planets you know. With luck. What does that mean? Where... Where are we? Where have we come to? To the edge of the outer universe. It was hard to believe what I was saying. Faster and faster, one galaxy after another rushed by. A hurry of whirling fireballs speeding into the endless void of space. Countless unfamiliar planets and constellations circled about me, catching the light in some ghostly fashion and then vanished into non-existence. 
I had at last reached the complete wilderness of space. And now, at last, I knew what happens when you leave this earthly life. The long, long sleep. Now I knew what it felt like to be dead. Suddenly, I was no longer a detached observer. I was terrified, thrown into an intolerable darkness, horror, and despair. Because I knew now, I knew now I didn't want to leave the earth so soon. I knew now I wanted to live. And again, I heard that same voice. Norman, you see that little speck of light? Yes. Keep your eye on it. It's growing bigger. It's more distinct, like... Like a pale brown cloud of some kind. That's funny. Funny? The the shape of it, I, I think... I think I've seen something like it somewhere before. It's, it's like a... Yes? Like a clenched fist. Do you see anything else? Yes, the, the fist, the, ha- the hand. is holding a, a stick... A shiny white stick of some kind, but not, nothing, nothing is very clear. Nothing is in focus. And above the hand, there's a little circle of, of light, sort of phosphorescent. Uh, the, the stick and the hand are just below it. You'll be all right, Norman. Everything's going to be all right. All right. And there will be no pain, Norman. No pain ever again. Why? You may live to be a hundred and fifteen, Norman, and able to eat and drink almost anything. The operation, I'm happy to say, has been one hundred percent successful. Forrest Haddon, my doctor, was standing beside me. I was in a hospital bed. The circle of light I'd been looking at was the face of a clock on the wall. And the white rod was the railing at the foot of the bed. Norman. Norman, darling. Oh, thank heavens it's all over. Lori. Lori, I'm alive. Of course you're alive. How do you feel? I'm not sure. A little weak. See, I've been away for a while. Far away. And a rather long trip. I know, dear. I know just what you mean. You know what? I have a wonderful idea for my next book. Oh, you mustn't talk. You must rest. It's about this fella whose doctor starts to operate on him. A 50-50 chance of his making it. The doctor's knife slips the patient sees the accident, realizes he's dead, goes off on a journey into space, sees all kinds of strange phenomena. If a writer of science fiction envisions his passage to eternity as an eerie odyssey through space, How do you suppose another person would see it? A coal miner, for example. Would he perhaps find himself digging down, down, down forever until he reaches ink-black oblivion? Or a carpenter? Would he be building an unending stairway of steps and risers leading to a perpetual, everlasting nothingness? We'll never know. I'll be back shortly. In recent days, there have been many heated discussions over the true definition of the word death. Biological death, where there is total and permanent cessation of all vital functions. Legal death, 
where many of these vital functions continue, but where there are no other signs of life as we know it. We leave the resolution of this question to the theologians, the scientists, even the lawyers. One thing we're almost sure of, along with Norman Hill, the journey to death may not only be terrifying, but it will also be very interesting. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Ann Williams, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. This spirit, having achieved the ultimate understanding, leaves the body and tries to become one with the universe. Leonard, I'm drowning. But the time is not yet, and so it must be born anew in another body. Leonard, is this you? Bridges, I am finally free. I know at last. I know. The guru showed me who I am. Who are you? I have been born again. Recreated. Although, uh, realistically, I never died. Yeah? Once again, I walk the world. I think. I dream. I create. But who are you? That is, who do you think you are? Oh, I know who I am. Yeah? Yeah. (laughs) I'm Leonardo da Vinci. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. If it works, it's obsolete. So says Marshall McLuhan. Alas, he must be speaking of other endeavors than crime. For in crime, if it works, it's up to the law to find a way to stop it as quickly as possible. But the clever criminal resists detection with every means at his disposal, fair or foul. And that puts the law at a distinct disadvantage. One must rely on clues. But what if the criminal has invented a new method of crime? One in which what is obsolete is the evidence. Sheriff, what brings you out here again? There's been another murder, Professor. Another? Like the first one? Yep. But that's two murders in two days. Isn't there anything you can do? No. We've got the bodies... We have the murder weapons. We can even construct a reasonable theory why the murders were committed. But the thing is, I got a feeling none of this is going to lead us to the murderer. Our mystery drama, The Dominant Personality, was written especially for the mystery theater by Percy Granger and stars Roberta Maxwell. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Imagine a rural area in the northern United States. An area so remote, the only roads are old logging trails. An area of glacial lakes, dark forests, where the population is so sparse, every house is an isolated outpost. In the summer, the tourists come to boat and fish, but with the fall, they return to the city, and those few who remain, the natives, settle back into solitude. Such existence breeds persons of marked character, capable of coping with any situation, that is, with almost any situation. Rod? Hey, hey, Rod. 
Rod, you home? Oh, his car's back. He must be... Uh, Rod, where the heck are you... Yes? Oh. oh excuse me, ma'am. I-, I was looking for Rod Talbert. My name's Olivia. Oh, I'm Murdoch Ross. I- I- I'm the county sheriff in these parts. I just dropped by to check on Rod's cabin since he's been gone. Would you like to come in? Well, is Rod here? He went for a walk. He'll be back soon. Oh. Thank you. I, uh... I, I was just trying to get a fire going in the fireplace. I'm not very good at it. Well, you don't have enough kindling. And, and those logs, that, that's hardwood. You ought to use something like birch or popple. Thank you. I guess it'll take me a while to learn everything. I'm going to have to know. Say, uh, excuse me for asking, but uh, are you a friend of Rod's? I'm his wife. His wife? I never knew Rod was married. He wasn't. We were married yesterday. <laughs> Where? Down in the city. Well, I that's something. All these years, Rod's had a girlfriend and never said a word. Of course, he's not the kind to share confidence. No, in. we only met two weeks ago. But two weeks? <laughs> well, I guess it does seem a little strange, but we were attracted to each other right off. It just seemed the natural thing. There. Is the fire better now? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. You want me to light it? No, I want to do things for myself. I've lived all my life in the city. Everything's so safe and predictable there. <laughs> sure is funny. What is? <laughs> Rod getting married. I don't know anyone who's more of a loner than him. You know what we call him? The Great Gatsby of the Northwoods. No one knows where he's from or why he came to live up here. How long has he lived here? Oh, let's see, it's nearly seven years now. <laughs> Strange fellow. But of course, he must have told you a few things about himself. No. <laughs> I fell in love with his eyes. <laughs> his eyes? Yeah. Sounds silly, I guess, but it's true. I was working as a waitress. Not much future in that. I must have seen a hundred people a day sitting at that counter. Then Rod came in. Other men had looked at me that way, but with Rod it was different. He didn't say much at first, but he kept coming back. He never stopped looking at me. Then he started telling me about this cabin and the lake and the woods. It all sounded so beautiful. I never would have figured when he disappeared like that three weeks ago... He'd gone to town to get himself a wife. (laughs) Say, you got that fire going pretty good now. Uh, Listen, I I don't want to stick around here on your your honeymoon. Uh, You tell Rod I'll be by to see him tomorrow. Is something the matter? Well... What is it? I'm afraid Rod's got a problem with some of the folks around here. Really? But we're so isolated here. There's not another house within a mile. Yeah, well, like I say, Rod's a real loner. He just don't seem to like other people. He's got a habit of running trespassers off his land at gunpoint. Rod does that? Yeah. One neighbor in particular, a fellow named Shep Taylor, kept a dog. Uh, Rod claimed he could hear the barking through the woods. He was always making threats. And then about a month ago, just before Rod disappeared, someone poisoned the dog. And it died? Yep. Yeah. Anyhow, now Taylor's gone out and bought himself a new dog, and, well, I don't want any more trouble. Maybe now that we're married, all that will change. Yeah, maybe. (laughs) Let me pay visits to the neighbors. When there's so few people around, it's silly not to get along. Well, there's, uh, Shep Taylor and a widow named Mrs. Booker. She's kind of a hermit herself. And then down the road in the other direction is, uh, Leo Hertel. He's from the city, too, He was a professor of psychology at the university uh, until he decided to drop out of society and come up here. He sounds interesting. Yeah, he's got a whole cabin full of books. (laughs) Well, it's going to be a cool evening. You ought to sleep good up here. I'll walk you to your car. It's nearly dark. I wonder where Rod is. He didn't say where he was going. He said he needed to go into the woods for a while. You're not afraid of being left alone, are you? Oh, no. This is an adventure. Oh! Oh! What's that? Oh, that's a loon. You'll hear them a lot up here. What a lonely sound. Now, good night, Mrs. Talbert. 
Good night, Sheriff. What did he want? Rod. What was Murdoch doing here? He came by to check on the cabin. You should have seen his face when I answered the door. Why was he checking the cabin? To make sure everything was all right, I guess. He seems like a very nice man. He's okay. I'm glad you're back. Where did you go? Just walking. Through the woods, down by the lake. You love it out here, don't you? Yeah. I think it's even more beautiful than you described. Look at the autumn colors. And not another house in sight. Oh, what's that? Ah, damn. Rod, what's the matter? That sounded like it came from Taylor's place. Rod, the sheriff said Mr. Taylor had a dog that was poisoned. So I heard. He said he's bought another. But it's not so bad. You can barely hear it. Let's go inside and make some supper. And then get some sleep. Good morning. Good morning. I just leave. Oh, I don't know. I feel tired. Here, spice some water in your face. Oh, oh, it's cold. <laughs> oh, I don't know why I don't feel more rested. The sheriff said the cool air here knocks one right out. Well, uh, maybe it just takes getting used to. Hello. Oh, who's that? Leo Hertel. He's an old professor who moved up here a few months ago. Oh, yes. The sheriff told me about him. Morning, Rod. Hello, Leon. Is this your new bride? <laughs> News travels fast. Well, not really. Murdoch stopped in to see me last night on his way back to town. My name's Olivia. I am pleased to meet you. You had breakfast yet, Leon? I know. Would you like to join us? Now that I've had my morning constitutional, I'd be delighted. Uh-huh. Who's this? It looks like the sheriff again. Oh, well, this is becoming quite the gathering place. Getting married certainly brings changes, huh, Rod? Well, what could the sheriff be doing out here at this hour? He said he wanted to speak to you about Mr. Taylor and his dog. Good morning, everyone. Rod, Mr. Talbert. Fisher? Morning, Murdoch. Out a bit on the early side, eh? Shep Taylor's been murdered. What? Oh, no. What happened? He was found in his bed, bludgeoned to death. Otis Thompson came up from the lumber yard to make a delivery about seven this morning. He knocked, and when there was no answer, he went on in. Oh, that's terrible. I thought he'd got himself a new watchdog. Yeah. Wasn't any good, huh? The dog is dead, too. Labrador retriever. Fully grown. Strangled. Wow. So who did it? Yeah, I don't know yet. No idea. Thought since your property lies next to his, you might have heard or seen something last night. Not me. I was sleeping like a lawn. And Miss Talbert? I didn't sleep very well, but I wasn't awake. At least I didn't hear anything that I can remember. Maybe something disturbed you? I don't know. Thing is, whoever it was didn't come up by Taylor's Road. There are no fresh tracks except from Thompson's lumber truck. And the only other way to Taylor's cabin... Is along the path that cuts through your property, Rod. I told you, Sheriff, I didn't hear anything. I didn't see anything. You think perhaps it was the hunter? Yeah, deer season doesn't open officially until tomorrow. Well, it could have been a poacher. Yeah, poachers don't generally leave trails. That's the problem. Now, I'm going back into town to file a report. You want to lift back to your place, Professor? Yes, um, uh, Talbot's asked me to stay for breakfast, but uh, I think maybe I should just take a rain check. Suit yourself, Leo. Of course. Uh, Mrs. Talbot, I I'm sorry about this. It's not a very pleasant introduction to our community. Oh, Rod, this is awful. It's happened before. What do you mean? Seems like every five years or so, someone goes berserk around here. Why? Not enough to do. Cabin fever. Doesn't it bother you that that poor man is dead? Why should it? I couldn't stand the guy.
Professor Hertel? Hmm? Oh, Miss Talbot. Oh, what a pleasant surprise. Am I disturbing you? No, no, I was just sitting out here reading an old book, but uh, a visitor around here, that's an event. Can I talk to you? Certainly. Is uh, something the matter? The sheriff said you used to be a professor of psychology. Yes. What is it? It's about Rod. I'm worried. I'm... I'm beginning to think maybe I don't really know him at all. We got married so quickly, but he seemed like the kind of person one could trust. He's certainly a good-looking fellow. But I think I've made a mistake, Professor. A terrible, terrible mistake. It may seem out of place at this point to quote the famous American humorist George Ade. But he once observed that those who marry to escape one thing usually find something else. However dull Olivia thought the routine she was shedding when she came under the spell of Rod Talbot, she may well have stepped into a situation even less desirable. Far less desirable. In fact, deadly. Mystery Theater will return with Act Two shortly. If you were ever arrested, to whom would you make your one phone call? If you were in trouble, to whom would you turn for help? What if you were far away from friends and family, far away from anyone you knew and could trust? What if, for example, you were in a lonely rural community where everyone was a stranger to you? And the most strange of all was the person who had brought you there, the person You had married. You think you've made a mistake, Mrs. Talbot? What kind of mistake? I don't think I should have come up here. I don't think I should have married Rod. I don't know what got into me. Got into you? The very first time I saw him staring at me, his his gaze locked into me. I felt like I had no willpower of my own. I couldn't think clearly. It was as if I was under his control. I can understand that. He's a very good-looking man. I often wondered why he never got married before now. No, it's more than just his looks. He has some kind of power. Oh, it sounds to me like you're talking about love. No. And if you are, I'm afraid you're talking to the wrong person. I've never been married. I was so obsessed with my experiments and researches into the mind, I realized I was working myself into an early grave. That's why you moved here? Yes, this forest primeval, as Longfellow would call it is the furthest extreme imaginable from the bustle of university life. And now, at last, I'm free. But the murder of Mr. Taylor... I know. Shocking. Tragic. Didn't you notice yesterday when the sheriff came by and told us about it that that Rod seemed totally unmoved by that man's death? Rod's not an easy person to get to know, and I haven't known him that long. I've only lived here a few months. But you don't think he killed Taylor, do you? I don't know what to think. All of a sudden, he seems so cold. Oh! Oh, that sound. The cry of the loon. It's so lonely. The Indians used to say the cry of the loon was like the cry of a woman lost in the woods. I'm beginning to know that feeling. Are you frightened? Yes. And tired. I slept so restlessly again last night. Doesn't that mean something? My my subconscious telling me what a terrible mistake I've made? Mrs. Talbot, I have been observing your husband. Frankly, he fascinates me. And I think I can tell you something about him. Please. He is what we psychologists call a dominant personality. What does that mean? A law of nature demands that human beings, just like any other animal species, have a pecking order, an order of dominance. It's been clinically proven that there is a small percentage of people who have the ability to lead others, to control them. These are people to whom the rest of us just naturally defer. Why? It could be due to any number of causes. Superior will, a stronger sense of purpose, but the point is... I don't think you need to worry that Rod has cast any mysterious sort of spell over you. But do you think he killed Mr. Taylor? 
I mean, if they were enemies, if, if Taylor was getting on his nerves. If Rod is one of those dominant people, he wouldn't like it very much if his will was thwarted, would he? No. Has he ever told you anything at all about his past? No, he never discusses it. Why does he want such complete isolation from other people? And if he does, why did he marry me? You're not thinking of leaving, are you? What if he plans to kill me, too? I think we're jumping to conclusions. You say you're frightened. Under the circumstances, I can't blame you, but I think there's someone who's even more frightened than you. Rod? Yes. I think he senses the power he has to exercise this remarkable influence over others. And I think it terrifies him. And that's why he tries to live as far away from others as possible? And why he never speaks of his previous life? Possibly. But if he's in hiding, if he did something... The point is, he went down to the city, he found you, he married you. To me, that's the behavior of a man who wants to change, to make a new start. But then why? You do love him, don't you? I don't know. You have some feeling for him. Yes. But that poor Mr. Taylor... Mrs. Talbot, Shep Taylor's dog, a full-grown Labrador retriever, was physically strangled. Do you really think Rod could do such a thing? I... I've heard stories about people going crazy and, and... and doing things like that. If you were married to a psychopath, I think you'd know it. But I understand your fear. Perhaps... You would feel safer back in the city. No. I'm not going to give in that quickly. Mrs. Talbot, are you all right? You and Rod aren't the only ones who had their reasons for coming here. I'd better be getting back. Maybe I should walk with you through the woods? Thanks. But if I'm going to stay, I'd better get used to walking the woods alone. You understand, of course, that I have a purely selfish interest in wanting you to stay. Thank you. Professor Hertel, does Rod like you? I hope so. Why do you ask? The sheriff said it wasn't just Mr. Taylor. Rod's never been friendly towards anyone who lives nearby. But yesterday morning, he asked you to stay for breakfast. Well, Murdoch is fond of exaggerating. It's a habit with people up here when there's not much excitement. Rod's just like anyone else. He's a fine fellow if you treat him right. Morning, Mrs. Talbert. Sheriff. Pardon my coming on in. It's getting a bit chilly this time of year to wait around outside. I didn't expect you. I, I didn't see your car. Oh, it's parked down by the main road. I came up through the woods. Is Rod here? No. I was just waiting for him myself. Certainly doesn't like spending much time indoors, does he? No. Have you got any idea where he might be? When I awakened this morning, he was already up and gone. Uh, maybe he went hunting. Hunting? Now, the deer season opened today. Rod's real fond of stalking game. He didn't say anything to me about it last night. He just, uh, up and disappeared, huh? I guess he's still used to living alone. Yeah. yeah. I guess so. Why are you here? Because, Mrs. Talbert, there's been another murder. What? Yeah, I found the body this morning. Was it... Was it someone who lived nearby? No. No, this one was a hunter from the city. Oh. Made camp down by the river on the other side of the road. Oh, but... But that land... That's the land that Rod owns. Yep. Was this man shot? No. No, he died the same way Taylor did. Bludgeoned. Obviously by a person of great strength. Now, some other hunters going up river by boat spotted him at dawn this morning. I'm sorry. Well... I'm a mite more than that. Where is Rod, Mrs. Talbert? I don't know. I told you he wasn't here when I woke up. Where were you just now? I, um... I went to see Professor Hertel. A social call? He's a very nice man. Hmm. Is there anything you care to tell me, Mrs. Talbert? About what? Two murders in two nights. Don't have to tell you how it looks, do I? No. No. Now, I know Rod doesn't like trespassers, Mrs. Talbert. Oh, neither do I. But the penalty for trespassing is ordinarily not death. 
Do you have proof that Rod did it? No, no, nothing, nothing concrete. There's no smoking gun, as we say. That's why I'm here. Are you a heavy sleeper? I don't know. Why? Yesterday morning, you complained you had a bad night. Yes. And how about last night? Why? I just thought you might have been kept awake by Rod's comings and goings. That's not fair. You have no proof against him. Why are you defending him, Mrs. Talbert? Why? That's what you're doing, you know. And it's real odd, because if your husband is guilty, the one person who ought to have the most to fear is you. Hello. Ron. Where have you been all day? Out. Where? I was doing a little fishing over on the river. The river? Got us nice bass for supper. Oh, uh, but I don't know how to cook it. I'll show you. Get some scallions and uh, basil from the garden while I clean it. Rod, uh, could could we sit for a moment and have a talk? What about? About us? I mean, about why we got married? Sure. We really don't know very much about each other. We know what we see. What else is important? But what about your past? Where are you from? That doesn't matter. What made you decide to come and live up here? I don't like crowds. I don't like being dependent on others. Were you ever married before? Why? A woman likes to know things like that. Why? What difference does it make? Were you? Olivia, we'll get along fine if certain doors just remain shut. Why did you use that image? What image? About doors staying shut. What's the matter with it? It's like the story of Bluebeard and his castle with the door he tells his wife never to open. The door to the room where the bodies of all the other women he's married and murdered are. What's the matter with you? You crazy or something? If you don't like people, why did you marry me? I don't talk about feelings. Okay? How come you're so nervous anyway? If I'd known you were going to be so nervous, I never would have picked you. Rod, there was another murder last night. What? Down by the river, on your land. The sheriff was here. He wants to see you. He thinks I did it. Does he? Yes. Huh. I don't know anything about it. But I can tell you this much. I didn't do it. Now, come on. I'll show you how to cook this fish. And then we can go to sleep. you to go to the professor's cabin this time, Olivia, and I want you to kill him just the way you killed the others, and then you will come back here to bed. Do you understand? Do you understand? Farewell contentment, farewell the quiet life. So said Desdemona when she realized she was hopelessly in love with the charismatic Othello. Olivia Talbot might well echo her words, for she too seems 
to have come under the spell of a powerful man. But if Rod has indeed mesmerized her in order to use her to create for himself a perfect solitude, then her plight is even more desperate than the fair Venetians. For at least Desdemona was able to enter into her marriage with her eyes wide open. Mystery Theater will return with our conclusion in a few moments. It is said that there is nothing new under the sun, but under the moon, oh, that's a different matter. The moon, Luna, was once believed to be the cause of insanity. It was said to control the dark, irrational side of man's nature. Today we know that isn't true. The only connection the moon has to the irrational forces in our story is that it is shining fitfully down on Olivia Talbot as she walks along a desolate country road. Hey! Hey! Hold it up there! Who is that? Mrs. Talbot! Mrs. Talbot! Yes? What the heck are you doing out here? I'm going to see the professor. Leo? Leo Hertel, yes. Do, do you know what time it is? It's past midnight. I was just making a final patrol before heading back to town. That's nice. Say, you, you aren't in trouble, are you? Excuse me. I must keep going. Uh, no, wait. What are you doing out here in your nightgown? Uh, aren't you cold? Thank you. No. Mrs. Talbert, are you all right? Mrs. Talbert, wake up! Wake up! Uh, what? Uh, oh, oh, Sheriff. Where am I? You're out in the middle of the road, and it's oh. one o'clock in the morning. Oh, it's cold. Here, here. Uh, take my jacket. Oh, how did I get here? You look like you were walking in your sleep. Here, okay, get into the car. Oh, oh uh, no, I, I don't think I should. Uh, why not? I, I, I shouldn't. Uh, come on, come on. It'll warm you up. There. Uh, slide on over. That's it. There. Uh, feel better? I, I feel nervous. Tell me, has this ever happened to you before? Uh, walking in your sleep? Uh, uh, I don't think so. What's that thing you've got in your hand? What? Oh. Uh, oh. Uh, what is it? It's a whetstone. With a wooden handle. Kind you'd use on a large blade. Let me see. Oh, it's, it's so heavy. What was I doing with it? The uh, question is, where did you get it? I don't know. Seems to me I recollect Rod having a whetstone like this. There's a tool shed behind our cabin, but Rod keeps it locked. You think you could have opened that lock in your sleep? No, I couldn't have done it because I don't know where he keeps the key. Mrs. Talbert... Why were you going to see Leo Hertel? Was I? That's what you said before I shook you awake. Why should I be going to the professor's house in the middle of the night? And with that implement in your hand. Sheriff, you don't think that I... Now that Taylor is dead, Leo is Rod's closest neighbor. But I like him. But what about Rod? Rod likes him, too. I mean, he, he certainly doesn't have anything against him the way he did with Taylor. You heard him the other day. He even asked him to stay for breakfast. I don't pretend to know what goes on inside that man's head, Mrs. Talbert. You don't think that Rod... But... But what... What did he do? Uh... Hypnotize me? Oh, that's not possible, is it? I don't know. I don't know what goes on these days anymore. I think you're making a mountain out of a molehill. If you're suggesting that I'm susceptible to hypnosis and that Rod has been using me to kill people. Would you like me to take you into town? Now? What for? Well, maybe you'd feel safer. I'm not afraid. You could stay with us, huh? Have my wife make up a bed for you. No. I want to go back to Rod. Why? I want to be with him. Look, Mrs. Talbot... I'm not afraid of him. Please take me home, Sheriff. That's where I belong. 
That's where I want to be. Come in. Professor? Murdoch. Is that you? Yeah. Oh, uh, just a second. I'll turn on the light. Sorry to wake you up at this hour. I think there may be a new development on the murders. Oh, no. Has someone else been killed? No. But if I'm right, there almost was. Who? You. Me? I found Olivia Talbert walking along the road just now. She said she was headed here. Mrs. Talbert. Look, I need your help, Leo. If I'm the next victim, you've got it, but... Mrs. Talbot. Uh, she seemed to be in some kind of a trance. And when I snapped her out of it, she acted confused. At first I thought she might have been sleepwalking. But then I noticed she was carrying a heavy whetstone. You mean something that could have been used as a weapon? Yes. Oh, dear. This is most distressing. I never would have believed. You think she was just pretending to be sleepwalking then? No. No, I think she was in a trance, all right. She wasn't properly dressed against the cold, but didn't bother her until I woke her up. Now, what I think is, Rod has been hypnotizing her. Well, that's a pretty fantastic proposition, Murdoch. Well, that's what I want to know. Now, you're a professor of psychology. I was. Is that kind of thing possible? Yes, theoretically, I suppose. It would depend on the powers of the dominant person and the suggestibility of the subject. But whoever's killing these people would have to be strong as an ox. Taylor's dog was strangled. Subjects often exhibit supernormal strength while under hypnosis. If that's what Rod's been doing, it's an impressive achievement. Uh, that's a purely clinical appreciation, of course. Where's Mrs. Talbot now? Well, she insisted I take her back to Rod's cabin. Really? Even though she realized what's happening? Yeah. I'm worried about her. On the other hand, if I'd taken her into town with me like I wanted to, I'd probably never be able to build an airtight case against Rod. How are you going to do that? Well, if you'll help me. Of course. I'm very fond of Mrs. Talbot. I don't want anything to happen that would hurt her. I'm going to go by there first thing in the morning. Now, I want you to appear while I'm there. If Rod thinks you're dead... And then sees you. Well, will you do that? What time? I'll get there at ten of eight. You come by at eight o'clock sharp. Olivia. Olivia. You returned much too quickly. I know. Did you do what I asked you to? I tried. Is the professor dead? No. Why not? I didn't go all the way to his cabin. You didn't listen to me. I don't want people around me. I want to be rid of all of them. Do you hear me? Yes. I want you to go out again, Olivia. Now. And this time, I don't want you to fail. Come in, Olivia. I've been expecting you. I'm here. I'm glad. I had no way of knowing how many nights it would be before Rod would send you to me. Do you know why you're here? To kill you. Very good. I can't tell you how excited I am. This is my ultimate triumph. For years, I have studied and experimented for this moment... And now, at last, it has come. Do you want me to kill you now? Oh, no, you're not going to kill me, Olivia. And do you know why? 
because I am the one who really controls you. Rod is only a middleman. Do you understand? Do you realize what I have achieved? What? A month ago, I brought Rod under my power and ordered him to find someone like you. I have accomplished the ultimate feat of mind control. The absolute mastery of another human being. That makes me very happy. Anybody can hypnotize a suggestible person face to face. But to be able to invest that person with hypnotic powers of his own, to order him to find his own subject and order that subject to commit murder, I have achieved something that anyone in my profession will tell you is impossible. But I have done it. I'm the dominant personality behind all this. Do you want me to kill you? Of course not. How obedient you are. What do you want me to do? It is time to bring my experiment to a safe conclusion. I am going to give you a gun. Yes. What do you want me to do with it? You and Rod are murderers, Olivia. You are evil people. Do you understand me? I want you to return to Rod's cabin. I want you to shoot Rod and then yourself. Once this is done, you will be forgiven. Thank you. I understand. I know you do. And now, Olivia, goodbye. You may go now. Hold it, Leo. What? Don't move, either of you. Murdoch. I had second thoughts about leaving Mrs. Talbert alone with Rod. So I went back, just in time to see her leaving the cabin again. And you followed her? That's right, Leo. And I heard it all. Mrs. Talbert, you can put that gun on the table now. Mrs. Talbert? Leo, tell her to put that gun down before she hurts herself. Olivia, point your gun at the sheriff. Leo! Do as I say. Yes? Leo, tell her to lower that gun. Squeeze the trigger, Olivia. Squeeze it. Yes. No! At him, not... That nice man. Mrs. Talbert, will you give me that gun now? Are you all right? Oh. Oh, what have I done? He's dead. Do you know what happened? Yes. He told me I had to earn my forgiveness. Do you remember killing the others now? Yes. It's all so frightening. It's over now. It's all over. Oh. But the frightening thing isn't. The frightening thing will never be over. Huh? What's that? That I have such strength inside me. That I have such strength. I'll be back shortly with a final thought. At the final moment, Olivia Talbert turned her gun on the very man who seemed to have her under his total control. For there was one fact of human nature that Leo Hertel forgot. One fact that all his work discipline and evil power could not change. No person can will another to act indefinitely in contradiction to his nature. Our cast included Roberta Maxwell, Ralph Bell, Gordon Heath, and Charles Irving. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams.
Welcome. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. So many of you write me letters asking for stories of the occult, of strange death and wandering ghosts, of gothic horrors and unimaginable terrors. Yet, others write for a love story. It's much too simple and gentle an emotion to belong on Mystery Theater. Or is it? After all, it was love that inspired Victor Herbert's song, Our Sweet Mystery of Life. To reinforce that, here is a love story that is not so much of this life, but more the one beyond. Marta's got to retire, Max. Retire? One of the foremost concert pianists in the world? Her heart won't stand the strain anymore. Julie, Julie, she can't afford to retire. <laughs> With all the money she's made? It's all been spent looking for him. But her husband is dead. Everyone else realizes that, except Marta Daninov. Our mystery drama, Love After Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Ralph Bell and Norman Rose. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Among the company of the great romantic pianists, the Chopins, the Rubensteins, and all the other towering geniuses, no name shone more brightly, although relatively briefly, than that of Marta Daninov. Perhaps audiences were unduly affected by this wisp of a woman whose thundering crescendos seemed a physical impossibility and whose delicate pianissimos were marvels of projected whispers. What made this fair little woman able to run this gamut of romantic emotions? The banked-up fires of a raging and enduring love that tragedy and disaster and separation could never quench. Marta is magnificent tonight, Julie. Magnificent. I don't know where she finds the strength, Mr. Frank. Oh, bank fires. It comes from within. She's a true romantic. Her soul overcomes her body. But how much longer can it? What do you mean, Julie? Well, she's ill. Much sicker than she'll ever admit. It's sheer willpower that keeps her going. Well, it has been all her life. Well, if you care about her life, you've got to talk her into retiring. I have to? Well, you're her manager. Who well, else? You're her secretary. You're closer to her than anyone. Well, the only one she'll listen to is you. No, no, no. All she will listen to is her heart. And her heart can no longer stand the strain. Oh, please, Mr. Brick. Convince her to retire before it's too late. There is no way I can do it, Julie. She can't afford to anyway. What? With all the money she's made? It's all been spent looking for him. She won't give up, so she has to work to keep on the quest. But he's dead. He must be dead long ago. Everyone realizes that. Except Madame Danino. Matt, forgive me, Mr. Breck. Oh, come, come. You should have been calling me Max long ago, Julie. Leave it that way, would you? All right, Max. But look, if she doesn't give up this hopeless romantic belief, I... I think she will be dead. Now, you, you've just got to make her face the truth. Yes, you're right. All right, I'll try again. <gasps> this time, I really will try. <laughs> She's coming to the end. Why can't she settle for that? The only real love she's ever had. Uh-huh. You didn't know Andre Danino for husband. That was the real love. It's what she pours out on an audience since he is no longer with her. Tonight was good, wasn't it? You've never been better, Martin. Hm. Superlative. <sighs> Strange. I felt he was there. I have never felt it so strongly that Andre was there. Marta, will it never be time for you to forget him? Never. There 
has to be a time. You cannot live in a dream world forever. Whatever world I live in, so long as I shall live, it will be a world that contains Andre and forever after. You're killing yourself, Martin. You need a rest. I can't rest. I shall never rest unless I find him. I know you don't believe he is alive. Nobody does but me. But I shall prove you all wrong in the end. Ah, has there been any other news? No. No. Then we will have to start all over again. You haven't time for this, Marty. Have a tour to complete and very heavy bookings for next year. Oh, there'll be some time for a rest in between. <laughs> a rest. Wasn't it wonderful that summer in England? The last one together. No, 46. We were so sure that disaster was all behind us. And the whole world was young again. Oh, why did Andre have to go home? It meant a lot to his career. And he was a patriot. Artists have no business in politics. He wasn't really political. He just wanted to play for his own people. And like all of us, with the war over, he thought that was the end of dictatorship. That we were all free. But they cancelled his visa to leave. I should have gone with him. Oh, Marta, you couldn't. You were already carrying Stefan. I know. Andre would never have forgiven me if they got their clutches on his son. Yes, or his wife. Oh, I wasn't of any value to them then. He was the recognized artist. But he would no longer play for them. Not for their political gain. So, he was eliminated. Yes, eliminated. Not killed. You know that once I started to make my name, I was contacted and told that... If I came home, they would free him from prison. Well, they offered you no real proof he was alive. And you didn't. The decision was made. So leave the past alone, Marta. I can't. I can't, Max. I will never believe he's dead. You think they would have hesitated to kill him or starve him? It was announced that he had died in 59. There has been no word of him in nearly 20 years. I still know he is alive. <laughs> For all your protestations. I think in your heart of hearts you too believe he is still alive. Or could be. Oh, now how can you say I believe that? I am a woman as well as an artist. Oh, I know many things. I know you. If you were sure in your own soul that Andre was dead, you would not have accepted being just my manager. Marta, he was my friend. I couldn't dream... Well, of course I love you. Why deny the truth? There is nothing you could hide from me, Max Breck. You lied to me, didn't you? When you said there was no news. Yes. The one we traced all the way to Canada. Yes. He may have crossed over into the States. The detective agency thinks they may have found him in Buffalo. Oh, Where? I will go to him. Slowly, slowly, Marta, please. It's only a vague possibility. And you are due for an important concert in New York tomorrow. We could fly by way of Buffalo. You know, that is not possible. The schedule is tight enough as it is. You've got to leave for New York tomorrow morning. Well, I I, I will cancel the booking. Carnegie Hall? You can't. It's too late. The whole future rides on it. And this may be just another dead end. I won't go unless you follow it up. All right. All right. If you promise no interviews tonight, straight to bed. Oh. And fly with Julie tomorrow morning so you can rest in New York before the concert. You have my promise, if I have yours, that you will go yourself. You are the only one besides me who can tell if it is really Andre. What a godforsaken neighborhood. Uh, yes. Uh, Father Quinn? Uh, that'd be me. Who's wanting me? I left my spectacles off. You wouldn't know me. My name is Max Breck. Uh, could I uh, step in and ask you a few questions? Now, if it's about the plaster repair on the altar, all in good time, man. We're a poor parish here, and it all has to go through the diocese, you see. But you've got to know the church is good for it, and I'll not be done anymore. Uh, no, I, I want nothing from you, Father Quinn, except information. 
Ah, oh, oh, well then, step in, step in. We're very strong on information here at St. Pancras. Uh, what instruction will you be seeking, Mr. Breck? It's about, uh, uh, Peter Dan. I understand he's a janitor here. Peter Dan has sought the sanctuary of this church. Now, he's a man who's suffered much and deserves to be left alone. It's like I told the other one of you nosing around here and upsetting a man. If he's committed some crime or other, let the police come fair and square. But I'll have none of you private eyes or whatever you are bothering him to death. Now he's about to find a little peace at last. Are you the police? No, no, I'm not. Uh, is Peter Dan his real name, Father? It's the name I accept him by. It wouldn't... It couldn't be... Andre Daninov, by any chance. That's what the other one asked. I'd give you the same answer. I don't know. Now, here's the door, for I mind no one's business with my own. I only want to see him for a few moments, Father. If he's not the man I'm looking for, I'll leave him alone. Please, please, Father, uh, close the door for a moment. Well... I promise you, if you just let me see Peter Dan, I'll know if he's the man I'm looking for. And if he is? I don't just want to help him close the door on his past, you see. I know how tragic that has been. I, I want to open the door to his future and the life and the love he deserves, and that's waiting for him. Oh. Well, now, uh, Mr. Breck, you impressed me as having Peter's interest at heart, but you still have to convince me. Come on in by the sitting room and we'll have a cup of tea, and you'll tell me why you're looking for him. If all you tell me is true, why wouldn't this Andre Daninov, once he escaped from his illegal confinement and found his way to America, go back to his wife? I can't answer that, Father. I don't know. You'd think at least he'd want to see the son he'd never seen. Well, that's no longer possible. Why not? Madame Daninov became an Israeli citizen in 1967 at the age of 21. Her son, a pilot was shot down and killed in the Six-Day War. Oh, Mary in heaven, God's will is so often difficult to fathom. It is indeed. Still, still, it's not for the likes of us to question. I won't debate the point, Father. I only know that a woman I have admired for the best part of my life has suffered enough. And if there is a way to ease the end of a life, I intend to fight for her right to that relief. Ah, uh, you're... You're a good man, Mr. Brennan. No, I doubt that, Father. But my motives in this, I hope, are pure. I'm sure they are. So, will you tell me where I can find Andre? Well, I mean, the man you know as Peter Dan. Uh, I'll, I'll take it to him. Now, forgive me, tis not all curiosity. Just one other thought before we go. Suppose it turns out this is your man. But he wants to be left alone and not go back to his old life. That is a bridge I've been waiting to cross as long as I can remember. Ah, I... Mm -hmm. Well, let's go cross it together. Is he far from here? No further than the sound of yon piano. He's at his morning practice. I wouldn't dream of interrupting it. Except for something as important as this. Is this the end of a 30-year-old search? Is Max Breck about to meet his old friend face to face again? And if so, what will be the result of that meeting? Why would Andre Daninov refuse to return to his wife? What ghost could haunt his freedom and still hold him a prisoner? Mystery Theater will return shortly with Act Two. From a shabby old house that is Father Quinn's living quarters, the older man leads Max Breck into the musty and shadowed church. The freshly painted walls of the altar stand out in bold relief against the peeling paint and patched plaster of the body of the church. The two men cross the transverse, 
to the other side of the altar. You'd find the man I know as Peter Dan behind John door. He, on second thought, in case he should turn out to be the man you seek, I, I don't know if I want him to know me as his, his betrayer. I mean him no harm, Father. And I truly believe you mean that, Mr. Blake. But that doesn't mean you may not bring it to him. Well, how? In what way? Whoever he may be, the man at that piano has found his peace, whoever and whatever he may have been. I think he would prefer to forget. We don't know that, Father Quinn. No, we don't. You said it was a bridge you would cross if you came to it. I did. Well, I'm backing out on joining you. Instead, I'll be saying a little prayer that it all comes out right for everyone concerned. Andre, it's Max. Max Breck, you know me. No, no you, you have the wrong man. I am... I, I, I am not the secret police. I'm a friend. For 33 years, we have been searching for you, Martin and me. I'm not the man you want. Not the man you named. Old friend, old friend. The years may have changed us, but I would know you anywhere. Just as you know me. I never saw you before in my life. Andre, it's no use. You knew me the moment you turned on that bench and jumped to your feet as if you were scared for your life. Why, Andre, why? I mean you no harm. Then go away and leave me. Now that I've found you at last? Never. What do you mean to do with me? Take you back to Martha. No. What? I cannot go back to her. Don't you see that I... I... Oh, Max... Max, you say that you are still my friend. Well, yes, of Then course. in the name of God, go. Go, leave me. Leave me alone as I am. Andre. Andre, I can't do that. Marta knows that I came here to try to find you. How? Well, she hired and paid for the detectives who tracked you down. Detectives? Why would she hire detectives to look for me? Because she loves you, and for every minute of every day of every year since your death was reported... She's never stopped believing that you were alive. Never stopped searching for you. It would have been better that she believed me dead. Why do you say that? Max. Max, look at me. What is left of me. I am surprised that you recognized me. It's been a long, terrible ordeal, Andre. But you've weathered it better than I or anyone could have dreamed. Why did they announce your death? There were five of us who escaped. It was beginning of winter. It was so cold your breath froze on your beard. Not even a rabbit would leave his burrow. They hunted us with dogs. But in the snow our scent was hard to follow and the wind drifted it across our tracks and wiped them out. After three days they left us on the plains to die. Four of us did. I was the only one to live on. On the fifth day, a gold miner coming down from the mountains to his winter quarters found me more dead than alive. He nursed me for three weeks in his cabin till I became rational again. By that time, from my ravings, he had learned most of my story. It was my great good luck he had as little love for the party and its bureaucrats as I have. With the help of a trapper, they, they smuggled me under the skins to a seaport. And from there, I managed to get by boat to Japan. It was not until nearly a year later when I reached Hong Kong and was able to hunt through back copies of the papers that I found I was supposed to be dead. Why didn't you get in touch with Marta? And let them know that I was still alive. But didn't you know that Marta pestered them so much and lined up so many prominent names and made such a racket in the UN about the circumstances of your death that she finally got them to issue a full pardon posthumously? Yes, 
I read that when I was in Israel. Well, why didn't you come forward then? I meant to. It's why I worked my way half across the world. To hear her play. To see her again. But you didn't. Oh, I, I heard her play. It was her first big concert in Tel Aviv. She was magnificent, a success fou. They would not let her off the stage. I remember her bowing and throwing kisses. How beautiful she was. Her young, with the whole world at her feet. And I knew, I knew I did not belong in her world anymore. So I, I never saw her. Oh, you fool. All the time her heart was empty for you. For what I had been, perhaps. Not what, what I have become. A man bitter, solitary, old, far before his time. An accident of failure, a nothing, a non-person. Oh, that is not true. I heard you when I came in. You still play. Oh, yes, I still play. On an instrument when I can, in my head when I cannot. What does that mean? Uh, all those years in the prisons, in the camps, on, on tramp ships as a seaman, in a thousand coolie labor jobs... Max, there was one thing that kept me alive, the music, the music. I could hear every note in my head. I could see it in my mind's eye, play it with my fingers on whatever surface I could press them against, a, a, a tough rail, a, a cell wall. And for most of the years since Stefan's death, the edge of any, any bar that did not throw me out on my ear. You know about your son, then? I... I only learned about him the month before he died. I never saw him. Oh, Max, why did... Why didn't she tell me before I left that summer? She was only thinking of you. You're the only man she ever thought of. That's why you have to come back to her. No, no, I cannot well, come back. Well, why on earth not? She's at the height of her success. She has the world at her feet. She's still in her fifties and radiantly lovely. I... I am a hundred years old in body and mind. I would drag her down. I can't. I won't do that. She should have someone young and vital. Like you, Max. In the name of heaven, have some compassion, man. Leave me alone. I may have nothing else, but I have a kind of peace here. Go, tell her you found out that I was shot trying to escape. Marry her yourself. She doesn't want me. She wants you. If she had me, she might as well have a ghost. I cannot do it. You must. You have to. What do you mean, I have to? Whatever you are is what Marta wants. She's dying, Andre. What? What? What do you mean she's dying, Max? No one knows just how ill she is except me. Not even a secretary worries about her overworking. Not even Marta herself. But if she rests, if she takes it easy... She'll never do that as long as you are missing. And to pay for the detectives that scour the world looking for you, she has to work harder and harder. It's a treadmill that's killing her. Oh, Max. Max, how long has she got? A month, a year. Well, not many more. Who knows? If she has the most important thing in the world she really wants... But, but it's foolish. It is romantic nonsense. Life is not young love. It is hard and bitter and, and unfair. And we cannot turn back the years. It would take a miracle to make it even a faded memory of what it was. But you know as well as I do, Andre, you've got to try. Well, you have not left me much choice. All right. I will try. But I still say it is a mistake. I, uh... Well, I, I, I haven't any money. Oh, it's the least of our problems. Go pack whatever you have to take with you while I make some plane reservations. It won't take long. I, I've learned to travel light. Oh, Max. I thought you'd never get here. I'm sorry, Jody. Plane was late. Uh, how's Marta? Oh, a nervous wreck. I, I've never seen her like this. Well, where's... Andre... Uh... He stopped to comb his hair or fix his handkerchief or something. He's a nervous wreck, too. Oh, we all are. You know, the house is almost in. We can't hold the curtain too much longer. I understand. 
Oh, maybe it would have been better if you'd let them talk on the phone before you flew in. Oh, don't blame me. Andre didn't want to, neither did Marta. I think it's better that they meet again first, face to face. Max? Yes? Uh, what's he, uh... What's he like? I, I mean, what does he look like? Like someone who's lived 30 years in hell. Spitting deep into his face. And pulls his shoulders down. But the worst part of all is what haunts his eyes. Oh, terrible. I, I don't know what Martha expects. I'd better go prepare her. I think you'd better. Even at best, I'm not sure she's going to be able to play the recital tonight. And I'll go right in before... Uh-uh. It's too late. Here he comes. That bent, wizened old man? That wizened old man was once tall and straight and young and bristling with talent. That's how she still pictures him. Andre, this way. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, oh, Max. That's all right. But we have to hurry. It's almost curtain time. Well, then perhaps we'd better wait until... No, 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 no. Marta's waiting anxiously. Oh, this is Julie Rand, Marta's secretary. How do you do? Mr. Deninov. What? Oh, yes, of course, that's who I am. Uh, here we are, Marta's dressing room. Marta, it's Max. Come in, Max. Andre, let me go in first. I thought you would never get here. Uh, where? He's is... here, Marta. He's right here, but uh, the house is waiting. Are you sure you want to see him before the recital? After 33 years, how much longer do you think I can wait? Of course, my dear. Come in, Andre. I'll leave you alone. Um. Andre. Marta. Across the gap of perhaps three feet, close enough to touch, they face each other, a frail and indomitable woman, a man bent and twisted, old before his time. Three feet, did I say? Or is that gap wider than a lifetime? Too far to bridge and lead them back to each other again. Mystery Theater will continue shortly with Act Three. There are some moments in all our lives when time stands still. The first kiss, whose magic you are afraid to break. The terrible news of some loved one's death. A moment of victory in a game. Or the terror of some nightmare from which you could not awake. The joy of something you have long anticipated turning out to be everything you imagined. Or the sick feeling in the pit of your stomach when you found it nothing but disappointment. This is such a moment for Marta and Andre. Andre. Marta. I have been waiting so long. You. You're just as beautiful as ever. And you. as handsome. Oh, no. No, that is not true. In my eyes, you are. You must be seeing me as I was then. I always see you as you were then. I always will. But, Marta, these lines, these wrinkles, my hair. Andre, what do you think I would be without my makeup? My hair rinse. I'm not a young girl anymore outside. But inside, I feel the same as the 23-year-old who kissed you goodbye. And seeing you again, all I see is the boy I never dreamed I was going to lose. Oh, Martha, darling. It's all right. It's all right, Andre. I'm all right. Just hold me. It, it, it 
been so long. So long. Too long. It's too late. I'll be no good for you. Oh, don't, don't say that, Andre. I need you now more than ever. I only want one promise from you. What? That you will never leave me again. It has been such a long fight. I'm so tired. I need your strength. There is not much left. They battered most of it out of me, and the last year since I escaped have drained what was left. I may not show it, Andre, but inside there's almost nothing of me left. I need you to lean on. It is your inner strength I need. Marta, the house is getting restless. Oh, give me just a moment longer, Max. You had better go, Marta. Not until I know I will find you here when I get back. I will be here. And you will stay. I will stay. Till death do us part? No. What? I have gone through enough. We have gone through enough in this life ever to be parted again. If death should take you first, I would follow right on your heels. And if God choose... I shall but love thee better after death. What? <laughs> Nothing. Just Elizabeth Barrett Browning's sonnet to her husband about how she loved him. Oh, Andre. Andre. Don't let anyone or anything take this away from us again. As heaven is my witness, I never will. I love you, Martha. I love you, Andre. I'm sorry, Martha. I'm but... coming, Max. Kiss me, darling. Martha. Oh, I am in heaven. This must be heaven. Oh, what a recital I shall give them tonight. Oh, my darling, I can't write you a love poem like Elizabeth Browning, but I can play you one. Will you be out front? Oh, yes, with Max. Then listen carefully. You will recognize my love song when I play it. We uh, can't keep them waiting any longer. Are you all right, Marta? Oh, I never felt more glorious in my life. Every note is for you, Andre. And especially in that one song. To our future, darling. Au revoir. Well, Andre, it looks as though congratulations are in order. A marriage has been rearranged. Yes. It is a miracle. If it lasts. Oh, come, what do you mean? I don't know. Just some premonition I cannot shake. You notice that this time, it was Martha who said goodbye. Why is she playing this? It's not on the program. It is a message to me. Message? Yes, in place of a sonnet. What? A love song. Just for me, you see. I... Martha! She's fainted! No. No, she has not fainted. She... She is dead. Julie, shut the door quickly. It's a madhouse here. Aren't they ever going to let up? Oh, eventually, I suppose. Why can't they let us alone? Julie, it's a great story. To be practical, the press and the media have every right to follow it up. You should hear some of the book offers, movie bids, heaven knows what else they've been bombarding my office with. All right, forget that for now. How is Andre today? Oh, no change. Still in his room? Oh, he hasn't come out of it since the funeral. Is he eating? Not really. Is he getting any sleep? I don't think so. Whenever I look in, he's just lying on his back, staring at the ceiling with his eyes so vacant. <laughs> Sometimes he's so still, I think maybe he's... What does the doctor say? If he doesn't snap out of it, he'll have to be hospitalized. At least there they can feed him intravenously. Well, let's hope it doesn't come to that. I'll go in and have a look at him. Hello, Andre. Andre... It's Max. Aren't you going to say hello? No. I'm better at saying goodbye. Oh, now come. You've got to snap out of this. By all means. I wish I knew the way to do it. 
Well, you won't get anywhere just by lying there. Max, do you know what I've been doing? I have been lying here, willing myself to die. I want to die, but I cannot make myself. All those years of hanging on, building, increasing my will to live just to spite those... Yeah, maybe they have the last laugh after all. Now that I want to die, the will to live is too strong to allow me to... Andre, listen to me. Suicide. Yes, that would be a way, you see. Only my religion does not allow that. So it appears I have to go on living, separated from Marta again. You've got to do something to help him, Max. I know that, Julie, but what? I don't know. If he just had some other interest to throw himself into, like Madame had after Stefan was killed. <laughs> she hadn't had her piano and her music. She'd have been... Uh, uh, uh. What is it, Max? Music. Music, of course, that might be it. Oh, wh where are you going? To see Charles Abelman at World Broadcasting. I think maybe he can make an offer that Andre just can't refuse. I have your word on this, Charlie? Absolutely. No hoopla, no exploitation. Just the facts simply and decently told in good taste. I have your word. Max, you don't need my word. This network is rebuilding its image. One of the programs we count on to do that is one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, I know. I've seen it, and I admire it oh, very thank much. Thank you. We don't want anything to change that picture for our audience. So you can count on that. All right. I think I can persuade Andre to do it. And you will allow him to play. At least 15 minutes. That's the deal. There has to be enough exposure so I can start building a career for him again. Fifteen minutes, that's a long time. Is, uh... Is he good enough? Can he still play? Oh, yes, I've heard him. Well, I, I think I ought to hear him first myself, Max, before I okay that. All right, I'll see what I can work out. But first, I have to sell the whole idea to Andre. I'll get back to you. Charles Abelman. Charlie, Max Brick. We're on for your show this week. Oh, that's great, Max. But uh, what about your promise I can hear, Mr. Danino? I've worked that out. You'll want to pick his own piano for the broadcast. So can you meet us at Steinman's tomorrow at 12 noon? It's right across from Connie Hall. And while he's trying out the pianos, I'll get him to play something for you. I promise you, you won't make the trip for nothing. <laughs> I don't know just why I am doing this, Max. You know why, Andre. You've got to have something to take your mind off what, what has happened. What a better thing to do than to go back to your piano. Carry on. For Marta. Now, you've got to make a living somehow. And you, you really think that I can make it play again? After what I heard in the church that first day, yes. All those years of dry playing on stone walls, on steel tables, the edge of my cot... Hearing the music only in my mind, all that kept me from going mad. It kept me alive. Was this what it was for? Or well, why not decide that it was? Oh, Max, I can't decide anything for myself. That's what I meant by I don't know why I am doing this. It is something inside me or outside and beyond me that is urging me to do it. What do you mean by that? I, I don't know. I told you once it would take a miracle to bring back the past. Maybe now I'm looking for one to bring me the future. I've never seen so many concert pianos in my life. Charlie, this is only one room. There are four others. Oh, no. We could be here all day. He tried every piano in this room and they didn't suit him. Now, don't tell me you'll go through all the others. Uh, yes, Julie, what is it? He's found one he likes. Where is he? In the back room. Oh, he's playing something. Come on, Charlie, if you want to hear this. And, oh, just a minute, Mr. Brick. What is it, Julie? Well, he, uh, he said he wanted to be alone for a minute. Well, we don't have to show ourselves. Well, maybe we should get back to him. He was, uh, well, strange. Strange how? Well, he smiled at me, and he, he looked sort of happy. And he said, do you believe in miracles, Julie? And when I didn't know what to answer, he said, I think I'm just about to. I don't know what that means. Hey, hold it a minute. By George. <laughs> Good enough for you, Charlie? Oh, it's magnificent. No, no, stop him. No, please don't. I want to hear more. Oh, we shouldn't interrupt it, You Julie. must. 
Don't you hear what he's playing? It's what Madame was playing uh, when uh, she... Julie, 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 take it easy. What's the matter? I don't know. I don't know. It's just... Don't let him stop him before he gets to that same phrase where... Oh, oh no. What happened? Oh, no. I don't know. Come on. He, he's on the floor. Just like me. Take care of it, Charlie. Is, is he... Andre. Is he... Andre. Andre, you, you all right? Oh, oh, yes. Yes. What happened? I... I suddenly found out how to pray. For me, it it is with music. So I asked God to to bring me to Martha. And he he turned his face on me again and worked worked a miracle to bring me home to my to my wife. Is is he dead? Yeah. What happened? Heart attack, debility, who knows? I'm not a doctor. Well, maybe God just called him home. What did he mean about a, a miracle? I think that he got what he wanted. Max? Yes, Julie? This piano he picked out... Yes, yes, yes. What about it? Well, look at the serial number. Why? This is the piano Madame de Ninoff was playing at the concert when she died. I'll be back shortly with a final thought. Max brought the bodies of Marta and Andre back to Israel, where they were buried beside their son's hero's grave. The stone above the grave reads, In memory of Marta and Andre Daninov, I shall but love thee better after death. That Max picked that quote was sheer coincidence, or was it maybe just another minor miracle? Our cast included Norman Rose, Ralph Bell, Evie Juster, and Ian Martin. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams. Come in. Welcome. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. When you strike at a serpent that hisses, you may only cause it to spring. That's rather sage advice when you come to consider it. But why is it so often disregarded? Why do people poke at snakes? Why don't people let sleeping dogs lie? Perhaps it's just as well, after all. If everyone always did the sensible thing, whatever would we do for stories? Miss Constant, didn't you say in front of many witnesses that you were going to kill Mr. Crawford? Well, sometimes you say something that Weren't you... Weren't you in his apartment at approximately the time of the murder? Well, I only went there to... And aren't your fingerprints on the knife that killed him? But there must be an explanation. There is. You're guilty of murder. The mystery drama, Everybody Does It, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Robert Dryden. I'll be back shortly with Act One. We're in one of those posh eating places where mediocre food is called by esoteric French names and customers pay exorbitant, even obscene prices to be treated like cattle by an arrogant, ill-mannered staff. And yet, they fight to get in. Why? 
Well, you know why. To rub shoulders with, or at least stare at, the celebrities. And who is here tonight? Well, at one table, we have the voluptuous, lovely, yet aging star, Margaret Constant. Nearby, Wilson Crawford, the illustrious critic. Wilson, aren't you going to say hello to Margaret? Perry, I'm no longer required to say hello to Margaret. But you should say hello to Margaret. Ah, uh, and why? To prove that you're civilized. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, what, what, what am I doing? <laughs> Wilson, you take me to dine at a place like this and I see you actually stealing packets of sugar. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> uh, stop laughing. I can't help it. <laughs> Perhaps the whole thing is my subconscious reaction or my adjustment to a new austerity. Oh, well, had I known you were strapped, I uh, would have suggested a more modest place. Yes, well, Perry, I asked you to dinner because I must have a serious talk with you. Oh, certainly. Uh, but first, you know, I think you should say hello to Margaret. I don't think so. For old time's sake? For old time's sake, for new time's sake, for all time's sake, I divorced the woman and that's an end to it. Nothing could persuade me to talk to Margaret. Well, I happen to know something that just might. Give it up, Perry. Margaret has signed to do a new play. That's no longer a personal concern. It's called St. Joan of Arc. I find it awkward to... St. Joan? Who's going to play St. Joan? Well, who are we talking about? Margaret. Oh, no, I won't permit it. A new drama. Joan of Arc? Yes, she goes into rehearsal next week. Well, we'll see about that. Excuse me. I will say hello to Margaret. Where do you come off playing Joan of Arc? Oh, good evening, Wilson. I won't have it. Won't you sit down? Oh, but just for a moment. I'm expecting someone important. What is this Joan of Arc nonsense? How have you been, Wilson? Have you lost your senses? I've regained them completely. The proof? I divorced you. You are going to play Joan of Arc? You're 50. 43. 54. I was being kind. You're going to play Joan of Arc with that voluptuous figure, those smoldering eyes, that voice? You're going to play Joan of Arc? Oh, this is going to be a Freudian interpretation. Oh, Margaret, who has overwhelmed your senses, seduced you with this delusion? Only the finest director in the world, Kavalevsky. Kav... <laughs> What, that charlatan? That genius. You hate him because you cannot intimidate him. A Freudian version of Joan of Arc. Margaret... Do not appear in this play. Run along, darling. It's garbage. It's self-indulgent trash. I'll tear it apart. Oh, ho, ho. reviewing it already. You haven't even seen it. I'll destroy it. We shall see. This will be Peter's masterwork and my greatest role. And everyone will acclaim it. Everyone but you. Joan of Arc. I suggest you open it in a burlesque house. Well, have you simmered down sufficiently? A woman's an absolute fool. So, what's to be done? Ah, uh, I have my own problems. Uh, Perry, would you pull over to the curb? I have to talk with you. I've been trying to broach the subject all night. Uh, what subject? Money. Money? I never worried about money. It was always enough and to spare... I made it, or Margaret made it. When we decided to part, I let her have everything. Oh, well, I thought you had a better lawyer than that. She's going to need it. She'll go broke trying to prove she's a serious actress. Well, now, I seem to be a bit short, and I was wondering if you could give me an advance. I thought I'd do a book of critical essays. Uh, I don't publish critical essays. They don't make any money. Now, a blockbuster bestseller with all the dirt and the inside theater gossip of the past 20 years? Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> We've had this discussion before. I couldn't write such a book. Well, thanks anyhow, Perry. 
I'll just have to scale down my style of living or work a little harder. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> would, uh, would you be interested in a rather, uh, lucrative special income? Oh, uh -huh, would I? Yeah, I, I can trust you, Wilson. And there's no reason why you shouldn't make some easy money. Easy money? Mm-hmm. I'm afraid that has an ominous sound. Oh, but it's really very simple. What would I have to do? Well, people like you and me, we travel constantly. Yes. And you're always flying to London to see the new plays. And I scour the continent for literary properties. Thus, we may perform a service for uh, certain people. What sort of service? A messenger service. The more I hear this, the less I like. Well, we are uh, eminently reputable people. Now, who would suspect us of anything or even think to watch us? Well, you, you're about to suggest some smuggling. Uh, uh, now, just consider that you're acting the part of a uh, confidential courier. Yeah, of course, it's dishonest. Well, of course. <laughs> But everybody does it. Everyone? Uh, you'd be surprised how many. People whose credentials are impeccable. But those people are thieves. Perhaps. But only a little bit. One cannot be a little bit of a thief. You are. Me? Yes. Don't you steal packets of sugar from restaurant tables? Oh, well, that... That isn't stealing. Uh, well, I suppose it's, it's all in the way you look at it. Well, how can you compare... Ah... Uh, You mind dropping me off at my place? Hmm. Well, I tried. Well, thank you, Perry, but I don't think I'd be interested. Ah, Mr. Crawford. Oh, uh, yes. What is it, Sefkins? Uh, shall you be having lunch at home, sir? Oh, I suppose so. Oh, Sefkins, I brought some sugar home last night. Yes, I'm aware of that. I emptied your jacket pockets this morning. Are you laughing at me? Oh, no, sir. No, sir. We have to tighten our belts. Any economy, no matter how small, is important. Uh, yes, sir. And if we're not required to purchase sugar over the course of a year, isn't that an important saving? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just pardon me, sir. Uh, Mr. Crawford's residence. Yes, who's calling? Oh. Yes, I'm sorry, sir. Mr. Crawford is out. Yes, I shall give him your message. Who is that? Uh, the bank, sir. The account seems to be overdrawn. Well, that must be a mistake. Oh, I'm afraid not. Call back and say I'll deposit some money today. Well, unfortunately, sir, I cannot do that. There are no funds, Mr. Crawford. Anywhere. Well, I expect my salary from the magazine. Yes, but that will just cover the rent. And then those articles I wrote for the... Yes, sir, but that check is not due until the 15th of next month. Huh. Well, obviously, we must do something, Sapkins. Uh, yes, sir. Any mail this morning? All bills. Any calls? Uh, Mr. Gulliver calls, sir. Perry, what do you want? Uh, he just called to chat. I said you were busy writing. Yes, yes, that's exactly what you should have told him. Mm. That's all, sir. And it's just as well. We've had enough bad news for one day. Uh, yes, sir. Ah, uh, well, when one must, one must. No. But, on the other hand... Come on in, Wilson. Perry, I'll be brief. This, uh, this thing you discussed with me, I've decided to try it. Oh, well, I knew you would. Just exactly what is involved. Well, the next time you go to London, see, I know somebody who will pay your fare and give you a thousand dollars. In return for what? You carry a small package. Which contains... Usually? Gems. 
And then what? Well, then someone will relieve you of your burden. And when you're ready to return, there'll be another package. And another fee. Well, what do you think? I think it's wrong. Uh, true, true. But I uh, plan to go to London next week. Leave everything to me. Are you at home to Miss Crawford, sir? Oh, of course he's at home, Sefkins. Uh, Miss Crawford, sir. Thank you, Sefkins. That'll be all. Margaret, you shouldn't do that to poor Sefkins. You know how seriously he takes his job. I don't have much time to waste. Ah, yes, indeed. And yet, isn't time the image of eternity? Oh, stop it. You always have to remind people how learned you are. That's why I divorced you. Well, if memory serves, I divorced you. We decided to part friends. We did have 15 years. And I admit I do have a, a residue of affection for you. We're still concerned with each other. Are we? For instance, the other night, you sought to warn me. You felt that I'm about to take a disastrous step. You were compelled to dissuade me. And so I have come here to dissuade you. From what? From whatever you propose to do with Perry Gulliver. I don't propose to do anything with Perry Gulliver. That's not true. Every time the two of you put your heads together, it's the beginning of a catastrophe. You never liked Perry. Perry Gulliver is a scoundrel. Why? Because he uses people. He's a thief. Well, he may have lost other people's money on occasion. Including yours. Well, those were the breaks. The risks and chances you take. Perry Gulliver is a thief in his heart. Just exactly what have you come here to tell me? I feel I should warn you. Keep away from Perry. <laughs> You're always jealous of him. As a matter of fact, you resented all of my friends. Out of the goodness of my heart, I come up here to do you a good turn. And what do I receive? Scorn and abuse. All right. I wash my hands of the entire business. She thinks she has. Little does Margaret know that soon she shall be immersed in this business up to her neck, if not higher. Wilson Crawford, Margaret Constant, and Perry Gulliver. A trio. But they shall soon become a duo in Act Two. And... May we expect a solo in Act Three? Patience, friends. We're getting there. The commandments are uncompromising. They state in bold and fiery letters, Thou shalt not. However, we perfect mortals try to shade the meaning here and there. We console ourselves by saying, doesn't everybody do it? Well, whether or not everybody does or doesn't, a gentleman named Wilson Crawford is about to. Now get that, Sefkins. Don't bother. Hello. Wilson? Oh, it's you, Perry. Well, weren't you expecting my call? Yes, I suppose I was. Well, I'll drive you to the airport. Uh, can you be downstairs in ten minutes? Yes, I suppose so. Good, I have your ticket and uh, a package. A rather small one. It should fit into your attaché case. Perry, I don't know... Don't what... be so nervous. The thing is absolutely ironclad, surefire, and foolproof. <laughs> You have your ticket and the packet. What's in it? Uh, that's really not your affair. Well, it'll be very much my affair if I'm caught. But you shall not be caught. How can you be sure? Because you're you, Wilson Crawford, the eminent critic. Your reputation protects you. Uh, yes, yes, my reputation. And I'm selling it uh, for a handsome fee. As Samuel Johnson said... Madam, we have already established what you are. We're merely haggling over the price. Uh, Wilson, uh, let us not go into an essay on morality. What am I carrying? Leave it in your luggage. 
It'll be picked up in your hotel room. But what am I carrying? And you'll find another packet in its place. Perry, answer the question. And also an envelope with your money. Perry? In crisp new bills. I won't get on that plan until you tell me. <sighs> Diamonds. Now, are you happy? No, I'm not happy. It's just... If it had been something else, I would have refused. You take what you get, Wilson. And once you're really in this thing, you never even think about it. And so, I say to you, my accusers, it is you who stand accused. I shall die at the stake, but a purer flame already shines in my heart. Am I saying that right? If anyone, anywhere could ever give that line a more transcendent meaning, my name is not Kavalevsky. What bothers me is, how can a flame shine in one's heart? I mean, shouldn't it burn? How quickly we jump to the obvious interpretation. It's just the kind of line that Wilson would tear me to pieces for in his review. Wilson, Wilson, I see, my darling, you are still not free from him yet. Well, I'm just asking. Trust me. It is not the literal word that matters. It is the tension in the voice. Oh. Besides, besides, I believe your Mr. Wilson is at present in the United Kingdom. He'll be here for opening night if he has to swim all the way. That's what I'm afraid of. Courage, my darling. You are no longer the trilby to his Svengali. Now, now let us reach for true greatness. <laughs> Wilson, you're back. Well, why didn't you call me? It skipped my mind, Perry. You were to call me as soon as you arrived home. I know, but this is an opening night. Uh, you, uh, you have something to deliver to me? Oh, yes, I suppose I have. You suppose? Yes, an envelope. A very large cellophane envelope. It appeared to contain several pounds of... Well, it looked like sugar. You had no business opening it. No one would pay to smuggle a few pounds of sugar, so I must assume it was a drug. Hand it over. I draw the line at that. So it's just as well. But, well, what, what is just as well? It's just as well that I lost it. You what? I must have lost it. I don't have it. Just hold it hold it for a minute. Therefore, since I cannot deliver the goods, I cannot accept the money. Here it is. Same crisp bills, $1,000. Furthermore, Perry, I've decided this isn't for me. Wilson. Wilson, you had better give me that package. This is morally wrong. How can I do it? Margaret was right about you. Margaret? What does Margaret have to do with it? She smelled a rat long before I did. All she had to do was see us sitting together in that restaurant, and she knew there was trouble. Listen to me. She's right. You are a thief. Well, be one without me. I quit. You can't quit. Watch me. They won't let you quit. They? Wilson, I am responsible for you. Because I brought you into it, I'll be held accountable. I'll go to the police. Do you know what you're talking about? I must be on my way. I have a play to review. Uh, well, an alleged play. You must give me that package. I told you. I don't have it. What happened to it? I don't know. It's just gone, that's all. It was placed inside your suitcase when you left London. And yet when I looked for it this morning, it wasn't there. Well, what could have happened to it? I haven't the vaguest idea. They won't believe it. They'll think you sold it on your own. The, the street value of that package is well over a million dollars. Indeed. Well, I can't miss the opening curtain. Wilson. Wilson, don't, don't, don't force me to... To what? To do something drastic. I am responsible for you. You should be. And I'm responsible for you, too. After all, a man should always be his brother's keeper. Hello? This is Marigold. Uh, this is Perry. Uh, Perry Gulliver? Yes, 
Mr. Gulliver? I, uh, I think we have a problem. A problem? Miss Wilson Crawford wants to quit. You must convince him that it's impossible. But that's only a half of it. Yes? He doesn't have the package. The package? The one he was to bring from London. He doesn't have it. He claims it's lost. He can't find it. Uh, That's why I say we have a problem. We have no problem, Mr. Gulliver. You have a problem. Uh, But I... I... You brought him into the activity. You are responsible. But uh, what is there I can do? Whatever is required to obtain the package. But how can I do that? You had better learn. And quickly. It's your responsibility. Yes. Margaret, darling, you were one. Thank you. An entire new career is before you. I showed him, didn't I? You were incandescent. Oh, listen, it is 11.20 yet. Wilson's review is coming on in a moment. Must we listen to that fool? Oh, I want to hear him eat his words. Turn it on for me. Must you listen to that spiteful, bitter, Please stupid... turn it on. Good evening. This is Wilson Crawford. I said to my producer, how can a news segment do justice to a play in the three minutes this permits me? Well, for Joan of Arc, a new drama written and directed by Alexander Kavalevsky, one requires not just three minutes, but three hours, three days. How does one even begin to explore the torturous reasoning, or lack of it, which prompted so many people to associate themselves with this pathetic, hopeless excursion into banality and futility. How dare you, Wilson! And Margaret Constant as Joan of Arc. She is punished for her hubris. For the first time on stage, she looks her age. Oh, I'd kill him! The ludicrous spectacle of this aging woman of the world desperately trying to convince us that she is the chaste spiritual teenage girl who is filled with the rapture of heavenly voices. Turn it off! He does not deserve to live. I'll kill him with my own hands. Uh, Mr. Crawford. As what is it, Safkins? Uh, the doorman telephone, sir. Miss Constant is uh, <clears throat> on the way up. Ah, we'd better lock the door until she cools off a bit. I'm afraid that might not be possible, sir. Uh, She may still have her key. I'm afraid she does. Wilson? Wilson Crawford? Looking for me, Margaret? I'm going to kill you, Wilson. Why? You destroyed me tonight. I would suppose you destroyed yourself. You won't get away with it. You can't deny you were wrong. You heard what I said. I am going to kill you. Go ahead. Kill me or don't kill me, but let's not play another bad scene. You don't believe me. Did you bring along a gun, a knife? Poison? Hmm. How's it going to be? Uh, uh, Miss Crawford, you're quite upset, and if you'll pardon my saying... Second, she can't kill me. She didn't come prepared. I could kill you with this. Uh, Uh, Now, Miss Constance... I bought you this jeweled letter opener. Uh, Miss Crawford, please, uh, put that thing down. Let her play the scene, Safkin. Uh, You think this is a joke? It's bad theater. And we must not subject poor Sefkins to a mediocre performance. Sefkins, uh, why don't you go to bed? Is it but, sir, I think we should Thank all... Thank you, Sefkins. Good night. Uh, 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 good night, sir. Uh, good night, Miss Constance. And now, dear Margaret, where were we? I'm going to kill you. Not only because of your review tonight, but because of your arrogance. Poor, poor Margaret. You don't believe me. Margaret. Oh! (laughs) Margaret. Stop that. Let go of that letter opener. I'm going to kill you. Let go, Margaret. Margaret, you're hurting my arm. Drop it. I, I hate you. I hate you. I'm sorry, Margaret. But I had to write that review. Oh, you... you destroyed me. I destroyed a false and ludicrous woman you were trying to be. 
It was necessary surgery. Who asked you? No one had to ask me. Now you can go back to the Margaret Constant who is true to herself. I never want to see you again as long as I live. What? Who's that? Oh, what time is it? It's morning. All right, all right, just a minute. Let me put on a robe. Oh, who are you? Why are you ringing my bell? And why did the elevator man let you come up? Miss Margaret Constant. And if I am? If you are, I have to talk to you. About what? A murder. A murder? I'm Lieutenant Tapley on the homicide division. Uh, and you, you wake me up at this ungodly hour of the morning. Don't you people ever sleep? I'm sorry, Miss Constant. Well, why do you come to me? I, I can't help you. I don't know anything about murder. I don't even know anyone who ever was murdered. Unfortunately, Miss Constant, you do. Or you did know someone who has just been murdered. Do I? Who? Mr. Crawford. Mr. Wilson Crawford. You've heard them shout at ball games, kill the umpire. And many people in the theater harbor the same feelings about critics. If this homicide lieutenant is to be believed, someone has just murdered our friend Wilson Crawford. No wonder the police have made a beeline for Margaret Constance's apartment. After all, she made no secret of her feelings about Crawford. She's in for some rough sledding in Act Three. Preserve, said the Roman philosopher, at all times, a temperate and pacific posture towards the world. Thus, you shall be spared the storms that constantly buffer the headstrong, the turbulent, and the unruly. Excellent counsel. A wise man does not broadcast any feelings of violence he may harbor against another. Look at what's happened to poor Margaret Constant. She kept raging about how she was going to kill Wilson Crawford. So naturally, when Wilson is murdered, the police do not have far to go. Wilson? Wilson is dead? Yes, Miss Constant. Oh, it's, it's impossible. I was with him last night. For how long? Well, it was uh, five minutes, more or less. I, I, At what time? What time? Well, let's see. I, I heard the broadcast. It was 11.20. I took a, a taxi to the apartment. It was 11.45 about. The approximate time of the murder. Who would want to kill Wilson? I am also saying that you were there at about the time of the murder. What? Finally, I'm saying that I should read you your rights as a citizen, and then I must ask you to come downtown. Mr. Sefkins, did you hear Miss Constant threaten to kill Mr. Crawford? Yes, uh, unfortunately. And how did she say she would do it? Uh, with your permission, sir. They, uh, they were both highly volatile people. She was furious. And they uh, played a scene, as uh, they so often did. I suppose they enjoyed the drama. Uh, that's what it was, a scene? Uh, yes, sir, that's what I thought it was. I'd had uh, 15 years of it <laughs> during their marriage. Indeed, that's why I left the room and went to bed. And she picked up the letter opener from the desk and said, I'll kill you with this. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you then left the room. Uh, yes, sir. I didn't think that she and was... And about uh, 7 a.m., you came into the room, found Mr. Crawford dead on the floor. Uh, yes, sir. He had been stabbed in the back. And the letter opener was lying there next to him. Uh, uh, permit me, sir, if I may. They were both angry at themselves. You see... They had no business being divorced. They cared for each other very much. That isn't true, Sefkins. It was all a misunderstanding. She was furious. But he incited her, and I think it was their way of, of making love. How 
dare you, Sefkin? See, they, they played one of their usual violent scenes. Oh. But this time it just got out of hand, that's all. Well, that isn't true. She didn't mean to kill him, Lieutenant. I didn't kill him. I didn't. Thank you very much, Mr. Sefkin. Uh, That'll be all. All right, Miss Constant. You ready to make a statement? Yes. The same one I've been making all along. I didn't do it. You had the motive. You made the threat. You were there at the approximate time of the killing. Your fingerprints are on a murder weapon. Lieutenant, I was furious. I did say, I'll kill you. I did go to the apartment. I did pick up the letter opener. But after Sefkins left the room, I, I, I even fought with him. But but only for a moment. And then I threw the letter opener on the floor and and I went home. And that's what I intend to tell the jury. And you expect them to believe it? Yes, because it's true. No, Miss Constance. I didn't no. kill him and you know it. I loved him. <laughs> I'm a fool, but I'm not a murderer. I know who killed Wilson. Perry Gulliver. Where does he come into this? Where's your proof? How can you accuse someone of murder without proof? You accused me. And what did you have? A few flimsy pieces of circumstantial evidence? Well, what do you got? Wilson spent all of last week in London. Why? What does that have to do with anything? When Wilson goes to London, it's on business. All right. So he had business. What business? The only reason his magazine would send him would be to review the new plays there. To the end of the season, there aren't any. So why did he go? Well, maybe it was a pleasure trip. No, he couldn't afford it. He was broke. Well, all right. I still don't One see why... One night, I see Wilson and Perry very chummy in a restaurant. A few days later, Wilson flies to London. A week later, he returns. On the next day, he's murdered. Obviously, Perry sent Wilson to London. Why? Why? What was Wilson supposed to be doing in London? He didn't write anything. Well, you know. I have friends in London. They kept an eye on him for me. Went to a few parties and came home. All right, so where are we? If Wilson didn't go there to do anything, perhaps he went there to get something. What? How do I know what? You're the professional. Don't you have any ideas? I've opened a world of infinite possibilities. Now, if this were a play... Yeah, well, Miss Constant, this is not the theater. Well, you see, we have Perry Gulliver sending Wilson to London for something. But uh, what? Drugs, diamonds, military secrets. Don't you ever go to the movies? When Wilson returned, they, um, uh, they, they quarreled about it. Well, how do we know? How do we know? That's something we can prove. Maybe. Uh, sir, how may I be of service, Lieutenant? Let me ask him. Well, go ahead. It's your investigation. When Mr. Crawford returned from London, did Perry Gulliver visit him? Uh, yes. See, Lieutenant? Do you know why, Sifkins? Well, uh, Mr. Gulliver seems somewhat upset. Why? Uh, uh, Miss Constant, I never eavesdrop. You know that. Uh, why do you say Mr. Gulliver seemed upset? Yes, well, uh, Lieutenant, <coughs> as Mr. Gulliver was leaving, I gathered he was angry because Mr. Crawford was supposed to have brought something from London I for him. I told you. All right, all right, all right. When Mr. Crawford came home from the airport, did he have his luggage? Uh, yes, sir, his suitcase. Uh, did you unpack it as usual? Uh, yes, yes, yes. First, I ran Mr. Crawford's tub, and, uh, and as he was bathing, I put away his things. Did you notice anything unusual in the suitcase? Unusual? There's no, sir. Nothing at all? Thanks, Hopkins. Well, you might call it unusual, but I'd, I'd already become used to it. Used to what? The sugar. Sugar. Uh, uh, Miss Carlson, after you left him, Mr. Crawford developed the oddest habits. He collected sugar. Uh, that is, while dining out, he would, well, uh, loot the sugar containers, uh, uh, take packets of it, and, and bring them home to me. And he had sugar 
in his suitcase. Oh, uh, well, uh, sir, I noticed some of it had spilled. Uh, it was in a sort of package. I opened it, and uh, there was a rather a large amount. Sugar. Uh, it says, I said to myself, hey, now, this is too much. Packets are one thing, but loose sugar. <laughs> now, this has got to stop. Besides... I didn't like the looks of it. The looks? Yes, yes, yes. yes. It was uh, it was just kind of powdery, so I poured it down the drain. You poured it down the drain? Uh, yes, Miss Constant. Lieutenant, it was a drug. Heroin, cocaine, whichever one of them looks like sugar. Yeah, but we have no proof. We can get it. How? I'll call Perry. Tell him to meet me at my place. I'll say I have the stuff. And I'll deal with him, see? See what? I'll get him to admit that he killed Wilson. You can be in the bedroom. At the, uh, the moment juste, you step out and you put the cuffs on him. Well, it works okay in those cop shows, but I can't do it. Why not? It's entrapment. It's against the law. I intend to accuse Perry of murder. I intend to tell him why he killed Wilson. He may try to kill me, and uh, I could use some protection. Yeah, but Miss Constant, what do we do if it was only sugar? I'll call him right now. Not from police headquarters. Well, what an amusing story, Margaret, dear. I knew the two of you couldn't be up to any good. So I confronted Wilson. I got it out of him. I could get anything out of him. Yes, except a good review. Which is why you killed him. I didn't. You did. Well, evidently, the uh, police are satisfied with you. Are you satisfied with me, Perry? How about your conscience? Oh, dear Margaret, I was born without one. How about your safety? You were handling those drugs for someone. There weren't an accounting. Suppose I were to tell you, I know where the drugs are. You? What? Ah. <laughs> Wilson came home. He told me everything. I convinced him to give me the drugs for, uh, for safekeeping. Do you want to hear more? <laughs> Go on. Quite frankly, the idea was to hold you up. But you came back last night, right after I left. You got into a fight with Wilson. You killed him. Where did it get you? I have the drugs. <laughs> what drugs? I need money, Perry. I didn't kill him. But they've got circumstantial evidence. I'll need the best lawyer in the country. I'll make a deal for the drugs. But I don't know how to go about it. Now, you go back to your people. You tell them. I'll be reasonable. I only want enough for the... the best lawyer. That's all. How, uh... How do I know you've got the drugs? Show me. Bring me the money. How much money? Fifty thousand dollars. Fifty thousand? I may need more. Make it a hundred. It's nothing. I understand this package is worth millions. But I... I'll sink you with me, Perry. I'll confess this part of it to the police. Oh, you can't prove a What thing. do I have to prove? At my trial, I'll insist you killed him for the drugs. The jury won't believe you. Uh, oh, but your friends will. So... Do you get me the money? Margaret, I... A good lawyer gets me a light sentence. You save your own life. It's the best deal you can get. Oh, <laughs> poor Perry. You really didn't want to kill him. But you were in so deep, you couldn't help it. You're not really a killer. Scoundrel, yes, but a killer, no. How was it, Perry? Hmm? How? <laughs> Come on. You have to tell it to someone, and you can trust me. What made you do it? He laughed at me. You know, Wilson. Yes. Yes, he only turned his back on me, and he dismissed me. The way he dismissed me. Oh, I was furious. I saw that long, sharp letter opener lying on the floor, but I was cool enough to know what I was doing. I picked it up with my handkerchief, not, not to get any fingerprints, and I... What? I... What did you do? I... I plunged it into his back. Oh, I'm... Going to be ill. I... Catch her. Oh. She's going to faint. Catch her. Wait. Well, who are you? Margaret, who is he? Oh, permit me to introduce you. Perry Gulliver, 
May I present Lieutenant Toplinger of the New York City Police? I shall return shortly with a final thought. The name of our story is Everybody Does It, and thus is formed the heart and spirit of our morality. For what is morality? It comes from the word mores, which means custom, usage. And so the hard fact is we are what we do, what society sometimes approves of, or winks at. A pity we cannot be that to which we aspire. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Carol Titel, and Earl Hammond. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams come in welcome welcome to mystery theater i am hyman brown as the centuries go marching by in review Head and shoulders above the rest of us march the great innovators, the scientists, the inventors. Their names are blazoned large in the annals of the world. Newton, Euclid, Da Vinci, Einstein, navigators, astronauts, explorers. But some who have opened new paths to mysterious realms go past unnoticed. For example, Herbert Boggs, whose strange and unique story I bring you now. Herb, Hmm? what do you mean, read? Well, it's hard to explain, Sadie. But you know, ever since I was shocked by that electricity, it's like, uh, like written up there in my mind. Like I was printed on a notice board. I can read the future, Sadie. Like it was, uh, the first page of tomorrow's newspapers. Our mystery drama, The Shock of His Life, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Larry Haynes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. to pick the most unlikely spot for a miracle that could battle modern science, you couldn't do better than Elmhurst in the borough of Queens, New York City, or a more unlikely man for it to happen to than Herbert Boggs. Herb is an average middle-class man in a crowd most likely to go unnoticed. He's been married to Sadie for 35 years, two children, grown and married, He has his own little bar and grill, and his interests are beer, boxing, football, and the ponies. He also likes the comics. Hey, Sadie, look, look at this here. What? Sparkman. See how he handles them creatures from outer space? Which one is he, the fellow in the union suit? Oh, Sadie, that ain't no union suit. That's his uniform like. Well, why would a grown-up man want to wear a kid outfit like that? Because, because it frees his muscles to do things. Oh, what's the sense explaining to a woman? Herbie, what are them zigzaggy things sticking out of his hands? Oh, that, that, that's his electrostatic ray. He hits you with that and zingo, you're static. It's like electricity. Oh, he must run up some utility bills. Oh, come on. What do you say, D? He ain't hooked up to the electric company. That's like his own electric power. Oh, in the comics, anything can happen. But it ain't for real. Oh, yeah. Well, don't you kid yourself, Sadie. You'd be surprised how many real scientific ideas come straight out of the comics. That, that's, uh, that's how it's a real education to read them. They, you know, these guys who draw them are geniuses, most of them. Yeah, well, well honey, why don't you get me a beer, huh? Why don't you get it for yourself? Well, can't you see I'm turning the game on? 
You know I always watch the football games on Sundays. All right, Herbie. You have your day of rest, but... Honey, don't turn it up too loud. Yeah, all right. No louder than I have to hear what's going on, okay? Well, I don't have to hear. Oh, no. Oh, Bon, the picture, the picture, Blue. Put, uh, put the beard down someplace, huh? You mean something's happened to that, too? Well, you got eyes, ain't you? We got the, we got the sound, but no picture. Oh, Bon. Honey, what are you doing? I'm going to get the back off. I can fix this thing. I, I can't miss the game. You can't fix it. You need a TV, man. What, at 33 bucks a crack? Anyway, where are you going to find one? on a Sunday, huh? But you shouldn't mess around, Herbie. It's dangerous. Well, what's the difference? You can still hear. I don't want to just hear. I want to see. You better not shove your hand in there. Oh, I can see already there's a tube half lying there. It just needs to be stuck back in. I read in a paper where it said a person should never... Ah, ah. <laughs> Say something to me. Answer me. Herb. Herb. Now, what did you say happened to your husband, Mrs.? Uh... It, it's Boggs, Doctor. Oh, yes, Boggs. Well, he was fooling around trying to fix the TV. While it was turned on? Yes. And he got a shot. Oh, yes. He just went down like a rag doll. Only when I kneeled beside him on the floor, he was... He was all stiff-like. Mm -hmm. Did he have any pulse? I don't know. I, I didn't stop to find out. I just called the police. But after, when you went back to him? I don't know. I didn't think to try. Was he breathing? I don't think so. That's what scared me so, Doctor. He was laying there just like a corpse. Stiff, like I said. How long... Pardon? How long was he lying there in that condition? Oh, I wouldn't know. For a while. And then, I, after I, I got him on his back with the pillow under his feet and all, then I could hear him a little, sort of, like, you know, snoring. The way he was when you first got here. But you can't estimate how long it was before you heard him making that sound. Oh, I was so scared, I... I mean, every second was like a year. and Well, maybe five minutes, ten. Is it going to be all right, Doctor? We have him breathing clearly now, and we're going to take him right down to the hospital. Oh, um, do you have a car? Oh, no. You uh, want to come along? Oh, yes. Couldn't I sit with Herb and hold his hand? I uh, think you'd better let me and the medic do that, Mrs. Boggs. Oh. You climb in with the driver. All right. Okay, Hank, open up the hooters and get us to the hospital fast. We don't want to arrive with a DOA. Sorry to keep you waiting so long, Mrs. Boggs. Herb, how is he? Well, at the moment, his condition is stabilized. His respiration is satisfactory, he's out of cardiac arrest, and his EKG is normalizing. What does that mean, Doctor? Well, Mrs. Barks, when you called police emergency, we got to you as fast as possible. But there was a period after your husband sustained the electric shock, during which we don't know his medical condition. But you said he was breathing and all again? Yes, his condition now is stable enough. What we don't know, Mrs. Barks, is what may have happened to him in the period after he sustained the shock until we arrived and could start treatment. Doctor, I don't mean to be stupid, I just don't quite follow well, you. let me try to explain. When we have sudden shock, like a, an electrical one, yes. which stops normal functions such as breathing and heartbeat, time is of the essence. Oh. I won't go into all the complications and technical terms, but if, through shock, a patient loses all cardiopulmonary functions for more than four to six minutes, well, then we're in deep trouble. You mean my herb would die? Not necessarily. What I do mean is that he could suffer irreversible brain damage and change. Oh, you think that that's what could have happened before you got to our apartment? Well, I honestly don't know. Mr. Boggs is still in a coma until he comes out of it. And we've had a chance to evaluate the EKG and other tests. I can't give you any definite answer. I'm sorry. But you don't think he's going to die? I, um, 
can't even promise you that. I know it's little comfort, but perhaps if the damage has already been done, it might be better for him and for you. I want him to come, too. I want him back. Well, of course you do, Mrs. Boggs, and I want you to have hope. But I also ask you to wait and see. The man you get back could very easily be as different from night and day as the husband that you remember and love. Good morning, Herbie. Sadie, where am I? Where should you be when you're sick? The hospital. Hospital? What am I doing here? Don't you remember? You were messing around with that TV. Like Mike, who comes to fix it. Didn't Mike warn you? What? Well, he said, you you know, never touch in the back without you pull the plug. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I remember. Hey, who won? Who won what? The game. What game? The game, the game that was going on when the set pooped out. Well, how should I know? You think I should care about football players when my husband was lying like dead? What husband? You! Herbie, you went and electrocuted yourself. How come you're in the hospital? I wake, wake, waking up like this, I couldn't figure. I never... I never felt better in my life. Oh, we'll let the doctor decide No, that. what do I need a doctor for? I know how I feel. I want to get out of here and go home. Now, just a minute. No, just a minute. Get my pants, Sadie. I don't belong here. Herb, you've been sick. Real sick. Two days you've been laying there like dead. You can't go home unless the doctor signs you out. All right, so get him and have him. I can't do that. He thinks you might have... Well... You know, with the electric shock and all. No, I don't know. Like I say, I feel like a million bucks. Now, I need out. I got things to do. What things? Well, like, I can't... I can't explain that there are things going on in my head. Now, honey, I don't care about rules and regulations. I'm getting out of here. Doctor or no doctor. Herbie, you got to have him to get out. And how am I going to convince him? Oh, he's going to let me out without any trouble. How do you know? Well, I can read it. It's that simple. Read it? What do you mean, read it? In my brain. In my brain, Sadie. Just like I can read so many other things now. Now, just trust me, huh? Like you always did. Gee, Herb. I want to. I want to with all my heart. But... Oh, it's... It's all so kind of different. I, I don't know where I'm at. You don't have to worry about where you're at, Sadie. Just get yourself set for where we're going. Now that we've been struck by lightning. Oh, boy. Good to be home. I just don't understand. After all he said, the doctor didn't make any problem about your coming home. Oh, why should he, Sadie? I'm in better shape than he is. Get me a beer, hon. Oh, sure, Herbie, if you say so. You want a glass? Oh, 32 years married, you ask me that? When did I ever use a glass? Are you sure the doctor wouldn't... Sadie, what do I care about the doctor? I know what's good for me. And for you. Here, just let me show you. Who are you calling? Of course. The bookie? Yep, that's him. Now look, Herb. We ain't got money to take flyers. I mean, like after the hospital and ambulance and all, you know? No, I don't know. And who says this is a flyer? This is something I gotta get through your head. Uh, hello? Horse? Yeah, 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 her. Yeah. You know, her bogs. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Listen, uh, you're holding some winnings for me. Um, 120 bucks, right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's all right. You check your books. It's there. Yeah, well, listen, I want to take a little flutter. Now, uh, you got notable gaffer in the first going off a of 10 to 1, right? Ah. Uh, and, uh, pleasure sky in the fourth, 70 to 1. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I want to parlay them on the nose to win. Yeah, yeah, the whole bundle. Are you crazy? Herb, you had winnings of over a hundred dollars, and you're betting them on a daily double with two outsiders? Honey, honey, not to worry. I can't lose. What do you mean you can't lose? I already read the results. Clear and simple, the way the things are from here in. What do you mean, Red. Well, it's hard to explain, Sadie, but ever since I took that that belt of electricity, it's like it's like written up there in my mind. 
Like like a, like it was printed on a notice board. I, I can read the future. Like, like it was the first page of tomorrow's newspaper. So, as Herb, or should I say, like Herb would say, here is a miracle happening right in that western end of Long Island. Has that extra amount of electricity her Boggs's body accidentally absorbed brought about some strange physiological or psychological change? Or has it, as Dr. Barnes fears, caused some profound and irreparable damage that gives him delusions? Mystery Theater will return shortly with Act Two. Here is Herbert Boggs, owner of a small local bar and grill, who is suddenly electrified and claims to be able to see, in his mind's eye, the front page of tomorrow's newspaper. It is also a fact that the electrical shock was of such severity that it put him into cardiac arrest and eliminated all his vital signs for an indefinite period. A period, however, which may have been long enough to cause irreparable damage. Herb, why don't you take a nice rest in your armchair and let me fetch your slippers? Oh, Sadie, will you stop acting like I went round the bend? I'm telling you the truth. That you could see into the future? Well, not the whole future, just like I could see what could be on the front page of a paper. The racing results? Well, if, uh, if someone won big enough to get a headline, and other things do... I'm, I'm just telling you the way it is, Sadie. Maybe I'd better get you some aspirin. Will you, for crying out loud, stop treating me like I had some kind of a sickness or something? I got vision right here. How can you be sure? It's just I am, Sadie, I am. All right, we can prove it out. Wait a minute. What are you doing? I'm calling the number. What number? There's this number you call to check the betting results. Couldn't you just listen in on the radio? Yeah, of course I could listen. This is faster. Yeah, yeah, like already I'm getting the rundown. About the horse race, the parley? No, 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 he's not up to that now. He's on basketball and football right now. Oh. oh, wait, 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 here he goes on exactors and perfectors and all that. No, hey, no, wait a minute. What? Here, here he goes on results, a big oval track. First race, notable gaffer wins at 10 to 1. Hey, hey, you know what that means, honey? We won? We just made ourselves 1,200 bucks. We did? Oh, we can sure use it. Oh, no, no, that ain't using money, honey. We, we, we have it all riding on the fourth race. Herbie, if we lose that, do we lose it no, all? No, we ain't gonna lose it. Well, how can you be so sure? Shh, shh, hold it, hold it, hold it. Yeah, the result's coming in right now. yee Pleasure Sky took it by a nose. <laughs> I told you. I told you I could see it just the way it's going to be. The huh? second horse won? Yeah, paying 70 to 1. That oh. means you and me, Sadie, just cleared ourselves more than $35,000. Herb, <laughs> we never had that much money all at once in our lives. Yeah, well, you better get yourself used to it, baby, because that's the way it's going to be from now on. Oh, no, Herbie, please. I'm scared. Let it go with that. You came in lucky once. Don't stretch your luck. What's the stretch? That ain't luck. Don't you understand? I know. I know before it happens. Darling, I... I you've been sick in the hospital. I think you ought to take it easy for a while. No, I know. I know what you think, Sadie, and I don't blame you. You think that electric shock curdled my brain or something, but it ain't that way. I wish I could make you see it so clear. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I just came back from the hospital, and you were with me all morning since I woke up, right? Right. So, you know that I haven't heard a radio or seen a TV or looked at a paper, right? Yes. The morning paper. We got it in the house? All right, all right. Now, fine. Now, I won't look, all right? But you look on the first page. Yes. And someone won big on a lottery, right? Uh, yes. Huh? <gasps> Joseph Davis... A retired construction worker was the grand winner in the two million dollar state lottery. All right, Sadie. Does it give the number of the ticket? Oh, let me see. Uh, yes, yes, right here. It was no, no, number. No, no, wait, wait. I'll tell you. I'll tell you without even looking. Um, uh, two, four, three, eight, six, nine, two. Right? Well, yes. Yeah. 
That's right. Yeah, you see? You see, I know which number is going to win. Oh. Yeah, let, let, let this Joe Davis have his two million next month. If we want it, we'll have it. How? Well, well, when I put my mind to it, I can see the number. Well, how can you get the number you want? Well, may, may, maybe I can't, but there's uh, 83 other places. Knowing the right numbers can put you and me on easy street for the rest of our lives. Where? The numbers, the horses, the right spread in basketball, football. A hundred ways, Sadie. I don't have to guess anymore. I'm going to know. Oh, there's something terribly dangerous about all this herd. It just can't lead to any good. Are you kidding? How good can it get? It's going to be a whole new life. I guess that's what I'm afraid of. Oh, come on, Sadie. Why should you be afraid? Because you go live it. I got my own second sight. You're headed for real trouble. And worse than that, you ain't going to be my herb anymore. Here I come. Hi, lover. Hi, Angel. Come in, close the door. Well, do we kiss, Gino? Or is this strictly business? <laughs> kiss first, Sherry, baby. Then we talk. Mm. You're it, Gino, all the way. I, uh... I need a little information, and I can't think of anyone better to dig it up for me. <sighs> so tell me. I got a customer, a live one, for a lot of years. He's gone sour on me. Oh, he owes you? Oh, no. He quit gambling? Worse than that. All of a sudden, he starts to win big too often. I want to know why. Look, Gino, isn't this man's work? This guy happens to be a bartender who owns his own little place. So? Isn't gambling man talk? Customers talk to bartenders. It don't work the other way around. Hmm. What'd you do? Misplace the goon squad? No, no, this doesn't call for strong arm stuff. You catch more flies with honey than Okay, you okay, I get the message, Gino. What's the address? And how do I recognize this pigeon? The address is on the paper. You'll find him behind the bar. His name is Herb. Herb Boggs. Miss, can I help you? Oh, uh, I, uh... If it was something to eat, we don't open the grill till 5.30. Uh, no, I don't want to eat. I, I, I couldn't. I... I, I like a, a drink, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, would you rather have it at a table than here at the bar? No, please, I, I... I don't want to be alone. In trouble of some kind? Yes. Uh, no. Well, there was a man bothering me. Get away, I said. My husband was meeting me in here. Is he? No. No, I just said that to get away. My, my husband... My husband's dead. Oh. I'm a widow. Oh. All alone now. I don't know why it is. Men seem to sense that. Try to take advantage. You know how it is? Uh, well, yes or no, <laughs> Now, listen, you'll be safe in here. What, what, what did you want to drink, huh? Oh, just a sherry, I guess. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to laugh. It was just... You see, I'm not much of a drinker. And I didn't know what to ask for. So the first thing I come out with is my name. <laughs> oh, oh, sherry, sherry. Yeah. That's your name, huh? Yes. Uh. But like the poet says... What's in a name? So I guess I, I will have a sherry. And not too strong, please. Oh, no. I'll give you the best. Yeah, yeah this will never hurt you. A glass of wine. Oh, like that other poet said. A glass of wine. A loaf. Oh, how did that go? Uh, a book of voice, uh, verses. Underneath the bow, a jug of wine, a loaf of bread, and thou beside me singing in the wilderness. Huh? Oh, gee, that's <laughs> beautiful. Ah, yeah, well. How come an educated man like you ended ended up behind a bar? I ain't claiming I'm any college grad or nothing like that, but... Well, you spend enough years behind a bar, you'd be surprised how many things you learn. Oh, you've read it to me like you were an actor. 
Oh, it made me feel so much better. Honest. I, I don't feel sad anymore. Ah, yeah, that's great. Hey, now look, you haven't even tried your sherry. Oh, I know. It's silly, but... Oh, I hate to drink alone. I, I don't suppose you would join me as my guest. Oh, no, 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 no. I never drink in my own place. Well, some... some other place? Hey, hey, hey. Now, look, I'm a married man. It's just because I'm lonely. Oh, I... I don't think I know your name. Oh, well, it's Herb. If you want to have a drink, my, uh... My relief barman just came in. It's, uh, my quitting time, and, uh... Cherry, I'll take you across the street to Adam's rib. Oh, that's so sweet of you, Mr. I mean, Herb. No, no, it isn't. Sherry, honey. Uh, you see, it's because I, uh, I read in my mind's eye it's what I'm going to do anyway, so I might as well check out why right now. <laughs> so I'll get my jacket. Uh, oh, uh, the Sherry's a buck and a half a clip. Uh, just leave it on the bar. You know, you're a funny man. No, nah, not funny, just strange. Well, I dig men who are far out. No, oh, no, 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 Sherry, it won't work. What do you mean? Look, if I was younger and I didn't have my Sadie... Now, I'm not saying I wouldn't go for all your flash in me, but uh, it won't work. Because, first of all, there is Sadie, and I never cheated on my wife yet, and never will. And second off... Because I know it ain't the cards. You're sure? If you came up to my pad right now, I couldn't make you change your mind? No, I don't have to be sure. I know. I know because I know I'm not going to your place. How? Well, like I said, I can see it in my head. I, I can kind of read it like. Anytime up to 24 hours ahead, I know whether a thing is going to be or if it isn't. How could you do that? Well, I didn't ask to be able to. I, uh... You see, I took a jolt of electricity and, uh, I nearly cashed in my chips. Oh? Yeah. And when I came out of it, I guess, uh, it kind of scrambled my brain some and, well, change over some of the cells or like that. But anyway, I could, uh, I could see into the future. Oh, like a day before a race, you could know which horse was going to win? Oh, that's easy. Oh, boy, are you the man with all the luck. Uh, well, not so fast. You see, the trouble with knowing about things in advance is you get to take the bad with the good. Like, uh... Like it's just, uh... Just coming clear... Who sent you to pump me? I mean, I don't see uh, all that clear yet why. Nobody sent me. No, no, Sherry, honey, that's a lie. Uh, but you know, you know Marks, right? All right, now you tell me what, what does Gino want with me? I wouldn't know. Oh. Well, I know this much. If a, a big fish like Gino is after me, it can only mean trouble. So, you see, Sherry, maybe I'm not so lucky after all. As long as man has existed, he has ached to be able to know of his future in advance. The seer or the professed seer has been a dominant figure in every culture in the world. But if all the prophets and magicians and astrologers and others actually have such a power, would they really want such a divine gift or learn like Herb that it brings far more harm than good. Mystery Theater will return shortly with Act Three. One of history's wisest men, Sir Francis Bacon, once wrote, Men may refuse things which are in the present, but leave the future to the divine providence. The wisdom of this thought is something poor Herb Boggs is about to discover, even though his ability to read the future is not something he is directly responsible for. It is a gift that was wished upon him, and which 
Despite his advantages, he is rapidly beginning to think he would rather have wished off him again. I brought us some nice, fresh coffee, Herb. No, no, no. None, none for me, Sing. Oh, would you rather have a beer? No, no. Well, uh, should I turn on the TV? No, no. Oh, now I know you must be sick. No, I'm not sick. I got a problem. Oh, I knew something was bothering you ever since you come home to dinner. Herbie. How can I help? Now, Sadie, this has nothing to do with you. Everything that has to do with you has to do with me. All right, all right. All right, now listen. When I first found out about, uh, about my gift, like, I, uh, I lost my head a little, all right? Well, you didn't seem no different to me. No, I mean about how I saw all the money that I could make. You know, all my life I played the numbers, the ponies, wherever you could lay a bet, right? Every cent I could afford and too much of the time, like you know, when I couldn't. Yeah, I know. Well, you know what I figured last year? I'm a loser. Over 40 years averaging out, I blew 50 bucks a week. That's 100 grand I blew, Sadie. With interest over all in years, it could have been two. That's all you or me would ever need. Now, do you think that's smart? No, that wasn't smart. But now you could get it all back and more. Yeah, yeah, that's what I figured, Sadie. I wasn't going to be greedy. Just get back my stake and maybe like interest money, you see? Only... Only I was stupid. What's so stupid about that? Well, I try to move too fast. I got... I got horse Turkle screaming what was I trying to do to him and I should have listened. To what? Well, he asked me to take it easy or either... Let him in on what kind of handicapping system I was using. Well, I fobbed him off, so... He must have went screaming to the big shots, you see, wherever he lays off his bets. So now, I... I got Gino Marks on my tail. Who is Gino Marks? Oh, he's a real, real hard guy, Sadie. This, this is his district, you see, and he doesn't like anybody that messes with his profits. Herbie, don't get mixed up with gangsters and hoodlums. We don't need the money. Forget it. Well, the whole trouble is I was going to forget it. I just about had our money back, Well, whatever we've got, you don't need anymore. Well, I'm not sure I even deserve the hundred grand I have. It ain't so much of a gift, you know. We come right down to it. Like last week when we bumped into Mo and Jane Rosen, you know. Yeah. Oh, it was nice to see them look so well. Who could have guessed? (gasps) Yeah, me. I knew. I knew she'd be dead the next day, Sadie. Oh. Yeah. And and that nice young kid that, that lives upstairs, well, she ain't going to have that baby. She, she'll be lucky if she stays alive. Oh, no. Yeah. And, then, and that's how come I know that Gino Marks is after me. You see, I can see all these things before they happen. And just to win some dough, who needs the, the other stuff that you got to suffer? That's why I want to forget it all or try to before... Oh. Be- be- before what? Maybe before that. What? The phone. I gotta answer that. Why? Let it ring. Take it off the hook. No, no, no. It's no good, Sadie. I gotta answer sooner or later. Yeah. Yeah, that's why it's speaking. Well, what? 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 What does he want to see me for? Well, okay. At least I can ask. Yeah. When? tonight. Well, I, I don't know. It's kind of late. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be there. Who was it? Who else? That was a message from Gino Marks. What? He wants to see me tonight. Tonight? He's already sent a card for me. Don't go, Herbie. Sadie, I gotta. Why? Well, because you never get anything for nothing. Now I gotta find out what I... I gotta pay for the good luck. Why should you have to pay anything? You worked hard all your life. You deserve some. Wasn't coming out of the shock I got enough. I should have left it at that, but I was tempted. And when a guy gives in, Sadie, I guess he's just got to face it. There's always the devil to pay. Mr. Box. Yeah, that's right. Close the door, Boggs. 
Take your seat. I want to talk to you. Sit down. Sit down. Yeah. Now, come right to the point. It's the way I work. <laughs> you know, you've been nicking my organization pretty good the past week. You mean I made a few bets and took some money off you, huh? That's what I mean. Too much. Yeah, well, uh, you won't have to worry. I, I got all I need now. Oh, you're going to quit cold turkey. Yeah, huh? yeah. I don't buy it. No horse player on a hot streak ever quit. Well, this one is ready to. I don't know if I want you to. You mean... You mean you want me to go on winning? Can you? Well, I... I can't say. Uh, what do you want, Mr. Marks? Hey, now that's getting right to the point, isn't it? You know... I just possibly might go into business with you. Business? With me? Why not? I go for success. But before we get too excited over what may just have been a, a run of luck, why don't we have a trial period? A trial period? For what? To see if it's really true. You can call it spots. If you can, we pick our spots and bet heavy. I mean heavy, Bugs. Eighty percent to me is major partner. The rest to you and I'll bankroll and, uh, suppose, uh, suppose I refuse. <laughs> now, you really don't want me to get into strong arm stuff, do you? No, 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 no. You wouldn't dare lay a hand on me. Not as long as I could be the goose who lays the golden eggs. No, I wouldn't have to. Because, um, that wife you love so much, Sadie, is that her name? <laughs> yes, Sadie. Now, you wouldn't want anything to happen to her. We got a deal. We got a deal. Hey. Hey. Uh, what? 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 What's my? Hey, no, 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 no! Look, wait! Don't, don't, don't you hurt her! I can actually explain everything. Oh. Oh, Sadie, Sadie, I'm sorry. What was you having, sweetheart? A nightmare? Oh. How could, how could I have a nightmare? It's not even dark yet. Well, almost. You haven't had your supper. No, no, I can't eat. Herb, you got to have something. It's just leftovers, since you won't even let me leave the house the last three days. <sighs> Herbie, what is it? What? I can't explain, Sadie. It's, it's, uh... I, I don't mind all the beer and the drinking and the sleeping all day and walking around all night. But what's the use, Herb? You can't hide forever. What are you hiding from? Your partner? Yeah. Oh, I never wanted you to go in business with a man like Gino Marks anyways. Well, why didn't you just quit? Oh, Sadie, don't you think I wish I could? If it's the money you want, give it back. I tried that. He doesn't want it. Well, what does he want? Well, you know... For me to tell what I see inside my skull is going to win the next day, so he can bet. So give it to him. What do you care? Well, you don't understand, honey. For weeks I have, and then just like that I had to stop. Why? Well, because. Because I don't know anymore. All of a sudden it just stopped, just like that. So that's why you wouldn't answer none of his calls the last three days. Honey, you can't put it off much longer. He's got men watching down there in the street. I've seen them. Yeah, I know, I know. They've been there around the clock ever since we first made our deal. He don't even trust nobody, Sadie. That's why... Oh. Who's that? I, 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 I'm going to see... No, 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 Sadie. Let me... You you go back in the bedroom, all right? No, I'm staying right by your side. Well, just stay at the line of the door. Uh, who, who, who is it? You could see me through the viewer. You know... Open up. Well, I got nothing to say to you. You can't put it off forever. Look, I'm alone. I just want to talk to you man to man. Better let him in, Herb. Tell him how it is, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, oh, okay. Just a minute, Mr. Marks. There. Evening, Mrs. Boggs. Yes. I have... What do, you, what do you want? Well, you know me. I don't waste time. Right to the point. Nearly a week 
now. We don't win, huh? Oh, I dropped the bundle. What is this, a double cross? Now, look, I know, I know. I know you lost. All right, you, you, you can have everything I got, all right? Everything you got is peanuts in my league. Why don't we win anymore, Boggs? Because I lost the power. I don't believe you. It doesn't matter what you believe. You can't change anything. Oh, I don't know. Excuse me, Mrs. Boggs. Hey, now you let go of my don't wife. Come any closer. You wouldn't dare shoot this her. This isn't a conventional gun, Herb. It's an electric stun ray in the experimental stage with the government. But we've made a few improvements, see? Instead of stunning, this can kill. Now, I'm taking Sadie here with me, and you're going to give me some winners for tomorrow, or you're not going to see her again. No, I won't let you. Hey, well, you fool. You'll have to kill me first. I'll see one of us in hell first. You'll... on the TV. And you dreamed all that? Oh, I always knew I had a smart husband. No, 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 not so smart. Or I wouldn't be here. You, you're sure now, Sadie, huh? Herbie, we brought you here to this hospital straight from the house. And you've been in a coma for the last 24 hours. <sighs> till you just woke up a half hour ago to... Tell me all you dreamed. Gee, it all seems so real. It's hard to believe. I'm never going to make another bet, Sadie. Suppose I would. I wouldn't sleep easy for the rest of my life. I'll be back shortly with a final thought. Herb Boggs learned a valuable lesson. No matter what the odds, a gambler can't be beaten unless he has the devil on his side. And having won with his help, what have you won? His payoff is that if you commit yourself to him, no matter how long and lucky the wheel spins, he is waiting for you in the end. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Joan Shea, and Ian Martin. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams. in. Welcome. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. All of us at one time or another have believed as Lord Byron did in the power of thought, the magic of the mind. Hamlet looked with his mind's eye. The great Caesar believed a good mind can possess a kingdom. 
today we'll meet a man who is living proof of mind over matter. The mystery being, if a brain can make possible the impossible, what could you or I do just by thinking about it? Gregory, I'm not so sure I like being locked up in the same cell with you. It... Oh, what's that noise? Look who just came through that drain pipe. A rat. A, a, a rat? Oh, here comes another one. I, I can't stand rats. They're not going to hurt you. We're, we're, we're locked up in here. Uh, guard! L let me out of this cell. Guard! Guard! There are rats in here! <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Great Brain, based on a story by Jacques Fruitrell, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Gordon Heath. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The most mysterious activity man is capable of is thinking. This is done by the mind. The mind is an activity of the brain. How it works is beyond us. We just don't know. Conan Doyle tells us, don't think about it. Stack up your brain attic with furniture where you can get at it when you need it. Isn't that elementary, my dear Watson? When we tick... What makes us tick? Did you ring his doorbell, Herbert? Well, of course I did. Uh, Jason, give the man a chance to answer his front door. Oh, maybe he's not home. Are you sure he said drop by at nine this evening? Well, of course I'm sure. Okay, I'll ring again. Herbert, uh, were you there at the jazz match? No, no, I wish I had a been. Uh, it was uncanny. Imagine a man who's never played chess winning over a grand master by sheer logic. Well, um, Gregory has more than logic to work with. What do you mean? He has a great brain. Gentlemen, I am pleased to see you. Oh, good evening, Gregory. Hey, good to see you too, Greg. Come in, come in. Have you been ringing long? Didn't hear the bell? Let's go into the library. Hawkins has a good fire going. We'll sit and I'll put my problem to you. Oh, you must be joking, Gregory. You of all people with a problem? Sit down, sit down. Jason, Herbert, anywhere that looks comfortable. You know, we three scientists get together too rarely. Mm. Yes, I do have a problem. And it's only to my nearest and dearest friends, you two, that I would admit to it. Well, as you said at the chess match, it's your move. This is yesterday's Sunday Tribune. I'll read it. The mental marvel, Dr. Gregory March, has done it again. Defeated the Grandmaster Chess Champion in four out of five matches. Dr. March claims he never played the game before in his life. That concentration can make the incredible credible. Is it not more believable that Dr. March has kept secret all his abilities? Which many suspect may be the case. Well, there are always detractors, Gregory, you know that. I keep trying to prove the superiority of the human brain, and at every turn I'd run into disbelief. So, gentlemen, that's the problem. And I enlist your aid. Oh, Gregory, we know you can perform certain feats of, uh, what do I call it, uh, mental magic. Magic? But not anything is possible with brain power. I disagree. Not only anything, but everything is possible. You two set up the challenge, and I'll meet it. Greg, Jason and I have an idea for a test. Now, there are some things which will not yield to any amount of thought. What, for instance? Prison walls. No man can think himself out of a cell. Uh, if he could, there'd be no prisoners. Uh, Greg... Greg, let's suppose you were locked in a cell, a special prison cell, reserved, let's say, for uh, the condemned murderer. Yes. Now, suppose you were locked in such a cell. Could you escape? Certainly. By brain power alone? A good test. Have me locked up precisely as you would any man under sentence of death, and I'll get out. <laughs> I will escape in a week. Say, the um, death cell at the state penitentiary... You know, I think I could arrange that. I, I know the warden. You name it. What do you wear? Whatever's customary. No, not a prison uniform, but shoes, socks, trousers, 
search. You'll permit yourself to be searched, of course. Naturally. My dear friends, it's not what's on my body that will help me out, but what's in my head. Au revoir, Hawkins. Take good care of the house. See you in a week. Uh, is it true, sir, that your friends are taking you this morning to the state penitentiary? <laughs> Don't be concerned. Purely a scientific experiment. Ready when you are, Gregory. It's now 27 minutes past 7 o'clock. I shall be gone a week. Yes, sir. Will you be needing a suitcase and clothes? No, Hawkins. Just what I have on my back. One week and 12 hours from now, these two gentlemen will take supper with me here. Warden Hammer, uh, let me introduce Dr. Gregory March. As I said to you last night on the telephone, Dr. March is to be your prisoner here at State Penitentiary. Uh, some kind of experiment, you said. Except in this case, the outcome is not unknown. But yes, all in the interest of science. So where do I begin, Warden? All right, Dr. March, you will first submit to being searched. Turn out your pockets, please. Now, will you remove your shoes and socks? I hope the inspection was satisfactory. You found nothing concealed which might aid me in escaping. Doctor, even if you had a blowtorch on you, I don't think you could get out of state, Ben. Gregory, uh, are you sure you want to do this? Would you and Herbert be convinced if I didn't? <laughs> well... No, I, I can't say we would. Uh, Warden, is it quite impossible for Dr. March to communicate with anyone outside the prison? Absolutely impossible. He won't be permitted anything to write with at all. Yes, and your guards, uh, would they deliver any messages from him? Not a word, directly or indirectly. They'd report to me immediately anything he said or turn over to me anything the prisoner might give them. I do have, however, three small requests. Well, I thought we all agreed to no special favors. I'm not asking any. I'd like to have some tooth powder, not toothpaste, tooth powder. Secondly, I'd like to have one $5 bill and two $10 bills. <laughs> Warden, is there any man in this prison who our friend might bribe with the $25? He's not going to meet another prisoner. He'll be in solitary. And as for anyone else... <laughs> no, not for 2500 Well, I can see no reason why Gregory shouldn't have the money. I think I have some... Tens. One, two. Uh, I've, uh, I've got a five. Now, you sure that's all you want, Greg? That'll be enough, thanks. You, uh, had three requests, don't yes. you? Yes. The third is, before I go into my cell, I'd like to have my shoes polished. Now, this is cell 99. Uh, guard, open up, please. This is the cell where we keep condemned murderers. It's on the ground floor. It's visible to every passing guard. There's one small window, barred, of course, a bed, a lavatory, and commode. Oh, this is awful. Greg, why don't you change your mind? Herbert, you're taking up valuable time by talking. Well, if I may ask you, Dr. March, valuable time for you to do what with? To think, Warden. Well, I ask it again, Warden, although I'm sure of the answer. There's no way any prisoner can leave this cell. No, sir, not without my permission. No one in 99 has any way of communicating with the outside. Jason, do I get the impression you don't trust me? Oh, not at all. I'm just making certain that you prove your case. Quite honestly. Oh, I was going to say scientifically. Why don't we set up a control the first night? Jason, join me here for the first day and night. Then you can observe. That's not a bad idea. I uh, think you should, Jason. Uh, you'd uh, you'd have to be searched also, you understand. Oh, why not? I'll do it. Here, uh, Herbert, my keys, wallet. Well, in fact, take the whole jacket. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll be dressed in shirt sleeve like Gregory. Uh, if you don't mind, sir, I'll just check your clothing. <laughs> Go ahead. No hidden weapons, I assure you. I uh, notice cell 99 is on the main floor. Are the administration offices here, too? Well, just three doors down the cell block is my office, so I'm certainly going to hear anyone trying to get out. Now, Dr. March, a guard will bring you breakfast in the morning, then a meal at noon, and at six you'll get dinner. The guard will stand by while you eat and then remove a wooden spoon and bowl and cup. 
And at nine at night, there's a cell-by-cell -cell inspection to it. Glad to hear it. The more security, the greater the challenge. <laughs> You're quite determined, aren't you, Dr. March? Yes, I am. Oh, in case I forgot to mention it, no one has ever escaped from state pen. No man has ever made it over that 18-foot electrified wall. Good of you to tell me, Warden. I'll make a note that is not the way to leave. Oh, sir, Jason? Mm hmm? Now, if you'll kindly lock us up, Warden. Why, oh, certainly. Guard. So long, Greg. Good luck. I'll uh, stop by for you the first thing in the morning, Jason. Oh, Warden, what time is it now exactly? Uh, 11.17. Make a note of it on your calendar. I will join you, gentlemen, in the Warden's office at 11.17 in the morning, one week from now. And, uh... If you're not there, Greg? There's no if about it. Both of you gentlemen finish your dinner? Yes, God, you can remove the trays. Ugh. That's the kind of food you're going to get for seven days. I don't envy you. I can afford to lose a little weight. You know, Gregory, I'd like to see you pull this off. I know you would. Would it be out of line to ask you how you go about it? When I tackle a new problem, I become all brain and mind. I begin by being a sponge, soaking up all the information I can. You can help. Go stand on the bed. Take a look out of the window and tell me what you see. Uh, 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 the prison yard lit by arc lights all around. Uh, that wall looks higher than 18 feet. It's uh, too smooth to climb up. And it's electrified on top. Hmm. How many guards? Let's see. Oh, there are four of them patrolling. From the window, how far down is it to the yard? Just a couple of feet, two, four, five. Good observation. Come down. <coughs> then I check my memory. Do you remember how we got to cell 99? Well, let's see. Uh, the main gate, guards booth there. Then through two heavy steel gates. Then into the main prison to the warden's office on this floor. Then, uh, oh, two more steel doors in the corridor and the double locks on your cell. Hmm. Step three, the inside. Search every corner. It's completely bare. Not a chair, not a table. The bed seems to be welded together so that it can't be torn apart and used. <laughs> you really picked the impossible. That's the whole point. Now, when you were looking out the window, did you notice anything in particular about the arc lights in the yard? Oh. No, I don't think so. One of the wires leads up past my window to the roof. Was that important? Well, it might be. No detail is unimportant. But you... Gregory, what's that noise? Let me have a look. There's something over in this corner. Well, what do you know? A rat. A, a, a rat? And another one. Now, where do they come from? <laughs> Gregory, I, I, I can't stand... Rats, I, I, I can't. Oh, here's the third. I, I, I've got to get out of here. They're not going to hurt you, Jason. Get down from that bed. But, but we're locked up in here. Uh, guard, let, let me out of this cell. Guard, guard! I am reminded of a poem by Robert Browning called The Pied Piper, in which he says, Anything like the sound of a rat makes my heart go pitter-pat. Seriously, though, the little rodents have been much maligned from Shakespeare to Shaw. If I may be permitted to give you a hint of things to come, rats, for the size of their skulls, have far more brain power than man. Mystery Theater will be back shortly with Act Two. We have called our mystery the great brain. That brain resides in the cranium of scientist Dr. Gregory March. To prove its power, he has vowed that by logic alone, he can, forgive me, steal a march on his warden and his guards and escape from prison in seven days. It is the following morning. Hey. Breakfast, Dr. March. Good morning, God. You know my name. Well, sir, the uh, whole prison's talking about you. Having yourself locked up. And you say you've done nothing. Uh, here, I'll uh, put 
Put your tray in your bed. Now, you'd better eat up. I'm supposed to stay till you're finished. Ah, what do we have here? Coffee? What's this? Oatmeal? Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> there go the rats. They smell food, and that would hell come miles. I've noticed there's an old dry drain pipe in the wall. They run in and out of it like it's a revolving door. Yeah, well, that, that old pipe's big enough uh, for a rat, but hardly a human being. <laughs> I've never been partial to oatmeal, but uh, you can get used to anything. <laughs> hey, rats don't bother you, Doctor? They're more scared of me than I am of them. <clears throat> How far is the river? Oh, about 300 feet. Hey, we have a baseball diamond out there on the other side of the wall. Hey, just for the staff. <laughs> you finish your coffee? Almost. I noticed last night I was getting very thirsty. You think you could bring me a little water in a bowl and leave it here? Uh, I'll ask the warden. I'll appreciate that. I suppose you're the guard assigned to my cell, so I ought to know your name. It's Argus. Argus? Really? Why? Is that name something special? I should say it is. Ask me to tell you about it sometime. Warden, uh, may, I, uh, may I see you a moment? Yes, come in, August. Uh, is everything all right in 99? One of the armed guards on outside patrol uh, handed me this just now. He said the prisoner threw it out of 99. Let me see. Five dollar bill tied around a piece of cloth. Will you look at this? You see what it says? Binder of this, please deliver to the warden. This is a piece of torn shirt. His shirt. Wait a minute, look. Inside there's more writing. Looks like a code. Uh, may I see it, sir? Nakai Paxi got to my feet. Oh, it's not English. What do you make of it, August? Well, why don't you try reading it backwards, sir? Back? If I want to escape, I can. What, is he crazy? Why write me a note like this? What do you think, August? Well, I'm thinking, where do you get the pen and the ink to write with? Thank you, Marge. What are you doing on your hands and knees over there? Oh, uh, hello, Warden. Just playing with the little beggars. There isn't much else to do to amuse yourself. I, um... I brought you this prison shirt. You won't find it so easy to write on dark blue denim striped with black. You know, I don't know what you hope to accomplish by that silly note. I know why you're here. But I warn you, it's my duty to stop you from escaping. And... What did you write that note with? Isn't finding that out also your duty? Angus, how many days have I been in cell 99? Uh, three whole days, Dr. March. And my name isn't Angus, it's Argus. Oh, how could I have forgotten? The new drainage system that was put in leads right to the river, does it? Uh, yes, sir. I suppose the pipes are pretty small. Oh, no, not if you're five inches high. <laughs> You're very watchful and quick. When I started this, August, I was firmly convinced escape was possible. How would you react to a considerable financial reward? For what? For helping me escape. You've got the keys. No. Five hundred dollars? No. Thousand? <laughs> Dr. March, if you gave me ten thousand dollars, I, I couldn't let you out. Now, between here and the main gate, there are seven different doors. Now, I only have keys for this building. Besides, I, 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 I just couldn't do it. Spoken like an August. What is it about my name, sir, that makes you say that? In good time, my vigilant watchman. I shall tell you. Tried to bribe you, did he? First some dumb message in code, and now attempted bribery. You know, August, I'm beginning to worry about that cell. Come on, come on along with me. I'm going to try to persuade him to forget this. Sears, open the cell block. Shh, shh, Warden. What is it? Well, I, 
I hear something from cell 99. Okay. Let's move up real quiet and see what he's up to. That sounds like he's got a file and he's working one of the steel bars. Dr. Marge, what are you doing? Uh, not a thing, Warden. All right, guard the cell door, please. What are you hiding behind your back, Doctor? Behind my back? Nothing. See? My hands are empty. Guard, search him. Hey, let me hear something, Warden. Here. Well, well, well. That looks like a metal instep from a shoe. Hiding it under your belt, Doctor, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're going to have to do better than that. Uh, here's another one, Warden. Oh, thank you. Well, that accounts for both shoes. You know, Doctor, never in a million years can you cut those window bars with something like this. Why don't you call your friends and tell them you're ready to give up? Tell them the scientific experiment is over. I haven't started yet. Argus, come back to my office with me for a moment, will you? I have an idea. Warden, do you think he has any chance of getting out? No, of course not. Just the same, he's darn clever. I was reading in the trib about him. That fellow Jimmy Purvis had a whole column about him being here. I don't know how he found out. He calls him Big Brain or Great Brain. You know something? It still bugs me that I don't know how he wrote that note. Who's that? Uh, the the uh, prisoner we just got up in 79, two tiers up. Come on, up the stairs, Argus, quick. One, one more flight, Warden. Oh, I'm getting too old for this. All right, what's the matter with you? Stop that noise. All right, God, open up. What am I to do? Get off your knees, prisoner. Argus, you know what's the matter with this man? Take me out of this cell, please. Take me out. I heard something. It's making me sick. Who is this please. fellow? What's he accused of? Uh, Henry Victor, sir. He's accused of throwing acid in a woman's face. She uh, died of it. I can't prove it. I can't prove it. Please put me in some other right, cell. I don't care, Victor. I'm the warden. If you've heard anything strange, I want to know what it was. I can't. I can't. Well, where did it come from? I don't know. Everywhere. Nowhere. Please don't make me answer. You must answer. It was a voice. But it wasn't human. Yes, go on. Go on. It, it was so muffled and so far away and ghostly. Was it from outside or inside the prison? I told you it didn't come from anywhere. It was here. Right, right here. Everywhere. I, I get the wolves. Please, Warden, I'll go crazy. You've got to do something. Good afternoon, August. I see they've got you on the yard shift. How do you like it out of doors? Hey, Dr. March, you're supposed to be inside your cell. I am inside, August. No, not calling out of your window to me here in the yard. Now, why don't you obey the rules, Doctor? You've only got three more days. I wanted to ask you, August... Who services these prison arc lights? Uh, oh, I don't know. It's somebody from the outside. You have no electricians in the prison? No, no, sir, we don't. I think you'd save tons of money if you had your own man. Well, it's none of my business. Uh, doctor, will you please get away from your window? Before I go, I have something for you, August. Step up a little closer, huh? Can you reach out from the yard to my window? What is it? Just this $5 bill. Take it. Well, what for? For being so affable and understanding. Keep it. You deserve it. And so I was patrolling out in the yard, and he's in his cell looking out the window, and he hands me this $5 bill. He said it was for me. I, I, I should keep it. Let me see. Five dollars. Wait a minute. March only had two tens and a five. One five came with that note. So where did he get this one? Well, uh, could somebody have changed one of the tens for him? Who? You're the only one he sees. Ah, uh, no, I've got to search 99 again. Something's hidden somewhere. When a prisoner can write messages when he wants, get money when he wants, we're in deep trouble. This could cost me my job. Uh, who 
is it? It's me, the warden. Uh, it's still dark. What time is it? Oh, please don't shine that flashlight in my face. It's three o'clock, Doctor. Oh, you're an early riser. You wouldn't care to come back when it's daylight, I suppose. I'm going to search every inch of this cell. Get up, please. First of all, I want to move your bed away from the wall. No. Nope. No, I don't need your help. You stand over there in that corner. Now, let's see what we have back here. Is that... Yeah, it must be the old drain pipe. What have you got in there? Oh, darn it, my fingers don't quite drink. Oh, yeah, I, I got a hold of something. As you, oh, it's a dead rat. Oh, yes, one of my local friends. Oh, my back. I shouldn't bend over that way. Doctor, help me move the bed up to the cell window. No funny business. Man. Yeah, happy to oblige. I might leave it there. Get a little more air. I'll just get myself up on it. Why are you standing on my bed? Just want to examine these bars. Yeah, that's solid. Solid. Everyone. <laughs> All perfectly rigid. Now don't move. I'm coming down. I was just going to give you a hand. Don't bother. Stand right there and we'll have a look at your clothing. All right, turn your trouser pockets inside out. Both of them? Come on, Doctor. Stop stalling. The left pocket. Okay. Now the right. Uh-oh. Money. Give it here, will you? One dollar bills. Five of them. If you'd like to borrow them, Warden, feel free. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me get this straight. When I locked you up here, you had two tens and a five. You sent one five with a note. You gave Argus another five. How did you get these? Now, don't tell me you just thought them up. I was going to say just that, but um, I won't. All right, I can't force you to talk. But I can watch your every move for the next 48 hours. Escaping from state penitentiary isn't going to be that easy. But, Warden, I never thought it would be. What we are hearing are the maneuvers of a superior intellect. Each move we have heard Dr. Gregory March make has a reason. Mystery Theater shall return shortly with Act Three. I don't think either you or I doubt that Dr. Gregory March isn't going to be able to escape that fortress of steel and stone. And I suspect for all his bluff, the warden fears the same. It's how he'll do it that fascinates. What transforming power is this superior brain able to exert? It is the fifth day, the hour is late, and the warden turns restlessly in his bed. What in heaven's name is that? Where's the light? Where's that phone? Night duty. Hit the alarm and get Argus to call me back. But I get some clothes on. Oh, 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 my back. That crazy man again. Okay, night duty. Turn the alarm off. Victor's screaming. I, I, I can't get him to quiet down. Open up his cell, Argus. <laughs> Now, 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 Victor, what's going on? Will you get up off the floor? What's all the yelling about? I can't stand it. I did it. I did it. I killed him. Yes, I did. I killed him. Take that voice away. Get it away from me. Take what voice away? I said enough. I admit I killed him. I threw the acid in her face. I didn't mean for her to die. Oh, come on, Victor. Stop it. Stop it. It was me. I did it. I confess. Get me out of this cell. Sure. Hear it? What? I don't hear anything. No, it stopped. It's that voice again. Kind of muffled, like a voice from the dead. What does it tell you? Acid, acid, acid. It keeps saying that over and over again. It accuses me, see? Acid. Because 
I threw the acid and the woman died. She couldn't identify me, see? But I have to confess, I got to the voices making me. Is that all your voice said? Just acid? That's, that's what it was saying yesterday and the day before. Nothing else? There was something else that said, I remember now, size eight hat. Yes, that's what it was. Size eight hat? Yes, size eight hat. Very clear. Said it a couple of times. Good morning, Argus. This is the warden. You can congratulate me. It's the seventh day and I'm still playing with a full deck. The two friends of Dr. March are here. Yeah, I know it's very early. Would you bring us all some coffee? <laughs> Thanks. Well, Warden, I'll confess to you. I thought he'd do it. And I'm very surprised he hasn't. Aren't you, Herbert? Um, not really, Jason. Even brain power's got its limitations. Well, I can tell you now, he didn't really try very hard. Spent most of his time being friendly with his guard, playing with the rats in his cell, writing notes. Now, that is something I never caught on to, where he got the pen and ink. And you know that 25 you gave him? Mm-hmm. It turned into a 10, two fives, five singles. Crazy, huh? Hmm. We never came into contact with any other prisoners? Never. I saw him, and his guard saw him. Well, here he is now. Uh, this is Mr. Argus, who's personally been in charge of cell 99. I'd just put the coffee on the desk, Argus. Gentlemen, help yourself. Uh, Warden, I have a special delivery letter for you. Oh, thank you. Tell me, how is our distinguished Houdini this morning? Well, half an hour ago at six, he was sleeping like a baby. Oh, he uh, gave me this last night. What is it? A silver dollar. He handed it to you? Yes, sir. To remember him by. <laughs> you see what I mean, gentlemen? Crazy stunts like that. But trying to escape? No, sir. Oh, excuse me. Wasn't he? What arc lights? Well, if you discovered it last night, why didn't you take care of it then? Well, sure, call the electric service company. Tell them to send three or four men down here in the double to fix it. Problems? Oh, an arc light on one side of the yard has been out all night. Uh, are you going to open the letter, Warden? It was a special delivery. Huh? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I'll be a son of a gun. Well, what is it? You look at the envelope. A special delivery letter, return address, cell 99. Says, dear friends, don't forget you're invited for dinner tonight at 727. Warden Hammer, that means you, too. And you, my vigilant Argus. Faithfully yours, Gregory Mart. Argus, you hightail yourself over to cell 99 right now and see if that man's still in there. Main gate, this is the warden. Those electricians arrived yet? Three workmen and a supervisor. Okay, but just make sure only four men leave. That gentleman is security. I, uh, I can't get over this letter. The, the, the nerve... Excuse me. Yeah? Two reporters? Sure, why not? Yeah, bring them over to my office. Did either of you gentlemen tell the press to be here this morning? No. No, neither did I. Warden, he's in his cell, all right, and still asleep. I could see him uh, through the cell door. Well, I've been looking at this letter. It's Gregory's handwriting, but the postmark is blurred. Looks like last night's date. Hm. How did he do it? That's what's got me. If he is in his cell, how did he do it? Argus, go see who that is. Oh, it's the reporters. Hello, Warden. Hi, Jimmy. Uh, gentlemen, this is Jimmy Purvis from the Trib. Uh, come on in and bring your friend, Jim. Good morning, folks. I uh, heard there's a story here. Uh, now, let me uh, introduce my associate. Uh, turn around, pal. Dr. Gregory March. Greg? How did you do it? <laughs> Forgive me. 
I'm a little earlier than 11.17, but I don't think Warden Hammer will mind. March, will you mind telling me how... Not Warden. Why don't we all go back to cell 99 and I'll show you. Jimmy, I think the Trib will enjoy this story. Jimmy, this has been my home for a week. Certain disadvantages, but certain advantages. To demonstrate the extraordinary advantages of this extraordinary cell, I step on the pad, sweep my hand across the bars on this small window, and presto! The window bars all fall down like magic. How could that be? I tested those. Before, Warden. Now that. Who's that in the bed? Mr. Nobody. Argus, shine your light upon that strange bedfellow. I pull back the cover a wee bit, and what do you see, gentlemen? A wig. <laughs> you ought to know, Jimmy. The color is excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. Would you mind pulling the covers all the way back, Dr. March? What's that body made of? Oh, happy to oblige. Well, for oh, good color. Warden, would you be so good as to identify what you see on the bed? I can't believe it. It's a coil of rope. Thirty feet, I'll have you know. And there are a couple of files, a roll of uh, fine wire, a pair of pliers. Sure beats me. If you'll excuse me, I'd better get myself back to the house. It takes me quite a while to decide what wines should be served at our little celebration. Just a minute. Aren't you going to tell us how you did it? Perhaps. Later. Over the brandy. Well, my very dear friends, was that dinner worth waiting for? I trust everyone else had enough to eat. Shall we tell them, Jimmy? Oh, you tell them, Doctor. They were your ideas. Very simple. You sit down and you weigh the odds. On one side, you have seven steel doors, and on the other, a rat hole. My escape was facilitated by a rat running out of a rat hole. Yes, but what did you write the notes with? And where did you get the money and all those things stuffed in your bed to make it look like you were sleeping? I mean, the rope, wire, pliers, you had a hardware store full. Uh, let me tell it my way, Warden. You sit there. You say, where do those rats go? Into the river? Or does the old drain come out on land? So you examine the little beggars. Their feet are dry. They are land rats. I see that, but... It's still hundreds of yards between cell 99 and where the drain ends. Warden, did you know there's a quarter of a mile of cotton thread in one good cotton sock? Let me show you. I snip one end with my fingernail and then pull gently, gently. See? One continuous thread. So I wrote a note on a piece of shirt. That was before you confiscated my white shirt, remember? Mm -hmm. Tied my instructions to a $10 bill and tied the whole thing to a rat's foot and sent him on his way through the old drain, keeping the other end loosely in my hand. Oh. <laughs> I knew the little beast, as soon as he got out of the pipe, would sit down and gnaw the thread off, which is what he did. It must have been the next day a boy showed up at the Trib and asked for me. He handed me the note, which said, Will the finder take this to Jimmy Purvis at the Tribune? He'll give you another ten dollars. The kid had found the note playing ball. Uh, what made you interested, Mr. Purvis? Well, the uh, note said, I dare you, and it was signed, Chess Player. I made the boy show me where he'd found the note, and sure enough, there was the thread. It ran the length of the old drain. That afternoon, I felt a tug, and I knew I had an ally. The thread passed notes back and forth, and wire became rope, and a plan was set up for today. You came pretty close, Warden, but your fingers weren't long enough. All you found was the dead rat I put there. I still want to know, what did you write the notes with? The metal tip of my shoelace made a pen. The shoe polish, moistened with water, was the ink. Doctor, I've got to hand it to you. Hey, uh, Dr. Marge. Did you have anything to do with a prisoner who was two tiers right above in cell 99? He was hearing voices. I'm afraid I'm to blame for better or worse. All the old drain pipes must be connected. To cut the bars, I needed nitric acid. I'd run out of shoe polish, so I tried whispering nitric acid into the drain pipe so Jimmy could hear me at the other end. Oh, so Victor did hear that word. Acid. 
After repeating it several nights, Jimmy got the message, sent some test tubes full of nitric to me, and with the wire, I was able to cut the bars. The tooth powder kept the acid from spreading. But once I got out of my cell, how to get to the warden's office disguised? We worked out this plan for me to have a workman's uniform, and I whispered to Jimmy, get me a size 8 hat. He did hear a size 8 hat. Poor Victor. So... It was you who cut the wire outside your window leading to the arc light. August, congratulations. That's just what I did. When the warden called the electric service company, I was waiting there. You were there, Mr. Burman? Mm-hmm. I persuaded the supervisor I'd like to go along that maybe there was a story. And I brought extra overalls and a hat for Dr. Marsh. I'd escaped through the window in the darkness a couple of hours earlier, replaced the bars and hid behind one of the buildings. I'd watched the patrols. I knew exactly what their route was. So I arrived with the electricians, helped Dr. March get dressed, and the two of us walked into your office, Warden. End of an escape. <laughs> I'll be darned. There's always a way. Just rely on your brain. Jimmy, don't be too hard on the Warden here. And August, my faithful guard. I've enjoyed every moment, sir. Whoever christened you must have known the profession you'd follow. Well, how's so, sir? Why, your name. It means a very watchful person. Argus was a mythical being with a hundred eyes, some of which were always wide open. <laughs> Not open wide enough, I'd say. I'll be back shortly with a final thought. The pertinent point that suddenly jumps in front of my mind is remembering a short verse by Emily Dickinson. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease, and you beside. Our cast included Gordon Heath, Russell Horton, Earl Hammond, and Ian Martin. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I'm Hyman Brown. Probably the greatest English writer of the last century could be the novelist H.G. Wells. Wells has lifted our imaginations with the first men on the moon, War of the Worlds, the Invisible Man, and so on. With extraordinary resourcefulness and creativity, he has brought life to the incredible. And today... We have taken his words from the page, placed them in your ear, so that you can actually believe you are in the outlandish world of H.G. Wells. Professor Lidget, can you make out the school desks and the school children? Yes, I can. And I do. From here they look phosphorescent, luminous, don't they? They do look strange, Platner. And that explosion blew us a considerable distance away. I must get back to the school and take charge. Oh, Professor Lidget, I, I don't think that'll be possible. Why not, indeed? Because I think that you and I are dead. <laughs> A mystery drama, Watcher of the Living, adapted from a story by H.G. Wells, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agat Jr. and stars Tony Roberts. I'll be back shortly with Act One. What will it be this time, Mr. Wells? Mars colliding with Earth? 
a machine to put you in another century? The problems of loving and living when no one can see you? None of the above? Something completely different. Yes. In fact, In the 90 years of science fiction that followed where H.G. Wells blazed the trail, no one has ever attempted to duplicate the story we tell you now. My name is Fred Plattner. I'm 27. My mother and father passed away when I was 10. I'm a teacher at a small school in Sussexville. So small that one teacher has to do the work of five. Too much work for too little pay. Last week, I heard of a great summer job in town. Lifeguard on Sandy Beach. To apply, I first had to get a physical checkup. Mr. Platner, I do not have good news for you. I'm sick, uh, Dr. Bender? No, I I wouldn't say that. Not sick, but uh, strange. Uh, You mean when you examined me, you found I didn't want to say anything until I had the x-rays, but I can tell you this. In all my years of general practice, I have never seen a body like yours. Uh, Well, uh, will I live? Who knows? Uh, Before I show you the x-rays, tell me, young man, why do you want to be a lifeguard? I understand you have an eminently scholarly position as a teacher. Well, that's what everyone tells me, Doctor. But there's no money in it now and no future in it tomorrow. What do you teach? What don't I teach? (laughs) Bookkeeping, geography, modern languages, and chemistry, which Dr. Lidget, our former principal, threw at me about a month ago. Aye, all those subjects. You must have a vast knowledge. No, I don't. But since my students begin by knowing nothing, all I have to do is bone up from day to day and stay one lesson ahead. What an extraordinary way to run a school. (laughs) In a town of a thousand persons and one and a quarter children per household, I was told by Professor Lidget, the principal, there was no alternative. There are two other teachers besides myself, and that's it. On my present salary, I can hardly save a cent. But if I pass the physical and get this lifeguard position, I could clear $300 this summer. I wish I could help you, Mr. Platner, but the facts don't help me. Uh, Let me show you. Uh, Look at these, your x-rays. First, notice, your heart beats on the right side of your body. Now look at this plate. That is the right lobe of your liver. However, it's on the left side, and the left lobe is on the right side. Uh, Tell me, have you noticed any changes in yourself lately? Well, now that you mention it, I have been finding it sort of difficult to write straight across a page the way I used to. You've stopped writing? How do you correct papers? Using my left hand and writing across the paper from right to left. Anything else, Mr. Platner, out of the ordinary? Well, I was never very good at sports, but now I can't throw a ball with my right hand at all. With your left? Not far. And sometimes I get confused at mealtimes, trying to find my knife and fork. I've caught myself quite often trying to cut my meat with my fork and putting it into my mouth with my knife. I'm backwards, is that it? What should be on your right side is on your left. You're sure I haven't always been that way? I asked myself the same question. So I got out your old x-rays from Dr. Jonas's files. The last time you came for a checkup... Everything was in its proper place. I wonder... I have a theory, Mr. Platner, uh, which is not easy to substantiate, how this might have occurred to a person. Uh, But my theory could hardly apply to you. It couldn't? There's a mathematical hypothesis that the only way a solid body can be changed is by taking that body clean out of space, as we know it, and inverting it. Oh, my gosh. Much further into space than any astronauts have ever gone, of course. Into the fourth dimension, in fact. Uh, But that is a theory, and you, Mr. Platner, are a fact. Obviously, your internal exchange of left for right was not the result of any voyages into the fourth dimension. But they are. I mean, uh, they could be. 
You have made such a trip? I have. I was hoping to keep it a secret. Uh, my dear young man, look, getting a job this summer as a lifeguard isn't that important. Oh, but I did. Two weeks ago. I mean, I returned from wherever I was two weeks ago. Didn't you hear about my disappearing from the school? You see, that's where I must have been. In that fourth dimension. Mr. Platner, you're not feeling chilly or flushed, are you? No, I'm fine. So you took a trip into space, did you? Well, I don't know where I was, but I, I certainly wasn't in Sussexville. Mr. Platner, I imagine the tests have been a bit exhausting, so uh, if you'll come into the next room, uh, you just stretch out on this couch, close your eyes, and rest up a bit. But I'm not tired. Uh, for your own sake, I think lying down won't hurt. You know, when you speak of traveling to other dimensions, even if you can't be a lifeguard this summer, I'd hate you to lose your teaching job because they thought... You've lost your mind. Of course, I couldn't really blame Dr. Bendener for thinking somehow I'd become unscrewed. And as I lay down in his ante room, those nine days in nowhere came back to me. Nine days I'd never forget. It began on a Tuesday night after chemistry class. Why are you still here, Platner? The bell rang. What are all these boys still doing here? They haven't all been kept in, have they? Uh, Professor Lidget, uh, <clears throat> Carson here uh, found some green powder up in the old lime kiln. So I told the boys if they'd like to take part in some scientific research, stay after class. And we'll subject the green powder to some scientific tests. Ah. Uh. Oh, uh, proceed then, Platner. I shall watch with interest. Uh, you don't mind if I stand beside you at the table here? No, 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 not at all. Uh, Professor Lidget, we're conducting this experiment to impress upon these boys, uh, Jacoby, Goodman, O'Shea, and, and Carson, that curiosity is not something that should stop after one has left school. So... Here is a medicine bottle containing green powder, courtesy of Billy Carson, and uh, plugged with a masticated piece of newspaper. Uh, plugged with what? Uh, a large spitball. First, we place a small amount of the green powder into a test tube. Now, we hold the tube under the tap and see what effect is caused by water. Hm. No effect. No change in the substance whatsoever. As you can see, the powder does not even dissolve. Now, uh, we'll prepare a number of test tubes, filling them with a little of Carson's green powder, partially filling each, and then in turn, we'll test the green powder against nitric acid, sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid. Very disappointing. No results, no changes in the powder. The experiment has yielded us zero. Nix. Naught. Well, boys, those are the hazards of science. Uh, why don't you set fire to some of the powder, Platinum? Light it? With a match. Mm, or a Bunsen burner. Boys, our principal, Professor Lidget, suggests a test by fire. Here we go. We knock a few grains from the bottle onto this slate on our lab table. Professor, would you oblige with a match? Oh, yes, happy to. Ah, it's smoking. The green powder is melting. Explosion, I was lifted off my feet and driven forcibly backwards. I wondered if I'd crashed through the wall or window of the chemistry lab. The next thing I knew, I was thrown to the ground. 
Ladner. Ladner, is that you? Professor Lidgett. Are you hurt? Well, I, I, I don't think so. Me neither. Uh, uh, my my face seems to be all right. <laughs> I still have both my ears, uh, hands, arms, and my feet. Oh, so am I, thank heaven. But where's the school? Where are we? None of this countryside looks familiar to me. Look. Straight in front of us. Huh? Those figures. I know those boys. They're in my bookkeeping class. But how strange they look. Sort of gray and amorphous. Almost floating. Are those gray shapes there? Those are our students? I can see their lips move. They're talking. But I can't hear a word they're saying. And they're coming towards us. The one in front is Johnson. Great heavens. He just walked right through you. I, I know. And I didn't feel a thing. Did you notice how dark it is getting? Above us, the sky is jet black. The only light is that greenish glow on the horizon and those black hills. Where, where are we? Well, I can still see the chemistry classroom, but seems to be receding, getting fainter. Yes, I can see it, too, way off there. It's as though I had X-ray eyes and can see right through the walls. Now, we must get back. We've been blown a considerable distance away. I must take charge. Well, I, I doubt that that will be possible, sirs. As I analyze it, uh, A, no one sees us. B, no one hears us. C, the boys walk right through us. D, yet we appear whole and uninjured. E, to ourselves we are real, but the school seems unreal. Therefore, I would conclude, uh, ergo... What, 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 what? That you and I, Professor, are dead. Well now, have we just heard from the living or, should I say, speaking dead? How's that for a first act curtain? The shape of things to come, things beyond have always intrigued men. If, as some philosophers believe, ours is a world of the dying then the next could possibly be the world of the living. What it's like, we may find out when Mystery Theater returns shortly. An overworked teacher in a small grammar school explodes himself and the principal into... into what? He believes it's the world of the dead. But could he be someplace else? Some in-between state? It's a land where everything is shades of gray and green. Remember, it was a green powder that caused all this. A fact that does not escape those left behind. Were you able to get any sense out of the boy, Dorothy? Well, Billy says it was a, a green powder he found. Brought it to class... And his chemistry teacher blew himself up with it. And that he and the principal just plain disappeared. Blown to bits. No trace of them, Jim. A doggone part of it is you'd think an explosion like that would make some kind of noise. Oh, it knocked out a wall, but none of the children were hurt. So Billy brought that green powder, huh? We could be in for a peck of trouble. Do, do you really think so? Our son brings an explosive to school. His teacher and the principal are blown away. They could hold us responsible. They could? We're his parents, and he's underage. I wonder which teacher it was. Oh, Fred Plattner. You remember him. They've got Fred teaching chemistry? What does he know? No wonder everything went fluey. Oh, he's such a nice young man, too. Oh, I know that. Now, promise you won't say anything to Billy tonight. He was very fond of Fred, too. Oh, no, 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 
don't, 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 Fred. Please, please, please don't. Jim, Jim, wake up. Jim, what is it? Jim, wake up. Oh, oh, Dorothy, I, I had such a nightmare. I, I was dreaming. Oh, don't tell me. Don't tell me. Why not? It was kind of crazy. I had a terrible dream, too, Jim. Fred Platner. He came right into this room and he motioned for me to follow him downstairs. Oh. And then he took out a small medicine bottle with green powder in it and was trying to give it to me. And then suddenly, it was gone. I saw him, too. By the whole closet. I mean, in my dream. He was standing by Billy's bed. And he had that same bottle in his hand. And he was shaking his head. And then I, I woke up. Poor Fred. He was too young to die. It was like he was trying to tell Billy something. That's what Fred did to me in my dream. Made me feel he wanted to tell me something. So, here I am, Fred Platner. Or maybe I should say I was Fred Platner. Now I exist in this other world, and I'm trying hard to get through to the world I've been blown out of. To those incandescent, phosphorescent shadows of people and places I knew. It's very frustrating. Platner, where the devil are we? Gee, I wish I knew, Professor Lidget. I was watching you before walking down that steep hill and stopping, and then you were shouting at some rocks. Well, I was trying to get through to Jimmy Carson. No go. He can't hear me. There must be a way to communicate with our world. Cut through the invisible barrier that separates us. Uh, Platner, I, I think I'm getting a chill. Well, it's sitting in one place, Professor Lidget. Uh, Give me your hand. Yes. Oh. Up, up you go. Uh, now, we'll get ourselves off this cliff. Down there, it may be warmer. Oh, thank you, my boy. I'll follow you. I don't think I valued you when you were teaching at Sussexville. Yes, that's good. That's good. One step at a time. It's never as steep as you think. Um, I'll have to tell you, Professor, I have no idea where we're heading. But at least we're moving, and that's the best way to keep warm. Fladner, you know what's even more terrifying? I can hear you, and you can hear me, but that's all. There's no sound in this place. The leaves are moving, but no sound. The wind is blowing. You, you, you can feel it, but you can't hear a thing. We came down this cliff, not one footfall, not a sound. It's all like some mad, silent movie. Not a sound anywhere. Will you see who's at the door? I'm just clearing away the breakfast dishes. Billy was late getting off to school today. Honey, I've got to make tracks for work myself. Harry's been giving me the hairy eye lately, ever since that rumor went around town about Billy blowing up the school. Uh, oh, all right. Oh, hello, Sheriff. What can I do for you? Good morning, Jim. May I come in for a few minutes? Oh, Sure. Is Billy home? Uh, who? Billy, your son. Oh, oh yes. I, 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 I mean, no, 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 no. Billy's in school. He loves school. Wouldn't miss a day. Now, maybe it's just as well. Uh, sit down, Sheriff. Uh, can I get you some coffee? No, thanks. Who is it, Jim? What? Hello, Sheriff. What brings you here this early? I'll get to the point. You all know about that explosion at the school? Why, yes, I did hear something about that. Uh, accident in the chemistry lab or something, eh? We've been investigating, and I'm not so sure I can call it an accident. Fred Flatner and Professor Lynchett have... <laughs> yes, that's a shame. We've questioned every boy who was in or near that class, Jim, and they all say the same thing. Well, Billy didn't mean anything by it. Honestly, he didn't. Dorothy, shut up. I, I, I mean, dear, let the sheriff tell us what's on his mind. I intend to. 
The information we've gathered is that your son brought a green powder into the class laboratory, and it was that that caused the explosion. A green powder? Well, where could Billy have found such a thing? He never said anything about it to us, did he, dear? Jim, I think we should tell the sheriff. Well, there's nothing to tell. You asked where your son could have gotten such a powder. Three boys were with him when they all went to the lime kiln. He found it there and put it in the bottle. Oh, what three boys? Ted Jacoby, Matthew Goodman, and Tommy O'Shea. I know those kids. They'll say anything. You know how kids are. You're not going to believe the word of little kids, are you? Unfortunately, we have no adult witnesses. But as we piece the story together, this was no ordinary school experiment. Well, I don't see how you could hold my boy responsible for the mistakes of a teacher. So far as you know, then, Jim, this whole story about Billy and the green explosive is untrue? Absolutely. Is this Billy's school satchel? Yes, it is. Where did you find it? In the chemistry lab, under one of the seats. I'll be straightforward with both of you. We found traces of a green powder inside. So, if you don't mind... I'm going to have to ask you, Jim, to come along with me back to the station house. I can't go there now. I'm due at work. I'm afraid you haven't got any choice, Jim. But what have I got to do with it? The law says that since Billy is underage, you, his father, are responsible. I have to book you, Jim. Book me? On what charge? Accessory to murder. Several days and nights went by in our green world. This particular morning when I awoke, large, strange snowflakes were dropping all over me. Green snowflakes. And then, for the first time, the stillness was broken by a sound. Platinum, you hear that? Ah, Bell. I think it comes from way down there in the gorge. Uh, let's get down there. Maybe there are people or someone who can help us. Oh, beautiful. Platinum, do you hear that? Hear what? The sound of our own footsteps. Things are starting to be a little bit more normal. And it's not so cold down here. Hmm. Mm. Look at those gray craters. Will you look at that? I never. A great stone building. There's an entrance. Let's go on in. Wait a minute, Platna. Isn't there something wrong about it? Something peculiar? Well, nothing more peculiar than finding any gray skyscraper in a green world. It doesn't have any windows. It's like being inside a huge tomb. There are some flickering lights way down there. An altar. Something's moving back there. Where? To the right of the altar. What looks like a torch burning a green flame. Oh, yes, I see what you mean. Now, follow along the walls where that strange writing runs around the side. All the way to the right. Snowflakes. Big as a balloon, moving up and down. Let's get closer and have a look. No, I, I think I'll stay back here. If I go forward, Professor, you'll be alone here. Oh. Those large things. Their heads. Floating heads. With with sort of tails hanging from each one like giant tadpoles in the air. They don't seem to have faces. Hey, one is turning around. It's got eyes. The others are turning now, too. They do have faces. Look at them now. They're floating away. Uh, anyone here? Uh, something just flew into my face. Something cold. It's, it's, it's one of them. Who are you? Who are you? Who 
Magna. I don't think I can take much more of this. Look back. What do you see? I see the school. Our school. The big assembly hall. And the boys are taking a test. <laughs> the midterms, that's what they are. Well, will you look at that? Some of them are using a crib. A pony. So they are. Cheating in a midterm. Platinum, make a note which boys are cheating. No, I don't see the school anymore. It's changing now. I can see a street. It... Yes, it's Main Street. So it is. But how can we see Main Street from here? Because it runs right through us. Uh, this world, this dimension. So that's where they went. Who went? Those floating faces. They're hovering over the people walking on the street, see? Look, one or two following each person, watching. Watching? Why are they there? They're watching the living. Platner, where are you? I'm here. I just don't want to look anymore. Oh, what's the matter with you? you you're crying. I know what those watchers of the living are doing. I know who they are. There are two of them above my head, aren't there? Yes. A man's face and a woman's face. I know them. I know who they are. The two faces over your head, you know them? It's my mother and father. H.G. Wells asks, who are these watchers of the living? Why do they so passionately watch those they have left forever? Is it that when our life is over and evil or good are no longer a choice, that we may still have to watch the consequences of what we began? If this is so, then certainly Fred Platner and Professor Ligette have not died, but have invaded that dimension which hangs over all of us. Mystery Theater will continue shortly. Let H.G. Wells continue his story. If human souls continue after death, then surely human interests can continue after death. So these watchers of the living keep an eye on earthlings. Make note that this in-between land is green, the color of renewal, of continuation, of movement. Therefore, this island in space and time into which our two men have stepped could be a moving platform. But to where? How many days has it been, Platner? No, how many times did I go to sleep and wake up? Uh, six, seven, eight? I can't be sure. We have only you to blame for this. I seem to remember that it was you, Professor, who said, why don't you set a match to the powder? Why do these infernal things have to hang around us? What have I done to them? Well, go, go on, get away from me. Go away. Do you hear me? I... I don't see how you stand these floating heads always following us, bumping us like balloons with faces. I am trying to be calm and not let myself go, and you must do the same, Professor. I could just as easily lose my nerve, but how would that help me? Hm. Listen. They've stopped. You're in a different spot than I am, Platner. Your mother and father are watchers. I hope you never see your parents as I'm seeing mine. Not being able to speak to them and be understood. Not knowing whether they are real or shadows. No. No. I absolutely refuse to be fingerprinted and that's final. You have a right to call your lawyer. Where are the bodies? Where's Fred Platten? Where's the headmaster, Professor Lidget? How can you be sure they aren't still somewhere, wandering about in shock, maybe, but very much alive? If in over a week they haven't shown up? Amnesia. Do you know what that is, Sheriff? If I were blown up in some ridiculous experiment, it would addle my brains, too. They're alive, I bet you, but they don't know who they are or where. Well, that all may be true, but you're still responsible for what happened. Speak to the mayor if you want to, but you're not leaving here until formal charges are placed. Uh, 
It had all changed between Professor Lidget and myself. No longer were we of like mind in this limbo of the dead where there was no sunrise or sunset, where a green haze hung over vast cliffs and stone buildings without windows. We were enemies, and that didn't help. The day I hired you for the school, I must have been mad, Platner. You got us into this. Now, what are we going to do? Try to keep my head, for one thing. For another, I am going to sit here and have another try at getting through to Sussexville. Oh, you have a formula? How are you going to do it? Concentrate. Mother, father... Help me see our town. There. I can see right through that rock face. The walls of the house. Like glass. Well, Professor, you got your wish. There's Billy Carson and his mother. They're standing in the kitchen listening to the telephone. There's unhappiness written on her face. I shouldn't wonder. That boy shouldn't be allowed out alone. He's a menace. They're talking to someone at the police station. Mother, father, I want to see what is happening there. Dorothy, honey, don't cry. They won't let me go home right now. I've called our lawyer. He's in court, but he'll get over here as soon as he can. Now, you just tell Billy what trouble he's caused. Uh, I don't know when I'll get home. I'll, I'll get there when I get there. That's all I know. This way, Mrs. Vandermill. I don't know what possibly could have come over that sales girl. I mean, to actually accuse me. Now, Mrs. Vandermill, there's nothing I can do. Maybe something did happen to fall off the perfume counter into my purse, but heavens to say I was shoplifting. Me. Helena Vandermill, why, I own half this town. Why would I ever steal anything? Uh, they did find some merchandise in your handbag. Oh. Oh, who is that man sitting over there? He's in our custody. He's waiting for his attorney. Now, Mrs. Vandermill, if you'll kindly pay the fine, all the formalities will be taken care of. Oh, Sheriff, you are the most understanding public servant in this town. The fine, Mrs. Vandermill? Oh, yes, of course. Now, how how much will it be this time? I'd say $50 would govern. $50 it is. Here you are. All I have with me is 20, so here are three and... Do keep the change. Thank you, Mrs. Vanderbilt. Yes, I'll be more careful next time and keep my bag closed. Who was that? The richest old gal in town. But I have to haul her in at least once a week. She can't help shoplifting. Oh, well, why didn't you arrest her? Oh, I couldn't do that. Well, why did you slip her fine in your pocket? I keep it safe there. Understand? Yeah, I'm beginning to. And how much would a little understanding cost me? Mr. Carson, I mean, Jim. I knew you'd understand the way we do business around here. I'm sorry I was a little slow. Uh, Let me see what I have in my wallet. The crookedness in our town. I had no idea... Starting with boys cheating on their exams, all the way to the police taking bribes. Lidget and I had stopped talking. I was too tired one evening to keep my eyes open, and before I knew it, I was asleep. Platner! Platner, get up! Huh? Huh? What? What's the matter? Get up! Oh, yes, certainly. <clears throat> Professor, what are you holding that rock in your hand for? I'm not staying here any longer. Well, how do you propose to leave? You're going to lead me back to the exact spot where we entered this other world. Oh, I don't know that I remember it. Well, you'd better, if you don't want your head bashed in. Professor Lidget, I understand the strain you feel, but what good will it do you to hurt me? I don't care anymore. I've got to leave here. All right, all right. Let's start up this path and 
see if I can find the place. Hello, operator. I dialed 555-1212 and I got a wrong number. Would you place the call for me, please? It's the mayor's office. <laughs> it works every time. Uh, good morning, Mayor. Not too badly. We made $260. 60 from the old klepto, and I nicked another citizen for the 200 All right, will you stop by, or shall I send the cash over to the town hall? Good. I'll put 130 in an envelope addressed to you and marked official business. That little scene at conniving didn't escape me either. It made me wonder, did I really wish to return to the life I had grown up with? We climbed and finally reached a plateau which I thought looked familiar. Is this where we first landed? Are you sure? I'm as sure as I can be. You know, Professor, that world of ours, it's not what it's cracked up to be. No, no it isn't But it's the only game in town And people aren't what they think they are Blattner, you're still carrying that glass bottle with some green powder Yes, I still have it What's left? Why? Nothing Just thinking Hmm it's finally dawned on me why the watchers of the living have such unhappy faces. What goes on on earth is enough to make anyone sad. Greed, deceit. The people you thought were honorable, people you respected. Even you, Lidget. You're much less of a human being than I thought you were. Much less. Lidget, what are you doing with that rock? Lidget, please... Please! I came to, on Earth, lying sprawled out in the schoolyard, covered in scratches and bruises. I was alone. Professor Lidget didn't get back to Earth with me. I, I remembered running away from the professor, and uh, then I tripped and fell... Yes, the powder must have exploded on impact, and here I was. It was getting dark in Dr. Bendener's office, and I remembered I'd come to see him for a physical. Feeling any better, Mr. Platner? Yes, I, I, I am. I'm fine now, Doctor. Had a little sleep? Oh, not exactly. I'm just thinking about how my insides got all reversed. Nothing's malfunctioning, you understand, just exchanged... Are you up to getting yourself home? Now, Dr. Bendener, I've decided I don't want to be a lifeguard after all. I'm just not the swimming kind. I didn't know there was any other kind. Oh, there are lots of ways lives can be guarded. Uh, I'd like to think about that. <laughs> think about what, Mr. Platner? Yeah, what I ought to do uh, now that I'm back. Back? Uh, go back uh, to teaching. I think you should. Oh, well, they say that those who can do, and those who can't teach. I think I can, Doctor. And there's an awful lot of doing that Sussexville needs. Maybe I'll just give it a try. I'll be back shortly with a final thought. Some folks around Sussexville are still scratching their heads wondering where Fred Platner and Professor Ligiet disappeared to for nine days and why the professor never came back. But Fred isn't telling anyone. Every now and then, though, he'll look up suddenly as if he was seeing someone he recognized. Who knows? Perhaps we are all being watched. Our cast included Tony Roberts... Bob Dryden, Bryna Rayburn, and Gilbert Mack. 
Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then. Pleasant dreams. in. Welcome. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. The poet tells us, at the door of life, at the gate of birth, there are worse things waiting for man than death. And well may we ask the poet, what are those worse things? After all, what could be more tragic than to die? And the answer, perhaps, it is more tragic not to die when your time has come and your life is over. And what are you trying to sell the suckers now? Rosie, this one can't miss. You know what I got here? What? Eternal life. So? What do you mean, so? I feed you the blockbuster and all you can give me is so? Now, I'm not sure how many people would want to live forever. What are you saying? Wouldn't you? I'd have to think about it. Our mystery drama, All the Time in the World, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Ralph Bell. I'll be back shortly with Act One. In everything we are told, there is a season. There's a time to be born and a time to die. And most of us follow that timetable. We arrive and we depart pretty much on schedule. Now and again, accidents or ailments or upheavals beyond our control may curtail our visit. But most of us have a pretty good shot at the allotted three score in ten. And many of us do even better. However, sooner or later, the hour must strike for everyone. Well, doesn't it? They are moving at a brisk pace through the lovely countryside, and it's a beautiful morning. All right, Harry. Where are we headed for? Rosie, baby, we are headed for one million bucks. <sighs> sure. Uh, but this time... This time, it's money in the bank. When can I write a check against it? Hey, Rosie, this can't miss. Hold it. That sign, it says Morristown. Right. That's exactly what it says. Morristown. Is that where we're going? We'll be there in exactly 15 minutes. What for? Because that's where the money is. And that's where the state penitentiary is. <laughs> Who would know that better than me? We're going to the state pen. Yes, baby. Why? Because he's being sprung today. Who is? A million dollars. We're going to pick him up. If you think you're going to bring home some bum for me to take care of... He's not a bum, Rosie. He's a pal of mine. He's guilty until he can prove himself innocent. Which, if he's a pal of yours, he will not be able to do. No, Harry. I'm putting my foot down. You turn this car right around now. But, baby, he's got no place else to go. If he's got a million dollars, he can find a place without any trouble. Rosie, I didn't say he's got a million dollars. What I said was... He is a million dollars. I don't understand you, Harry. <laughs> of course not. And I don't understand you either, Rosie. That's what makes our relationship so, uh... Yeah, what word am I looking for? Doomed. There it is, just up ahead. Yeah, I see it. And there uh, he is, standing by the gate. Who? Oh. My old buddy, Lucas. That's his name, Lucas? Lucas what? Well, I don't know if it's his first name or it's his last name. Yeah? Well, it would seem to me you don't know him very well. I know him well enough to make a million bucks. Hey, Lucas! Hey, up in the back. <laughs> Atta boy. And we're off. 
But waiting long, Lucas? No. Lucas, say hello to Rosie. Hello, Rosie. My pleasure, I'm sure. So, here you are, Lucas. With the new suit. <laughs> Some suit. And a cardboard valise. And a $20 bill, right? Yeah. So, how does it feel to be out, Lucas? All right. Hey, Lucas, I'll bet this is the first time you ever rode in an automobile, eh? Yeah, I guess so. How do you like it? It's fine. What have you two guys got going here? A vaudeville routine? Hey, come to think of it, when did Lucas ever have a chance to ride in an automobile, eh? Oh, well, how long has Lucas been in the slammer? A long, long time, baby. Yeah? What did he do? Why were you jugged, Lucas? Uh, uh, this time? I, uh... I don't remember. What do you mean you don't remember? Rosie, baby, not everybody has such a good memory. What does he mean this time? I happen to know his record. This time, he was up for murder. Murder? Yeah. It was during an armed robbery. Uh, it's coming back to me. I... Yeah, I remember now. Stop the car this minute. What for? You are not going to bring home any strong arms. Rosie, we have to give Lucas a break. No. Now, just look at him. Isn't he the nicest, mildest guy you ever want to see? He's out. The man paid his debt. He saved his time. You spell that O-U-T. He did his 99 years. And furthermore, if you ever think... He... He what? He was inside for 99 years. Harry, what kind of double talk are you giving me? This is a man who was sentenced to do 99 years. So he did his 99 and here he is. Nobody does 99. Here's a man, he looks, what, 35, 40, maybe tops. How can he have served 99? He's got the documents to prove it. What documents? For the next five years, Lucas has got to report once a month to his parole officer. He's got this card. Uh, uh, show it a card, Lucas. Harry. Just look at the card, huh? What does it say? Uh, the state of New... Ah, uh-huh, you see? It's an official document. Lucas, sentenced in the year 18... Oh, no, they have to be kidding. You're looking at the thing there in black and white, and you still won't believe it, To huh? serve a term of 99 years in the state penit... No. I still say it can't be. Lucas, how old are you? Oh, uh, I don't remember. I couldn't believe it myself at first. At least a... A hundred and forty years old. Oh, no. What do you mean, oh, no? People live that long, don't they? I never heard of it. Besides, he looks younger than you do. (laughs) Well, so much the better. For what? For our chances of making a million bucks. Oh, yeah. How many times have we had this talk before? Ah, ha, 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 ha. But this time, this time there's a difference. Yeah? What is it? Lucas. All right, Mr. Lucas, you may put your shirt on. Well, Doc, what's the verdict? Verdict? How old would you say Lucas is? How old? I'd say he has the heart, the lungs, the arteries, all the vital signs of a man in his 30s. His 30s, eh? Say his late 30s. Uh Uh-huh. Thank you, Doc. Would, uh, would you make a statement to that effect? I have subjected Mr. Lucas to a complete physical examination and find him to be in excellent condition. I would state that his health is above average for a man 40 years of age. This is the old ball game, Rosie. Yeah, well, all I know is this has cost us 75 bucks. And there has also been a substantial increase in the grocery bill since Lucas showed up. Rosie, you got to spend money to make money. Okay, we're spending it. Why don't we start making it? Tonight. What happens tonight? We go on TV. Who goes on TV? Me and Lucas. What for? Honey, how do you make money? It beats me. And if you want the truth, it also beats you. You advertise. That's right, Rosie. You gotta advertise. You know why? Oh, what am I getting into here? This little poem I picked up. The codfish lays a thousand eggs. The homely hen lays one. But the codfish never cackles to tell you what she's done. And so we scorn the codfish while the homely hen we prize. 
Which only goes to show you that it pays to advertise. Oh. And what are you going to advertise? And where are you going to get the money to do it? I'll answer the second question first. It's free. What's free? Tonight. You're going to see Lucas on the tube doing a guest shot. Who'd want Lucas for a guest shot? Bonnie Quackenbush, that's who. Oh, it figures. With all the other fruits and nuts. And what is Lucas going to advertise? Lucas is going to advertise that one commodity for which every single person in the world would give everything he owns. And what is that? Eternal life. Eternal life. Oh. What's with the O? Here I feed you the blockbuster and all you can give me is O? Eternal life. I'm not sure how many people would really want to live forever. What are you saying? There's enough suckers out there to add up to a million bucks. in Tubeville. It's me again, Bonnie Quackenbush. And look at whom we have for you in the Quack Pack tonight. Oh, wow. Ain't he a handsome thing? But remember, girls, Bonnie saw him first. And his name is Lucas. I'll say hello to the pack, Lucas. Uh Uh-huh. Hello. Uh, sexy, right? Uh, well, here's what's been happening. When the studio pack came in, we asked each and every one to write down how old they thought Lucas is. And I got all the answers right here. And they say, 35, 36, 37. Oh, that's how they've been running, 35-ish. Now, all of you, take a good look at Luke and give us your guess. A little speculation music, please. Now, are you ready? Have you guessed? What did you come up with? Well, you're wrong. Tell the pack how old you are, Lucas. Go on, tell them. I uh, don't remember. Of course not. If I were as old as you, baby, I wouldn't want to remember either. But here is Lucas's best friend, Harry Barrows. Harry, yak at the pack. Ah, uh, thank you, Bonnie. Um, I have here a statement. A signed statement. From a fully ordained doctor of medicine. Which says... Lucas has the body... The physical equipment. ...of a man in his late 30s. Go on, Harry. Give us the zinger. If you consult the records of the state penitentiary up at Morristown, you will learn that Lucas has just been discharged from prison. Oh, we certainly hope that Lucas has learned his lesson, don't we? Ah, uh, yes, Bonnie. Uh, he certainly did because he had a long time to think about it. So long... That he'd even forgotten what he'd actually done. And how long a time was it, Harry? Ninety-nine years. You are saying, then, that exactly ninety-nine years ago, Lucas here was flung into the Bastille. You could look it up. So, how old does that make Lucas? Your guess is as good as mine. Hey, Rosie. Oh, where have you two clowns been? Did you see the show? You know, it's three o'clock in the morning. We were hiding out. What for? You saw the show. You saw how everybody went crazy. Harry, what is it I all... told you. Suddenly the place was invaded by reporters in the paper, the radio, TV, the whole media. All right, it's not the pack. What for? We have to leave. Why? Sooner or later, they have to find out where I live. Well, isn't that what you wanted? No, no, no. We have to get away. Harry, did you do something wrong? All we did tonight was hook the fish. Now we have to be very careful how we reel them in. Oh, no. I've heard this one before. Rosie, honey, you have to have faith in me. I know what I'm doing. What are you doing? What are all these moves, this strategy? Honey, we have to go away so that you can mix up a batch of the elixir. The elixir? What elixir? The elixir of eternal life. What do I know about mixing up an elixir of eternal life? Rosie, for a girl as smart as you are, there's nothing to it. Nothing to it at all. The elixir of eternal life. Slowly but surely, the outlines of Harry's master plan seems to emerge from the mist. The elixir of eternal life. How would you like to be able to walk into the corner drugstore, point to the shelf and say, I'll have a bottle of that. 
the time may be nearer than you think. And then again, it may not. It depends on what happens shortly in Act Two. What can I tell you? Only what the record states. And what does the record have to say for itself? This. That a man named Lucas was sentenced to serve a term of 99 years for armed robbery and murder. Well, the 99 years have elapsed, and here is Lucas, still alive, looking no older than the day he went in. They had to set him free, and they did. And here we are. What is this elixir of life, Harry? It happens to be our million dollars. Uh Uh-huh. Look, Harry... I'm going on record right now. Now, please, Rosie, we got no time. We have things to do. I have been through one scheme after another. I lose track of all the hustles, the flim-flams, the capers. But it doesn't matter. You know why? Rosie, I... All your hustles and capers. You know what they all got in common? They don't work. Rose... They do not work. Never in your life have you ever succeeded in making a dishonest dollar. Okay. So if you got no confidence in me... Why do you stick around? Because maybe it's your fate. After all, everybody does what he's meant to do. And what was I meant to do? Fail. Hey, look, we have to get out of here. I'm lay low. See? You go on TV to advertise, to attract attention. And then when you get it, you want to disappear. Now, why? Well, you start to figure out how the elixir of life eternal should taste. While Lucas and I load up the car... So, what do you think? Mmm. Maybe it's too sweet. Oh. Now, I'll put in half as much sugar. You know what it needs? Maybe it should taste uh, more mysterious. Mysterious. So, I'll put in some pepper. All right, but come on, we got to hurry. Why? Because you have to strike while the iron is hot. That's also a very good time to get burned. The elixir of eternal life or of life eternal. What sounds better? Taste it now. Mmm. Mm-hmm. Ah. It's almost there. Uh. I tell you, Lucas, she's one in a million. You see, to how many dames could you say mix up a batch of eternal life elixir and in no time at all, there it is. Hey, where do you think you're going? You keep working on the elixir, Rosie. I got a little missionary work to do. Lucas can keep you company. Oh, taste this one, Lucas. Oh, no, huh? No big hit either, huh? Well, let me see. Uh... Oh, I think I'll put in some honey, some garlic. What else have I got in here? Let's... How about some vinegar? Yeah, I'll just put in a little bit of everything. Why don't we just run this through the blender, froth it up a little bit, huh? Yeah, so. Well, now, why don't we see how our little witch's brew is doing here? What do you say, Lucas? How about a little taste? What do you think, huh? Ugh. Pasca. I beg your pardon? I... You don't have to make such a horrible face. Pasca. Pasca, huh? What's that supposed to mean? Hey, wait a second. If it tastes so awful, how come you're drinking the rest of it? Some more. More? Did you see your face while you were pouring it down? Oh, it's good for you. Good for you? Yeah. I remember. The master would make us drink it whenever we were sick. Uh-oh. What is commencing to start here, Lucas? What's with the master bit? The taste. Oh, I remember the taste. It brings everything back. Yesterday, everything was so... so dark. I couldn't see back into it. It was so long ago, but... now... the taste... it's like a knife. It cuts through. You know what I'm saying? No, Lucas, I don't. Pasca. 
It was brought into the house of a master by a Greek slave. He called it a... a posset. Sure, yeah. Uh, hey, Lucas, why don't you lie down and take a little nap, huh? Lucas. My name was Lucius. I never had another name. I was the illegitimate son of the master and a Lydian slave woman. I remember now. Lucius. And then, many years later, it was Ludwig. And then, Louis. And Lucas. Are you trying to tell me what I think you're trying to tell me? Oh, I've lived so long, so long. There are times when I'm so tired and I can't remember, but the taste... Brought me back. I'm Lucius. Yeah, sure. I was born in Rome. Italy. No, no, Rome. It was all Rome. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Lucius. Uh, when, when was this? I don't know. What year? Year. I don't remember. Maybe I never knew. How could you not know? Well, people like me, we, we didn't know anything. We're just lucky to be alive. Oh, although I'm not so sure that was lucky either. Well, what did you do? Well, most of the time we were hungry. When we got sick, very sick, they'd take us to the master. And he'd give us a posca to drink. So we could go back to work. What kind of work? On the farm. Well, it was very hard work. And you don't know when it was? What was going on? No. No, every day was the same. Lucas... Going along with this. How come you're still alive? Oh. Oh, well, you see, I was a thief. Yeah? You had to steal to keep alive back then. Well, well, most people stole a little food from the kitchen, maybe fruit from the trees and so on, but the master knew about it. He, he, he wouldn't let on because he knew you had to. Me... I was different. Different? Yeah. I, I, I didn't steal just because I was hungry. No? I stole because... Because I'm a thief. Like I can't help myself. Come on, Lucas. You don't expect me to believe that. Well, it's true. It's in the blood. Like one man can play music, one man can paint pictures, and I... I have to steal. All right, but that still doesn't answer the question. How come you're alive after all this time? Because Apollo said so. Apollo? He was one of the gods. Oh, I'm afraid you're only getting yourself in deeper. No, there, there was a temple of Apollo on the master's estate. I see, and there was this gold mask of Apollo on the altar. So I thought I'd steal it. I'd be able to raise enough money to, to go somewhere else, start a new life. You sound like a dear friend of mine. But I got caught. How did I know? I'd always get caught. It figures. The penalty for stealing from the temple of a god was usually death by torture. Please, Lucas, no horrible details. But the master said he has offended the god. Let the god decide his punishment. So they loaded me down with chains. I could hardly move. They set me in front of the altar of Apollo. It was midnight. And there was a terrible storm. I can hear the thunder. Listen. To what? The thunder. Terrible thunder. And the lightning. It was flashing all around me. Lucas, are you okay? And the voice. The voice of the god. Listen. You hear it? You hear it? The voice of Apollo. Lucius. Lucius, thief and slave. Don't you hear it? No. No, I don't hear nothing. It's a voice that seems to enter inside your head. It it flows through your whole entire body. Lucius, thief and slave. You have defiled my temple. Voice. It can't speak it. Inside me. Now just take it easy, Lucas. Lucius, villain and slave. Scoundrel and thief. 
Please. It's all right, Lucas. You expect the god Apollo to sentence you to a horrible death? But any death would be a release and a reward. I sentence you instead to a horrible life. The life of a thief. The life you have always lived. The only life you know. You shall live such a life forever. You shall be a thief under the rule of all the nations to come. You will live many lives in countries yet to be discovered. But all you shall know of them is the insides of the prisons. Forever. <laughs> Lucas. Lucas, you okay? Here. Here, drink some of this. I remember. The taste made me remember. So, you have to be a couple of thousand years old, right? I'm, I'm old. I'm very old. What happened, Lucas? Didn't you ever catch on? Couldn't you see there's no percentage to it? In all these years, couldn't you decide to make something out of yourself? How? How long does a guy have to be a sucker? I was born poor, ignorant, a slave. I never had a chance to learn anything. All I knew how to do was, was steal. And you didn't know how to do that too good either. But it's my trade. I don't want to do anything else. Look, the last time I was in prison, it was for, for 99 years. Now, I'm free. I know I'll have to steal again. Now, Lucas. Yeah. When Harry brought us here to this place, I noticed a store down the road. I know. Soon, very soon, I'm going to break in there. Lucas, and... you mustn't. I can't help it. With your luck, you have to get caught. It isn't luck. It's fate. Mm. Now, this is exactly the way it should taste. This is the elixir of life eternal. And what are you going to do with it? My rosy honey, we're going to sell it. Oh, we're going to sell it, huh? Everybody's seen Lucas on the TV. Everybody knows how old he is. I don't think so. But go ahead. So this is what Lucas drinks. You see? This is the elixir of life eternal. Okay? Harry, how do you expect me to make enough of that stuff in a kitchen? Now, let's see. You got a whole blender full of it, huh? That should be more than enough. More than enough for what? More than enough to make a million dollars. Our friend Harry certainly has that million dollars on his mind. That million dollars that always seems to elude him. The goal that shines so brightly up ahead, but remains ever out of reach. All right, is this to be the time? You can see he has quite a bit going for him. Within a few moments, we shall be involved in the third act and the revelation. Gentlemen rankers out on a spree, damned from here to eternity. So wrote Mr. Kipling. From here to eternity is a long, long, a limitless time. But it seems to be stretching out ahead for our friend Lucas. Our other friend Harry has the idea that he can make a good thing out of it. You mean just this picture full of this... Elixir of life eternal will be enough to make a million bucks. You heard me. How? Tell me, Rosie, how would you promote this? I would do it the common sense way. Which is? Harry, you went on the TV. You exposed Lucas to millions. Here's a man who is over 100 and he looks less than 40, right? Go ahead. Okay. So the rubes are looking at him, Popeye. Now you should say, listen, suckers, here's the secret. 
This is Lucas's own secret formula. This is what Lucas drinks every day. This dandy little elixir of life eternal. Here it is. One buck. And a million saps I'll dig down. Which means I'd have to go into business. I'd have to buy a million bottles, hire labor, get involved with payroll taxes. Okay, you just talked me out of it. Let's forget the whole thing. Lucas is starting to get a funny look in his eyes. I haven't stolen anything in 99 years. You just control yourself, huh? I'll, I'll try, yeah, but I don't know if I can. Here, drink some of this good old elixir, huh? Why should I try to sell one million bottles of one dollar apiece when I can sell one bottle for a million dollars? And who's going to give you one million dollars? I'll be back within the hour with a certified check. Uh-uh. I'm scared. Of what? I don't know. But it's not going to work. What do you mean it's not going to work? Rosie, why can't you have faith in me? I have faith in you, Harry. I have faith that you'll go to jail, as usual. You see the possibility, you see the potential, eternal life. How can I miss? You'll find a way, Harry. You always do. Well, Mr. Bowles, uh, what is this offer of a lifetime? Mr. Mammon, you've heard of Lucas? He was featured on a Bonnie Quackenbush program. The convict? Yes. Well, Mr. Mammon... He is more than just a convict. Come to the point. I met Mr. Locus five years ago in the state penitentiary. Yes, you were serving a term for some hapless confidence scheme that went awry. Uh, may I ask uh, how you know about that? I know everything about you, Mr. Bowles. When a man expresses a desire to see me on business, I have him investigated minutely. I have a computer operation that can turn your whole life inside out. For instance... I am aware of the fact that when you were in the third grade, you were caught cheating on a spelling test. Uh, wrong. It was arithmetic. Now, you were saying, Mr. Burroughs... Uh, my, um, My cellmate was Lucas. Cell 87, Block C, North Wing. Yeah, well, that's when I got to know him. And about his incredible age, we became very friendly. And after a while, he revealed a secret to me. His, uh... Secret. Yes. It consists of a beverage. Continue. He drinks it every day. And you wish to sell me this beverage? Yes. For one million dollars? How did you know? Because that is exactly what I should do if I were in your place. Well, uh, do you want to live forever? Or let us say, uh, indefinitely? Hmm. I would have to take that question under advisement. I, uh, have here a sample, Mr. Mammon. Which could prove what? I'll let you have a free taste. Now, sir, drink that down. And tell me, doesn't that convince you? The distinctive flavor of it that is truly the elixir of life. You're very clever, Mr. Burroughs. I am offering you more than you could buy anywhere else for your money. Eternal life. It's the best confidence operation I've ever encountered. I assure you, it's not... It's foolproof, hmm? <laughs> Who could ever prove it's a swindle? This is not a swindle. Oh, it is. But how could the victim ever prove it? The victim? As long as he's alive, you're in the clear. He would have to die. Uh, sir, uh, I'm afraid you don't understand. The only thing wrong with it is... Nobody would want to buy the product. Oh, yeah? What's wrong with the product? Eternal life. Who really wants it? Why, everybody. Do you? Absolutely. I don't. And I don't know anybody else who does. Oh, a lot of people would like to live forever. Oh, they think they do. Until ten minutes ago, I thought I did too. But then when I was confronted with it, I really began to think about it. No, thank you. Well, sir, I'm sure I can do business elsewhere. Are you? Nickels and dimes, maybe. But a million dollars. Oh, uh, by the way, that little elixir of yours tastes pretty good. Mind if I have another sip? Where's the million bucks? Uh, 
Well, Rosie... Do you, you think... have it in one big bill or a lot of little ones? We're having uh, temporary difficulties. Yeah. And it looks like they might become permanent. Oh, come on. What do you say? It's been on the news about Lucas. What about Lucas? They're saying he's a phony. Who is? Everybody. Your friend Bonnie Quackenbush should be on right now. Turn it on. Listen. How could it be a phony? I saw Lucas's record. Yeah, wow. Go figure. Turn on the set. Has the pack ever been taking flack? About what? About Lucas. Seems it's a hoax, folks. Yes, indeed. The show caused so much chatter that we decided to investigate the records at State Pen. Well, it seems that they goofed somehow. A man named Lucas was sent up 99 years ago, but he died. I don't know if they buried somebody else or what, but his records got confused. And the man you saw on this show last week wound up with them. Maybe it'll never get straightened out. But one thing for sure, nobody could be 140 years old and not look it. I guess you've heard enough. I don't understand it. Eternal life, I thought people would beat down the door to get it. It sounded foolproof to me. It was. Only thing wrong with it was you. Me? Yes, Harry, you. It had to fail because you're fated not to be successful as a con artist. It doesn't matter what the hustle is. Now, what kind of talk is that? Faded. It's your destiny. Destiny. So the story about Lucas just killed it, that's all. But I should have been home free before it broke. What do you mean before it broke? Were you expecting it to break? Well, sure, weren't you? What do you mean, wasn't I? You knew it had to be some kind of swindle. You didn't actually believe Lucas could be 140 years or so old. How could a man that age look and act so young? He's not 140 years old. That is definite. Well, that's what I just told you. His real age would be closer to... Oh, about 2,200. Twenty. Hey, Rosie. Is this you talking? Those are the facts, Harry. He told me. He told you what? He was born a slave in ancient Rome. That's what Lucas told you? Yeah, he remembered. And he was a thief. And because he tried to steal something from an ancient god named Apollo, he was condemned to live forever. So? Why was that a bad deal? As a thief. As a two-bit coffee and cakes thief. Always in and out of jail. This is what he told you, huh? Yeah. And you believe him? Yes, Harry. I believe him. Where is he? Where's Lucas? Last I saw of him, he was in the other room having a nap. Let's get to the bottom of this. Lucas? Hey, Lucas! Hey, wake up, Lucas. He's not here. Where would he go? It's nighttime. Harry, I'm scared. Why? He said he hadn't pulled a robbery in 99 years, and he just felt... Well, he felt he couldn't sit still anymore. Well, where would he go? He said something about the store down the road, and how some night he'd just have to break in there. i got to stop. Uh, Harry, it may be too late. He doesn't have a chance. Old Dobkins, a storekeeper, is a deputy sheriff. He sits up all night with a shotgun. Maybe Lucas didn't get there yet, huh? I'll take the car. I'm going with you. No, no, no. Harry! One of us has to stay out of jail. Lucas? Hey, Lucas? It's open. And the door's open. Uh, Lucas? Is that you, Harry? Hey, Lucas. Well, what are you doing in here? What do you think I'm doing? Are you crazy? Let's get out of here. Uh, let me see if I can find the cash. Hey, Lucas, you're crazy. This is break and entry. And what's the steal here? You can do five to ten for it. Uh, what's ten years? Let's get out of here, will you? Yeah, just a second. Stay where you are in the name of the law. Let's beat it. Halt! Into the car, Lucas. Into the car. Hurry up. Halt in the name of the law. Thank you, nurse. Uh, hello, Harry. How do you feel? Uh, different. Yeah, well, that's to be expected. You've been unconscious for three days. Oh, yeah? Well, I... I feel different. Uh, in a funny kind of way. Uh, like what? I don't know. It's as if I'm a different kind of person. 
I thought I was dead. Yeah, well, they all say it's a remarkable recovery. Some even believe it's a miracle. It happened right after the transfusion. What transfusion? Well, you needed blood. So it happened that Lucas was your exact type. I tried to stop the transfusion. You did? Why? Well, you know why, Harry. You're going to be just like Lucas now. But, of course, I, I couldn't explain that, so, so they went ahead. What do you mean, uh, I'm going to be just like Lucas? You're going to live forever, just like him. Uh, uh, Rosie, you, you can't believe that. I can, and I do. I don't want to live forever. I'm sorry, Harry. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Spend the re- forever g- going to jail for confidence schemes that don't come off. You could try to become another person, Harry. Yeah, but I can't. I can't any more than Lucas can. Well, at least you'll be company for each other. You won't be alone. Hey, Rosie, this thing, if it's true... You know it's true. It has to be true. Rosie, come with me. Where? Into, well, I guess into forever, into life eternal. No, Harry, no. It's not for me. Oh, Rosie, don't you love me? Oh, I do, Harry, but just for one lifetime. And you're going to spend a lot of this one in jail for that attempted robbery. Rosie! Besides, a gentleman called on me the other night. Mr. Ambrose J. Mammon. I believe you know him. Mammon? He's just crazy about this drink I put together. Well, that was my elixir of life eternal. Except we're going to call it Posca. It makes a wonderful tonic, Harry. If you don't believe me, ask Lucas. Rosie, you can't leave me. Harry, you're the one who's going to leave me. I could never find anybody like you. Never. Oh, I don't know. You're going to have plenty of time, Harry, to look. You'll have all the time in the world. I'll be back shortly with a final thought. If only I had it to do over again. So many of us say that with such heartfelt sincerity. And the implication is that we would do it better and that we would be wiser. But the truth is, we would make the same mistakes. Doesn't history keep repeating itself? Our cast included Ralph Bell, Joan Shea, and Ray Owens. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams. Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. A savage place as holy as enchanted as air beneath the waning moon was haunted by a woman wailing for her demon lover. A woman wailing for her demon lover. How poignant. How poignant the way the poet puts it. But are there demon lovers? And are there women who will fall in love with them. Surely this is the stuff of legend and myth. And yet, there are things that simply cannot be explained. You mean we shall actually see the tiger from up here in the tree? Yes, and I shall shoot him as he passes below. But why should he pass by here? Well, he's after the goat. The one down there. Oh, poor creature. Why doesn't he run away? He can't. He's tied to a stake in the ground. But the tiger will kill him. An unfortunate necessity. Oh, no. Oh, no. I shall not permit it. Louise, 
Where are you going? I intend to free that Louise, goat. you can't go down there. Come back here. Louise! Our mystery drama, The Love God, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Marion Seldes and Court Benson. I shall be back shortly with Act One. East is east, and west is west, and never the twain shall meet. So said Mr. Kipling, but he knew better than that because it did meet for many years in that vast, mysterious universe of a country called India. India with its kaleidoscope of religions, races, and languages. India where there is so much myth and so much reality. This is a story that took place at a time when India was known as the British Raj. A lady and a gentleman are sitting on a veranda... Uh, did you know that veranda is an Indian word? And they are sipping tea. Cream. Thank you. Sugar. Thank you. Cake. Oh, I shouldn't. But you will. Well, just the thinnest, tiniest uh, sliver. I know what you're up to, Willis. You're afraid to spoil your appetite for dinner. Oh, about dinner. I shall not be having dinner. No. Bahadur Khan. Not having dinner. I'm afraid not. But we've prepared your favorite. I'm afraid it can't be helped. Ah, Bahadur Khan. It is in my mind to hunt this night. See, therefore, that thou wilt prepare the double barrel express rifle. You're going to hunt this evening? Uh, reports of a man eating tiger in the Mahura district, causing no end of a fuss. Oh. The tiger has got to be put a stop to. And you're taking Bahadur Khan with you? Well, of course. But you will be back by Saturday. Yes, one way or another. That's good. I need Bahada Khan to drive to the railroad station at Maipur. Oh? Yes. To pick up Louise. Louise? I've actually prevailed upon her to come out for a visit. Louise? You remember my friend Louise? The skinny one? Well, she is slender. Pasty-faced? Light complexion. Watery eyes. Actually, her eyes are that delicate shade of china blue. Kind of a big woman. Stately. And as I recall, very opinionated. Uh, she does have some rather sincerely held convictions. She's really a lovely person. No doubt. When you get to know her, uh, you don't mind, do you? Well, this is your home as well as mine. Perfectly awful female. Now, Willis, she's a perfectly lovely person. No, I was talking, my dear, from a masculine point of view. Ah, Bahadur Khan, I shall want the Martin as my second gun. See thee now to the horses. My name is Bahadur Khan. I serve in the house of Willis Foster Sahib. Foster Sahib is the district commissioner. He is wise indeed. In his 40 years of life, he has not taken a wife. This does not sit well with his sister, Pamela Sahiba, a widow who keeps his home. English Mem Sahibs have a peculiar affliction. They cannot tolerate the sight of a bachelor. I could tell by the sweet notes in Pamela Sahiba's voice and the shining look in her eyes that this Louise... Sahiba was her latest candidate to storm the citadel of the fortress that was Foster Sahib's heart. Boy! Does the Mem Sahib deign to speak to one so lowly? Are you... Uh, is your name supposed to be here? I've got it written down here. Are you Bahadur Khan? Bahadur Khan, it is. With the permission of the presence. You were supposed to meet me inside the terminal. If the presence will forgive, I was afraid to venture inside the house of the fire carriages. Afraid? What on earth is there to be afraid of? The fire wagon that pulls the terrain. The engine? Inside, it is filled with devils. 
Devils? Oh, yes. Devils that have been captured by the government and sentenced to boil the water to make steam for the train. I have never heard such nonsense. Angry devils. And sometimes they escape. In their great fury, they will melt the iron of the fire wagon. And there is a terrible explosion and many die. How can you believe such superstitious nonsense? If it offends the presence, I shall not believe it. She was rather large as Mim Sahibas go, and not at all unshapely. However, her tongue was never silent. A talking woman for Foster Sahib? Never. And so, without a moment of silence, we drove to the house. As we entered the gate, there was something that finally stilled her voice for a moment. What's that? What's that noise? Uh, noise? Can't you hear over there? That man is hitting that woman. Uh, that is so. He's beating her. Put a stop to it. Sahiba, that man is Foster Sahib's gardener, Pierre Khan. Make him stop. He has no right to beat that woman. He has every right. She is his wife. I'll stop him myself. Uh, but, but, Sahiba. Stop that. Oh, 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 I said stop oh, that, you scoundrel. Oh, stop that oh, at once. Poor Pierre Khan. What was he doing but beating his wife? Suddenly he was beset unmercifully with an umbrella. And thus did the Mim Sahib Louise enter the household. I must say she made her presence felt. She was constantly correcting, admonishing, advising. She was having an effect on everyone except, of course, Foster Sahib. He found reasons to work quite late at the office. One day, the two Mem Sahibs were having tea on the veranda. Uh, Louise, dear, I must ask you not to, uh, 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 to interfere. Interfere? In what way? <laughs> well, the truth is, in every way. I'm sure I don't understand. Uh, since you've come to the station, Louise, you've managed to turn things topsy-turvy, inside out, upside down, and every which way. Have I indeed? Uh, for example, you know, uh, Pierre Cannes beating his wife. Oh, I put a stop to that quickly enough. Uh, the point is, you had no right to stop him. And you had no right to belabor him with your umbrella, either. Do you object to my actions, Pamela? I'm afraid, Louise, I must say yes. But the scoundrel was beating her without mercy. You didn't see him abuse that poor girl. Oh, I've seen him. You have? Yes. <laughs> Many times. And you've done nothing to prevent it? There's nothing I can or should do to prevent it. Things are very different out here. Oh, yes. And you're different, too. Why, back home, you were a member of the Fabian Society. Well? Well, I remember you at the meeting when you were asked to speak. Please, Louise. They still talk about that speech, the most inspiring oration on the rights of human beings. Louise, what you fail to understand. Suppose they could be aware of this conversation. What would they say about it back home? This is my home now, Louise. My husband is buried here. My children are being raised here. I have no other home. Oh, Pamela, you mustn't think that way. You'd better start thinking that way, too. Oh, no, never. Louise, I asked you to come here because there is no hope for you in England. That isn't true. Then why did you come? That crowd of starry-eyed idealists we ran about with, for the most part, they don't believe in marriage. And those that do, well, they don't believe in... Well, they don't believe in consummating it. Pamela! I saw the way the wind was blowing there ten years ago. So I came here where I could meet someone. It took you somewhat longer, but here you are. Meanwhile, please do not upset my household. What am I doing to upset you? In the you? matter of Pierre Khan and his way, for example, you have given me a problem. You see, he no longer beats her. And that's a problem. Laila is the best cook I've ever had. Now she just sits and mopes all day. Oh, why? Because her heart is broken. 
She believes her husband no longer loves her. But why should she think so? Because he no longer beats her. Dear, let us not forget the object of your visit. I know that my brother is a most unusually difficult fish to land. Uh, do you see this charm around my neck? Mm-hmm. Rather somber-looking well, thing. Please listen before you say anything. When I came to India ten years ago to live with Willis, Bahadur Khan said to me, Sahiba, here is a token from the god of love, Omira. Omira? There are thousands of such gods. At any rate, he told me, if I wore the charm constantly, within the year I would be married. I did. And I was. Are you telling me that you actually believe in this? What I'm telling you is that a girl needs all the help she can get. And so, I uh, took the liberty of asking Bahadur Khan to, uh, to... Uh, to what? Bahadur Khan? You'll see, Louise. Sahiba. Bahadur Khan, hast thou found the charm for the Mem Sahib, as I asked thee? One who is even less than the dirt beneath the Sahiba's feet has indeed brought that which is desired. Behold. Oh, Louise, look, it is beautiful. Well, what is it supposed to be? It's your charm. You are now under the special graces of the love god, Omira. <laughs> what are you saying, Pamela? And before the year is out, he shall find you a husband. Here, wear it around your neck. I shall do no such oh, thing. Oh, but Louise... Do you expect me to partake in this superstitious nonsense? To aid, abet, and encourage it? No. Thank you, Bahuda Khan. Pamela, I shall win Willis through intelligence and... Wit and, and, and all the civilized things we have in common. Such a vain and foolish Mem Sahib. But what is to be done? The English, they are like children. They refuse to learn when they are young, and when they grow old, it is too late. Poor, silly Louise Sahiba. Now, no one shall ever lead her to the marriage bed. I don't know about you, but I agree with Pamela. A woman needs all the help she can get, particularly in the affairs of the heart. So then, what prognosis for this proposed match between Willis and Louise? Can it proceed without help from the love god? Is there a love god? Mystery Theater will continue with Act Two in just a few moments. It is said that marriages and hangings go by destiny, which means that each is foreordained. But destiny, like everything else, can always use a push here and there along the line. Well, here we are in the India of over 100 years ago. A determined spinster named Louise has just turned down an offer of help from one of the local love gods. My goodness, you would think it was an offer she couldn't afford to refuse. That will be all bad again. Sahiba. You didn't have to hurt his feelings. You could have accepted the charm. Mm -hmm. And connived at this dark superstition. Oh, Louise, everything doesn't have to be so serious. Well, I think it's high time we adopted a serious attitude towards that heathen mythology. Bahadur Khan is quite tolerant about our religion. Can't we extend the same indulgence to his? Really, dear, you shouldn't be so earnest all the time. But life is earnest. Life is real. Yes, yes, I suppose so. Now, um, shall we apply ourselves to the problem at hand? The conquest of Willis? Oh, I wish you wouldn't refer to planning for marriage as a conquest. Conquest? Seduction? <laughs> call it what you will. I call it a meeting of the mind. It's also a meeting of the body. Too rational. 
intelligent human beings who can see that their best interests can be served and their better natures enhanced by a union, as it were, of the spiritual aspects. Uh, tell me, what plans have you in mind for Willis? I shall prove to Willis that I am completely interested, not to say fascinated, by his work. Oh, why do women feel they must take an interest in a man's work? Well, to prove that they share. Nonsense. I intend to have a, a partnership with my husband. Uh, what most men have in mind is an ownership, not modern, progressive, enlightened men. Oh, darling, they're the most boring kind. Well, good afternoon. Oh, home early, I see, Willis. Yes, pour me a cup of that tea, please. Bahadur Khan. How are you, Willis? We see so little of you. Uh, well, the uh, work of the empire, the vast, lumbering Indian empire, must be got through somehow. Ah, Bahadur Khan. It is time to settle accounts with the man-eater in the Mahura Hills. Thou wilt fetch the double-barrel rifle and ammunition. It is even as the prison's commands. The second gun and all else that will be required for the hunt. We leave in the morning. Are you going to try for that tiresome tiger again? No, well, we'll put an end to him this time. Do you intend to actually shoot and kill a tiger, Willis? With luck. But a tiger... Such a noble, magnificent beast. He's a cattle killer and a man-eater. Aren't you moved by Mr. Blake's poem? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Oh, not this one. He's old and sick and mangy, half blind and lame. That's why he's become a man-eater. Because he's unable to hunt down game. Oh, well, then it's a... A mission of mercy? Well, I suppose you could call it that. Well, then I approve. Completely. Well, thank you. And also, I believe I should like to come along. Come along? Well, of course. This is India. The India of the jungle. The true India. But it might be dangerous. Dangerous? You said the tiger was half blind and lame. Yes, of course. <laughs> That's what makes him even more dangerous. A half blind, lame tiger? Yes. <laughs> But he's still formidable, not to be trifled oh, with. Oh, but I should so like to see it. Do let me come. Is there any reason, Willis, why Louise shouldn't go? Well... Then it's settled. <laughs> come to my room, Louise, and I shall lend you an outfit suitable for tiger hunting. Aren't you the sly one? What do you mean? I'm sure you must know how tigers are hunted. No, really, I haven't the foggiest notion. One uh, sits up all night in a blind and waits. Is that a fact? As if you didn't know. So there you are, the two of you, alone in the moonlight with the perfume of the exotic jungle flowers creating a most seductive... Oh, nonsense. We shall have a most rational discussion to ascertain our common interests. Oh, yes. I was afraid of that. And so the three of us rode to the Mayahura Hills, which had sent messages to the district commissioner to rid them of the man-eater who filled entire villages with dread. When we arrived in the foothills, we proceeded on foot, and since these were not our hills, I stopped for a moment and knelt. What's he doing? We may proceed, if the prison so desires. Lead us, Bahadur Khan. What was he doing? He was asking permission to hunt. Asking permission? From whom? From the guard of this particular jungle. Oh, you see, we're strangers here. <laughs> You speak as if you actually believe in it yourself. <laughs> Does it hurt? I would suppose one is always well advised to have as many things going for one as possible. But to answer your question, yes. It, it hurts. It hurts the cause of progress and enlightenment to support base superstition. Ah, right then, I knew her hopes were doomed. He would never lead her to his marriage bed. For a brief moment, he had been attracted to her. 
The fact that she wished to hunt the tiger at night had marked her as a woman of spirit. But then, of course, she had spoiled it all with her inability to hold her tongue. Ah, uh, these foolish English. Why do they talk so much? Does thou hear it, Bahodur Khan? By the favor of the presence, thy servant hears. What is it? A goat. A goat? If it is thy will, I shall go forward to see if the villagers have prepared the blind. What is he saying? We must keep our voices low. What is he saying? The villagers should have built us a platform high up in a tree. Why? Sahib, Sahib, come. Yes, I believe it's in readiness. Up here, Sahib. Good. Uh, help the Mem Sahib up the tree. Oh, thank you very much. Shh. Now come, we must hurry. Ah, Shere Khan hunts this night. Shere Khan, who is that? Oh, that's what the natives call the tiger. You know, this is really quite roomy and comfortable. Yes. Now, I have a question. Mm. You can look down from here and shoot the tiger, but <laughs> why should he be good enough to oblige you and pass this way? That's why. I don't understand. Well, look below. Uh, to the left. What do you see? Seems to be a goat. Exactly. What's he standing there for? Doesn't he hear the tiger? Oh, yes, he does. Well, then why doesn't he run away? Well, he can't. He's tethered to a stake in the ground. Well, why? For what unearthly reason? It's a very sound reason. The villagers put him out here to attract Shere Khan. And when he comes, I'll be able to shoot him. But the poor goat. What about the poor goat? But the tiger will spring on him and kill him. Well, yes, that's the idea of the thing. Well, that's not fair. It's the only way to do it. Are you saying this is the only way to hunt a tiger? The only way without risking the loss of life. But the goat is going to lose its life. I mean human life. What, the goat is also a child of the creator? Oh, no. I, I, well, I can't tolerate this. Making too much noise will scare off the tiger. That poor little goat. Where are you going? I shall not stay here and see that goat be made a victim. You can't go down there. Bahadur Khan, stop her. Don't you dare. You come back here. I'm going to untie that goat so that it can run away. Now listen. Nice goat. Nice creature. Just let me untie this knot. The tiger is prowling around down there. I can't seem to unloosen this knot. You want to get killed? Open this knot. Louise! Even if I could see the tiger, I couldn't shoot him in time. Giving way, it's opening. Louise! Just another moment, that's all I need. Louise! Run! You're free! Sorry. Run! Behold! Run, you silly little goat! You get away from here, you big bully! Get away! Go home! Shoot him, Sahib! Shoot! How can I shoot that confounded woman standing in the way? Go on now. You heard me. Go home. There's a nice pussy cat. Just turn around and go straight home. You hear me? Go home. Are they not crazy, all these English... On the ground is the mad Mem Sahib, and she is almost twisting the whiskers of the terrible tiger. I do not know which of the two is more frightened. Up in the tree is Foster Sahib with the double barrel rifle, cursing as if the devil is in his mouth, trying to shoot the tiger. But the Mem Sahib is in the line of fire, and also in the tree we have me, Badur Khan. Wondering, waiting to see how, with the grace of God, it will all come out. And I am with you, Bahadra Khan, also, waiting and wondering how it must all come out. As we both know, the design has already been woven by providence, and all shall be revealed in the appointed time by revelation. Which, in our drama, is always the third act. He who rides a tiger, the proverb tells us, 
dares not dismount. That's a very good analysis of those who are actually riding the tiger. But what can we say of one who is facing the tiger and alone, unarmed, and on foot? I would suppose we could only remark such a person is hardly a good insurance risk. Now, you be a nice pussy cat and go straight home. That's right. Go home. <laughs> I said goodbye to you too, and don't you dare show your face around here again. No, Sahib. Now shoot him. Missed. The other barrel, Sahib. Quickly. Oh, he got away. So he did. And I'm glad. You're glad? Well, isn't it better this way? There was no bloodshed. It was all your fault. My fault? I should have had him. But aren't you happier it worked out like this? There's no blood on your hands. But that's my job. It's your job to get blood on your hands? It's my job to kill tigers that terrorize the countryside. You threw such a scare into him, I don't think he'll be in the mood to terrorize anyone for a long, long time. Miss Louise, I... I... Yes? Nothing. Nothing at all. Hadakan carry the rifles. We are going home. I must say that the journey home was not a happy one. Foster Sahib was angry, and the Mem Sahib Louise did not know why. After a while, she too became angry, and so they spoke not a word to each other. When they arrived at the house, the Mem Sahib Pamela called me to her. Bahada Khan, I have here a note which informs me that the children of my servants have not been vaccinated against the smallpox. What's happened? The people no longer believe in devils. And it has been believed that the vaccination is the magic that enters the blood to vanquish the devil of the smallpox. The Sahiba Louise has insisted to all that there are no devils. And in that case, of what use is the vaccination? I see. Thank you, Bahada Khan. That will be all. But that was not to be all. Foster Sahib was very unhappy at home. And therefore, Mem Sahib Pamela was unhappy. And Mem Sahib Louise, she too was unhappy. Indeed, it was a most unhappy household. And then, one morning, before he left for his office, Foster Sahib stopped to speak with his sister. Where's Louise? I believe she's out somewhere. Mm. What trouble is she causing now? I think she's teaching some of the children to read. Yes, well... I thought you two would get along. I can't imagine why. You're so alike in so many ways. None of which is apparent to me. I, uh, I suppose you'd like to see her go. Mm, I know she's your oldest friend. She's not old. The fact is, she is so obviously out of place here. Well, yet I, I, I can't ask her to leave, can I? No, I suppose not. Well, what's to be done? Leave it to me. Leave what to you? There are ways of getting around things. Now, Willis, Willis, you must not be cruel. No, dear. But I shall be surgical. Well, good morning, ladies. Good morning, good morning Willis. Oh, everyone's so bright and early for breakfast. You seem to be in excellent spirit. Ladies, I am drunk. <laughs> Willis, you never drink this early in the morning. Oh, this is the greatest intoxication of all. What is? The glow, the exhilaration that has nothing to do with alcohol. What does it have to do with? Love. Love? Love? Ladies, you shall be the first to know. I am in love. Willis! At last, the steadfast Willis has finally fallen, taken prisoner by two sparkling blue eyes, a halo of golden blonde hair, and lips as luscious as the Kabuli grapes. I am her captive without hope of quarter. 
Uh, Whose captive are you, Willis? I saw her last night at the club. And suddenly... What can I say? I... I was smitten. By whom, Willis? By Jenny Thorpe. Uh, Jenny Thorpe? Jenny Thorpe? Uh, uh, Jenny, uh, she's a... She's an angel. Uh, She's a... She's already buried two husbands. Let her bury me, too, if it comes to that. Are you sure, Willis? When the heart speaks, can there ever be doubt? I... I wish you the best fortune, Willis. May you always be happy. Thank you, Louise. Um, You must excuse me. I, I, I think I have a headache. You can't be serious, Willis. That impossible Jenny Thorpe. I shall be serious for as long as it may be necessary. I don't understand. For as long as Louise remains here. Oh, well, it isn't necessary to hurt her. Oh, Pamela, dear, there is no such thing as painless surgery. All this was taking place even as I, Bahadur Khan, was serving the tea, the eggs, and the mutton chops for the breakfast. Later in the morning, as I proceeded to clean the bedrooms, I noticed the door of the Mem Sahib Louise was closed, and from within, the sound of a woman weeping. I was about to go away, but suddenly her door opened, and the Sahiba appeared before me. Obviously, she had hastily dried her tears. Bahadur Khan... May I speak with you? This insignificant person would be willing to spend eternity listening to the words of wisdom from the present. Please, Bahadur Khan, I'm serious. I'm so miserable. You see, I've always been in love with Willis all my life. He'd never look at me. And now, now he's going to marry someone else. <laughs> Is it not written, there are other fish in the sea? Fish? Yes. Men? No. Oh, Bahadur Khan, perhaps... Perhaps I offended that god. What was his name? Omir or something. That is when I refused that charm that you offered me. Now I'm willing to believe anything. I mean it. What have I got to lose? And this is such a strange country. Who knows what can happen here? I looked at this Mim Sahib who was fighting her tears. A strange country? No. This is not a strange country. It is really quite simple. It is the English who are strange. And this one, not only strange, but also ill. And why was she ill? Only because no one had ever led her to the nuptial couch. Which is why she was always getting herself into so much mischief. And yet, she would make an excellent wife for Foster Sahib. Ah, these English. Why are we always compelled to arrange matters for them? If the Sahib... uh, will deign to listen. Oh, yes. You have grievously offended the great love god, Omira, when you insulted his charm. But I'm sorry. Omira is a god of love. He can always be appeased. He can? How? One must go to his temple and pray to him. Are you asking me to pray to a heathen god? The Sahiba has honored me by inquiring if I would serve her. If she continues to insult the mighty Omir... No, 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 uh, no, no, I certainly don't. No, not at all. Then we must go to the temple of Omira at midnight. At, at midnight? Yes, at midnight. At which time we shall pray to the love god... For a miracle. Yes, one must always pray for a miracle. And in addition, one must always prepare for a miracle. After all, these things cannot be spun from the air, can they? And so, to begin, I went to the kitchen 
and spoke to Laila, the cook. And why should I help the Sahiba, Louise? Because I ask it of thee. I do not like the Sahiba. If thou refuse me, I shall tell thy husband about that British soldier in the bazaar. He has already beat me for the soldier. And the Bengali merchant. Also for the merchant. And for the Afghan horse trader. Ah. <laughs> uh, what is uh, required of me? Bring the paint, the powder, the rouge, which thou knowest so well to apply. Also, thy wedding gown. My wedding gown? Ah, yes. A most exciting garment. We must prepare the Sahiba, Louise, for her encounter with the love god of Omira. At midnight, we shall meet at his shrine. And so, at midnight, we met at the shrine of the love god. It was a bower of dogwood trees in full bloom, a few feet from the house. And why not? Any lovely place may be sacred to the god of love. At first... I did not recognize the Sahiba Louise. Laila had performed magic with her paint and her gown. Standing in front of me was a magnificent, stately goddess with skin like alabaster, flaming red hair, flashing eyes. I tell you, she was one to inflame the senses of any man. And so I approached. Sahiba Louise, are you now ready to pray to the love god Amira? I, I'm ready. Then speak. Speak of what is in your heart. Ask for the fulfillment of your desire. I, I want. Willis Foster. I want Willis Foster. Listen. Listen to the reply of the love god Omira. I, I... I don't hear any... Close your eyes and listen. Listen. Yes. My child, I have heard your prayer. I grant your wish. I fulfill your desire. You shall have Willis Foster. Go to him. Go to him now. Tell him it is my will. Oh, but I... Do you believe in me, my daughter? Yes, but I... Then go to him now. Yes. Yes. Like one in a dream, she turned, she walked into the house. She went to the room of Foster Sahib, and I heard... Oh, oh what, what, what time is it? You... Oh, who... who are you? You don't know me. Louise? No, oh, it, it, You can't be Louise. I'm Louise. But you're... You're beautiful. Why have we kept apart from each other for so many years? Now that you ask me, I... I don't know. Even as children, we knew we were meant for each other. Why did we fight against it? Well, I guess you thought I was dull. And did you think I was too clever? Well... <laughs> I'm not really clever. No, and I'm not really dull either. What is this nonsense about that awful Jenny Thorpe? Well, that's, that's all it is, Louise. Nonsense. You were always too shy to say it, and I was too proud, but someone has to say it first. I love you. And... And I love you. 
Uh, just, just a moment. Then he closed the door to his room, and I was able to hear no more. Like a good servant, I retired for the night, seeing that my master had need of me no longer. And you, to whom I tell this tale, have need of me no longer as well. For the rest of the story, you may supply yourselves. I will be back shortly with a final thought. Our story may perhaps raise a question. Is there a God of love? Are meetings, matings, and matches all arranged in advance? I would answer most likely because some of the pairings and partnerships we see around us simply could not come about by themselves. Somebody, somewhere, somehow must have had a hand in it. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Kurt Benson, Grace Matthews, and William Griffiths. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then. Pleasant dreams. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. Since time immemorial, stories have begun with the classic phrase, Once Upon a Time. Then to the avid and eager listener would come a history of love, hate, adventure, horror, every emotion the teller wanted to convey. But history, like all words, is not necessarily what we think it means. Its basic definition is a narrative of events connected with a real or imaginary object, person, or career. Note, it does not confine itself to the past. So, here is a history of the future, the kind that begins supposing if... We recognize your presence, daughter... What is your desire? Not mine, but the earth creature's. He demands an audience with you. Demands? He says that if he is not returned immediately, his people will send their ships against us and shoot the mothership out of the sky. Our mystery drama, Enemy from Space was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Mandel Kramer. I will be back shortly with Act One. This is the year of 2029. President Winston Alexander is midway through his second term, a commanding figure on the world stage who has brought America to a new surge of leadership. The unfortunate breakdown of arm limitation talks have more than ever isolated the two superpowers and with nuclear proliferation of fact, the only hope of world peace is that the two superpowers are at last nearing a major accord that will mean peace. This is where we stand on this fateful night at exactly 3 a.m., February 25th, 2029. This is Central Command, Triple Red Alert. Repeat, this is CENCOM, Triple Red Alert. Attention all units, highest priority. This is Alert AAA, 
This is a triple red alert. An unidentified flying object has pierced the DMZ and has now landed on the front lawn of the White House. Mr. President. Mr. President. What is it, Andy? Why are you knocking so frantically at Father's door? I don't know, Ginny. We may be under attack. Now, under... Yeah, stick with me until I check on your father. I... I'd better try the door. If... Mr. President, I... Good Lord, no. He's not in his bed. Oh, where is he, Andy? Where is Daddy? Daddy! Daddy! The window is wide open. That thing is still now, there. Ginny, come back. They must have taken now, Ginny, it. don't show yourself to the enemy. Get down. Get down. What for? They're not paying any attention to now, us. That is some kind of warcraft out there. They might fire on you. I don't care what they do to me. They've got my father. Well, oh, stop them, Andy. Stop them somehow. Ginny, by now, every piece of equipment in the U.S. has been alerted to stop whatever the heck that thing is. Oh, Andy. That nobody wants to see the president kidnapped. I'm... But we can't bring any firepower to bear on him without risking your father's life. Well, what are you and the rest of you little soldiers going to do? Well, I can't tell you exactly. There are contingency plans for things like this. What? I don't know. I'm, I'm not a member of CENTCOM, but there must be something that... Attention, please. Attention. Who's that? It's coming from a spacecraft. There is no cause for alarm. We come in peace. This is Commander Varg aboard the spaceship. We are a communications vessel from the matrix of the mothership Niklo 7. We seek information only and have borrowed your President Alexander in order to get it. He is quite safe. When we have completed our talk, he will be returned unharmed. I don't believe him, Andy. Why doesn't he let Daddy say something? To reassure you, we will let President Alexander talk to you now. I realize this is very unusual. For everyone's best interests... I ask you to call off all alerts and to take no action for the next 24 hours. I am assured by my, my unexpected hosts that I am in no personal danger, nor is anyone else. I am being taken to meet Commander Vard's superiors for some as yet unrevealed reason. I have agreed to a truce for 24 hours. If I am not returned by then, I ask Congress to put the nation on full war footing for its defense. Who is it? Colonel Harris, Miss Alexander. Oh, but just a sec... Come in, Andy. Any news? No, not yet. Oh, do I have to be cooped up here like this? Shinny, oh, do I even have to answer that? You know what it's like out there? Panicsville. Oh, what do you think it's like in here? Inside me? Oh, hold me, Andy. Uh, I got you, Slugger. Oh. Now, hang in. What's happening to us, Andy? To the whole world? Who are they? I don't know, Jenny. Nobody knows yet. Where have they taken Dad and why? Don't you think I'd give my eye teeth to be able to answer those questions? Oh, never mind you. What about all those fancy tracking systems, our big sophisticated strategic command, or whatever you call them? Didn't they follow that saucer thing or whatever it was? Yeah, from the second after it lifted off, the darn thing just disappeared. Where? How? Darling, I'm a lucky little boy in the Air Force who ended up a president's aide-de-camp and I hope pretty soon his son-in-law, but I am not a scientist. Oh, don't try to waffle, Andy. You must have some idea. How could this spacecraft slip all our defenses? Well, first off, it has some kind of radar negator. Otherwise, it never could have gotten here. 
And second, who knows what this craft is vectored on? It could be traveling on a Mobius curve that took it upside down into some other space continuum or through a galactic time window. Oh. All I know is we can't pick it up electronically by laser, satellite, spectroscope, nothing. It's just gone. Oh, and Dad with it? Gone. No, Gina, he's all right. What makes you so sure? You heard the man. What man? Well, whatever he was, Varg, the spaceship's commander. Oh. He promised he'd return your father after they talked to him. What are they, whoever they are, want to talk to him about? Well, search me. Oh, don't give the big stone face to me, Andy Harris. You've got to have some idea of what's going on. I swear to you, Ginny, I do not have one clue. And if they don't return Dad within 24 hours, then what? I, I guess we go on full wartime footing. Against what? Well, that's the big question, Ginny. It's bad enough that we have to take a step into the last unthinkable war, but to have to make that step without knowing the enemy is kind of mind-boggling. Do we even know that they are the enemy? Yeah, I think President Alexander answered that one for us in the speech we heard. He was the one that set up the time limit. And the way I read it, he wasn't running all that scared. I think he was laying it on the other guys that they weren't dealing for much strength. You really honestly believe that, Andy? I don't know what I believe. And neither does anyone else. This is the one contingency nobody ever figured to make plans for. Welcome, Varg. You were successful, I hear. I am always successful. It's nice to know someone has a good opinion of you. Someday I will make you sorry for your contempt for me. It isn't contempt, Varg. You're beneath that. Do not give yourself airs, Zeda. Because you are half borrowed from the life stream. We modules are just as good as you. I don't intend to argue with you. Have you brought our hostage? He is just beyond the door. Can we get on with the business at hand before the Supreme One questions the delay? Oh, one of these days, Zeda. Open. You may come in, Mr. President. Thank you. This is Dr. Zeda. You will be in her control now. May I ask why I've been brought here, wherever I am? My instructions do not permit me to do so. Then I demand to be taken before this... this Supreme One. What is it you want of me? My desires are simple and quite practical, Mr. President. I am a doctor. A medical doctor? Yes, May I ask your name? Zeda. That's all? Dr. Zeda? Won't that serve? It's only identification, after all. Why am I here? As far as it concerns me, for a basic series of tests. Medical. I'm not applying to be a citizen of whatever state you represent. You have joined Nicholas Seven as a passenger. It is routine for you to be quarantined until we can determine that you are properly immunized. There isn't time for that. I thought I had made it quite clear to your Commander Varg that if I am not returned to Earth or am not in contact with it within 24 hours, a state of war will exist between us and your country, whatever it's called. We have no country. I beg your pardon? We are survivors, limited to the travelers on this spaceship. Oh, this is a large cosmos in itself. We are not inconsequential, but we are a culture in search of a home. I don't understand exactly why I have been... Well, why mince words? Why I have been kidnapped? What function can I serve for you? I am not quite sure of that myself. It is something you will have to discuss with the Supreme One... after I have finished my tests. Give me your arm, please. What for? I wish to take a blood sample. If you don't get me in to see your precious Supreme One, Dr. Zeta... you will have a bath of blood... My country, for its own protection, will throw all our might against you and blow you and your mother ship out of the sky. Not while you are hostage. Oh, yes. I would disappear with you. I am, after all, not indispensable. You mean you would permit your people to destroy you? I would expect them to if you were the enemy. Are you? First of all, I must carry out my tests. And then... I will seek an audience with the Supreme One and tell him you wish to appear before him.
I bow in reverence before you, O oh, my father. We recognize your presence, daughter. What is your desire? Not mine, but the Earth's creatures. He demands an audience with you. Demands? He says that if he is not returned immediately, his people will send their ships against us and shoot the mothership out of the sky. Fortunately, since we are in another time continuum, they cannot find us unless we choose to show ourselves. His threat and his demands are useless. He wants also to know why we have taken him and what it is you want of him. I want you to adapt him. Wash his brain clean so that we can send him back to fulfill our purpose. I don't think I can do that, Father. He is too strong. Then you must change him. Make him completely one of us. I don't know if that is possible. All things are possible. Did you not become completely one of us? Yes. So then shall he. But I can't do that without killing his... It is hard for me to describe to you, Oming, my father. Because we are different. It is you who are different. Do not fill me with old angers. Are you still prattling about the non-existent, what you call the soul? Did we not stamp that out of you? Yes, father. Then should we hesitate to destroy it in a stranger? I am not interested in President Winston Alexander, the earthling, except as he shall serve our needs. However you achieve the result, I want him fully conditioned to carry out those needs and our commands. Now remember, this is a story of supposing if. Supposing there was a mothership from some unimaginable planet coursing in space looking for a new land to colonize, and supposing they singled out Earth and felt that it was their promised land. How much would they lay claim to? Or would they simply follow the pattern of colonialism and take it all? Mystery Theater will return shortly with Act Two. The United States, since its birth, has traditionally been a haven for all displaced persons who seek a new chance in life. By and large, with few exceptions, no country has welcomed the alien more generously. But alien in a science-oriented society is no longer a simple description of someone who may differ in minor ways, such as color, creed, or politics, tomorrow's alien may come from a background so foreign that there is no hope, there is no hope a world can be shared. You have been long, Dr. Zeta. What news do you bring? I am afraid not what you want to hear, President Alexander. You mean I am not to see your supreme one? He has commissioned me to be his ambassador. Well, under other circumstances, I couldn't be more charmed. Perhaps even under these. What do we have to discuss? Mr. Alexander, if that is the correct term to apply to you. It is perfectly correct. Except somehow between us, I... Yes. Well, I don't know what made me say that. Some... Some strange tug underneath everything makes me want to deny any formality between us. I must tell you, Mr. Alexander... You are wasting your time. I am not a woman as you conceive of women. Are you so sure? Yes. You must understand about us aboard this ship. We are only humanoids. You cannot judge us by your standards. Humanoids? Robots, if you prefer the word. Although it is not exact. Let me explain. The mother ship on which we are now traveling, was named after the planet that was our home, Niklos 7, in the Adumbrian Galaxy. Some generations ago, 
a supernova in our galaxy exploded. And in the holocaust that swept across our planet, almost all of my ancestors were destroyed. Those that were left found in that environment that was left, the human body, as you would call it, could not be sustained. You mean there was no atmosphere? No air to breathe? What? Oh, there was atmosphere. Poisoned by radiation. And that forced us to adapt. To adapt in what way? Since the human body was eroded, we had to provide an envelope in which to sustain life. We developed what was essentially a machine. An engine wrapped in the simulacrum, the semblance of the human. And we powered it with the mind. The individual souls of those left alive. Well, if you were so successful, why didn't you develop and recolonize your planet? Because, unfortunately, our atmosphere was not stable. And in the time following the Holocaust, we were left with no air to breathe and no way to adapt our robots to some other form of energy. The strongest of us set out on this ship to seek a home in another planet. And you have brought me here to discuss introducing you and your shipmates into our culture? Oh, no, Mr. President. There is nothing to discuss. It is my function to prepare you so that you will make it possible for us to take over your planet. How? It would be hard for me to explain. In storage, against the necessity for constant replacement... We have robots ready to be activated. You see this machine here? Machine? Perhaps you did not recognize it as such. Two rooms behind glass doors. In one, they are already placing your robot. My robot? He does not look much like you yet. But the electrodes they are attaching to him will be synchronized with the electrodes we attach to you. And when we are finished, he will be, in every physical sense, a simulacrum of you. A duplicate of you. And what happens to me? You become a husk to be discarded. What? Mm, an outmoded model, unable to function in the atmosphere of our new world. What new world? The one that will exist in the dust of radiation and the end of Earth. The world that all of us from Niklo 7 are going to build with your help. I will not be party to anything like this. You have no choice. Vog, seize him. No. Oh, 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 oh. All right, Vog. Put him in the transformer. Afternoon, Ginny. Afternoon, Andy. Oh, I've been dying till you got here. What's new? Uh, not a thing. No news of Dad? None. Oh, no. Well, what else is happening? What isn't? We've tried to keep it as secret as possible, but there are always leaks. Well, what is this? Uh, thank heavens the country doesn't know about it yet, and the press is capped, but the diplomatic wires are burning. What do they say? Well, they don't say anything, baby. They just ask. <gasps> Naveep has been on the hotline off and on all day with President Brusco. Well, what's his reaction? Uh, what's in it for them, first off? Then diplomatic regrets. They probably figure if we're going to be under attack from outside in space, it might be time for a little more cooperation. But we don't know yet that they are under attack. Baby, a pirate ship turns up on the White House lawn, and in spite of the greatest security set up in this old globe, they just take our president away like he was off for Disneyland? Hey, everybody's running scared because they don't know what's next. Baby, we don't know what we're up against. <laughs> This is President Alexander, aboard a shuttle spacecraft, returning me as promised to the White House at the pre-agreed time. I have been well treated and am in the best of health. No one need have any concern about me. I have just completed preliminary discussions with a friendly power from outer space, which will have dramatic and earth-shaking consequences for the safety of America and the whole world. I am aware that all our armed forces have been alerted. I ask them as President and Commander-in-Chief to extend safe conduct to the spaceship and allow it to land me and then depart in full safety. Where is it, Andy? I can hear it, but I can't see it. Uh, you, me, and everybody else, Jenny. 
I'll lay you odds even radar and transcom haven't got a fix on it. But it can't be just invisible. Well, it could be. Probably sets up some sort of magnetic field which locks it out of all our sensors, including just plain old eyesight. But it sounds louder and louder. You can tell it's approaching. Well, ten to one, it doesn't have to. They just want to warn us they're on the way. You better keep to uh, one side of the window, Jenny. <gasps> Uh, where? Oh, by the monument. It's skimming in like like a frisbee. Wish oh, that's oh. all it was. Oh, you don't think anything's going to go wrong, do you? It sure had better not. Oh, Since that thing showed up in the first place, I got a hunch nothing's going right. Oh, Daddy. Virginia. Oh. It's all right. It's all right, baby. Oh. It's all right. Oh, it's been such a nightmare. It oh, was quite an adventure. <laughs> what are you doing, still up? Is there anyone who's been aware of what's going on in the last 24 hours that sleeps and out of the quest? Well, I hope the knowledge hasn't been too general. Oh, I wouldn't know. But Andy says not. He thinks they've been able to keep the lid on. I hope so. Oh, you're, you're okay, aren't you, Daddy? As you can see. Oh, but what went on? Why did they take you? Who are they? I uh, mean... No, 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 no. One question at a time. <laughs> Incidentally, let me close this door. Tell me, who are they? What happened? First of all, they are friends. Friends? I shudder to think of what might be about to happen to our world if they hadn't warned me. Warned you of what? A monstrous plot to destroy America. What? An unholy alliance to take over and rule the world, if there is any left of it. What do you mean? It's too complex to explain to you, Virginia. There is a secret alliance between a group of mineral-rich nations and our main enemy, which is called the Consortium. The Consortium? They are poised to unleash a massive strike against us, which would wipe us out before we had a chance to reply. Now that plot has been uncovered. I, we, have an opportunity to, to treat with them, or at least with our knowledge, to instigate a preventive strike. Thanks to our friends from outer space, we have a chance to buy some time, or force enough, to hammer out a new agreement. If not, we must move first. That's the decision that I have to make. And unfortunately, it must be made alone. Oh, poor Dad. Like you always say, if you only could have shared it with Boots. Um, Boots? Mom, what you used to call her. Oh, oh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> but what, what does that have to do with anything? This is a decision of state. <laughs> Is it six, audience? Commander Varg, oh, Supreme One. I have a little time left. My light is growing dim. You shall be my successor, and I will have you bound in union to my daughter. In her burns the only flame which can guarantee us immortality. You must guard it first of all things. You sent for me, great father. I ask you about the earthling. Varg has delivered him back to his planet. Has this module, this simulacrum, been properly vested with our ideas and desires? Yes, father. Then we control this robot completely? Yes, father. And the real, what is his name, Alexander has been eliminated? I didn't hear your answer, daughter. The real Alexander has ceased to be a threat. Mm. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, who, who is it? Andy, it's me, Jim. Uh, uh, hold it, I'll, I'll be right there. Uh, what is it, Jenny? What are you doing wandering around at five in the morning? Andy, I'm scared. Can I come in? Mm. I don't know how to say this, so it makes sense. You're the only one I can say it to. Say what? Uh, come on, baby, spill it. Andy, the man they brought back in the spacecraft? Uh-huh. That's not my dad. It's not President Winston Alexander. There's just no way that is my father. As President of the United States... Winston Alexander holds the fate of the world in less than one hand. In cold fact, in the finger that may press the button to unleash atomic warfare to end the world. President Alexander 
has been replaced by a robot, activated by a power in space that has everything to gain from the end of Earth and nothing to lose. I shall return shortly with Act Three. While America sleeps safer in the year 2029, secure that her kidnapped president has been returned safe and sound, his daughter is the only one to question what we know to be the truth, that the man who sits at one end of the hotline is a robot from outer space, controlled and operated at the whim of the leader of a spacecraft, desperate to find a home for his alien cargo. Only President Alexander's daughter faintly glimpses the truth. Can her instinct be enough to stop disaster? What are you talking about, Ginny? I tell you, he is not my father. Well, you mean they brainwashed him or something? I don't know what I mean, Andy. It's just... It's just, I, I, I don't know, little things. He is not my father. What little things? Oh, I don't know. Like, he calls me Virginia. Now, that's, that's funny. That's strange. Dad never called me anything but Jen. And he doesn't... I don't know how to describe it. It, it. it just doesn't feel right. Ginny, we've all been through the ringer and been pretty shook. Now, you're just jumping at shadows. I'm not. At, at Boots. Huh? Boots. That was Dad's name for my mother. Dad could never forget it. Ginny, your mother's been dead for 15 years. But you don't forget things like that. Dad wouldn't. He can't forget his own name for her, that he loved to call her. If it isn't your father... Who is it? I don't know. I... Oh, Andy, do you think I'm losing my mind? Because there's something about him that scares me. It scares me right down to my heels. Wake up, Mr. President Alexander. Uh, Wake up. Uh, well... That's such a long name. Oh. We must find something more suitable. What did your wife call you? What? What did you say? Did your wife have a name for you? My my, my wife? Ruth? Boots? She, uh... Yes, she, uh... She she, she called me Wink. Wink? Yes, short short for Winston. It was a silly name, but... I liked it. Wink. I like it, too. Wink. Well, where am I? Where I brought you. To my bed. To your bed? I, I can't stay here. You must. Where else can I hide you? Hide me? Why, why, why must I be hidden? Because I should have destroyed you once I made your other self. What other self? The one we sent back to Earth. The one we programmed to destroy all the people on Earth. So we Niklausians may have a home again. To destroy all the people on Earth? How? Why? You ask me. You were the ones who made the seed of your own destruction. But the bombs do not obliterate. The radiation will disintegrate. When there are no living left, we robots can make it home. Nuclear war? That's unthinkable. Look, I, I know President Bruskov. He's a man of sanity. He could not start such a war. It is not he who will start it. Who then? Yourself. What? Me? In the image I have created of you and sent back to take your place. Wait a minute. Now I'm beginning to remember that that, that machine, that scanner, and a robot that you were molding so that it would look like me. But you, you didn't. You, you, you couldn't have. I already have. He is sleeping at this moment in your bed on Earth. When he rises tomorrow, he will still believe what he has been programmed to believe. That his friend, President Bruskov, and a number of leaders from the Third World have betrayed him and are prepared to start an atomic war against America. Convinced he has no other option, he will initiate the war instead. In the resulting Holocaust, what survivors are left, we will exterminate. So that your Earth 
will be fit for us to occupy. Well, then what purpose am I being saved for? When we met, you felt the same urge I did. A long-forgotten urge for me. I am not like most Niklosians. My mother was alive, the last of the humans on our planet. You are the first living man I have ever known. What? I want you. You want me? You want me for what? Uh, as a luck charm? As, as a house pet? Look, I have got to stop what you say is going to happen. There is no way. There has to be. Zeta, listen to me. Now, you say that your mother was human, and you are her child. So you must have some feelings. If you, if you have any... If you have any love for me... Love? Well, what made you keep me alive? I don't know. I wanted to know, to feel, to understand why I felt these... these things in me. I never... Wink. Is what I feel for you love? I doubt that. Love doesn't ask or demand... Love gives. You want me to give you something? Yes. Give me my freedom to go back and to save my world. Love, what are you doing here? I have been listening to you plan treason against Domingue and our ship. But I ran a screen so no one could listen. As commander of the ship, I have my own communications. No one can shut them down. What is it you want? Him. Why? To eliminate him, as you should have done. Leave him alone. Give me the earth man to destroy. And give yourself to me. And I will keep your treachery my secret. No. I am in no mood to argue. I will destroy him now. Don't. I warn you. How can you stop me? Like this. No. Oh, how can you? No one is to be armed but me. You fool. I am a doctor. If I can create the simulacrum of life, do you think I would not have the power to destroy it? But we, we are deathless. Only the human spirit is that. A robot dies forever with the body. But you can give another body to... <sighs> Never. It's time that all of us went down to destruction. Good Lord, he's just, he's just disintegrating. It's not a body at all, it's just a mass of wires and circuits and transistors. Is that what's sitting in place of me at this very minute? And programmed to blow up your world as you know it. I've got to get back and stop it. You can't stop it. Only I can do that. Then you have got to. I don't have to do anything. But this I can do out of free will. You said that loving was giving. I only hope we are in time. <laughs> We've got to get back to the White House, Andy. Yeah, I know. I have the duty in an hour. Tonight, I have the black box. The phone? Yeah, the trigger. Oh. Once the code word is spoken into it, that's the end of it all. Oh, no. No, Andy. He's not planning to use it. I don't know, honey. This has been a day to remember. Or forget. Ever since he came back from... from wherever the space nicks took him, he's been obsessed by this plot, he says. They proved to him that the other side is set to push the button. I want to tell you, the cabinet meeting was a shambles. He is not my father. Well, whatever he is, he is not the president. Man, that's why I had to get you away from there to talk to you for a moment. Crazy as it is, somewhere along in this afternoon, watching him, I... I knew you were right. Mm. The guy in the White House is not our president. Could you convince any of the cabinet members or, or the Veep of that? I'm nah, just a lowly lieutenant colonel and the president's special aide. I'm still on the outside looking in. So what can we do? Nah, try to keep cool. Nothing's happened yet. And nothing is going to happen. But you just said that... Yeah, that I was on the outside looking in. That, that's true. Except for one thing. Tonight, I have the special duty. Remember? The black box. Right. If he tries to use it, Ginny, I'm going to stop him. Are we going to announce this arrival? There is no need. 
I have the radar negator on. We can penetrate your DMZ and have landed before they can activate a screen. Still, to avoid the risk of upsetting an already uneasy situation. Wink. How much more would it upset if you were to announce yourself as President Alexander returning when your whole world believes you are already there? Yes, I suppose you're right. But what do we do when we land? There will be ground forces. Helpless against the force field I maintain and the one I shall throw around you. And then what happens? We find your simulacrum and I destroy him as I did Varg. And then? Then. All is as it was before we invaded your world. I will return to the mothership and Earth will be safe. But you could stay, Zadar. You could stay and... Nothing. There is nothing for us. And I must return to take command of the Niklos 7 and drive it forever out of your orbit. But where will you go? Where we should have gone long ago when we ceased to be anything but automatons. To course into the empty void of space till fuel or air runs out. And we will be no more. In the end, the ship will break up. We will all disintegrate like Vark and disappear into atomic dust. I won't let that happen to you. There is no way you can stop it. And no time to discuss it further. We are about to land. Close the door, Colonel. Yes, sir, Mr. President. Only, uh... Only what? Uh, Ginny wanted to talk to you for a moment. Well, Ginny will have to wait. I have no time to talk to her now. Close the door. Yes, sir. Bring the box over to the desk and open it. Yes, sir. Why did you, uh, want me to open it, sir? Because I'm going to have to use it. Use it, Mr. President? The forces of evil have bound themselves together in an unholy alliance to wipe the America we know from the face of the earth. We have no choice but to take preemptive action. Open the box and give me the phone. No, sir. What? If you disobey my orders, I'll have you shot. Yes, sir, but not much chance of that since I'm the only one that's armed at the moment. You think for one moment that that outmoded weapon that you're pointing at me could... What's that? I'll I'll open the window and... It's the spaceship. What's it doing here? Let me see. The door is opening. Zeta, what are you doing here? Eliminating you. So, that is the end of it. And us, Wink? No. Don't go. I must. But I gave you something, Wink. I gave you back your world. What can I say? Only goodbye. Me and mine. We're a disease which had to be stamped out. And will be. You will never see or hear of us again. But at least once, Wink, I gave. I found out what love is all about. I would rather have lived it. But it is also worth dying for. I'll be back shortly with a final thought. The nights are lonelier than ever now for President Winston Alexander since his daughter Ginny married full Colonel Andrew Harris. Oh, they live in Georgetown, not too far away, but far away are his thoughts, far away beyond the stars, with a woman named Zaida who learned about the miracle of love just in time, but still too late. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Evie Juster, and Russell Horton. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams.
It's 10.07. ABS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. The occult is described by Webster as that which is not to be apprehended or understood, that which is beyond the scope of plain understanding. Now, the simplest forms of life know certain things, how to feed, how to propagate, without the least desire to learn how or why. More complex animals grasp more difficult problems till today. There are monkeys who can communicate with us in sign language. But only man, restless, greedy, and complex man, persists in trying to comprehend everything. Wake up. Wake up. Mm, What? Nobody needs you here anymore, nurse. Nobody what? He has seen the great light. He is submerged in it. He is dead. Our mystery drama, The Glass Bubble, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Terry Keene. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. ever be satisfied? Will he ever stop asking how and what and why and wherefore? Will he ever call a halt to his search for the total knowledge that he believes will bring him total power? The answer is no, never. He will know it all, even if it kills him. curled up inside my glass bubble thinking what to do now. Of course, to other people my glass bubble would seem to be just a room. A little room only eight feet square with white walls, white ceiling, a white chenille rug on the white floor, a white bed with a white cover, a little white chest next to the bed with a white reading lamp on it and my white telephone. I've lived in this room since I was a tiny baby, and that was 43 years ago. I call it my glass bubble because of something Strindberg wrote that I've always remembered. Living alone in a single room produces a strange feeling of almost morbid intensity. Like being inside a glass bubble. So you see... It was in this very room, snuggled on this very bed, when at the age of 28, I woke in the middle of the night with the certain knowledge that my father, who had been ill for quite a long time, was dead. I got out of my bed. I walked down the corridor to his bedroom. I opened the door. I switched on the light. And I walked over to the big chair where his night nurse was snoozing. I shook her very gently. Wake up. Wake up. Mm, What? Nobody needs you anymore, nurse. What is it? You're discharged, as of now. But I was... You can go home and don't come back. But I... My father has seen the great white light. He... He what? He is submerged in it. He is one with it. He is dead. Then I went back to my room, my glass bubble, and laid down on the bed. I left it to the nurse to rouse my sister Joan. In my glass bubble, I waited for the feeling of morbid intensity to return. 
which about daybreak it did. And I reached for my phone, which by now, thank heaven, was not in use. Yes? Hello? This is Doris, Tom. Oh. Oh, yes. What is it? Is something wrong? Nothing's wrong. It's not even six o'clock, Doris. I know. I wouldn't have called you, but it's urgent. Father's dead, Tom. What? Your father? He died a couple of hours ago. Oh, you poor kid. Honey, I'm sorry. I need to see you. Of course. But I'll throw on some clothes and I'll come right over. Uh, No, don't do that. Uh, John's been calling everybody. The house will start to fill up any minute. What do you want me to do? I want you to stay right where you are. I'll come to you. I'll be right over. I pulled on some boots, threw my fur coat over my nightdress, and crept out of the house. I had come to the crossroads of my life. I'd known for years, 23 years to be exact, since the age of five, that there would be a break in my life sooner or later, and that when that break came, I would have to choose. Well, it had come. There in my glass bubble, in that particular state of intensity, I had made my choice. I pulled up in front of Tom's cottage. I got out and walked up to his door. I had never been more sure of myself what I had to do. Come in, come in, come in. Gosh, I've been so worried. Poor baby. You want something? A drink? Coffee? I made coffee. No, I don't want anything, thank you, Tom. Well, sit down anyway. Here, here, here. Sit down. I don't need to sit down. I won't be staying long. No, I, I suppose you have to get back. When, uh... When did it happen? At three minutes past four. Three minutes past... You were there? You were with him uh, when it happened? No, I was in my room. Oh, the nurse... The nurse was asleep. Well, who was with him? I mean, uh, three minutes past four, if, if the nurse was asleep. How do you know? But who told you? Nobody had to tell me. No, but Doris... I simply knew. I mean, you couldn't know. Of course I could. Darling, how? I was asleep in my room, fast asleep. At three minutes past four, my eyes flickered open. On the instant I was awake, I saw him. Who, darling? You saw who? My father. No. No. First, I saw the great light, the great white and luminous light filling the room... Filling the world. Filling all space and everything beyond. The moonlight, darling. There was no moon. There weren't even any stars. No, there was just this great light. This gigantic radiance. And my father staring into it. Bright as it was. He didn't even blink his eyes. No, he moved forward. He moved into it. And it swallowed him up. I, uh, I don't know what to say to you, Doris. Uh, There's nothing for you to say. Oh, I, I wish I could understand you. Well, then listen, and I'll try to make you understand. What happened a few hours ago, it's not the first time such thing has happened to me. When I was five years old, now that's the first time I remember There may have been many instances before that. One day, our family cat was missing. He was a dear cat. We all loved him very much. And there was a big outcry from my father, my mother. Even the cook was upset and the housemaid, too. Everyone but me. You uh, weren't upset? No. Because in my little white room, lying on my little white bed, I could see the cat quite clearly. And I went to my mother and I said, Don't cry, mother. The cat is smashed flat on Oak Street in front of the fish market. It must have been the way I said it because she went right over to the fish place and there was the cat in the middle of the street, run over by a car. Smashed flat. That's... That's quite a story. 
And I was ten when Joan was born. Prematurely, you know. No, I... I didn't know. Oh, yes. They didn't think she'd live. But one day, in my little room, I could see her laughing and cooing and holding out her little arms. And I went to my mother and I said, Don't worry, Mother. Joan's going to be all right. And my mother gave me a funny look. Maybe she remembered about the cat. I don't know. Anyway, a few days later, Joan was out of danger. Hasn't had a sick day since. What do you think of that? I, I don't know what to think. It was while I was lying in my little white room that I realized this was a year or so later that my mother was losing her mind. No, I didn't tell anybody about that. It didn't seem the kindly thing to do. But a year later, they had to put her away. So, you see how it is. No, no, I, oh, I don't... Oh, Tom! Not it's the... so obvious. It isn't obvious to You've me. heard of the psi faculty, haven't you? I've heard of it. I've got it. Are you telling me you're psychic? Is that it? Everyone is psychic, Tom. Potentially psychic. Not me. Oh, no. Everyone. Tom, the mind is limitless. Don't you know that? Not the mind. Limitless and filled with energy. Filled to overflowing. But most people waste this beautiful energy. They let it stagnate. Instead of freeing it. Letting it flow out and out. I have to stick with reality. But reality is energy. Don't you see that? Reality is energy and only energy. Energy. Pure and simple. Not to me. Do you know that I often go alone to the theater or to concerts or to the moving pictures? Not because I care about the plays or the music or the films. No. Just to soak up all the wasted energy from the foolish, heedless people around me who are wasting theirs. No, I, I, I didn't know. Well, how could you? Nobody knew. I never told anybody. Because I had to be sure. Sure of what? That my energy, my psi quality was strong enough to use for the good of mankind. Tonight, when I woke up in my little room and knew for a certainty that my father had just died and went to his room and found him dead, even then, I wasn't quite sure. Not quite. So I went back to my glass bubble. That's what I call my room. And I stretched out on the bed. And lying there, the certainty grew in me. Grew. Grew. And grew till it took over my mind, my body, my soul, my entire being. And I knew with such positiveness, such assurance, that's when I called you. Knew what? What did you know? That you and I, my dear, can never be married. I felt sorry for Tom. I suppose. I'd been the only woman in his mundane, circumscribed life. He'd adored me, given me all his respect, his admiration, his love. And I? What had I given in return? Nothing. Not really. But tolerance and permission to worship me. Poor Tom. Poor, good, loyal, tender devoted Tom. Yes, I tried to feel sorry for him. I really did try. And I almost succeeded, but my mind was too full of the glorious adventures that lay in store for me. I couldn't, I simply couldn't waste any of my precious energy on him. As I lie here now, in my glass bubble, looking back on that momentous decision of mine 25 years ago, I realized how very wise I was. Because the following year, 
Tom married my sister, Joan. How very strange are the ways of destiny. How little we know of the vicissitudes of life. How ignorant we are of the wisdom of our decisions, or even why we make them as we do. No wonder that sometimes it seems better just to stand still. I shall be back shortly with Act Two. So inventive, so resourceful have our technologists become in the last few decades that the rest of us gasp with admiration and even awe. But we gasp with something else, and that is fear and a feeling of impotence. We cannot cope with this strange new world. Small wonder that so many of us want nothing more than to be told what to do. We feel we can no longer control, nor do we wish to control our own lives. It's too difficult. Huddled here in my glass bubble, I think back 25 years to the wedding of Tom and Joan. Mr. and Mrs. Struthers. Handsome Tom, adorable Joan. Ideal couple right out of a magazine, the classy kind. I performed my duties as maid of honor, smiled and said appropriate things, knowing that once this charade was over, I could come back here to my little room. I saw little of the storybook couple after that. I had no wish to, and probably they felt the same way. They thought me strange, and I thought them ridiculous. They went their way, and I went mine. Until a week ago. Who is it? I said, who is it? Go away, please. I don't permit dogs here. Dogs, it's Joan. Joan? Your sister. Let me in. Have you got a dog with you? You won't hurt. Come on, Doris. Open the door. No, if you're sure... Oh, what an ugly black thing. It's hot. So big. It's so black. Are you going to let us in? Both of you? I never go anywhere without him. And vice versa. Well? Why, why did you come here? Let us in and I'll tell you. Oh, all right, okay. Thank you so much. Come on, baby. <laughs> baby? You call that big black thing baby? Uh, are you staying long? I've left, Tom. You what? His jealousy was unbearable. What did he have to be jealous about? Can I help it if I'm attractive to men? What men? Oh, Terry and Dwight and Martin. Any man, all of them. Men I don't even know. He's jealous of the way they look at me on the street, in restaurants, any place. And every time one of them phones me, oh, my dear, what scene. Well, are you going to give me a cup of tea or something? Oh, it will come in the kitchen. I'll give you some tea, and then you can figure out what you're going to do. Where you're going to live. Why, here. I'm going to live here, with you. Where else would I live? <laughs> I was horrified, aghast. The very thought of anyone invading my privacy, encroaching on my solitude, it was unbearable. The fact that this was my sister, well, I hardly knew her anymore. She was Mrs. Tom Struthers. Her life was a world apart from mine. And mine, what did she know of my life? What could she know? What did I want her to know? Nothing. Now I have to have her here with this huge black hairy monster constantly at her side no I could not endure it now there's your tea drink up and then call Tom and tell him you're coming back you have a phone of course I have a phone there's one on the wall over there and there's an extension upstairs uh, see that you use this one why this one because the other one is in my room and I don't allow anyone in my room. Why not? Because I don't. 
Now finish your tea and then call Tom. I can't. Doris, I... I can't go back to him. I really can't. How can I make you understand? You've never had men interested in you. Do I have to remind you that Tom was interested in me? Oh, years ago. Uh, that he only married you after I turned him down? Did you really turn him down? I always wondered. Well, I did. Why did you? Not that he's anything special. Tom is a very good man. I simply had other things to do with my life, which did not include marriage. Let me stay for, for a day or two at least. Out of the question. Well, till I can make other arrangements. What sort of arrangements? Well, I could uh, go to a hotel, perhaps. Do that. I can't. Not right away. Why not? Why not this afternoon? Because I'm expecting some calls. Everybody thinks I'm staying here with you. Everybody? You told everybody you were staying with me? Not everybody. Just a few people. Who, for instance? Jack and Marty and Charles. Men. All men? Doris, I can't help it if I have this, this fascination for men. I suppose I'm what they call a femme fatale. It's not my fault. Then Tom's right. No, no. You have been playing around. Oh, no, I wouldn't. Tom's got every right to be jealous. He hasn't. I swear to you, he hasn't. It's just that they run after me all the time. You mean they'll be calling here? They might. I can't have it. For a week. A few days. Oh, let me stay overnight. At least you can let me stay overnight. Oh, Doris, I'm your sister. You're the only person I can turn to. Please, just till tomorrow. You've got plenty of room. Please, just for tonight. How about the dog? We'll be good. He'll be quiet. Oh, please. Well, you can have Father's old room. Oh, don't you sleep there? It's the best room in the house. I have my own. The one I had when I was little. That dinky little room. It suits me. I gave her Father's room and she and her big black dog settled in. The dog behaved well, I have to admit that. He simply followed her around. But he was not quiet. Every time the phone rang, he barked and barked and barked till Joan answered it. And an hour after her arrival, it started ringing. I get it. I got it. Yes? Hello. Oh, Stephen, why did you call me? You know I told you not to. Stephen, Jimmy, Marty, Bob, an endless string of phone calls. What was she, this sister of mine? A witch? A sorceress? Or simply a wicked woman? I enclosed myself in my glass bubble oftener each day. And for longer periods of time. I began to be fascinated by these phone calls. And I began to pay them strict attention. The pattern was always the same. I'll get it. I got it. Yes? Oh, Andy. Oh, she was clever. Feline and clever. And my glass bubble was not having its old effect on me. I could not attain that state of morbid intensity. I was too distracted, too distraught. The sound of that provocative little voice stirred memories in me. It was becoming unbearable. And I had to do something. I went to see Tom Struthers. Why, Doris, this is a surprise. Come in, come in. I have to talk to you, Tom. What's the matter? Are you all right? Uh, you know your wife is staying with me. Oh, is she? Oh, I thought she might go to you. Tom, I know about your jealousy. She told me. My jealousy? Oh, my dear, you can't be blamed for it. Oh, well, that's nice to know. You have no idea what it's been like since she's moved in with me. Men have been calling her at all hours of the day and night. I don't know who they are, but there must be dozens of them. Really? The phone rings, the dog barks, Joan rushes to the phone. It's another one. 
And I mean the way she talks, so coy and kittenish, leading them on, but never really saying anything. You know what I mean? I know, I know very well. You mean they've called her here? In your very own house? Oh, yes. Oh, poor Tom. Well, no wonder you were jealous. Who could blame you? I wasn't jealous. Well, you must have been. You had every reason to be. Joan was. But I wasn't. Joan was jealous. What did she have to be jealous of? You know. No, I don't. You must know. Don't tell me you don't know. Know what? That I've never stopped being in love with you. In love... In love with me? Or the memory of you. You mustn't say such things. Tom, no. Now, it can't be. It's been 25 years. We've hardly seen each other. I have a very good memory. Look, we will forget you've said any of this. Forget I ever came here. Forget it all. I will go back to my place and I'll tell Joan to come back to you. But I don't want her back. You must. You must. You will straighten everything out. Now, I'm sure there's a way. No, please, please don't come near me. Don't touch me. Don't. Don't. We will forget that. drove home too fast, too recklessly, my emotions in turmoil, my heart racing, all with confusion. Tom had not been jealous. Tom had loved me. I drove faster and faster and more and more recklessly, but somehow I reached home safely and let myself in, only to hear the familiar sound. any more scenes. Your jealousy. It's too much. No. Tom. No. Then I knew my sister was possessed. To be possessed is to be dominated by an extraneous personality or by a passion or an idea or an impulse or, if you will, by a demon. It is a mystery why anyone would desire to be so possessed. But it is becoming more and more apparent that a great many people gladly surrender to outside authority and willingly, even eagerly, abdicate their autonomy. Self-possession has become for them an unbearable burden. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. We were talking before about being self-possessed. This is not quite the same thing as being self-sufficient. One self cannot live happily without other selves with whom to share the chancy business of living. But sharing is not the same as owning or being owned. One must belong to no one and nothing but oneself. Or what one shares with other selves is worth little or nothing at all. Curled up here in my glass bubble, my knees pulled up to my chin and my eyes closed tight. I strive with all my will to induce the feeling of morbid intensity that Strindberg described and so often experienced within his own glass bubble. It will not come. Memories. My mind flits across that last meeting with Tom when he said he'd loved me all those 25 years. 
that he cared not a fig whether Joan returned to him or not. I remember leaving him and driving furiously home and hearing Joan on the phone in the kitchen. Yeah? Hello? Oh, Tom. Tom, I can't come back to you. No, Tom. No! And I remember, too, with a sharp stab of pain, my certain knowledge that my sister was possessed. After that shattering moment of truth a week ago, I retired to my little room, to my glass bubble. I never left it. And the telephone rang several times each day. And the dog barked. And Joan rushed to the kitchen phone. And her soft, seductive voice floated up to me. I'll get it. I've got it. Yes? Hello? Oh, Jim, is it you again? The mood was upon me. Every nerve quivered. Every sense was sharp, acute. I reached out my hand to the white telephone on the little white bedside stand. I had to know who it was that Joan was lying to this time. Softly, stealthily, I lifted the receiver of my white telephone and put it to my ear. Oh, Jimmy. You're such a dear boy, and I'm most awfully fond of you, but... Oh, now don't say that. You mustn't speak to me that way. Because it's not right. The receiver fell from my hand. There was no second voice on the line. Joan was speaking to a voiceless being. A creature only she could hear. She was still talking to the voiceless entity when I crept out of the house, got into my car, and drove cautiously, deliberately this time, to Tom's cottage. Doris, you came back. Doris. No, Tom, don't come closer. Well, I'm... I have something of the utmost importance to tell you. All right, all right, darling. Sit down and tell me. I will try to be brief. It will take as long as you like. Uh, no, I must tell you quickly because I have to get back. Joan is possessed. Possessed? Possessed? Oh, come on now, darling. Listen to me. When I went home after that last time, I saw you. When I walked into the house, Joan was on the phone in the kitchen. She was talking to you. To me? But I haven't talked to Joan since she walked out on me. That's when I knew she was possessed. She was talking to someone, someone she thought was you. Who could it be? I don't have any idea, and I couldn't care less. Well, I care. She is my sister. So what I did, I shut myself up in my room. I didn't even come out for meals. I told Joan and the servants I had a cold. Then today, half an hour ago, the phone rang. The dog barked, of course. And Joan ran to the phone the way she always does. But this time, I picked up the extension, the phone in my room... And I listened in. Well, who was it she was talking to? No one. No one? No one that could be heard, except by Joe. Doris, what, what are you getting at? A disembodied voice. I don't get it, Doris. I really don't. A voice from out there somewhere. Oh, come on now. A demon voice. Doris, And please. who was transmitting the demon voice? Who? The only one who could. The devil. Doris, sweetheart. Doris, baby. Baby, yes, baby. That's what she calls him. What do you mean? Imagine calling the devil baby. You don't mean the dog, do you? Of course I mean the dog. Don't you know that the devil often appears on earth in the shape of a big black dog? Didn't you know that? Uh, I, I don't... To think I let him into my own house, let him stay there, let him sleep in the same room with my sister, let him follow her around wherever she went. Doris, listen. He was so well-behaved, so obedient, so quiet, so well-mannered. 
But that's the way the devil can be when he wants to. I don't think that... Except... Except... When the phone rang. Then he would bark. Bark and bark until she'd answer it. He was egging her on, you see? Making her go to the phone. Making her talk to the voiceless demon. Listen, Doris. Tom. You have a gun, don't you? What? I said you have a gun. You do, don't you? Yes, I've got a gun. Well, but... give it to me. What for? What do you want it for? Well, what do you think I want it for? I don't know, Doris. I'm just afraid. I want to shoot the dog, of course. But, Doris... If you knew the devil was in your house, dominating your sister, holding her in thrall, wouldn't you want to kill him? Wouldn't you do it? But you don't actually know. I do know. In my glass bubble, it came to me. I know. Now, give me the gun. Here's the gun. Thank you. You know how to use it? I know enough. Thank you, Tom. Wait, wait a minute, Doris. Thank you very much. A gun is nothing to fool around with. Doris! I drove home with Tom's gun in my pocket. Everything was becoming crystal clear in my mind. I pulled up at the house, opened the door, and went in. Of course, the first thing I heard was Joan's voice. I'd expected that. And I smiled to myself as I made my way to the kitchen. Yes. There she was, with the devil huddled close to her legs. But what can I do? I'm a married woman. <laughs> oh, really? You mustn't say things like that. Hang up the phone. Uh, what? Oh, just a second, Harry. My sister just came in. Hang up the phone. Tell Harry you can't talk to him anymore. Harry, I have to hang up. My sister wants to talk to me. What is it, Doris? Sit down, Joan. All right. Sit. Baby, sit. That's a good boy. Must that dog sit so close to you? That's where he always sits. You know that. He wouldn't sit anyplace else. Oh, you just try moving him. You'll see. Joan, there's something I have to do. I'm sorry, my dear. No. You're going to ask us to leave, baby and me? No, not that. You mean we don't have to leave? You don't have to. Just him. You are possessed by him. But I love him. You love the devil. The devil? My baby. Your baby is the devil. He has taken over your being. He has deluded your poor mind. He has come into this house disguised as a black dog. It's an old trick of his. But this time he won't get away with it. Doris, what are you going to do? Sit very still, Joan. No, no! Oh, Doris, what have you done? The door chimes startled me. I turned and ran for the stairs. The chimes pursued me up the stairs, all the way to my glass bubble. I threw myself on the bed. The chimes had stopped. But I heard a banging on the front door. I heard a voice. A dear, familiar voice. Open the door! It's Tom! Open the door! Let me in! I could not concentrate. I could not induce the feeling of morbid intensity. I buried my head in the pillow, but it was no use. My glass bubble was failing me. Then I heard... The crashing of the front door. Now it's all right. Now the mood is taking over. Now I know what to do. Here in my glass bubble, everything is coming clear. Take me. 
here too late. I found Joan in the kitchen, sitting in a chair, the dog beside her. She had a bullet through her head. Upstairs, I found Doris. The coroner called it heart failure. What else could he call it? Everybody dies of heart failure, right? As long as your heart beats, you're alive. Am I right? Yes, yes, sure, I'm right. Oh, uh, the dog. The dog was okay. I brought him home with me. We're getting to be real pals. Since I'll never get married again, he's good company. The only company I've got, actually. Oh, I suppose you're wondering about those phone calls. No mystery. You dial the operator and ask her to test your phone. You think something may be wrong with it. Hang up. Wait a few seconds. Phone rings. Pick it up. Say thanks. And when she's off the line, you go on talking. So nobody, of course. Very effective if you want to make somebody jealous. Joan used to do it all the time, but it didn't work with me because I still loved Doris. Now there's no one. Just me and the dog. Tom Struthers is still living in the same house with the big black dog. Folks see them around town now and then, shopping, doing errands. He doesn't speak to anybody. Nobody speaks to him. But the big black dog never leaves his side. Never. And he never barks. Never. I'll be back shortly. At the store, they told me there's a powerful anti-itch drug I can buy without a doctor's prescription. Now, I use Biclozine Cream as directed. No more burning, embarrassing itching. No more scratching. Biclozine actually speeds healing. Biclozine Cream. What a relief. Now, soften and remove hard, callous skin with the same ingredient doctors use most. Apply Dermasoft Cream to feet, hands, elbows as directed. Dermasoft Cream. Fellow Americans, if you're still shopping here and there and everywhere for shoes, hold it right where you are. Put your feet together, stop running around. Just step around the kitty and you'll cover the ground. Anywhere you want to go, head your feet in our direction. After a couple of years, maybe Tom got so lonely that he dialed the operator and asked her to check his telephone. I could be wrong, of course, but I don't really think I am. Our cast included Terry Keene, Patricia Elliott, and Tony Roberts. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time...
I'm E.G. Marshall. The universe goes on and on, as round and round she goes. And where she starts and where she ends is something no one knows. Beginnings and endings. Our neat and precise human minds will insist on clearly stated limits, boundaries, definitions. But unfortunately, there are no satisfactory ways to limit, bound, or define the truly important things in life. Have you interrogated the prisoner? I have. Hey, who says I'm a prisoner? We have no use for the cargo. Destroy it and confiscate the ship. What are you trying to pull? And dispose of the prisoner. What do you mean, dispose of the prisoner? Am I being sentenced to something? To death. Don't I get a trial? You have been tried and found guilty. Our mystery drama, The Hole in the Sky, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer. Get rid of that noise, Curly. What's the matter? Don't you like good music? <laughs> I thought you was a real space jockey. If you want to talk about space, all right. You want to get down to business? Well, how about a little drink first? When I listen to a deal from you, I better be stone cold sober. Oh, would all Curly ever steer you wrong, Raj? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, do you know where Medusa's at? Medusa? Uh, that should be a star beyond Polaris. Well, I got the chart right here. Uh, the fifth planet circling around Medusa is called Bacchus. Hey, you can see it. Mm -hmm. I can also see it's a pretty good trip. Uh, can that lark of yours hold a 3,000-pound cargo? What kind of cargo? Why do you care? I won't handle contraband. <laughs> What's contraband? Everything's contraband to somebody somewhere. You know what I'm talking about, Curly. Hey, what's the difference, huh? The trip's illegal anyhow. There are no solo flights allowed outside the solar system, so what do you care? No drugs, no weapons, Curly. Now, would I be mixed up with weapons and drugs? Up to your ears. No, 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 no. This is just stuff for the ladies. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This Bacchus is a wild, wild place. It's just being colonized. Now, you could clear a fortune with some makeup. You know, powder, makeup, things the ladies just have to have. That's contraband. Yeah, sure, sure. Hey, but it's nice, harmless contraband. Look, if I'm caught with any sort of non-essential... If you're caught, what's the difference what you're caught with? What's the deal? Hey, <laughs> fantastic. You split the take 50-50. I what? That's right, old buddy. Right down the middle. What's the catch? No catch, no catch. No ifs, ands, and maybes. 50-50. Some deal, huh? When do I leave? Your cargo's ready right now. Tonight? Well, it better be tonight. You're due to sit down and back us no later than the 21st. 21st of what? 21st of this month. 21st? That, that, that's in six days. Well, actually, six and a half. Look at the chart. You see where Bacchus is? Sure. Well, this trip should take six weeks. There's no way I could ever cover this distance in six days. Oh, sure there is. How? Why, Roger, old buddy, you know how. You just go through the hole. Oh, I see. That's the catch. Ah, oh, now, don't tell me you're scared of the hole. I'm scared out of my wits. Now, look, if anybody had ever told me that Raj Thorpe had that little streak of yellow... Don't you? try to get a rise out of me, Curly. I'm not yellow. I'm smart. I'll see you around. I make it around 8 o'clock. That's as long as I can hold the job open. Goodbye, Curly. Hey, don't, don't go away, man. It'll make it harder for you to come back here. I'm not coming back. And I meant it. I was through with all that stuff. But what else was there for me to do? What else did I know how to do? I could join the Space Navy and wear a uniform... 
and be assigned to contraband control, which meant I'd have to prowl through space hunting down guys like me or guys like I used to be. Magda was waiting for me when I got home. Curly called. Yeah? He said your ship is loaded and ready. Mm-hmm. That's what he told you, huh? Well, he's in for the surprise of his life because I'm not going. What did you say? I said I'm not going. Honey, that's just great. Is it? Well, it means you got something better. Oh, is that what you think? You do have something better, don't you? I don't have anything at all. Well, then I don't understand. How could you turn Curly down? Because I... Because I... How do you think I've lived this long? Being scared is what keeps you being careful. Okay. It's just I understood there was a fortune in this trip. But I'd have to go through the hole. And I'm never going to do that again. Roger, you've come through it before. Do you have any idea what it is? That hole in the sky? I don't know. Some people say it's all in the spaceman's imagination. Let somebody tell me that. You don't know what it's like. Okay, Roger, okay. It's a hole. A big black hole in the sky. I believe you, Roger. And there is nothing in there. Nothing. Honey, don't you think you need a drink? Nothing. Do you understand? It's a kind of corridor. A crazy kind of corridor. Whatever you say. It's like the back door to everywhere. Wherever you want to go, it's right there. It sounds like fun. Like, like everything opens up on it. Everything is right there. Once you're there, you're everywhere. I believe you. Stars that are billions and billions of light years away from each other, like, like, like Polaris and Orion. Like Taurus and Ursa Major. It's as if you can just move from one to the other, like crossing the street. That's why it's only six days from here, because six days is how long it takes to get to the hole in the sky. And once you get to the hole, you're anywhere you want to be. Do you understand? I keep telling you, it's not all that complicated. But I'm not going there again. Oh, honey, just try a little goblet of this and you'll go anywhere. It's a wild place. Hey... Maybe I'd like to go there. A place where the whole universe is twisted and turned on itself. Sometimes it's quiet. Silent as the grave. And then... Then it explodes. Explode? Everything goes haywire. Crazy. There's no longer any sense of time. Or space. Or place. And you can just... Disappear. How can you just... Disappear? Take just a little sip of this. It's good for what ails you. Look. Right here on Earth, okay? There used to be a big ocean between Buenos Aires and Cape Town. Thousands of miles of ocean. Sure. And right in the middle, someplace, there used to be a spot called the Bermuda Triangle. Is that so? And the ships that they had, the ones that were supported by... About. The ships that sailed over that spot disappeared. Ships that flew above this place disappeared. So? So this kind of thing has happened before. Maybe that was a hole in the ocean. Sure, Raj. If you say so. Look, get that tone out of your voice. I can't go through that hole in the sky again. I can't. I, I made a dozen trips. And nothing happened. How long can I be lucky? No, if I go this time, I, I'll be lost. I'll disappear. Oh, come on, honey. Take a drink. You'll feel better. You always do. I've been thinking about it. I'm going to sell the lark. And do what? I can sell the lark to the Navy and raise a stake. And go where? Where? Um, to a planet like Bacchus. Or maybe right here in our own solar system. A wild place like Venus. Etch, or a mine. And you could raise enough from the sale of the lark? Oh, a good piece of it. For the rest, uh, well, I gave you plenty of jewels, money, credits. I know you did. All I'm asking is for you to give me some of it so I can get started. That's not all you're asking, Raj. You're also asking me to go with you and break my back in a mine or on a ranch. It's only tough for the first couple of years. I don't want to go. And as far as the money's concerned, it's mine. You gave it to me. I thought you and I were beyond words like yours and mine. And just said ours. No. Yeah. What'll I do the day you get tired of me? I'll never get tired of you, Magda. I'm sorry, Roger. 
I can't say to you, my darling, everything I own in the world is yours. Take it. Magda, I'm not asking for anything which I... You know that basically I'm out for myself. Did you think you could change me? All right, Magda. Six days there and six days back. Well, honey, that's less than two weeks. I'll be waiting for you when you come home. Back from her anyhow. She could only give me what she had to give. Why did I think I was entitled to more? And who was I kidding? I'd become a farmer, a rancher, a miner. I was nothing but a space rat. And I might as well learn to live with it. And die with it. I didn't even bother to tell Curly what he already knew. I went directly to the spaceport. The space conquered. But we had to go through the ritual. Hey, Roger. Hi, Joe. Hey, you inspected and cleared. Okay. That's uh, two page two. Uh, destination? Uh, Venus. And uh, cargo? None. Purpose of journey? To visit friends. Oh, come on, Roger. You got to do better than that. Why? What's the matter? Give me a break. The sheet does get checked. How does that look? To visit friends? Well, what do you want me to say? You could say uh, medical emergency. Say medical emergency. Mm, you got to prove you're sick, though. You got to name the doctor and so forth and so on. Joe, write down anything you please. Well, don't bite my head off. You and I know what you're doing. You and I know where you're going, okay? All right, look, I'm going to visit my poor old mother. Great. But you better have one, and she better be on Venus. Joe, just let me get out of here, will you? Raj, don't go. What do you mean, don't go? I mean, pack it in. Walk away from it. Are you telling me I can't go? No, I'm not telling you not to go. I'm just asking you not to. Why? Because you won't be coming back. How do you know? I know all the signs. You're not coming back, Raj. I know you are not coming back. At this point, he probably knows something we don't. But what? From the little we know about it, we can appreciate that any journey... ...and uncertain. But obviously, there's something especially dangerous and ominously unusual about this one. Well, Act Two is but a few minutes away. What was that popular song from a generation ago? It was called Far Away Places with Spring. And what were those far away places? Oh, they were in Asia, Africa, Europe. Just a hop, skip, and a jump away. But our story today is about really faraway places with strange names like Tau Seti, Betelgeuse. And on a clear night, sometimes you may see them up there in the sky. What kind of thing is that to say to me? I'm not coming back. Because it's true. Raj, five years ago, I had my own ship, too. Five years ago, Curly had a job for me. Something like this, only uh, mine was in Orion someplace. Look, why don't we swap stories when I come back? You are not coming back, Rod. You better listen. I came out to the field here feeling just like you do. Everything inside me like jelly and... And like you, I knew I wasn't coming home again. I'd been through that hole in the sky too many times. Like you, I was scared. <laughs> scared to face guys like Curly. Also scared of starving. What was I going to do to make a living? What else can I do to make a living? Join up, Ron. Oh, no, so I could never do that. That's what I thought at first. But isn't it better all around if guys like you and me wear the uniform? At least we understand. I have to go now. It isn't too bad. The money's good. It's clean. Bribery, that's clean. Uh, maybe not, but... Hey, you can protect your friends. I'm only on the take as far as cargo and destination's concerned. All the money in the world wouldn't get you off the ground if I knew your ship wasn't spaceworthy. Yeah. Well, look, I got a schedule to keep. Don't go, Rod. I have to. Well, then, don't go through the hole. You know as well as I do I have no choice. Okay. 
Okay, I'm on the desk tonight. Uh, maybe I can keep the hounds off your trail. In 15 minutes, I was completely clear of the Earth. I would have no problem while in the boundaries of our own solar system. But as soon as I was out in the galaxy, the patrols would be after me. I could outdistance any single pursuit ship. But if they had my position and course, they could set up a fire network that could destroy me in the fraction of a second. I could hear Joe Dresden on the monitor. He was getting reports from all of his scouts who had sighted or thought they had sighted me. He would be feeding all this data into a computer, which would calculate my exact position. Attention all ships, Rainbow Command. Illegal craft identified as Mark, registered Captain Roger Thorpe, probably headed for Polaris. Consult charts 946 and 202. Subtract coordinates 4 and 8 from coordinates 12 and 18. Mark, challenge. Allow five minutes for reply, then open fire. Thank you, Joe. He had sent the pursuit off in exactly the opposite direction. He had bought me at least two days' time. Attention, all ships, Rainbow Command. Fugitive reported headed for Ursa Major. Consult charts 380426. Fugitive reported headed for Tau City. How skillfully he kept directing the pursuit away from me. I was coming to the end of the fifth day, and now I didn't have to worry. I was near the hole in the sky, and even though so many people were convinced that it was all fiction, that was back down there in the safety and security of Earth. Up here, even the most skeptical suddenly became believers. I could rest assured there was nobody within a trillion miles of me now. Roger. Roger. You can answer me, Roger. You won't give away your position. I'm on a sealed frequency. Joe? You're at the edge of the hole, Roger. I know. Turn back. I can't. I'll, I'll clear a path for you. I have to keep going. I'll bring you home safe and sound. I'm going in now, Joe. I'm here. And I was there. I was in the hole in the sky. It was so quiet. So peaceful. So tranquil. I'd better feed my computer. My speed, my course, my declaration. I could expect to find myself orbiting Medusa. Then I could set my bearing for the planet Bacchus. I could still hear Joe's voice. Roger, it isn't too late. Now get out of there. It's quiet, Joe. It's quiet. That doesn't mean anything. You know as well as I do, it can all change in a fraction of a second. Thanks for everything, Joe. I'm all right now. Come home, Roger. Come home before it's too late. Roger, come home before it's too late. Joe. Joe, where are you? Where are you? Suddenly, everything started to spin. Everything went out of control. Not just my computer and my instruments, but everything inside of me. It was as if, as if I was just coming apart under some terrible pressure. An unbelievable stress and strain that began to pull me in every direction. It was as if it were the end of the world. Or maybe it was the beginning. Maybe it was the chaos that was in the very beginning. Then, there was nothing. Voice. What was she saying? It sounded like no language I'd ever heard before. Then I remembered what I had to do. I fed the sounds into the computer and waited. Just like the ancient anthropologists could construct an entire prehistoric animal from just a few fragments of bone, the computer could project an entire language from just a few significant sounds. Gradually... The voice became clearer and clearer. What ship 
is yours. Identify. Identify. Lark. Lark. How many aboard? Just one. Identify. Roger Thorpe, registered captain. Home port. Earth. Where is that? Consult star chart 876. What is star chart 876? Whatever you happen to use, start with Polaris. What is Polaris? You draw a line from Polaris to Deneb. There are no such stars. Hey, what's that noise? You are locked into a landing beam. Hold it. I don't necessarily want to land. Cut your power. I only need to get my bearings. Prepare to descend. Am I being forced to land? You are being invited. But I don't want... Cut all power. Step clear of the ship. But where... where... Follow instructions. Under protest. Follow the red line. Where am I going? Stop at the door. Wait. For what? It will slide open. Step inside. What's in there? Step inside. There's nothing in here. Step inside. All right. All right. What do I do now? Wait. What do you people want? Who are you? Where am I? I was in a room of some kind. A plain, bare space. There was a chair. Just a single chair, and that was the only furniture. I sat down. I waited. Who were these people? What did they want? Then the wall slid away. And facing me was a woman... She was sitting behind a desk of some kind. She was young, about 30-ish. She wore a black robe. Her red hair was short. She might have been good-looking if she didn't have such a serious look on her face. She touched a switch, and suddenly on the entire wall behind, there appeared an enormous sky chart. Point out your home star. My home star? Well, it, it doesn't show up too well, you see. It's Red Dwarf. I can give you its position. Yes. Uh, just let me orient myself. I'll have to find Polaris and then Tau City. I've never heard wait, of any... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This isn't possible. I don't recognize any of these patterns. I warn you to tell the truth. But this is all, all very strange. Orion should be right there. Orion? I don't see a single thing I know in this entire sky. This is the universe. Well, maybe it's a part of it that's off somewhere. This is the complete universe. Oh, wait a minute. The universe is infinite. <laughs> Why did you do that? Blasphemy. Everyone knows the universe is closed and limited. Okay, okay, have it your way. Why are there no papers on your ship? Because I didn't need any. What is your cargo? I'm sure you looked it over by now. Cosmetics. What are cosmetics? Didn't your translating computer tell you? Yes, but I don't understand. Well, it's just... It's just stuff that women put on their face. For what purpose? I guess it makes them look better. Better? What's the difference? Please, answer the question. Is it important? It may be the most important thing in the universe. These uh, cosmetics, they change people's faces? You could say that. It disguises them. Well, strictly speaking, it might. I see. Yes. Yes, I see. Well, I hope you see something, because I don't. Interrogator. Yes, censor. We have examined the ship. Have you examined the prisoner? Who says I'm a prisoner? <laughs> you have not been spoken to. I have examined the prisoner. We see no use for the cargo. Destroy it. At once. Confiscate the ship. Immediately. Dispose of the prisoner. What does that mean, dispose? Uh, save him for the games or eliminate him quietly. Whatever suits you. What is he talking about? I shall save him for the games. Look, am I being sentenced to something? To death. Wait a minute. Don't I get a trial? You have been tried. 
and found guilty. I have the right to defend myself. You have no rights at all. What sort of place is this? It could very easily fit certain places here on our own Earth. But this is a story that takes place far in the future. In a place so far away that the imagination can scarcely encompass the distance. But space, time, what do these things matter? People are people everywhere, aren't they? I shall be back shortly with Act Three. more things in heaven and on earth than are dreamed of in your philosophy is a favorite line of Shakespeare's. And of course, he had a rather limited idea of heaven. He didn't know that the heavens consisted of an infinity of space with an unlimited number of worlds. Can you imagine what he might have written had he been able to talk with a modern astronomer or an astronaut? From what I could gather... The man was called the censor. The girl who had been talking to me was called the interrogator. Anyhow, they both decided that it was all over for me. The man left. You will be executed at the games. What games are these supposed to be? The games to honor the establishment of the autocracy. Look, I don't have anything to do with all this. What was your purpose in coming here? I was on my way to Medusa. Medusa? Yes, it's a giant yellow star. There that... is no such star. How can you make a statement like that? Because I never heard of it. That doesn't mean that... If it existed, I would have heard of it. Since I have never heard of it, that is proof that it never existed. Why do I have to be killed? Because you have come here to overthrow the autocrat. That isn't true. Are you a stranger? Yes. The only reason strangers come here is to overthrow the autocrat. Since you admit to being a stranger, oh, no, it just means... just hold on. That doesn't necessarily follow. Do you have legitimate business on this planet? Well, no. Then you admit it. Since you do not have legitimate business, you therefore must be treated as a stranger. She stood up and nodded her head. Two men in black robes came in. I understood I was to go with them. I don't care what world you're in. A cell is a cell. This was a small room with smooth white walls. There were two beds in it. I had a roommate. His name was Artie. And I asked him why he was in jail. I tried to kill the autocrat. Look, set me straight, will you? Who was the autocrat? He is the maximum ruler. That's why you want to kill him? I want to kill him because he oppresses the people. And then what? Then perhaps the next maximum ruler will be a kinder person. And suppose he turns out worse? That has happened before. Mm -hmm. In that case, what do you do? Kill him and hope again. Wouldn't it make more sense to eliminate all these rulers entirely? Well, then who would rule? The people. The people? How could the people rule? Well, they would elect representatives to, well, to, let's say, to a Congress. I don't understand how that could work. It doesn't work with all these rulers, either. Well, that's because he has not come yet. Who? The ultimate ruler. And who's he supposed to be? The ultimate ruler? He will come down from the skies. How? He shall be carried by a bird. You have to be a pretty big bird. Yes. And he would mark his people. Mark them? In what way? In a certain way. In other words, you don't know. I only know what the prophecy reads. Oh, it's prophecy. For those of us who believe he will come. Still, it should be easy to explain what marking his people would mean. Well, I suppose with a sign that will enable everyone to recognize them. All right. Meanwhile, how does it look for you and me? We shall be executed. You say you were opposed to the ruler. What'd you do? I wasn't able to do anything. We are too few, too weak. Or maybe we are many, but we do not know it. We have no sign by which we may recognize each other. Well, what did you actually do to wind up in here? I... I complained. You complained? About what? The weather. 
You mean you're going to be executed because you complained about the weather? It wasn't the first time. If you establish yourself as one who complains, it means you are basically a dissatisfied person. Therefore, you are likely to revolt. Well, do you plan to just sit here and wait? It does no good at all to make other plans. Why not? How can plans be carried out? We are sealed in here. There is no hope of escape. There has to be something we can do. We must face our fate bravely. I can't accept that. Accept it, since you may not reject it. It seemed there was no help at all. The days passed. When would it happen? The games at which the execution would take place. Or were the executions the games? Even Arnie didn't know. And the jailer who brought us our food wasn't talking. Then one morning, Artie was taken out of the cell. And I thought, this is it. But why was I being left behind? Then about an hour later, Artie returned. Hey, I thought that was the old ball game for you, Artie. You were worried, I'm sorry. It's my fault. Your fault? Oh, I should have told you. As the day draws closer, you're given a chance to save your life. Oh? What kind of chance? Well, naturally, you don't take it. Why not? What have you got to lose? Everything. You see, you are given an opportunity to inform on your fellow conspirators. Oh. The fact is, I don't have any fellow conspirators. Well, didn't you say that you belong to an organization that wants to overthrow the autocrat? I didn't say it was an organization. Well, then how do you expect to... One person can do it. If he is resourceful enough. But wouldn't it be better if you did have a group? Of course, but how would we know each other? I was very brave, but I wonder. Suppose I did have confederates. Would I have betrayed them to save my own life? I don't think you would, Artie. Then suddenly the door opened and the guards were in the cell. They grabbed me... I was hustled along some corridors and finally into a room. A small room. She was behind a table. There was no place for me to sit. Suddenly, she took a small metal rod from under her black robe. She pointed it at every part of the room. It gave off a squealing noise. One has to be sure. Of what? I'm sorry, I cannot offer you a chair. My name is Dinara. What do we have to be sure of? That we are not overheard. We are safe for a moment at any rate. What am I doing here? You know what you are doing here. You have been sent here to save us. I what? You are the ultimate ruler. Me? Now, j j just it hold on. It does you no good to deny it. I'm telling the truth. I have no idea It's probably what... the truth as you see it. You do not know that you are the ultimate ruler. But you have fulfilled the prophecy. The prophecy? Surely Artie has talked with you in the cell. Well, yes, but I didn't believe... It was predicted that the ultimate ruler will come down from the skies. He will be carried by a bird. What is the name of your ship? You can't be serious. The Lark. And it is a bird of delight. It's not an angry bird, a bird of prey. That's all coincidence. And he shall mock his people. Well? What have you brought on your ship, on the Lark? You have brought the devices with which your people can be marked, paint and powder. Look, I'm afraid you don't understand. It's the prophecy. I am not the ultimate ruler. It does you no good to deny My it. name is Roger Thorpe. You told me that. I come from a planet called Earth that revolves around a tiny reddish dwarf star called Sol. It doesn't matter. I'm a trapped space captain. I carry mostly contraband if I want to make a living. It's not important. There's a place called the Hole in the Sky. I never heard of it. It's a spot in the universe where, where crazy things can happen. You get all twisted and turned in space. Space and time. It makes no difference. So maybe I am in an entirely strange universe. It doesn't change the prophecy. If you are aware or not of being the ultimate ruler, you fulfill all the requirements. Why are you telling me this? I, too, wish to overthrow the autocrat. You? But aren't you a, a member of the regime? There are many of us who do our work secretly. And hope for the day to arrive. The fact is, I'm going to be executed any day now. So what good does it do if you think I'm the ultimate ruler? You have been brought here by your beautiful bird. You have brought the material with which to mock your people. Your people will save you. There was only one way to make sense out of any of this. I would just have to assume that I had landed on a planet of nuts. 
pure and simple. And so I did. But it got pretty grim. One day, Artie and I were taken from our cell and brought to an enormous stadium. There must have been a hundred thousand people. All of them wore black robes with hoods that covered their heads. Artie and I were led to the center of the arena. Then we heard the voice of the censor. These men have plotted against the autocrat. Their fate is to be consumed by the mighty electric energy of the state. In a few moments, they shall no longer exist. Let this then serve as a lesson to all who would attempt similar madness. Not a single word was heard from the robed and hooded crowd. And then we heard it. A humming that grew louder and louder. I began to feel warm, then hot. And soon it was as if I was on fire. Stop! Who dares halt the execution? I, the interrogator. For what purpose? Revolt. Arrest her. Before anyone dares to touch me, I shall remove my hood. Look at my face. Let all who have the same marking now show their faces. Her face was white as powder could make it. Her lips were red as the most flaming scarlet. I could hear her voice shouting. Believers in the ultimate ruler, show your markings. And now by the thousands, the hoods came off. And there they were. Men, women, children, with stark white faces and flaming red lips. Hardly anyone remained masked, except for the censor and a few high officers. And they were quickly hustled away. And now the silent crowd began to kneel. Kneel! Homage to the ultimate ruler! No, no one should kneel to me. You are the ultimate ruler. They must. About that makeup. You mean the sacred markings. Men... Men shouldn't really wear any. Would you deprive us of the privilege of showing our reverence and respect, ultimate ruler? The prophecy has been fulfilled. The ultimate ruler has arrived on a beautiful bird. He has brought with him the markings that his faithful followers have proudly put on and shall wear forever. And now, all hail the ultimate ruler. I don't understand completely. I'm the ultimate ruler. I'm treated with respect and reverence. I have whatever I want. There are times when I can't believe it. Am I lost in space? Or am I lost in my own imagination? Who knows? At times, this is real. And times when it seems like a dream. I only know one thing. I entered the hole in the sky, and I'm still in there. Do any of us know what it means? Is there a hole in the sky? Is there a Bermuda Triangle? Are there mysterious disappearances that simply defy all rational explanation? We work for centuries to solve a riddle. And then when we think we know the answer, suddenly the original question looms larger than ever. I'll be back shortly. I'm going on a picnic. That's nice. With Blanche, my sweetheart. That's her over there. And you want us to make up a picnic basket? With special wine and special food, Mr. Uh... Vino Branco. Hi, Mike McDonald. Vino Branco is the name of Lancer's white dinner wine. Vino Branco? Yes, very crisp and refreshing. It's affordable and it goes perfect with any food. Like caviar? Vino Branco is perfect with caviar. Okay, give me two quarts. Of what? Of caviar. It's $25 an ounce. How much do you want? 
Right. Well, there'll be two of us at the uh, picnic. Uh-huh. And uh, Blanche eats like a bird. Well, just give me an estimate. How about a quarter of an ounce? <clears throat> Perhaps you'd enjoy the Vina Bronco with something a little less expensive. You mean like this chicken? This pheasant. Blanche eats meatloaf. Isn't this meatloaf? No. She eats meatloaf by the gobs. It's not meatloaf. It's patty de foie gras. Okay, I'll take the Lancer's Vina Bronco. And what do you have to eat for under ten bucks? This jar of mustard. Perfect. Blanche eats mustard by the gobs. I'll wrap it up. Honey, we'll eat the mustard here. You what? can't eat the mustard. Ah, the summertime. When everybody's fancy. He turns to love and Lancer's Vino Bronco White Dinner Wine, imported by Hugh Line, Hartford, Connecticut. You think you've got a problem buying your mother a present this Mother's Day? Try buying presents for four mothers. I have my mother, Jack's mother, my grandmother, and his grandmother. I couldn't possibly leave anybody out, so I give them each the Whitman sampler. The sampler's been a Mother's Day tradition with us for years. If you've got a problem about what to buy your mother this Mother's Day, give her the Whitman sampler. It's the perfect way to say Happy Mother's Day, no matter how many mothers you have. At the store, they told me there's a powerful anti-itch drug I can buy without a doctor's prescription. Now, I use Bicozine Cream as directed. No more burning, embarrassing itching. No more scratching. Bicozine actually speeds healing. Bicozine Cream. What a relief. Now, soften and remove hard, callous skin with the same ingredient doctors use most. Apply Dermasoft Cream to feet, hands, elbows as directed. Dermasoft Cream. Maybe there is a hole in the sky. After all, Einstein spoke of a place where the past, the present, the future are all intermixed and intermingled. He says it occurs at the speed of light. But just think, in the universe that's surrounded by our own minds, the private universe that each of us presides over, the past, present, and future frequently mix and mingle. And that truly can be where you find the hole in the sky. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Joan Shea, Earl Hammond, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. If you can't pay your gas, electric, coal, oil, or other fuel bills, you may qualify for help from the city of Detroit. To apply, you must live in... Marshall. A good deal has been made these days of the power of the ancients over life and death. Since no one has ever returned to tell us, we have no idea whether any one belief in any one deity guarantees life after death. Does Charon run his ferry across the sticks in both directions? Will Anubis guide any other nationality than ancient Egyptians to judgment? Will Vishnu appear to the Hindus or to all of us? to punish the wicked. Though we have no positive answer, today's mystery tale is worth checking out. Frank, where have you been? I've been going crazy trying to reach you. I've been to Boston for a three-day seminar. What's the matter? Can you please come over right now? You're my husband's best friend. I've nobody else to turn to. He just sits there in front of that statue like a zombie. And I'm scared. Please, Frank, hurry. Hurry! How 
our mystery drama, Messenger from Yesterday, written especially for the Mystery Theater by Gerald Keene, stars Norman Rose. would never have happened if the college had not been named Imhotep. But there it was, christened Imhotep College, after the Egyptian god of knowledge in a small New England town. Except for a department of Egyptology, this college carried a pretty complete curriculum from accounting basics to writing art of effective. So why did it happen there? That man driving a 1969 station wagon into a driveway. That's where our story begins. Gloria! Hey, Gloria, I'm home. I know you are. It's the one in the house. Gloria, can you come outside a moment? Darling, I'm in the middle of frosting my own birthday cake, if you want to know. I know it's your birthday, honey. That's why I want you to come out to the car. I can't come now, Rim. You'll be sorry, Gloria. Oh, all right. Oh, men, you are all alike. I have to stop what I'm doing because King Tut here, my famous professor of Egyptian history, has given an order. All right, now, well, what is it? I don't see anything. Look in the back. Ramsey. What is that? Are you crazy? <laughs> Happy birthday, darling. A life-size statue of an Egyptian pharaoh? I don't know whether to laugh or cry. Do you think it looks all right in that corner? Well, I don't know, Gloria. You see the way its right arm is sort of bent at the elbow? Mm -hmm. Well, I was thinking if we could sort of, you know, prop it up against the mantelpiece. How would it look like... <laughs> Ramsey, you are really too much. You bring me a life-size reproduction of a standing pharaoh, and you want to put it in the middle of the room? Oh, it'll look like it's leaning with its elbow <laughs> on the mantelpiece. Come on, how about it? A contemporary sculpture. Oh, I can imagine what our friends will say when they come to visit. Gloria, who's your friend? Or, uh, Gloria, there's a man by the mantelpiece. Uh, I was kidding. I think it looks great in the corner. Uh, can you think of any other place? It is the only place. I certainly don't want it in the kitchen, and I don't see it in the bedroom. Mm. All kidding aside, sweetie. You like it? How can I not like it? it? It's beautiful. All that guilt. Must have cost you a fortune, but I'm afraid to ask. Gloria. Gloria, look at it. Am I crazy, but wasn't one arm bent a moment ago? What? What? Uh, I'm not crazy because I do remember. Mr. Ray of the junk teak shop where I got it, I remember we were carrying it out to the station wagon and that, that right arm was bent. Mr. Ray said it probably had been, you know, holding something like a spear. Well, how could it have been bent? That's what I want to know. Because right now, that pharaoh has got both his arms straight down at his sides. Am I forgiven, Gloria? Oh... I don't know. I'll think about it. Dinner will be ready soon. I don't mind cooking my own birthday dinner or baking my own birthday cake, but in all the years we've been married, you have never come home without champagne. I will never forgive myself for forgetting it. Mm. I've got no excuse whatsoever. Classes were over early, too, because my students had a test today, so I didn't even have to do any teaching. Well, I guess it was all the excitement of finding this full-size standing pharaoh in that crazy place. Yeah, you know, it just threw me. I can't believe he let you have it for so little. Are you telling me the truth, Ramsey? Well, <laughs> it's a reproduction. The dealer said that this was a test statue. You know how they do it. They make a mold of the original and then cast copies from that. I guess this one was imperfect, so they chucked it. No, well, not so anyone could tell. Well, all right, Professor West, if you can tear your eyes away from my golden cell for an hour, dinner is on the table. Oh, boy, that was some feast, Gloria. Well, I gotta loosen my belt. <laughs> that chocolate cake. Some more coffee, darling? Are you bad? 
Uh, look, can I have a second piece? You cannot. I'm putting the rest of this cake in the fridge where you cannot get at it. Ramsey! Ramsey West, you old faker. You bought it after all and snuck it into the ice box. What did I do? This bottle of champagne. And I was beginning to feel sorry for myself. Hey, where did that come from? Oh, Mr. Innocent. Gee, Gloria, I forgot. I got so excited finding this Egyptian statue in a junk shop, I clean forgot. Look, honey, this bottle of champagne, I, I never saw it before, believe me. You are the sweetest absent-minded professor I ever married. Go on, open it. I love surprises. But, Gloria, honest. Will you stop it? Now, the next thing you're going to say is that the pharaoh put the champagne in the ice box. <laughs> Hello? Ma! Oh, gosh, it's good to hear your voice. Uh, how's Dad? Mm-hmm. How's life in Florida? What? Oh, she is. W w when did that happen? Oh, my gosh. Well, now, look, if this is ill and there's no one to take care of the kids, sure, I'll go. Uh... Uh, uh, which hospital? Uh-huh. I'll take the next plane to Chicago. Don't you worry. Uh, no, Ramsey can't come. It's exam time at college. Now, listen, don't you worry about sis. And, and call you when I get there. Okay. And love to Dad. <sighs> Uh, can I speak to Professor West? Uh, well, this is his wife, and it's urgent. Oh, I see. Uh, well, then can I leave a message for him? Okay, tell him that my sister is sick, and I'm taking the next plane to Chicago to help take care of her kids. Will you see he gets that? Thanks a lot. I thought you'd gone to your sister's. Oh, great Scott. The pharaoh is vacuuming the living room. I am making this house ready for the long journey. Must be going crazy. Seeing things, hearing things. This, well, this just doesn't happen. A statue that, that moves, that talks. I better get Frank on the phone fast. He'll know what to do. Uh, hello, Frank. Hi, Ramsey. What's on your mind? Oh, Frank, are you busy? No, I was just going across the street to a diner for a little supper. They got Greek rice pudding. Oh, look, Frank, would you mind coming over here? When? Now. What's the problem? You sound kind of funny, Ramsey. What's the matter? Well, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm suffering from some kind of delusions. What's that noise I hear? Well, someone is uh, vacuuming. I thought Gloria was out of town. Look, Frank, don't ask so many questions. Just get yourself over here as fast as you can. And even when I pulled the vacuum cleaner plug out of the wall, the machine kept right on going, and the pharaoh kept moving it across the rug. Oh, come on, Ramsey. What is this? That statue over there in the corner was doing your house cleaning? Oh, what can I tell you? <laughs> Gloria will love you if you're your little Egyptian homemaker when she gets back. No minimum wage or social security to cough up. Frank, I tell you, that figure standing there against the wall was vacuuming. All right. All right. Let's be scientific about it. First, let's examine it. Now, see. Oh, it's really a beauty. I haven't seen anything like this outside a museum. Is it on loan from someone? Oh, it's... Gloria's birthday present. I picked it up at Mr. Ray's junk teak for next to nothing. You were always lucky. Look at the workmanship. This must have been made by one of the master carvers. And the age of it. 19th Dynasty, am I right? Well, the original probably was. This five foot five statue is a copy? Yeah, from the Edwards collection. Oh, even copies aren't cheap. 
I don't know what to tell you, Ramsey. It's a physical impossibility for this statue to move. You must have imagined it. I didn't. I tell you, it's physically impossible. Now tap all the way around to the back. See? Solid, through and through. It's not on casters. Now, how could the legs have been walking? Search me, but they were. I'd say, on the basis of what you tell me, you need a rest from teaching Egyptology. You've probably become so immersed in your subject, the, uh, how can I put it, the, uh, the ancient Egyptians have become so real to you that your mind has brought this statue to life. Frank, will you take a look at the handle of this vacuum cleaner? Do you see those specks? I'll be a son of a gun. Mm -hmm. Would you say that on this handle there are traces of gilt and gold paint? Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. Do you still think that I was seeing things? No. But I'm beginning to wonder about me. Ramsey, how many drinks have we had? Go on, tell me more. It said... I am making this house ready for the long journey? Right, as clearly as you're saying it now. Mm. Tell you what I think. And I'm not a professor of psychology without pretty much knowing that field. Especially aberrations. Aberrations? Mm. The human mind is a funny thing. There comes a time when it acts as though it had a mind of its own. You've just had a signal, that's what. A warning. Your mind is saying, Ramsey, you've been overworking. I'm going to give you a sign that'll scare the daylights out of you. So you had better take a rest. That's what my mind is saying to me. Mm-hmm. More or less. Ah, uh, well, I guess you're right. Mm-hmm. It's been my experience that if those signals are disregarded, the subject could be heading for a nervous breakdown. Now, that's a little free advice. Now, got any food in the kitchen? I'm starving. <laughs> Wait till you see Gloria's creamy chocolate cake. She's got it tucked away in the icebox. <laughs> Frank, look at all that food on the kitchen table. Hey, you're a heck of a cook. And lit candles. And my favorite little fat steaks. Ah, and chocolate cake on the side and coffee on the burner. Hey, I ought to come over here more often. Frank, I didn't prepare that meal. What are you talking about? I tell you, I had nothing to do with cooking this dinner or setting the table or lighting the candles. Well, whatever magic you practice, it turned out great. It sure beats the diner. I'm sitting down and digging in. Mmm. Wonderful. Cooked to a tea. I hope the nourishment was prepared as you wish. Mm. What did you say? Right. I turn around. Look who's standing in the door. Humping Jehoshaphat. The Pharaoh. When faced with extraordinary or unexplainable phenomena, the first step is to assess what you know. Better than most other people, Professor West knows the ancient Egyptians believed that life continued after death. Whether there is fact in such a belief, who can tell? But certainly, the power of movement, recognition, and speech had been given to this plaster effigy of a man who lived 2,500 years ago. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Is there a link between the past and the present? Some theorists believe we are all linked in a chain, an endless belt of humanity destined to go round and round, which might explain why generation after generation seems to make the same mistakes. Or is there linear time, as others have said, that we are but travelers on a river of time passing the shores of events? Whatever the theory, the fact remains that in the house of a college professor, a statue has moved and spoken. It was the darndest thing. 
Uh, I've made a lifetime study of philosophies and psychologies, and the only explanation I could comfort myself with was mass mesmerism. Hypnotists use it, faith healers use it, and somehow, Ramsey and I had fallen for it. I swear to you, Frank, I had nothing to do with preparing that dinner. Now, don't keep saying that. It's too much for me to handle right now. Uh, let me just add up what I do know. And here I am in your living room. It's ten o'clock at night. I've eaten. I'm sitting in front of your fireplace. You're six feet away. I'm standing upright, leaning against that mantelpiece. There's a five-foot... Five, reproduction of a 19th dynasty pharaoh. Now, how far would you say I am from the pharaoh? Oh, two feet, three, somewhere between. Mm -hmm. It's made of plaster. Has two feet that are well balanced on the ground. No platform. Covered with gold paint. What any scientist would call a totally inanimate object. Yet I saw it move and I heard it talk. I'm glad it's you too, Frank. We might get a raid on twin straitjackets. Now, wait a minute. I, I never said you were disturbed. What I said was, you may be under a strain. So we're both under a strain. Now, let's keep pulling it apart. Uh, do you mind if I smoke? I'm trying a new tobacco, and when I see you turning blue, I'll stop. Yeah, there are matches up there on the mantelpiece. Yeah. Now, where's that tobacco? Did you say there were matches up here? Oh, my heavens. Will you look at him? He's, he's lit a match for you to light your pipe with. Thank you, Pharaoh. Thank you. I've got it. There was a slip-up when these copies were being manufactured, and you got yourself a robot. A robot? Well, how is that possible? Anything is possible. No, that's not what I mean, Frank. A robot has to be programmed like a computer. My Pharaoh acts independently. He sees a problem. He solves a problem. He deduces we're hungry. He makes a meal. The room needs cleaning. He does it. I'm not denying that you haven't got yourself a very special kind of robot. Oh, I've got an idea. Um, well, uh, thanks a lot for coming over, Frank. I'll uh, I'll see you to the door. But I, I, I don't... Oh. Come on. Do you think the Pharaoh can listen and understand us? Who knows? But I'm not taking any chances. Let's go outside. I'll walk you up the street. Uh, look, I'll, uh, I'll fix the latch so I can get back inside. Okay, shoot. Oh, I've got to find out who made that pharaoh. You've got something. Who indeed? Well, after my 10 o'clock class tomorrow, I've got the rest of the day off. I'll go to the junk teak and find out where he got it and keep tracking back. How about you? You want to come? Can't. Big day for applied psych. I'm free in the evening, though. A horrible thought that crosses my mind is maybe some manufacturer is turning out a whole army of robots, and all of them may not like to do housework. Hey. Hey, what is this? I'm, I'm locked out. I know I put this door on the latch. Hey! Let me in! Pharaoh, stop kidding around. Let me in. About an hour later, I was home reading in bed. And Ramsey called. Told me he'd been locked out. Had to break a window to let himself in. Said the Pharaoh was just where we left him. Standing in the living room. The only thing different was all the ashtrays had been emptied. And the glasses washed and put away. I told him he'd got a good thing there. He didn't think that was very funny. Hello. Is this Museum Masterpieces Incorporated? Uh, right. Oh, this is Ramsey West. I recently acquired a reproduction of a standing pharaoh, Seti the First, I think. <laughs> it appears that way. Yeah, that's right. But you, you do make all those plaster cast copies from the Edwards collection, don't you? But yes, I do. Well, of course you can. I was going to come over and see you. Right, I'm at uh, 14 Elmhurst Drive. I'll be here the rest of the day. Oh, I didn't catch that name. Ludlow. And how will I know you? Uh, some... Some red hair, okay. Say, you are... <laughs> he hung up. Let's 
Mr. Ludlow? Mr. Ware? I thought you were. I know you. Your face looks familiar, too. Well, you're Red Ludlow, class of uh, 61. And you're... Uh, Ramsey West. I teach Egyptology at Imhotep College. Well, good for you. So, you're with Museum Masterpieces, huh? Professor, I am Museum Masterpieces. And that is my truck in your driveway. Oh, yes, so it is. It's a nice job. Oh, come on in, Red. Well, actually, nobody calls me Red anymore. I've got so little of it left. <laughs> uh, now, uh, where's the pharaoh? In the living room. Through here. Uh, there he be. The reason I wanted to uh, come over and talk to you, I wanted to know how many of these uh, have you made? Oh, just a hundred. If more orders come in, we'll cast another batch. Uh, do you think you could move him forward away from the wall? I want to look at something at the back. You see, we... Was I imagining that? I, I thought he stepped forward. <laughs> well, I'm uh, <clears throat> spending too much time in the shop. Those fumes must be getting to me. What are you looking for in back? A serial numbers. Uh -huh. You don't think the Egyptians put serial numbers on the statues of their pharaohs? Uh, no, but we do on the copies. It... Uh, oh. I was afraid of this. What's the problem? Professor, can you keep what I'm going to say completely confidential? Well, sure, but what's wrong? Well, of course, it goes without saying. Museum masterpieces will reimburse you for what you paid for the statue. Well, I don't know that I wish to part with it. Oh, I'm afraid you'll have to. No question about that. I'd say there's quite a big question about that. I gave this one to my wife as a birthday present. Oh, in that case, does it matter to you if we give you a duplicate reproduction instead of this one? It certainly would. I, well... You see, I've become rather attached to this particular copy. I'm afraid that's just the point, Professor. This is not the copy of the standing pharaoh Seti the First. This is the original. And I'm afraid I shall have to remove it from this house. <laughs> oh, oh I, I'm blinded. I went off right, right in my face. All this smoke. A, a fuse must a fuse must have blown somewhere. Mr. Ludlow, Mr. Ludlow, where are... Mr. 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 Ludlow? Red? Where are you? My son, he who stays the hand of Osiris must perish. Pharaoh. Pharaoh, did, did you make Red Ludlow disappear? That wasn't very nice of you. He is at peace with his ancestors. He is? Ramsey, darling, I'm back. Oh, I'm so glad to be home. Honey, what's the matter with you? You look terrible. Oh, yes. Well, uh, well it's just the uh, shock of seeing you. Uh, how's your sister? Shock? Well, that's a nice thing to say, I don't think. Oh, I tell you, it's good to be home. Ah, uh, and there's that beautiful pharaoh. How are you, Pharaoh? Did you take good care of Ramsey while I was away? Don't talk to him. Uh, don't say anything. Well, why shouldn't I? He's my pet, Vero, my birthday present. Ah, you never know. What would you do if he answered you? Well, it depends. I guess if he spoke 19th Dynasty Egyptian, that would knock me out of the box right away. Well, so, let me look around. Well, I congratulate you. The place is spotless. Ramsey, you are a marvelous housekeeper. Well, I, uh, I had help. And the first thing I knew, Frank, there was this flash, and that was the end of Red Ludlow. Mm, I don't know what to say. And two minutes later, Gloria shows up. Her sister suddenly got well and came home from the hospital, so Gloria took the first flight back. Did you tell her what's been going on? Are you kidding? I don't even know how to explain his truck in our driveway. And what happens when Museum Masterpieces comes looking for the boss? They'll ring my bell, and the next thing you know, the police will stop by. What am I going to tell them? You sure can't tell them Red was atomized by a Pharaoh reproduction. They'll haul you off to the loony bin. That's another problem. It's the original. Lord knows what it's worth. It's probably priceless. First thing, get rid of that truck in your driveway. Well, how can I? When Red disappeared, the truck keys disappeared along with him. Then you're in the clear. No corpus delecti, no crime. Oh, 
Oh, I hope he's there. I just hope he's there. Hello. Oh, thank heaven, Frank, it's you. Yes, who's this? Gloria? Frank, please, please, could you come over right now? I know it's late, but I am so worried, and you're his best friend. I don't have anybody else to turn to. Frank, it's just terrible. He hasn't been to his classes all week. It's like I'm married to a zombie. He just sits there and... and... Frank, just hurry up and come over, will you please? Well, I've been waiting for you out here on the porch. I didn't want you to have to ring. Come on in. Okay. What is it, Gloria? Well, I told you he hasn't been to his classes for days. I don't know if he's ever going back. Where is he? In the living room. You won't recognize it, Frank. He, he's turned it into a tomb. What? He got some floor-to-ceiling photographic murals of the inside of some Egyptian tomb from some museum, and they're on the four walls. The fireplace he turned into an altar. And then, you know that exhibit of Egyptian artifacts in the front hall of the college? He brought everything here. All those funny statues of dogs and jackals and snakes and... Masses of dried flowers and tall grasses, and he just stuck them in jars all over the living room. But why? I don't know. It's something to do with that Egyptian statue he brought me for my birthday. Gloria, get rid of it. He just sits there like a king on a throne with this stunned look on his face. I'll go in there right now, Gloria. I'll do what I can to snap him out of it. And the worst part of it is he, he just won't let me near him. He makes his own meals. I don't know where he gets the food. Just comes out of thin air, I guess. He sleeps right in that room when that old army cot. I, I don't know what to do. And he won't let you go in there? When I go marketing, I have to go out the back door. Then I hear him talking, Frank, and I don't understand a word of it. You just leave him to me, Gloria. Go up to your room. And if I need any help, I'll holler. Between a statue thousands of years old and a teacher of today. Are there powers retained in carved wood and gilt that can transcend the ages? Was a spell woven by the ancients that can still hypnotize? If I were you, I'd just make sure your lucky charm is handy when you listen with me as I return shortly with Act Three. ordinary average house on 14 Elmhurst Drive in a room transformed to a replica of an Egyptian tomb, there is a statue, the Pharaoh Seti I. It speaks, it performs tasks, it seems to perform miracles, like making people disappear. Is there a scientist alive today who could create a robot of such powers? Or are these powers manifest beyond anything we can imagine? I'm not going to pretend I know the answers. All I knew was Ramsey West, professor of Egyptology at Imhotep College, had gotten himself much deeper into ancient death rites than he should have. And as his best friend, I would do anything to help him and protect him. Hiya, Ramsey. How are you, old boy? Who is it? It's me, Frank. Say, you really made this into quite a museum, didn't you? What are you doing sitting on that... Where did you get that chair? A lot of nice designs you painted on that. Made it look like a throne. You may advance. Oh, hey, Ramsey. It's me, Frank. Neil. Kneel, slave. What, are you kidding? You have been ordered to kneel. Oh, uh... Hiya, Pharaoh. I didn't see you standing there. Kneel, slave. Yeah, sure, sure, okay. I, I was going to kneel anyway. What is your message, slave? Uh, I just stopped by to see how you were, Ramsey. 
I see you got the Pharaoh still. So I guess nobody came around for him. Yes, yeah, hey, can I get up off my knees? Rise. Oh, Ramsey. Ramsey, step out of it, pal. What's with you? What? What's the matter? Ramsey, come on. Get up off that chair, will you? What? Uh, Frank? The least you could do is offer me a drink. Oh, Frank, Frank, is that you? Ramsey, you got to snap out of this. Now give me your hand. I'm not going to hurt you. Dad, a boy. Now, slowly, I'm going to pull you off that throne. Here we go. Come on. Stop. Father, stop him. <laughs> Darn it. I must have tripped. <laughs> How dumb can you be? I, 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 I can't get up. What's the matter with me? Bring me my crook and my flail. Ramsey, somebody stop playing games with me. Let me up off the floor. Ramsey, are you all right? Ramsey? Frank. Frank, are you hurt? I don't think so. I just can't get up. Gloria, go. Run. Get out of here. If you value your life. The next five hours in Ramsey West's living room were about the most terrifying I'd ever known. It may be realized that Indeed, all those forgotten dynasties of ancient Egypt, all their beliefs that the dead and their families and friends would continue life after death, were no mere superstitions. But why Ramsey West should be caught in this web, I did not know then. At about two in the morning, I had talked myself hoarse. Ramsey fell asleep in his chair, and even the Pharaoh's eyes seemed to close. I crept out. Frank, is that you? I didn't expect to find you still up. Been sitting here in the kitchen all this time. Oh, Frank, what am I going to do? Let's begin with a cup of coffee. I, I've got the water on. You want strong, regular, a week? How many spoonfuls? Strong, please. I just couldn't connect with Ramsey. I talked, but most of the time he just didn't hear me. He's in some spell of some kind. I don't even want to know what it is. But how can we get him out of it? Huh? What's that? It's just the tea kettle. Cooped up in that mausoleum sure made me jumpy. I don't know if I should tell you this. I guess I have to. Somehow, that pharaoh... Somehow, it, it talks. It really does. Oh, Frank... Not you, too. I am perfectly sane, Gloria. It doesn't always say things that make sense to me. Right after you got yourself out of there, I was lying on the floor, remember? Ramsey said, Father, let him live. But let who live? Me. Now, there are two ways we can go. I can pick up the phone and call the hospital and tell them to send over the men in the little white coat. No, I couldn't do that, Frank. Oh, let's try the other way first. Once during the evening, I heard Ramsey call the statue Father. Maybe that's the key. Get rid of that statue, and we're okay. Now, have you got a hammer or a hatchet or something heavy like that? I think so. I don't know if we have a hatchet. Ramsey keeps all our tools in this drawer. A screwdriver and an egg beater. Oh, ha- how's this? That's a pretty good sized hammer. Thanks. This ought to do the trick. Plaster is plaster, and if you hit it right, it ought to shatter like glass. Gloria, I may make an awful mess of your living room, but it's the only way. What are you going to do? You know, he's sitting in the dark now. May even be asleep. Well, I'm going to walk into that living room, turn off all the lights, Go over to that plaster pharaoh, and I'm going to break it up into little pieces. Frank, it, it's not a copy. It's the real thing, an original. Oh, yeah, no matter how valuable it is, believe me, it's not worth having above ground. Well, couldn't we call a museum and have them take it away? It must be destroyed. Look at the damage it's already done to this house. To Ramsey, to you, to me. You want to put this 
There's only one word I have for that statue, this evil thing into a museum where it might affect thousands of people who come to look at it? I never thought of it that way. Mm. I'm going in now. You stay here. No, I can't. I have to be with Ramsey. He may need me. Okay. Yeah, this hammer's a good weight. Let's go before we lose our nerve. Who's there? Don't sit in the dark, Ramsey. Isn't that better? Got the light now. My crook and my flail. Bring them here. I'm here, Ramsey. So is Gloria. I don't know who you think will bring you a crook and flail, but I have my symbol of power, a hammer. I'm sorry, Ramsey, but we have to do it. There is evil intent in the air. You bet there is. Ramsey, stay there. Just stay out of my way. Don't strike the statue. I must. Frank. What happened? Why did you drop the hammer? Uh, what? The hammer. What was I doing with the hammer? The zero. Yes. So? You were going to smash it. I don't see anything that needs fixing. I can't remember now why I brought it in here. You don't remember? <laughs> Gloria, forgive me. I had a long day. A conference that lasted till two in the morning... And some of those abnormal sight papers my students handed in were a little too abnormal. Well, folks, it's been a nice evening. Thanks for the coffee, Gloria. Frank, where are you going and uh, why? Ramses has commanded me to leave this presence. I'm excused, so I obey. Frank, what's with you? You don't talk like that. So, see you. Frank, Frank, for heaven's sake, come back. Don't leave me here. Please don't. Frank, stop. Stop. Frank, what happened? Oh, hi, Gloria. What are you doing out here? Frank, don't you remember? I don't know. Was there something I forgot? About Ramsey and that pharaoh. Oh, yes. Nice-looking statue. Of course, only someone who's into Egyptology would give it house room. Frank, you don't remember about half past nine, my phoning you, asking you to come over... I guess I do. We had coffee in the kitchen, right? Do you remember why we did? What we talked about? Do you remember anything strange about our living room, the way it looks? Like an underground Egyptian tomb? And Ramsey sitting on a big wooden chair staring at that statue? Do you remember any of that? You were in there for two or three hours, you said. Vaguely. You don't remember we decided to smash that pharaoh with a hammer? Gloria, you're going to think I'm an awful dunce. And I don't know why it's all like some dream that starts to disappear the moment you wake up and you can't hold on to it. Now, why would I want to take a hammer to break up that pharaoh? It means an awful lot to Ramsey. Are you sure you didn't misunderstand me? Frank... Do you remember saying Ramses has commanded me to leave his presence and so I must go? Come on, Gloria. It's late. We're standing in the middle of the street and you're telling me jokes. I'm getting an awful headache. So if you don't mind, I'll be on my way home. Tell Ramsey I'll call. I can't even remember what day it is. And I'll see you, Gloria. I hope so. Gloria, is that you? Yes, it's me. Oh, Ramsey, why do you have to sit there? I wish you wouldn't. I wish you were you. My father has something to say to you. Oh, Gloria Seti, speak to thy handmaiden. My daughter, are you prepared for the journey? What journey? Great Seti. You and my son, Ramses II, have been rescued from reincarnation to return to the proud kingdom. This life you enjoyed in this century is not yours to keep. Return to join your ancient ancestors. 
the gods await you. Didn't I tell you, darling, this was a perfectly lovely house? Yes, the real estate agent said we could spend as much time as we liked here and then bring her back the key. It's completely furnished. Oh, really? Who does it belong to? Well, that's the funny part about it. The people who used to live here, a professor and his wife, one day they just left town and disappeared. <sighs> Will you look at what's standing in that corner? A pharaoh. Mm. Yeah, they just left it here. Mm, that might be worth something. The most curious coincidence is that he was the professor of Egyptology at the college, the job you're going to be taking. Well, come upstairs with me, darling. I want to show you how big the closets are. My son, my daughter, I shall be sending you your servants very, very soon. I've been looking through old textbooks on ancient Egypt to try to make sense of what happened. Of course, I was struck with the similarity of names, Ramsey and Ramses the second. Then I read all that about reincarnation, and I wondered, had they found themselves in the wrong century and had to go back? Your guess is as good as mine. Which reminds me to tell you what is inscribed over the tomb of Ramses' father at Abydos on the Nile. Death does not end all things. in scarabs, amulets, and colored stones and buried themselves so they might live forever. Is that any more primitive than current beliefs that opals are unlucky, jade wards off heart disease, copper wristbands cure arthritis? And as for the luck of rabbit's feet, numerology, astrology, let's just say the ancients had no corner on superstitions. Our cast included Norman Rose, Terry Keene, Gordon Gould, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown.